everyone, and welcome to The Second Games. My name is Jeff, and today I have the honor of commentating on our first event of the games, Freestyle Skiing. In this event, runners will be competing against one another in the classic 1991 PC game, Ski Free. Before we get into the action, let's take a moment to go over the rules and scoring. Each skier will have three attempts at the freestyle course, with their highest individual run counting towards medal placement. The course itself is made up of three sections, the trick stage, the race stage, and the survival stage. In the trick stage, skiers will attempt to rack up as many style points as they can by using ramps and moguls to complete tricks while trying not to lose points by crashing or wiping out. After the first thousand meters, the race stage then begins. Skiers will continue to race down the mountain, scoring additional points by reaching the 2,000 meter mark as quickly as possible. Finally, in the survival stage, things get interesting. Skiers will try to avoid the abominable snowman for as long as possible, scoring final points based on how far they are able to go before being caught and eaten. The total score for the run will be the sum of the style points earned in the trick stage, one point for every tenth of a second under two minutes in the race stage, and ten points for every meter the skier can elude the abominable snowman in the survival stage. You got all that? Well, I hope so, because we're just about ready to begin. Today's event participants will be John, representing Ubechistan, Lindsay, representing Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, Peter, representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, and Sarah, representing Imperium Ludum. All right, I've gotten word from the mountain that our first competitor, John, is ready for his run. Let's see if he can set the bar high. It's a beautiful day on Ski Free Mountain as John wastes no time going directly into the freestyle section. His first trick, a big one, scoring, ooh, 89 points, but hitting a tree immediately. Still positive at 57. He's choosing his shot here. He's, he's, he's thinking about doing some jumps. No, still very direct on this. He's going to have to hit some jumps if he wants those points. Nice. Bringing home 154. A little bit of a slowdown on the moguls. Dodging trees. Ooh, a little front flip off a of mogul. Some bonus points there. Oh, and then John hits another tree there. Still looking pretty good. Got 144 points so far. About 400 meters to go in the freestyle section. Oh, not going to want to hit rocks like that, John. Carrying a whole heck of a lot of speed through here, but not really finding many jumps that are accessible to him. Coming down to the last 200 meters here, he's still looking for that final trick to put his score over the edge. Oop, and he found a tree instead. Oh, and a jerk-ass snowboarder. Get out of here, jerk-ass snowboarder. Oh, lining up for a good jump. Oh, but he doesn't do any tricks on the jump. Strange. All right, with 211 points, John is now passing to the second element of his run, the downhill speed section. He's going to want to try to maintain as straight of a line as possible and turn as little as possible to maintain that 18 meters a second as much as possible. There is the option of trying to take jumps in this section, which do speed you up uh, temporarily, but honestly, it's a kind of a big risk because those rocks and trees, they come out of nowhere, especially when you're moving at 21 meters per second. John looking nice and clean through here, dodging those dogs. Whose dog is that? Why is it on the mountain? Coming down just about 200 more meters to go, looking very clean through here. Dodging trees. This is going to be a pretty hot time to beat if he keeps clean through the end of this. Oh, and he wipes out on a style. Sw oh, no, and then hits a tree as well. He's going to lose a five or six seconds there, but oh, well, that's not going to help either. He uh, just barely made it over the finish line, and the abominable snowman was waiting to consume him, as is his right. So John's score breaks down like this, 211 style points off the first section, a pretty solid run, 59.8 seconds for the speed section, also very solid, and a little less of a solid 11 meters of survival time versus the Yeti. John puts down a score of 919. Is it good? Is it bad? Well, I don't think it's bad, but we'll see just how good it is when we go to our next runner. I'm getting word from the mountain that Lindsay is ready for her first run, so let's get to it. Lindsay begins her run by heading straight down maximum speed, a little quick mogul jump there for one style point, and oop, head first into a tree. We're going to the negatives, friends. Oh, we're up, and then we're back down. We're at negative two style points. Lindsay, you're going to want to not do crashing into tree style. You're going to want to do jump style. 
All right, maintaining quite a bit of speed through here. Up, oh, there's another tree. Back down to negative 33 points. Lindsay's really gonna want to clean this up. Up, oh, no, maybe, maybe, maybe Lindsay was misinformed about the goal here. It's not to uh, attack as many trees as possible. It's to be as ill and or as sick as you possibly can. With the first 500 meters of the trick section, Lindsay has made negative 121 points. Uh, not the greatest start from our competitor from Daisy Baby, Baby Bitch Territory. Uh, she comes down. Uh, all right, that'll help out quite a bit, getting about 24 points on that last trick. Whoop, barely dodging a tree and then dodging into the tree. Some habits die hard. All right, as Lindsay approaches the final 100 meters of the freestyle section, she once again kisses the tree gently on its bark and then does a sick-ass, ill-ass trick to recover some of those points. All right, not a great start with a negative 132 in terms of style points on the first section, but Lindsay's moving into the second section and she seems determined. Taking a nice, clean, straight line, getting that jump boost to go up to about 30 meters per second, 28 meters per second. Dodging trees well here. It seems like her downhill game is her best game here. Ooh, that rock snuck up on her, but she said no thank you. Moving along at a very good clip right now. I believe she's just a little bit ahead of John in terms of timing at this moment. Another dog on the mountain. Whose dog is that? Whose dog is that? Who are all these dogs belong to? Oh, Lindsay with a very straight line. Oh, oh, she hesitates there. Oh, and tacks a rock. Oh, oh, you hate to see a second rock there. It seems that in Ski Free, when you when you you get thrown off your groove, when you lose your your momentum. Oh, and then the the abominable snowman is there immediately to consume her. All right, so Lindsay's score stacks up like this. First section, not so great. Negative 132 style points. Generally want to be positive in the first section. Uh, those points will count against her score. Uh, her second section with 61.1 seconds in the speed section. Great run so far. Um, and 13 meters with the Abominable Snowman. Not bad. Worth a total combined score of 609 points, putting Lindsay behind John by a small margin. With Lindsay's first run in the books, our third competitor, Peter, is ready for his first run. Let's get down to the mountain. All right, Peter has begun his run and he's looking to, oof, oof, hate to hit a rock that early in the run. Up, oh, but uh, oh, follows it up with a jump. Now, if you do a sick enough trick, but you don't land it, you still can get positive points, which is what Peter did there. Uh, Lindsay did not have a great first uh, trick section. John, a pretty good one, so Peter's gonna, oh wow. He's gonna look to try to put some distance between them now, and he's up to 242 points with 600 meters to go in the freestyle section. Just banging out ill trick after ill trick, even though he's broken his spine on a couple of them. Peter's up to 388 with 400 meters to go. It is looking like Peter is bringing some style into this competition. If he can back it up with a quick uh, uh, speed section time and a good escape from the Yeti, this could be a, a fantastic run to start with. And that's how you want to start the games. You want to come out of the gate and have a great run to start with. All right, not, not as much in the back half of his run here for Peter. In the, uh, in the trick section, but he's gonna get one final trick out and 479, and he's into the speed section. Looking good so far, you don't wanna get rattled here. You wanna just kinda keep, maintain your line and and dodge like your, like your life depends on it, because it does, because the Yeti will eat you. Peter keeping a pretty good line here. Snowboarders and dogs on the mountain being pretty Cooperative. Oh, ooh, throwing in a swag front flip for no reason. You'll love to see it. You don't get any style points if you do tricks outside of the freestyle section. However, people will clap, and I will think you're cool. All right, Peter coming down. Maintaining very good speed through here. He's been 18 meters a second for most of the run, just doing tiny little adjustments left and right to get out of the way of trees and rocks. Oh, oh, he just bar oh, he overcorrected a little bit and clipped that tree anyway. All right, he's coming down to the Yeti section here. Oh, he's not going to have much speed. Uh, 
And the, the, he actually managed a, a, a pretty respectable Yeti run there with 17 meters. All right, Peter's score breaks down like this. A huge style section at the beginning puts him in a very commanding place with 479 style points, a very respectable speed run of 59.1 seconds, and a good 17 meter escape from the Yeti brings Peter in at a fantastic first run score of 1240 points. Peter just pushed his way onto that podium and said, I'm staying here. You're gonna have to push me off this podium yourself. John and Lindsay, some work to do in round two, but next up we have our fourth competitor's first run. So let's get down to the mountain for Sarah's attempt. It's a tough thing to do to follow up a run like Peter's, but let's see what Sarah can make of it. A moderately good trick off the first one, no crashes, ah, but then taking that early crash. That's separated so far our competitors. The early uh, uh, trees, kind of before they get their legs underneath them in the freestyle section. Ah, Sarah being smart here. There's no time constraint on the freestyle section. So if you want to take your time and move left or right, angle yourself in for a jump, get yourself situated, take a breath, you got time for it. Unfortunately, Sarah missing a jump on a mogul, and here comes a large jump, and oh my gosh, she's executed the hyper jump. If, uh, if you go off of a jump and you land perfectly on a jump at the moment that you hit the ground, you go a million miles in the air in Ski Free. Unfortunately, I think it shocked Sarah so much that she wasn't able to take advantage of it to throw down some ill-ass tricks as she was en entering space. Unfortunately, a couple of uh, uh, collisions and a, a, a messed up trick here is kind of suppressing her score a little bit. She's still positive, coming up on 70 points, 73 points at this point. Uh, and I think she'll take 73 into the speed section. Taking a moment to collect herself, and she's moving forward. Now, 73 isn't a bad score for the style section, but as, as we saw with Peter's run, you can really make up a ton of points in the style section if you're careful about it. Up, oh, Sarah taking a quick rock collision here. Also attempting, uh, as, as all of our runner, other runners have, uh, of just maintaining as straight a line as possible down the mountain, changing directions just a bit if she needs to to dodge uh, obstacles as they come. Uh, not a lot of people going all out and going for jumps on the downhill speed section, uh, but so far it's proven a wise uh, a wise maneuver because these trees can really slow you down, and every second counts in this section. All right, you got about 200 meters left on the rest of the sprint, and the key here for competitors in the survival section is to attempt to maintain your momentum into the section. So Sarah's got a good pace here. Ooh, she could have hit that jump. She might have had a lot more uh, space out in front of the abominable snowman. But still, 28 meters is the mark to beat on the third section, survival section, so far. Sarah's score breaks down like this. We've got 73 style points, a modest showing, but not negative, and that's a key point. In the speed section, Sarah had a pretty good time of 54.3 seconds, and in the survival section, Sarah shows us how it's done, maintaining that speed and escaping for a solid 28 meters from the abominable snowman. All of that put together puts Sarah at 896 points for this run. Just underneath John, who currently sits in second place, with Lindsay bringing up fourth at 609, and Peter sitting happily in first place with a fantastic first round run of 1240 points. One of the nice things about this event is that you get multiple tries, so if you have a bad run, you can just put it behind you, focus in on the next run, and try to do better. John, Sarah, and Lindsay have some ground to make up on Peter, and I'm sure they'll seek to do just that in the next round. With that, I'm getting word that John is ready for a second run, so let's get down to the mountain. All right, John lining up for his second attempt here, uh, hitting a couple of early moguls, but then also an early jump, banging out 85 points in the first trick. Oh, and following up with a pretty good one as well. Hits the tree, but still, oh, double hits the tree. Oof, you hate to see it. Still coming through with 90 points at the moment. A uh, pretty solid jump there, up to 167. Oof, a fall, but still up to 252 points. 
John is doing much better in terms of his street freestyle section this time. In fact, he's he's threatening Peter's score with about 350 meters to go. He's just going to have to find a couple more jumps. You can see him sidestepping there, searching around a little bit to see if he can find some jumps. No luck so far. Oh, I don't think you're going to get much air off of that. Nope. Uh, tries a tries a front flip off a of mogul and and regrets it a little bit. Oh, John accidentally misses a final. Oh no! The dog comes by to check on John. John says, "Get out of here! I got points to score, Mr. Dog." Ooh, banging out two quick jumps. Oh, and the boost off the tree for 439 style points off, out of the first section. A big improvement from John, showing that you just have to put your first run behind you and do better in the second. John still demonstrating some some skill here in the downhill section, just gentle adjustments left and right, not really losing more than a, a couple of meters per second. Ugh, a tough tough decision there between the trees and the rock. John keeping pretty good momentum here, watching out for dogs on the mountain. A nice clean section of snow here for Johnny. Hasn't had to make any turns for a good while here. Still staying nice and straight down this downhill. Has to do a little bit of modification there. Still looking nice and clean. Oh, and the abominable snowman. That almost looked unfair. John had plenty of speed, plenty of momentum going into the final section. But it seemed like the abominable snowman might have had a grudge. He was waiting right at the finish line to consume John, as is his right as an abominable snowman. Well, John's score breaks down like this. We had 439 style points, a huge first section from John. 62.7 seconds in the second section for speed, uh, also a very, very good score. And then 11 meters at the end, not as big of a showing as John wanted to see off of the survival section, but honestly, a very, very solid run, putting him within less than 70 points of Peter's first round run that sits in first place. John takes a very solid grip on Silver right now and still has a chance to improve in his next run. Speaking of improving, our next competitor, Lindsay, is going to seek to do just that in her second run. She has 609 points right now and she needs a better showing to stay in the medal race. Let's get down to the action. All right, Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay is doing a preemptive front flip. Unfortunately, front flips before the race start don't count for any points, but I appreciate the moxie. All right, not a bad trick off the start. Lindsay throwing down up to 48 points, already going much better than her first run in terms of style points. Doing a little adjustment left to right. See, this is a smart tactic here because you can set yourself up for the jump properly and you don't have to be concerned with any time in the first section. Lindsay spying out her jump here, throwing down another trick. Uh, not as much as she wanted off of it. She's at 88 points right now with about 580 meters to go. A small jump there, but it was worth 10 or 15 points. Still, anything is an improvement over negative numbers for Lindsay here. Ooh, and a big trick she puts down, putting her at 131. She's got 300 meters to improve that score even further. I think she can. Oh, a big spin, a big jump, oh, and a big smash right into the tree and an ambulance at the bottom of the hill. Lindsay changing angles here for a big final trick. Ends up at 127 points as she finishes out the freestyle section. All right, she's on to the speed section. She did not have much trouble with this last time. Oof. Commentator's curse, I spoke too soon. She's collided with two trees, kind of tilting her at the very beginning of the speed run that she had very little difficulty with last time. You can see she's cutting her turns a little bit harder now, trying to avoid smashing into any further trees. But at a certain point, you just got to close your eyes and go down the mountain. Oof. A, poor mo a poorly timed mogul jump there ends up smashing into a tree for Lindsay. Maintaining pretty good speed here. Ugh, and the mogul jump got her again. You do get a speed boost from doing those mogul jumps, but, uh, it, you know, it's counteracted if you end up hitting a tree at the end of it. And the hospital bills are tough. 
All right, Lindsay coming in about 200 meters left on the speed section. This is where you really want to keep it straight and keep that speed and momentum. Maybe line yourself up for a jump as soon as you go into the survival section. Don't want to slow down here. You want to keep momentum. Oh, Lindsay, keep it going. All right, not a bad showing for the survival section. Lindsay's score breaks down like this. 131 style points, a huge improvement over her first round style points of negative that. 47.9 seconds in the speed section. Not as good as her first run, but still a moderately respectable score. And 16 meters for the survival. All told, that gives her 770 points, which at this point is not enough to move her into metal contention, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. If in Lindsay's next run, she can clean up the style points even more, have a better speed section, and then carry that speed through to the survival element, I think she'll have a much better score than she currently does. It's going to take a lot of work to catch our first place competitor, Peter, who is up for his second run now. Let's get down to the mountain. All right, Peter had a very big first round. He's going to look to build on that. If he can top his score from the first round, Peter's going to be in great shape. Not finding too many jumps at the top of the mountain here. Oof, and hits the chairlift. Oh my, I might have spoke too soon again. Peter's having a not so good freestyle section so far. But again, with the, the competition structure, you do get three runs and only your best run out of those three counts towards the medal placement. Another crash for Peter here, still getting points, but not as many as he might want. Uh, down to 62, it's not looking quite as good. Oh, dodges a rock nicely and has a Good jump. Oh, but then that Rock's brother comes up and gets him. Got to watch out for the Rock family here on the mountain. All right, with 170 style points and 200 meters to go, it looks like he's not going to be topping his first round style score, but he should be hitting the speed section with a lot of speed. Oh my gosh, and I spoke too soon. Two quick tricks towards the end and one smash into a tree means that Peter walks out of the style section with 346 points, a very respectable number, despite his struggles at the beginning of the mountain. Doing a pretty good job here of maintaining his speed. The mountain has been kind in giving him a, a nice long downhill section without too many complicated obstacles. He's got about 500 meters to go here, and he's looking nice and smooth. Oh, I said it, and he hit the tree. Well, up until that moment, he was looking nice and smooth, and then right after that moment, he also looked nice and smooth. A good approach on the final 250 meters here. A quick cut to dodge a lot of obstacles in one little clump there. Up oh, right into the rock. He may have taken his eyes off the prize there for a second. Ran straight into it, but he's squared back up down the mountain. Now he's got to maintain his momentum here if he wants to try to get away. Oh no, and the abominable snowman was right there. I think Peter was maybe attempting to dodge to the side to see if he could outsmart the abominable snowman, see if he could get an angle on him, but unfortunately the abominable snowman was right there to meet him. Peter's score for this run breaks down like this. 346 style points is a very solid amount of style points, but it doesn't quite rise to the level of his first round freestyle section. 55.8 seconds on the speed section is also good, but the real downfall of this run for Peter was the five meters gained on the survival section. Attempting to juke the abominable snowman works out sometimes, but sometimes it does not. 954 won't improve Peter's standings currently, but it's still a respectable run, and he could still make up more points in his third run. All right, and our final contestant to complete their second run will be Sarah from Imperium Ludum. Let's see if she can improve on her first round 896 points. Sarah begins the round with quite a bit of speed going into the freestyle section. Ooh, hitting an early jump and dodging a tree, but kissing a rock instead. Oof, ooh, and a second collision is putting Sarah down to negative 46. Uh, she'll climb out of that gap, but then immediately hit one of the tram line poles and uh, go back into the negatives. Unfortunately, Sarah's still kind of oscillating plus minus, plus minus. 
If she could keep a couple of these tricks in a clean string together, I think she'd be doing real well, just like you just saw. And just like that, she's up to 84 points with 500 meters to go in the freestyle section. Not finding any convenient ramps here. She's looking. Ugh. She found a convenient tree, unfortunately. Down to the last 300 meters here, and she's really hunting for one of those jumps. A small mogul jump isn't going to quite do it. All right, she found one. All right, she's back to plus 54, but only 100 meters to go. This is really pointing out the importance of being clean on the style runs, because every crash does lose you points. All right, Sarah with a, a modest 54 style points coming into the speed section, and this is a realm where she really didn't struggle last time up, but of course the slow skier puts the words back in my mouth and subtracts a little bit of time from Sarah's run. Staying nice and downhill on this section. A lot of obstacles coming at her. She hasn't had a really nice straight run for a good while in this in this section. But being clean above all else in this section is gonna is gonna win you the most points. Coming up on the final 300. Oh, she you know cut an edge unfortunately and slowed way down and then found a tree. It's looking like this might not be Sarah's best run in terms of the speed section. Last hundred meters and. Abominable Snowman is right there to meet her at the bottom of the hill. Sarah's second run had potential early, but unfortunately a number of mistakes really hurt her point score. 54 style points, 56 seconds on the speed section, and only 5 meters of survival amounts to 664 points in total. Unfortunately, that score won't be able to improve her position, but she's got one more try. All right, friends, we are moving into our final round with our first competitor, John. He'll have one more chance to put up a score and go for the gold. Let's get down to the mountain. All right, John begins his third attempt with the number 1240 burning in his mind. That's the number to beat. That's the number to take gold. A little bit of issue early on with the moguls, but John's already got 129 points. Looking pretty good at 700 meters to go. Adds on to that. Oh, all the way up to 254. A bunch of jumps coming up. The jump randomness is being very kind to John right here. Oh, barely misses that jump there. A big, big multiple front flip. Crashes it, but still gains points on it. He's up to 300. Adjusting side to side there and able to hit the jump. Oh, no, but a mistake ends up hitting a tree off of it and instead of getting points Oh, and John with a hyper jump Maximizing it by doing a million tricks in the air. Wow Wow, 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 John 568 points in the style round the biggest score we've seen so far. John speeding through the speed section. No issues so far. If he can just keep a clean speed section together, tied together with that freestyle section, this could be the run to take the gold out of Peter's hands. Coming up on the last 300 meters here of the speed section, and John has maintained his momentum pretty well. It won't be the fastest time, but he won't need the fastest time. He'll just need a good time here. Ooh, a snowboarder almost takes him out, but he manages to dodge. All right, coming up on the final 50 meters, can he stay away from the abominable snowman? He's putting some speed on. Oh, he tries to traverse sideways, and he actually gets... 21 meters of survival out of that. Well, if there was a time 
to elevate and score your best run of the competition, John. It was the third round, and that is exactly what John did. A huge 568 style points in the first round, a very good speedy time in the speed section of 58 seconds, and a very strong survival element with 21 meters, all totaling up to 1,358 points, which takes the gold position for now. Peter now finds himself in second place, with Sarah falling to third place with 896 points. Peter's going to have to take a very good run in the first round and turn it into an amazing run to try to beat John out here. But who knows, one of our other competitors could come out of nowhere and have a huge final third run. Remember everyone, it's not the total of your points, it is your highest individual scoring run. With that said, let's see what Lindsay can do on her final run. Lindsay approaching the freestyle section. Oh, a mogul jump right off the bat. 34 points is not bad. Using her distance very efficiently here, you can get a lot of points in a very small amount of distance if you're careful about it. A big jump there, didn't land it, but did get to take home a couple of points. Dodging trees here, a small mogul jump. Oh, and she lines up for a big one. Ugh. You hate to see the ski lift pole coming at you that quickly. When you're committed to the jump, there's nothing you can do. Just like that tree. Alright, Lindsay, once again in the up and down game here. Gaining points and then unfortunately losing them on difficult collisions. She's got 250 meters and a lot of points to make up. Oh my gosh, the dog almost got hit that time. 50 points on the board with only 150 meters left. Can she find another jump? She needs at least one more jump to add some points on. Oh, and she just seemed to dodge them. I guess that was the jump she wanted, but it still didn't work out that well. All right, well, 57 style points will be what she takes home into the next section here, having a pretty clean speed section. Dodging trees left and right, keeping those skis straight down the mountain. French fries, not pizza. Quick adjustment and back to the straightaway. Oh, and the rock came out of nowhere. It's only been there for 30,000 years. Lindsay taking advantage of some jumps. Ooh, putting a lot of speed in this section with these jumps. But there is the risk of hitting stuff when you get down to the ground. Unfortunately, it did not pay off for her. Keeping a pretty good pace through here. Considering all of the uh, collisions she's had, she uh, actually is doing pretty well in the speed section, considering. Looks like she'll turn in 55-ish seconds and... A uh, moderately good escape from the uh, the Sasquatch there. Uh, all told, Lindsay's third score was not her best of the day. She got 57 style points in the first section, a very strong 55.4 seconds in the speed section, a moderately good 13 meters in the survival section, all totaling up for a total of 741 points. Unfortunately, that will not be good enough to make it into the medals today. At this point, it is a race between John, Peter, and Sarah for where they stand on the podium. John has the time or the uh, score to beat at the moment, but Peter is up next. It's high drama here on the mountain. Can he steal the gold? Let's find out. 1,358 points is the mark to beat as Peter approaches his final run. Gets a, a good jump, but no tricks off the bat. Uh, a couple of flips there for a solid 88 points off the first 150 meters here. Peter finding another great jump there up to 173. It seems like if Peter's going to take this, the style section is really where he can he can excel and uh, and outscore John. 275 points coming up to the halfway mark of the the freestyle section. Actually, up to 324 with another solid jump. Ooh, and here comes another one. Lands it, 
391 points. He's cashing in right now. Oh, no tricks on that jump, unfortunately. Can he find another couple jumps before he hits the bottom of his section? Does a couple of front flips off of a mogul, but still takes home points for it. A huge, mega sick trick. Peter's up to 546 points for the style section. Can he get one more? Bangs out one more jump, crashes, but oh my gosh. 647 points out of the style section. Oh no, don't hit trees, Peter. If he wants to win this, he's got to be nice and clean through this speed section. Oh, a second crash. It's getting tense. He's got the points to win it, but he has to follow up on the speed section and the survival section. John's score is going to be very, very difficult to beat. There we go. Peter's in a bit of a rhythm now. He's, he's just doing the, the gentle adjustments. Dodging this gear just barely. Oh, front flips for swag. We love to see it. All right, he's got about 200 meters to go here, and he's at 107, looking pretty good on the speed time considering his early issues. Oh, and a late crash. Oof. All right, his speed, his score is going to be 53.1. Oh, and a moderately good run from the Sasquatch. Oh, my God. We'll have to go to the scorer's table for a final ruling. But, yes, it does look like Peter has managed to pull out the gold on his final run by a score of 10 points. Peter, 647 style points in the first section. A huge, stylish, swag-filled element. 53.1 seconds. Slow. Not that good. But he persevered. 19 meters on the survival. A good finish. Two less meters, and John would have taken it. But it seems that with that run, Peter is currently in first place holding on to that gold medal alone. The only thing that can mess up his gold medal aspirations is Sarah's third run. She's got a lot of work to do in comparison to her earlier runs to see if she can catch up with Peter, but this is what dreams are made of. Let's see what Sarah can do on her final run. Sarah's third run and the 12th run of our freestyle skiing event has just begun. She's looking for early jumps, and she finds a good one, putting 51 points on the board right off the bat. Coming out of 200 meters of her freestyle run, and she's searching for those jumps. She really needs them. She's not getting a, a lot of help here from the, uh, the terrain generation. Oh, no. She's looking for those jumps. Uh, a little small sideways one. Here's another big one. Oh, a couple of front flips. Oh, she nearly hits the mega hyper jump. Ooh, a second rebound jump off of there, and she's at 150 at 500 meters to go on the freestyle section. She's going to need to get a lot luckier in terms of finding these ramps and landing these tricks. She's up to 242. She's got a lot of ground to cover. Now, even if she doesn't manage to match Peter or John's style section score, Sarah's speed section has been very good, as has her... Abominable Snowman Avoidance. So she can still make it up on the back end. Oof. Hurts to crash into rocks after a big jump like that. Oh, one final style jump there, and she gets 271. The crash does not count because it happens outside of the section. All right, and she's racing down the mountain in the speed section. You know, it would have been nicer to have scored more in the style but she's going to need a blazing fast time here and then a long avoidance of the Abominable Snowman to attempt to pull this one out. Perhaps if there's a snowboarder near the bottom of the mountain, the Abominable Snowman will go after the snowboarder instead. Sarah dodging the jumps, not wanting the speed boost, but wanting to maintain her, her uh, uh, careful approach here. Oh no, hitting a rock on the on the on the hesitation there. Oof. Barely dodging a tree. She's 
She's coming up in the last hundred meters here. What started as a good speed section did not do that well. Ugh. And the abominable snowman placement, unfortunately, very close by to her. Sarah's final run, 271 for style, 50.9 seconds for speed, and 10 meters of survival totals up at 880 points. She was not able to improve on her previous runs. All 12 runs have been certified and all scores tabulated, and we have our final results. In first place, winning the gold medal is Peter of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with 1,368 points. In second place, John of Ubechistan with 1,358 points. In third place, with 896 points, we have Sarah of the Imperium Ludum. And in fourth place, unfortunately not bringing home a medal today, we have Lindsay of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with 770 points. Now that the event is concluded, let's take our first look at our medal standings table. In first place, we have Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with one gold. In second, we have Ubechistan with one silver. In third, we have Imperium Ludum with one bronze. And in fourth, we have Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with no medals so far. Individual medal counts stand like this. Peter's got one gold, John's got one silver, Sarah's got one bronze, and Lindsay has no medals yet. All in all, today was a beautiful day here on Ski Free Mountain. The Abominable Snowman ate well, and we got to see some incredible competition. Congratulations to all the competitors. Once again, my name is Jeff, and it has been a privilege to commentate for the freestyle skiing event today. Tomorrow's event will be the luge, so we'll see you back here on the D-pad for more games coverage. That's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Be kind, be safe, be well, and we'll catch you next time. Hello, hello everybody. I'm Outsprit, your resident buggo, here to commentate for the second games. Today we will be doing Luge. As a matter of fact, it is specifically VR Luge from PlayStation VR Worlds, something I didn't even know existed until today. Each Luger will have a single attempt to get as far as possible along a series of four Luge tracks throughout the city, dodging obstacles along the way as a timer ticks down the time remaining in their run. So it's basically arcade style. You gotta get there quickly, you gotta get checkpoints, and you gotta add to your time before you run out of time. You gotta avoid traffic too, but you can also gain speed by being behind traffic. So it's a risk reward situation up in here. There are four tracks in total, Devil's Dash, Danger Pass, Construction Dash, and Midnight Falls. The loser that reaches the end of Midnight Falls in the shortest amount of time, or who makes the furthest before time runs out, is the winner. We have our participants ready to go, Dave of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, John of Ubechistan, and Sarah of Imperium Ludum. So let's go ahead and see what we're doing. Of course, Dave will be starting us off. Alright, so here we go for our first run of the day here. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a highly action-packed and maybe somewhat disorienting situation, but uh, that's kind of what VR is all about, isn't it? I, this doesn't feel like it's 111 miles per hour. Oh, boy, there we go. That was a slick dodge there. That too. You really don't have much time to get out of the way of cars while also getting that speed boost. Apparently traffic cones are no problem for our participant here. Now, take a look around you too, because not only do we have our exciting sport going on here, we also have some delightful, you know, landmarks and things to participate in around here. Oh! Uh, logs are also not a problem, so that's great. And we have here the, uh, the hot air balloons of good luck. I believe they will be showing up for everyone, but I could be wrong. Ooh, that was close. You could see the silhouette appear there, too. Ah, yes, the classic under-the-car movement. Everybody's favorite in this sport.
Now, I'm fairly impressed with the scenery around here. Uh, I wanted to take a look at some of those billboards. Uh, obviously, they were advertising some of our future events, but uh, we do have our results here at the very least. Dave was able to reach his section's end in 47 seconds and 88 hundredths of a second. So that's, uh, I don't really have anything to compare it to, but it seems pretty good to me. How about we go ahead and move on with Lindsay's run next? Now the real balloon of good luck is that one over there with the monkey suspiciously similar to Diddy Kong there. Now uh, we can see here that Lindsay is a little more uh, uneasy than Dave was. Uh, seems to be getting into the swing of the situation here. Uh, those green flames mark the checkpoints that were noted earlier. So let's just see uh, how uh, she takes these turns here. Now, in real life, this is probably a pretty dangerous sport to be doing around real incoming traffic that doesn't really know you're there, but that's why we have VR to take away the problems of such a thing. And thank goodness, too, otherwise we'd be having lots of terrible, terrible accidents. And we don't want that. Oh, careful there. Apparently you lose speed if a car is going towards you. Oh, oh, and that was a bit of a nasty back and forth ping pong there. Careful now. I see that uh, now that Dave has demonstrated the technique, everybody else will be doing their best to... Uh, Copy it. Well, that's okay. We are playing on PlayStation after all. Uh, the kings of copying the better ideas. Don't tell anybody I said that. And there's our finishing line. Now that I actually know what it is. So at the end here, we do have Lindsay with a lower time than Dave, with 44 seconds and 9 hundredths of a second. Always room for improvement, of course, but uh, we won't disparage it too much. We still have more runs to watch, so let's go ahead and move on over to John's. I see the uh, speed getting up here. Gotta be careful, though. Even though it seems like every track is pretty predictable in its traffic layout, uh, you never know what might unexpectedly happen. Uh, like being a little too close to the edge there for comfort. Uh, if it were me playing the game, I would definitely be freaking the heck out. Now I do have to wonder... Oh! That was a full stop there. Not great. Not great. But I do have to wonder uh, if this was modeled after any real-life area, or if it just was created from nothing. You gotta hand it to uh, the modelers out there who know how to create these environments, uh, and they know how to make all the shortcuts work, too, so that the stuff that you don't see isn't really worried about, either. Take a nice, good whiff of that sawdust, and let's keep rolling. Hmm. So that looked like direct contact with that vehicle, but it seemed to not actually stop, just slow him down. Maybe he was uh, lucky enough to be able to get underneath it. I'll have to keep an eye out for more of that. I do feel like, uh... oh jeez. Oh, get back on the track, sir. You got that. You got it. Good job. Good job. Yeah, no. Looks like they aren't real collisions, just speed-lowering ones. But that's all good. John's time remaining was 39 seconds and 40 hundredths. So, we've been steadily decreasing as time goes on. We'll see how we do with our final run of this first stage with Sarah. It's unfortunate that there is no uh, second model for a female player, but uh, I'm sure that a female could get in this gear and it would look no different regardless, so we won't uh, deride them too much for it. Let's see, uh, 
Sarah's probably had the benefit of being able to watch all other people play before her and see how to possibly improve her times here. But uh, we'll see how that pays off in practice, because it's one thing observing, it's another thing executing. That seemed like a pretty swift checkpoint to me, though, so I'm uh, thinking we might have a pretty good run on our hands here. Alright, uh, nothing too bad so far. Uh, seems to be avoiding collisions using the uh, classic trick there, although it did end a little roughly at the little back there. Looks like they collided with a wheel on their way out, which kind of uh, did make that unfortunately a little less good. Alright, careful around the bend here. We're almost there. Looking like it's going to be pretty good, though. Alright, so we actually managed to get a better time than Dave that time, with 48 seconds and 23 hundredths remaining. Good on them. Uh, as a reminder, we had uh, four, around 48 seconds rounded with Dave, 44 with Lindsay, and 40 with John. Uh, or actually more closer to 39, wouldn't it? We are all set with that stage, so now we're going to get to see a new stage with Danger Pass. Of course, Dave will be starting us off as he did before, so let's get started with that. Alright everybody, welcome to the new track, Danger Pass. It's probably dangerous because it's nighttime outside, so that probably doesn't help, but... Whoa! That's certainly a lot more traffic. Looks like there was a little traffic jam there, so we had to turn to avoid that. Probably intended strategy, though. The uh, interplay of different uh, tracks there is interesting, though. I wonder if that's actually a way someone could go if they were ballsy enough. Alright. We'll see how uh, Dave has uh, solidified his skills from the first run here and tried to make a little better time for himself here. It's p possible that uh, he was able to learn something from everyone else's adaptations and it cost improvements in Sarah's case of his run. That was a bit of a uh, rough ping pong there, at least. And don't you just love saying ping pong? It's an excellent describer for many things. So it does seem like the main danger in Danger Pass here is the traffic. There's not too much else in other gimmicks here. It's just the cars and the trucks and what have you. You don't have to worry about sawdust or traffic cones that didn't matter or logs that didn't matter. But I guess that means it's just consolidating everything, ain't it? Looks like we're here at the end. Whoa! That's a... Uh, Surprising end for everybody there. Dave was able to reach the end of that zone with 29 seconds, 39 hundredths. We'll see how that compares with everyone else. Uh, as we said before, really no way to know if that's good or bad until everybody else goes for it. So let's just go ahead and get to the next run, Lindsay's. Let's see, starting out here. Uh, oh, we do still have our wiggliness from last time. Uh, maybe she just likes it, though. We, uh, we all know Lindsay here. A little wiggliness never hurt nobody. So this road does look pretty unfinished with regards to the, uh, whoa. Now, careful. We don't want the triple ping pong. That's even worse. Now I have to ask, uh, losers that uh, do this sport, uh, you know, for real, for realsies, without the aid of VR, do they, uh, do they prefer unfinished roads? Is that the thing that they are all about, or uh, do they actually make their own tracks, perhaps? 
We'll have to do that research some other time, I think. Ooh, ooh, that was a uh, rough dismount there, unfortunately. But it's okay, we've got the balloons of good luck here, so everybody will be fine. No actual injuries in the course of this, because this is virtual reality. Our, uh, our loser avatar here is not going to complain too much about his lot in life. That's a pretty good swoop there. At least it's nice and bright in the tunnels. I'm sure this would look even better on the actual machine compared to uh, the YouTube video here. Well, there we go. Lindsay was able to get a time of 26 seconds, 55 hundredths remaining, so that puts her below Dave in the standings once more. That doesn't mean anything just yet. We gotta check out the rest of the run still, so... John, you're up next. Give us a good show, why don't you? Alright, steady as she goes. Let's give it a shot here. And the uh, increasing speed there doesn't seem perfectly in line with real life, but I'm willing to forgive it. Uh, yeah, unfortunately it looks like going under a oncoming car is not going to increase your speed. But it will prevent you from gaining a little speed too, so... All in all, just not a good idea to deal with oncoming cars at all. A little bit of a collision there as well. I will say, uh, wipeouts, probably we're expecting a little more of them, but it's unfortunate that we're not seeing them, but uh, that's just how the game was made. I'd like to remind the viewers uh, watching at home today, uh, if you have not hydrated yet, probably a good idea to do so. They say that uh, wine is the water of life, but I believe that water is indeed the water of life. That was an interesting strategy there, going to the side for a bunch of cars there, trying to sneak into the main track afterwards. See how that pays off. Again, uh, going under a oncoming car will not help. And that's what you want. Can't get two of them though. That one was a little low to the ground, unfortunately. Alright, we're coming up on the end here. Looks like we're going to end with a time of 16 seconds and 33 hundredths, putting him squarely in last here. I won't say whether that's good or bad, I have to remain unbiased for now. Alright, why don't we just go ahead and finish our last run of Danger Pass here with Sarah. Sarah's our real competitor here. Uh, she and Dave have been vying for f uh, first and second here, so we'll see how that hops up. Perhaps Dave can make an improvement on his placing, or perhaps Sarah will remain with her lead here. Now that's a, a fascinating matchup here. Uh, if if uh, I was a betting man, I wouldn't say that those two were the ones that would be going at it, but it only makes it all the more interesting. Now, I'm also not aware of any of the racers here having any prior experience with VR Luge. I would uh, be very interested to know if any of them have been able to play this in the past, but considering it's VR, it does seem a little unlikely that a lot of practice was able to be gotten in, at least scheduled practice beforehand. They would all probably have to uh, be borrowing headsets in certain areas or such. Of course, you could always practice in real life, but uh, probably wouldn't go so well. Time is looking good so far. At the very least, Sarah knows not to go into oncoming uh, high cars, at least. Oh, there was a bit of a snag there, but we're almost at the end. All right, she made it to the end with uh, 32 seconds and 48 hundredths, putting her 
in the lead once again for this run. Down below her is Dave with 29.39, Lindsay with 26.55, and John with 16.33. So basically, they hit the exact same thresholds as they did in the first run. You can't blame them for being consistent. We'll see if that consistency holds up as they head for the next stage, Construction Dash, which I feel like they've already been doing a lot of. All right, and as usual, our first runner here is Dave and Construction Run, which starts with not even one minute on the timer. So that either means it's going to be over quickly or it's going to be over quickly, if you know what I mean. So as well as the top runners have been doing so far, there hasn't been a run yet that has had like no mistakes. So it makes me curious exactly what a perfect run would look like. Maybe we'll see one later, who knows? Now let's not uh, throw too many stones here, but it does seem like the various stages overlap with each other a bit. Oh! Now that's a tricky situation to get past. Uh, I'm sure the other runners will be glad to have been exposed to that. Yes, yes, it does look like... Uh, Assets are shared between stages, but you know what? They add their own difficulty in their own ways. We can't be too mad. I certainly won't be. Alright, so uh, the run has picked up some smoothness here. We got another checkpoint coming up. Let's see what we can end up with near the end, which uh, I imagine is coming up pretty soon. Alright. Just kiss the wall there without losing speed and without hitting that car. That was excellent. And that uh, truck was dropping tile tires on the ground, looks like. Interesting. Well, we uh, finished our run here. Uh, Dave managed a remaining time of 15 seconds and 12 hundredths. Pretty even there which means it's pretty close. If that's a good time, as we have been led to believe in the past, that only means that uh, this stage does not have a lot of wiggle room, so we might even be starting to see some failures coming up here, depending on how well the other runners do. But uh, let's not jump to conclusions, let's just go ahead and watch Lindsay's run here. All right, the monkeys are watching from afar. That's how you know we're in a good position to enjoy some luge. Alright, some good reaction dodges from the beginning there. It doesn't seem like that uh, impacted her speed too much, colliding with the swinging... I don't even know what that was holding, uh, really. Kind of looked like giant pool noodles, but that can't be right. Maybe it's those metal tubes that are needed for construction, which would make sense. Ooh, that was a little bit of a rough collision there. It was close to good, but uh, they just couldn't quite make the middle of it. Ooh, and you're getting some air here, too. I didn't know that was legal. I'm sure a uh, proper technique there would be to swiftly get behind that truck before getting onto the main track here, but it does seem like you do not have a lot of time to make that happen. All right, I believe that's our final checkpoint before the end here. Whoa, careful. It's definitely getting trickier with execution. Cars right behind speed trucks. Requesting some very, very slick reaction time. Oh, oh, bad ping pong at the end there. But uh, we have made it to the end, so that is good at least. That gives Lindsay a uh, time remaining of 7 seconds and 12 hundredths, sharing the hundredths with Dave, but not sharing much else, if you know what I mean. Let's go ahead and watch John's run while we ruminate on that. The steady difficulty increase of the tracks here has definitely been fascinating. Uh, as someone who watches a lot of video games, not so much games like this, but, you know, just games in general, all across the broad spectrum. 
I'm always looking out for difficulty adjustments, you know? I like to see what's going on with subtle changes as things get harder. If it's seeming unfair or if it seems properly properly put in its place here. And from what I can tell, VR Luge is a fairly subtly increasing change here. And that car was swerving like mad, so I don't know what was going on there. I feel like we didn't see those on the previous runs, but uh, I could be wrong. It doesn't seem like the rough terrain here on that track is of any detriment to the speed that John was receiving there. If anything, it was helping just because it was downhill. Alright, once again, uh, we do not want to be going into oncoming cars. Alright, we're almost at the end of the track. Can we make it? We don't have much time left. Oh no! Poor John was not able to make that end of that run. First time to see that. We don't want to see that. But uh, we'll see what happens next with Sarah's run. Alright, let's see how Sarah does our second, or first place rather, competitor so far. But this has been a tough track, as we've seen so far. And I can only imagine how much how much tougher it's going to get when we reach the final track. Might be seeing multiple unfinished runs in that rate. But hopefully it won't be quite that bad. Seems smooth so far, though, at least. Yep. Yeah. You gotta, gotta respect the work that the workers are putting in here, too. Whoa. Ah, that wasn't so good, unfortunately. Well, with the swerving of that car there, it is a little hard to predict how things are gonna go there. And the wheels on this uh, luge board must be super oiled up and ready to go for something like that. Alright, looking like we're passing our final checkpoint here. I think things look good here for an actual finish, but... Uh, all we can really hope for is to see something near the end here to pull out some good time. Uh, there it is, coming into view now. I think the tiles from that truck are not really impactful at all. That's okay. So it looks like Sarah finished with a very, very minute improvement over Dave's time with 15 seconds, 39 hundredths. Once again, Dave had 15 seconds, 12 hundredths. Lindsay with 7, 12, and John did not finish. There's only one stage left for everybody to observe here, and it's looking like it's going to be a tough one. So buckle up, since we're all allowed to do that while they aren't, and let's go ahead and head for Midnight Falls and see how Dave does. Seems like it's a similar start to the uh, last stage, just at night time. Oh uh, yeah. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice that we passed the Shark of Good Luck at the beginning of this one on the top left, but... That was some seconds ago already, and I'm only just noticing now that we had barely any starting time here, so... Let's tr do our best to keep it positive as we roll through these checkpoints. It's never too late for an upset. Oop! Watch out for falling rocks! Ho ho ho! Yeah, classic traffic cone situation. Oop, oop, oop. That was uh, not so great. And now the other racers will know what to avoid coming up here. Nice air there. I guess that's more legal than I thought. See the balloons are all lit up and pretty tonight. Very much enjoy that feeling. 
No, don't ping pong too much. We still got a race to finish here. Can't be too much longer from here, right? That was uh, almost a good speed boost there, but we had a collision right at the last second. There's a good uh, truck movement there. Tiny collision on the way through, and unfortunately, Dave was not able to actually finish his run there. If even Dave isn't finishing, I have a bad feeling about everybody else, but uh, we'll see how we do there. Let's go ahead and check out Lindsay's run. Alright, Lindsay, good luck. The shark believes in you, and so do I. Getting our uh, resident wiggly motion at the beginning here. So I'm not sure if getting a collision just lowers your speed or if it actually, like, gets your timer down, too. It's interesting to think about. Whoa! Alright. Well, at least that wasn't a overall negative passing under that truck. You can only imagine those rocks wouldn't be good to hit, unlike all the other fake obstacles you've been dealing with up to this point. Alright, keep it up. Keep it up. You're doing good so far. That sick air, I imagine that must feel very disorienting when you're actually in the situation with the headset. But we can all appreciate its sickness from a distance. Oh, was that? Oh, wow. Uh, Lindsay hit the checkpoint at the end there, but it was a little too late for it to matter, unfortunately. She has a did do not finish as well, but uh, Dave is ahead of her in the do not finish rank rankings at the very least, so he's got that going for him. Since John wasn't able to finish his last run, he will not be participating in the final run here, so we only have Sarah to worry about now, so let's see how she does. All right. Our current leader here, uh, it does seem like uh, the remaining time from the last levels does make, it does add to the factor of what you start with in these, which I'm only now noticing, but I am, at least I actually noticed it, so you can't fault me too much for that. Alright, good uh, drift there, keep it up. Whoa! That was a bit of a rough ping pong there. Uh, not the kind of performance you want to see on this final run here. A bit of a collision there, uh, nullifying the boost that we were about to acquire. Time is still looking decent though as we head on through. <laughs> bit of an air collision there. That would have been cool to see if it wasn't fake. Alright, uh, looks like she's gonna hit the checkpoints with just a few seconds to spare. Let's see if it's enough to actually get her to the finish line. I feel like uh, we're getting a bit of deja vu here. No, not quite, not quite. So, yeah, it's looking like Sarah, despite her earlier showings there, was not able to actually get quite as far as Dave did on his run on that level. So it does look like we have Dave in the lead now. Congratulations to Dave for taking away the gold on this run here. Major upset, I gotta say. But uh, that made it a very interesting event to watch. Very stressful very action-packed, awesome stuff. Congratulations to the other competitors, we can't forget. Sarah does walk away with that silver, and Lindsay is able to grab that bronze as well. So our final medal count here, we have Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with two golds, Imperium Bluden with a silver and a bronze, 
you bet your stand with a silver and daisy baby bitch territory with a bronze. Peter and Dave are sharing a gold medal for their own squad there. Sarah was able to get both medals in the this run and the previous run, and John was able to keep his medal from before, and Lindsay got her first medal today. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. I've been Elk Spritz. If you've enjoyed the sound of my sultry voice, be sure to check me out on Twitch over the summer, where I do some fun streams. And also be sure to check out the rest of the games. We've got short track speed skating coming up, so hope you're all looking forward to that. Till next time, see y'all later! Hello sports fans, my name is Seated and welcome back to the second games. For today's event, our four teams will be fighting for short track speed skating supremacy on the newly remastered later skater track from Mario Party Superstars. And this is indeed a very short track, with each competitor trying their best to clear five laps as fast as possible while trying to pass the other competitors. There will be three rounds of five laps, and the fastest combined time will be this event's winner. Now, as the fourth place skater doesn't actually get a formalized time, their time for each round will be calculated based on how long it took the third place skater to cover the same amount of ground for however long of the track they had left. But not only do they have to fight for their position on the track, they also have to fight against the controls themselves. The slippery ice floors combined with the tank controls of this particular minigame are going to make for some difficulties that will take reflexes, mental fortitude, and no small amount of screaming to overcome. Your four competitors for this event are Rick from Imperium Ludum, playing as Wario, John from Ubetristan, playing as Waluigi, Lindsay from the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, playing as Peach, and Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, playing as Donkey Kong. Looks like our competitors are ready to begin this slippery skating scuffle, so let's head down to the track for round one of the event. On your marks, get set. Alright, looks like Jeff is starting with the inside line with Rick very close behind. John falling out to the back. Ooh, some unfortunate control issues with John there. Seems like the middle of the pack is very well situated, but Lindsay, ooh, almost jockeying for first there. Jeff staying out front, three laps down. This is a very, very quick game. Jeff seems like he's got this cemented, it is the last lap, Lindsay would have to make a very strong recovery, and that is the first round done. Wow, that is very fast. I should not be surprised by this, but here we are. A very fast first round, with Jeff actually managing to break the track record for an excellent time of 25.22 seconds. Lindsay close behind with 25.89, Rick in third place with 26.37, and John getting an estimated time of 27.78 seconds. Jeff managed to keep his lead throughout the entire race, possibly helped out by his starting position on the track. That didn't deter Lindsay though, as she briefly managed to pass him on the third lap. Rick seemed to have some trouble passing Lindsay though, and actually seemed to push her forward a couple of times, much to his dismay. John had some unfortunate early bumps on the outside of the track, possibly due to those pesky tank controls. No time to wait around, as round two is ready to start. On your marks, get set. Alright, looks like Lindsay has the inside track this time, with Jeff on the outside. Will this impact the standings? Only time will tell. John seems to be having a much better time with controlling this go round. Lindsay keeping that first place position throughout the whole thing so far. Jeff still lagging behind. Seems like the starting positions have made a pretty big impact. Ooh, John almost making it into first. Still one lap remaining and it is a very close front pack. Ooh, Rick managing to get past John. And that is the end of the race. Ooh, Jeff only just managing to get that photo finish. Barely missing out by 0.1 second there. A much closer second round with only one and a half seconds between first and fourth. Lindsay takes first place with 25.29 seconds, almost beating Jeff's time from the previous round. Rick takes second with 25.44 seconds, and after reviewing that photo finish, we can confirm that John just managed to achieve third place with 26.76 seconds, beating Jeff, who ends with an estimated time of 26.86 seconds. The competitors seem to have gotten their bearings after that first round with very consistent positioning right up until the end. Unfortunately, John's strategy of going wide to try and overtake Lindsay backfired as he fell into third place right before the end of the race. Going into our final round, we have Lindsay in first with a combined time of 51.18 seconds, Rick in second place with 51.81 seconds, Jeff in third with 52.08 seconds, and John in fourth with 54.54 seconds. With less than a second between between first and third, it could be anyone's game, but is three seconds too much time for John to make up? Only time will tell as we move on to our final round of the event, and our competitors are at the ready. On your marks, get set. The starting position is looking very similar to the second race, but Jeff is already making a break for it, going from fourth to second. 
in very quick succession. Lindsay keeping in first. No, she isn't. She's down to second as Jeff has taken first place. And Rick has overtaken Lindsay to take second. This could be a very, very close match. Jeff seeming to keep that first place despite Rick's various attempts to get past. Can he keep it? He does manage to keep first place. Lindsay actually taking fourth after starting in pole position. Unfortunate. A very exciting final round with many twists and turns despite the track just being an oval. The final positions for this race actually ended up in reverse order from their starting positions with Jeff getting a time of 25.19 seconds, taking first place and breaking his own track record. Rick in second with a time of 25.61 seconds, John taking third place with a time of 26.39 seconds and Lindsay getting an estimated time of 26.82 seconds. Rick kept a level head throughout this race, biding his time and steadily moving up from fourth to second but was not quite able to overtake Jeff by the end. Jeff on his part had a very aggressive start, moving up to second place by the end of the first lap, taking the lead by the end of the second and keeping that lead for the whole race. John had a promising start but seemed to get pushed out of the inside track by Rick and Jeff in their fight for first place and Lindsay seemed to just barely get beaten out at every turn despite some very good play throughout. And with all our races done, our competitors taking a well-earned rest, the final standings are as follows. John unable to make up that three second deficit with a fourth place time of 80.93 seconds. Lindsay going from first to third with a time of 78 seconds flat. Rick holding steady with a second place time of 77.42 seconds and your winner from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, Jeff, with a time of 77.27 seconds. Now let's check in with our medal tallies to see the running totals. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook is looking to sweep the entire second games with three gold medals split evenly between Dave, Peter and Jeff. Imperium Ludum is holding steady in second with two silvers and a bronze, with Rick scoring his first medal today while Sarah holds the other two. You Betcha Stan is in third place with one silver medal held by John, and the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory is in fourth place held up entirely by Lindsay's two bronze medals. Thank you all very much for tuning into today's event and make sure to come back tomorrow for the biathlon. I have been and will continue to be Seedood and I hope you enjoy the rest of the second games. Hello and welcome to yet another event in the games. My name is Nintendo Fangirl or you can call me Sam. I'm a YouTuber. I exist all over the internet and I love to talk about anything and everything Nintendo. So I'm very excited to bring this game to you today. And along with me today is my co-host, Alex. Hello, my name is Alex Rosenberg. I go uh, by Luke underscore Starks on the internet. And today, our runners are going to be going into a test of skill, strength, dexterity, and accuracy racing across the Heber region of Breath of the Wild. It's a biathlon. A biathlon! I can't wait. And it is the fourth event of the second games. Ah. So exciting. So each runner will start from the Hya Taza Shrine, hopefully I'm pronouncing correctly. From there, runners will race southwest across Pekita Stone Grove, climbing the sheer cliff face and ascending the Hebra East Summit until they reach Hebra Peak, the first checkpoint. Once they set foot on the peak next to the Korok awaiting there, they have a couple options. If they feel comfortable with shield surfing, they can take that northern path, moving west through the Cold Snap Hollow, and then down around the west side of the Heber South Summit. Or, if they'd rather take the shorter path on foot, they can head southwest along Toronto Peak, moving along the east side of the Heber South Summit towards Bospro Pass. They can also opt to try blazing their own trail right down the middle to our second checkpoint, the Rito Flight Range where they now have to land on a wooden platform. Which isn't easy to begin with, but then runners have to shoot all 15 targets in the flight range from the air. They do not have to clear them all in one attempt. They can come and go from the landing platform as they please, but time's called when they land on the platform one last time. A couple rules before we begin. The runners may not use the sailcloth for any horizontal travel until reaching the flight range. They can use it to prevent fall damage, but cannot use it for any other purposes. Rivali's Gale is also completely prohibited during this event. Wonder why. Uh, they also may not change clothes, and they also shouldn't because, as you'll see, uh, they're not going to survive if they, they change out of their warm weather attire in the Hebrew region. Uh, and they may not consume food. One fairy has been provided, as well as Mifa's Grace and Aruk's Protection. All right. Uh, all right, and let's talk about this event's participants. We have Rick of Imperium Ludum in the top left. We also have John of Uzbekistan. That's a good name. Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. And Peter of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Oh, you said that really well. All right. I'm surprised. <laughs> well, let's go off to the games. All right. As we get started, we have oh, Rick there in the they top go. left. 
All right, as we get started, we have Rick in the top left, John in the top right, Lindsay in the bottom left, and Peter in the bottom right. Now, this is the second time that John and Lindsay have competed in race events within Breath of the Wild, uh, but the last time that happened, Lindsay actually placed fourth of a really bad game over in the last game, so this hopefully will be the opportunity for her to make up a comeback a little in bit of these games. I'm looking here, and it seems Peter's the only one, I think, so far that's thrown out his uh, his shield for a little shield surfing. Yeah, shield there surfing is going to be a little bit tricky to see whether or not that momentum is going to help you over here. This area is a little bit tough. There is a bunch of enemies over here, and not only that, trying to get up to Heaper Peak is going to require a lot of climbing. And they do not seem to have a bunch of stamina. They all have their three bars of stamina, but it is a long way up to the top. Mm-hmm. And we know there's no food consumption, so. That is correct, no. So making it through there. Yeah, so right now it really is a, a game of, of stamina. How long people feel comfortable sprinting. I do think maybe people are being super conservative with the, the stamina usage, with the exception perhaps of Peter, who seems to be, uh, he's run out his stamina bar at least once that I've seen. But it's mostly in terms of speed. We've got John going up, but looks like he's currently in the lead. Although Rick is seeing the surface of there as well, so it's currently anyone's game. Peter, definitely the last Ooh. point on the wall. Backslid a little bit there. So some sliding for Peter as well. I'm seeing Rick pausing in the in the few spots that he can. John too, to refill that stamina to get up to the top. It's working. It looks it's like Rick's going to get to the first major yeah. part of outside of the area where the shrine is. They are on their way to their first checkpoint, which is the very top of Hebra Peak. You'll know what it, the top is because of the Korok that happens to be sitting right there. Rick's definitely pulling ahead now. You can see he's on this, uh, the snow field right now, whereas all other three competitors are still in the climbing phase. Except for Lindsay. Lindsay now heading oh, yes. into the second position. Looks like Peter is trying to get up to their top first. It's going to be really interesting to see whether or not John or Peter get to the top first. Looks like it's Peter. Oh, we have Peter getting up on, onto the flat stuff. John close behind. Rick taking the nice lead. Yeah. Very comfortable lead on the way up to Heber Peak. I'd love to see how close people get comfortable, our competitors get comfortable with filling out uh, that stamina bar. Seems I've noticed, like we're doing pretty good on that. Yeah, John seems to be going pretty much all the way, using up that stamina bar before he lets go. He's done a good job of not, not running it out completely. But Rick's tactics are working in his favor. Rick is the first There's one on to clock. our checkpoint. Looks like Lindsay's going to be coming up right behind, followed by John, followed by Peter. Actually, John and Peter are going to be really difficult to figure out which one goes first. At this point, there are three options for our players. Our next location of checkpoints are the, at the Rito Flight Range outside of, of Rito Village in Tabantha. There are three options here. You can either go surf all the way through the west and go south. You can try to go to a footpath in the south or you can just go through the middle. And it looks like Rick is going to be going for some shield surfing. We have Lindsay doing some shield surfing as well. Peter's doing the same. And John still hasn't gotten up to the peak. Almost there, though. We have Lindsay using a her first Rook's protection. Peter trying to get around that whiz robe. Rick's moving real quick with that shield right now. Yeah, so Rick is really sliding around through Cold Stop Hollow. He's going to work away around the, the west side of Heber South Sunnet. We have Lindsay used up all of her Daruk protection, so any other defense she has is going to go directly to her health. Yep. Lindsay taking a nice dive down very quick. 
uh, save with the Sailcloth. Now, remember, the Sailcloth can't be used for any horizontal travel, but it can be used to negate fall damage. Which Very is nice thing to have. Yep. Rick making a slight turn around the Bacoblin hideout over here. Being very careful to not to actually trip them and to notify them of his presence. That would be a bit of a pain. We have John using two. All, actually, no, all three of his Druk's Protection. Yeah. We have two people who now have used up the entirety of Druk's Protection. Peter's got one use and Rick in the front currently got all three. He's in good shape right now. John looking to figure out how he's going to get to the next part of this area. It's a very long way down, and it can kill you if you are not careful. Oh. John taking Lindsay. some damage after a fall. Lindsay is not far behind Rick. She's really pulling in, and that, that shield surf down that hill really did help just now. Yeah, Lindsay's very close behind. She does have an Ice Wiz Road to contend to, and because she has no Drift Protection, it's going to be a ooh, little bit tricky. Just ran out and, of stamina, ooh, too. That stamina thing could lead to trouble. But narrowly escapes it. Good dodging. And Rick is at our first, uh, is the, f Rick is the first one to get to the flight range and already taking no time to shoot the target. Rick does not need to worry about tra horizontal traversal now that he is here with the sailcloth. Uh, in the flight range, the sailcloth can be used as normal. He can land on the platform as many times as he want. Just the last time he lands there after the 15th one is shot is where his time will end. But Rick is in the top spot. Looks like Lindsay is not too far behind. John and Peter. Pretty close, but it looks like Peter is starting to gain his upper hand. Rick with three shots already. His arrows are falling a little bit short. They are. He's going for a bit of a, a little curve, but it does get that four shot off. Mm-hmm. This could be where it, where it all comes together. It could take, you know, solid several minutes to just shoot down these 15, uh, these 15 targets. And if ever there were a time for someone to catch up, perhaps take over the lead. It is entirely possible. It is all a major test of dexterity and uh, accuracy. Something that hopefully Lindsay will be able to take advantage of her dexterity as she accidentally wakens a frost talus, but she is actually at the flight range now. Second person there. She has not a lot of time to catch up with the six shots that Rick already has ahead of her. Gonna have to be a real sharpshooter here. Oh, now seven. Let's see if she can do it. She's already got oh. one on it. Rick okay. got with the number eight. Rick doing some course corrections and missing twice on that one. Lindsay, Lindsay now, now getting two. a second. Rick's now going back to the landing platform. It Oops. looks like John's going to actually hit the flight range first. Peter, I'm not sure what's going on with him, but he is very much in the back. He's going by some wolves. Lindsay falling into the water. Wasn't oh, quite able to manage. That is unfortunate. That is going to be a bit enough. of a time penalty. Not by much, but it loses some precious time, which mm -hmm. with five targets remaining, Rick, make that up, make that four. Rick looks like he is going to run away with this one. Oh, two quick and easy shots by Lindsay. She's now at seven. John has also now began his shots with one on the board. Lindsay at eight. She is pulling Lindsay in. Lindsay is catching up. And Peter has finally joined the rest of the group at the flight range. But it, it looks like it is going to be very difficult for him to catch up with Rick. Three to victory. And Lindsay tearing by three. All right. 
Peters oh, now on the close. board with shots. Rick's waiting John to pulling in his first four shots back up. pretty quickly. Lindsay's now at 10, 11, only one Lindsay point between Lindsay is and Rick. Real, real close. And it's tied. And it is a tie game. Wow. It is uh, really going to be a matter of who can land faster. Lindsay and Rick now tied with 13. Rick missing uh, both of his shots. Lindsay going back to regain stamina. This could be the last one. If she aims right, she could take this whole thing. Rick, Rick only needs one, one more. Very tight. Looks like Peter fell and voided out. So did John. Lindsay now also at 14. Oh, and Rick with that one hit. All he needs Will to he do land? is land. He and does. And it's game. Rick takes First the place. win. Lindsay going to come in behind at second place. Very tight game right at the end. Lindsay really managed to close that gap. Not and quite in, fast enough, but... An incredible turnaround. Rick of Imperium L Ludium... Uh, Rick of Imperium Ludum takes the first place. Lindsay coming in second. John and Peter. Only two targets actually did for them. Oh, and Peter Back loses his grip and falls into the rocks and voids out. That is an unfortunate time loss. To some extent, the falling in the water could be a time save if the goal were to get back to the platform. I think in Peter's case, he's really just aiming to get as many of these targets as he can as quickly as possible. Not entirely but sure if that's going to help. John is going to drop into the water, but he only needs one more. Oh, <gasps> he doesn't do it. He lands in... The fairy saved. And the fairy gets saved. He's the only one to use a fairy. I'm so glad we got Here's to see Peterson. a fairy save in this in the games. I agree, but John gets his 15. There it is. John, the second place last year in the triathlon in Hyrule takes the bronze. With a 12 19. Peter with only four more to go. I'm gonna drop down. I'm gonna get those two right on the middle spire. Where are other two? Are they close together? Nope, doesn't look like it. We've got one on the side over here. Oh, he Nails got those that two pretty quickly. Now it's a real matter of looking to see where exactly that last one is. And he finds it there is right is. on the opposite side, close to the landing platform. <sighs> and with that, all he has to do is land onto the platform. And that's time. Peter taking the fourth place with a 1328. Wow. You know, between Rick and Lindsay, it was really close. That is a, what, 15 second difference. And there were more than 15 seconds apart for a large portion of that race. Lindsay really managed to close that gap right in the, the target. Range. Lindsay definitely closed that gap, but it was not enough to take the win from Rick. Rick doing an incredible job at the target range and getting a lot of momentum right from the beginning, being the first one to actually get to Heber Peak and his shield surfing technique bringing him all the way down as fast as possible. Meanwhile, John and Peter, both strong contenders. I think Peter may have had a little bit of difficulty with uh, managing the stamina at some points and pulling out the shield in kind of inopportune moments early on, uh, but he did manage to get to the end and pull it all through without too much difficulty. Sidon is hot. Didn't, I didn't catch where he actually got specifically hung up on. Uh, it was mostly climbing from what I saw. Um, I think he may have wandered a little bit not in the direct path, which will hurt you. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, the screen 
in this particular region of Breath of the Wild during a snowstorm. It's, it's a very gray. Camera. Like <laughs> yeah. I was, I, I was running through it myself earlier to like understand the route, and I'm like, okay, this is this is interesting. I mean, this was not an easy challenge for the competitors, it for was sure. Not. Uh, and they all did great, better than I would have. Great job. At the end of that round, Tierra de los Hermanos Hook currently still in the lead with three gold. Followed by Imperium Ludum with one gold, two silver, and one bronze. And then our Daisy Baby Bitch territory has got no gold, but it does have one silver and two bronze. And you betcha, Stan, leading up in fourth with no gold, one silver, and one bronze. Rick is currently leading the charge with both a gold and a silver under his belt. Peter, Fon Peter Dave, and Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook coming in second with three gold, Lindsay with one silver and two gold, and then Sarah and John tied with one silver and one bronze apiece. It's anybody's game for games at this point. Uh, so thank you for watching. Please come back for tomorrow's event, Nordic Combine. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to congratulate our fearless competitors for making it through this horrible cold region, <laughs> the Hever region, in Zelda Breath of the Wild. Uh, again, I'm Nintendo Fangirl. Feel free to look me up at Nintendo Fangirl. I'm happy to talk about Breath of the Wild with anyone. And Alex? And my name is Alex Rosenberg. I am Luca underscore Starks on most places on the internet. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time in the games. Bye! Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth event in the second games, the Nordic Combined. My name is that Andy guy and I'll be commentating this match. And in this event, the runners will be competing against each other in the extra stage of World 5 in Yoshi's Island called Comics Revenge. The first objective of this stage is to retrieve a key hidden behind a chomp rock on a tiny platform without getting knocked into the abyss by a comic soaring across the screen and green gloves attempting to pelt you with eggs. After grabbing the key, they'll make their way towards the middle ring, also known as a checkpoint for the unfamiliar, to unlock a door to a shack where Yoshi will be equipped with skis. In this portion of the level, they will have to strategically jump, not only to continue to dodge comics assault, but also to avoid rolling rocks and bottomless pits. At the bottom of the ski slopes after a huge jump, Yoshi will utilize his helicopter form to escape more attacks from comic, green gloves, and bumpties. The runner to reach the goal ring at the end of the stage the fastest will be awarded the gold medal. But without further ado, let's introduce the event's participants. First up, we've got Dave of Tierra de las Hermanos Hook, Rick of Imperium Ludum, John of Ubechistan, and CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Alright, kicking things off is Dave here. Thank you. 
We're gonna roll right into it. Get the first couple of jumps in, and oh no, you hate to see that. That's an early death. But uh, thankfully, that's not too far into the stage, so we're not gonna lose too much time there. Dave getting right back on it. Probably gonna see him being a little bit more cautious. And now we're gonna collect the key. Let's we'll see how he fares with the eggs. And comic flying at him. Mission complete on that front. We've got the key off to the next part of the level. Gonna do some platforming. Hit the switch to get your walkway going for the next part of the stage. There's another switch down the road, but uh, we don't really need it since we're not going for collectibles. We just want to get to the end as quickly as possible. And that's a hit there. We're not going to lose too much time. We got uh, Baby Mario back almost immediately. And uh, another hit there. Got to retrieve him or else you're not getting anywhere. So we're off to the next portion. Going to hit the middle ring and get Yoshi his skis. Oh, there we go. Almost ran right past the door there. And we've got his skis. Look at how adorable. Baby Mario gets a neat little cat there. And we're off to the first jump. Clean. Jump over the rolling rock there. Second jump passed. Oh, mistiming that one leading to a death. That little fall will waste a little bit of extra time there, unfortunately. But thankfully, we got the middle ring and we are right back to it. We're getting the skis back. And back to the slopes. Headed down to the first jump. Cleanly done again. I'm gonna dodge that rock. Timing on that jump, extremely better. So, oh no, we're hitting the next obstacle though. Whenever you hit anything, including Comic or one of the rocks at the end of the jump, what's gonna happen is gonna, you're, you're gonna roll into a snowball and that does slow you down a bit. Dave has made it to the next portion of this ski slopes though. Oof, not jumping the right portion. So we're gonna slow down again thanks to that snowball animation. But now we're off to the last jump. It's the big one. And perfect, right into the helicopter. So we're gonna transform and head straight up for a little bit. Get bumped around by the eggs. You can actually use those to boost you up a little bit, but he wasn't worried about it too much. Now we just have to worry about the terrain and the bumpty. So slamming into the walls might slow you down a little bit, but Anything to really keep you from falling into those bottomless pits uh, is really worth taking the hit for, so. We're back at the Yoshi block, back to normal form, and we are at the end of the stage. All he's got to do now is jump through that goal ring, and his run is done at 2 minutes and 51 seconds. Solid run by Dave there. And uh, up next, we're just going to get right into that with Rick. Dave setting the time at 2 minutes 51 seconds. And off we go. Rick starting things off with uh, smooth platforming there. We'll see how he does getting that key. Didn't even have to budge that rock using the egg as a boost to get up to the next platform. That was very clean. Very solid play by Rick so far. Stalling a little bit in the air to get Comic to keep himself up there and out of his way. And using the switch as a boost to get up to the next platform. Very nice work there. Unfortunately, taking a hit back a few platforms ago, but not too bad as he is already just killing the competition. Takes a moment to look up for a second before he gets the skis, and he's off to the slopes. First jump is up. Clean, solid landing. Rick looking pretty solid so far. Not one fumble jump at this point. Unfortunately, Comet getting in the way at the very end, but thankfully it was at the end of that portion, so he was able to go right into it. Your position resets no matter what's going on, so oof, taking another hit at the end of that jump there. Here comes the big jump. Looks like he's uh, well on his way to getting helicopter form. Boom, right up on it. And up he goes. Just zooming upwards to get Comic out of the way so he doesn't have to worry about him. Unfortunately, the Bumpty knocking him back a little bit. They don't do damage, but 
clearly they will set you back if you run straight into them. Almost ran out of helicopter mode time. And landing on Comic. Oh no, that's going to take a little bit of time trying to get baby uh, Mario back. But we're at the end of the stage. Jump into the goal ring, and that's his run. Rick setting the time and the lead to 2 minutes and 7 seconds. That was a great run by Rick there. Um, we even got to see a few little speed strats at the beginning portion of the level. Unfortunately, a couple of slip-ups at the very end with uh, getting hit by Comic and the Bumpty there in the helicopter form. But overall, a super solid run. And up next, we've got CJ. All right, we're kicking off the level. CJ going through, just not even worrying about the stairs at all, or the key for that matter. Let's see if he goes back to snag that. I think, uh... He was just wanting to get rid of that one guy so he can not have to worry about him throwing eggs while he went to grab the key. So that made that part a little bit easier. Unfortunately, getting battered by those eggs and knocked into a pit. So another early death, unfortunately, but we're going to get right back to it. Oh, going down the stairs this time around. Is he going to take him out first? Yes. Oof. Using that hovering though to get right back up there, almost lost him again. Two seconds left on the clock and there goes another death for CJ unfortunately. Gonna have to kick that one back, we got plenty of lives to deal with. And off we go. He's gonna take out this uh, green glove here. Ground pound takes him out in one hit. Almost got sniped by Comic there, but he was too smooth for him, got the key, and we're off to the next portion of this stage. Using the egg for a little boost, oh, but unfortunately Comic grabs him again. And, oh uh, no. Oh, made it back up to the platform only to get slapped and knocked back into the abyss. Gonna have to start over from the beginning. I like those little guys that bounce through the beginning. I forget what they're called, but uh, they seem like they'd be nice little buddies to have. Taking out Green Glove. I'm gonna snag the key from the rock here. Comic's making his way downtown. And, ugh, sniping him again. That section really giving CJ some trouble here. Let's see how he tackles it this time around. Comic definitely getting his revenge in this run. He is not happy. Oh. Green glove down. Going back to get the key. As he waits for Comic to jump by, or fly by rather. Snags the key. Jumps over him again, uses the egg as a booster. And now we've got our exclamation point platforms down. Boing. Oh, didn't get the boost from the button there, but looks like he's doing pretty well this next portion here. A little bit of slowdown from all these birds on screen. And we are off to the slopes. Let's hit that middle ring and get those skis on. Alright, we're off to the first jump. First jump cleared. Rolling Rock not giving him much trouble either. And that jump was very clean as well. We love to see it. Unfortunately, Comet getting the best of him right there, rolling into a snowball, only to get reset by the screen transition. Up, oh, jumping at the wrong time, unfortunately, so that's going to lose a little bit of time too. Now we're at the big jump. Going straight into helicopter mode. Time to begin the ascent. Let's get bopped by an egg first. And away we go. Let's see how he handles the terrain and the bumpties. Going a little low there. I was worried that we were gonna see a uh, fall in helicopter mode. Yoshi is pretty much invincible here, but 
If he doesn't get where he needs to go soon enough, he gets warped all the way back to the bubble he got helicopter from load from. And unfortunately, in this stage, that means that's a death. So we're gonna have to go back to the middle ring and do the skiing section all over again. But if he does well with the skiing like he did last time, then uh, not too much time lost there. So we're gonna see him make these jumps real quick. Some nice movement. Rock's not posing any problems whatsoever. And running into comic again, unfortunately. Oof. Oh, messed up the jump at the end of that cloud there. Funny to think about jumping off of clouds anyway. But we're back at the big jump. We're gonna get our helicopter, move up the mountain again. Now you really gotta watch for Comic in the background because he pretty much tells you when he's coming. So, let's see, dodging the Bumpty, maneuvering through the terrain, dodging Comic. That's some good movement. And we are at the Yoshi block. Can he get there in time? Yes! Had me worried there for a second. And we're at the goal. Let's see what the time is after jumping through that ring. CJ at 5 minutes 45 seconds. Good job on completing that run, CJ. And we've got John to round things out. So uh, looking forward to seeing this run here in just a moment. Rick's still holding the lead at 2 minutes and 7 seconds. So John has his work cut out for him. But... Let's see how he fares. All right, here goes John. Starting off his run. Not worrying about going down the stairs. Looks like uh, he's taking the same strategy of taking out the green glove before getting the key. Very safe strat there. Oh, unfortunately went too far back and respawned the green glove, which eventually took him out. Attempt number two coming up though. All right, so he's gonna take out Green Glove. Unfortunately, mistiming it and getting bopped by Comic there. We've got Baby Mario back though, and we're going to grab that key. We're gonna dodge some eggs. Unfortunately, getting hit by Comic right as he was doing the ground pound to take out the bad guy. Are they really bad guys though? Anyway, we're gonna hit the switch, get our platforms going. We're gonna barely dodge Comic there. That was a very, very close call. Not even worrying about the second switch. He just wants to get on to the next portion of the level. I can see him trying to kind of determine where Comic's gonna be when he pops up on the screen. Very smart moves there. And we're at the middle ring. Gonna walk right through it and get those skis on to head down the slopes. First jump clear. Gonna dodge that rolling boulder. And just looking like no sweat for John on that one. Is he gonna be able to dodge Comic there? No. Oh, snap, he sure did. I thought that timing was a little off, but he made it without a scratch. Going for a little swag to get the red coin there, I see you. Unfortunately, getting turned into a snowball there for a split second. And we're off to the big jump. Gonna run into that helicopter bubble and make the ascent up the mountain to go to the last aerial portion of the level. Let's see how he deals with Comic and the Bumpties. Some pretty good movement so far. We're dodging everybody. Comic getting uh, kept at the top of the screen here. Let's see if he makes it in time to hit the Yoshi block. And we're in there. Off to the end of the level. Gonna jump through the ring. And... John's time, 2 minutes 43 seconds. So, that concludes today's event. Looks like we've got Rick in first place getting the gold medal at 2 minutes and 7 seconds. John snagging silver with 2 minutes and 43 seconds. 
And Dave with the bronze, 2 minutes 51 seconds. And with that, the current standings are as follows. In first place, we have Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with three gold medals and one bronze medal. Second place up is Imperium Ludum with two gold medals, two silver medals, and one bronze medal. Third place, we've got Ubechistan with two silver medals and one bronze medal. And in fourth place, we have Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with one silver medal and two bronze medals. Thanks again for tuning in to today's event. I'm that Andy guy. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for Alpine Skiing. And remember, real G's move in silence. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Winter Games. I'm Teddy, aka Evil Hippie, and for the sixth event of the games, Alpine Skiing, runners will be competing against one another in the NES game Slalom, developed by Rare, with music by Donkey Kong Country composer David Wise. Skiers will be making their way down a series of trails on Snowy Hill, with the goal of completing three courses before time runs out. The mountains of Slalom are very difficult, so skiers have to work hard just to qualify. Skiers will have three attempts to clear the first trail, the qualifying run. If they manage to clear the course before time runs out, they will continue through to the next two trails, Cotton Candy and Skid Row. The skier who reaches the end of Skid Row in the shortest amount of time, or who gets the furthest along the trails when the time runs out, is the winner. Of course, there will be plenty of obstacles along the way, from jerrys to series of moguls to sledders and snowmen, and of course, the gates themselves. Should be an entertaining time of retro gaming, and let's get into our first run. And here's John of You Betcha Stan on the starting gate and going down, and the first thing I have to say is, they put a lot of effort into that butt sprite. Anyway, as John makes his way down this first trail, uh, we'll go over the controls. They're fairly simple. You push left, you go left. You push right, you go right. You push forward, you tuck and stick that wonderful butt sprite right in our faces. And if you hold back, you pizza and slow down. Ooh, clipping a skier there and going for a tumble. Uh, the A and B buttons both jump, and that's about it. Dodge that mogul. Jumping over these sets of moguls nicely, and ooh, just managed to keep it inside the gate. Oh, bumping off trees, and down he goes. That skier's catching up. Thankfully, John gets ahead. Oh, bounces off the tree. Narrowly avoids that skier with a nice tuck, and crosses the finish line. 22 seconds remaining. Nice long victory animation. John finishes with a time of 1 minute 2.88 seconds and is currently in provisional first place. Let's move on to our next run. Dave of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook on his qualifying run. Here we go. Now Dave seems to be managing a much straighter approach, maintaining a top speed. Jumps over the mogul, doesn't feel like steering. Going for a bunny hopping technique. Hugging the right side of the track. Bouncing over moguls. Oh, switch over to the left and back to our comfort side the right. Narrowly avoids a skier and a set of moguls. Into the tree section. Not hugging the trees as much as John was. Sneaks between the skier, going through the last set of gates and across the finish line. Overly long finishing song. And Dave finishes the first stage of qualifying run with time of 54.04 seconds, moving him ahead of John and into provisional first place. Let's move on to our next run. And here's Sarah of Imperium Ludum, right off the start gate with a nice tuck. Little scoop to the right. Avoids the skiers. Ooh, bounces off that gate. Manages to get inside that gate just, but hits the skier. Takes a launch off of him, a couple of moguls. Ooh, bumped into by that Jerry. Is hugging the left wall, the anti-Dave strategy. Keeps scooting right back to that left wall and seems to be avoiding most of the kerfuffle. Misses a gate and, well, if this was real skiing, it would be disqualified, but just slows you down a little bit. Skating back to the middle. Ooh, 
hugs a tree and ends up on her face. Accelerating towards the end, it was a rough time to break down, but still manages to make it within the necessary time. And Sarah finishes her first run with a time of 1 minute, 1.6 seconds, moving her ahead of John and into provisional second. Up next, we have Felice. Felice of Daisy Baby Bitch Tori. They're on the starting line, and let's go. Oh, moves to the right, clips a gate, but manages to stay up. Accelerating again, we're back on. Oh, they just managed to keep it inside. Bouncing back and forth to avoid. Skates around the mo- Skates, come on, this is skiing, not skating. Makes a nice launch off the mogul, bounces off the skier. Mm, you can bounce off the moguls too, it seems. You can get launched, you can get bounced. Oh, misses the gate. All it does is slow you down, hugs a tree, and ends up on their face. Accelerating again. Oh, and hugs another tree. Second time's a charm. Getting up to top speed with that wonderful butt sprite. And manages to finish within the allotted time. And Felice finishes the first stage with a qualifying time of 1 minute, 5.86 seconds, moving them into provisional fourth place. All of our competitors have qualified, so let's move on to the blue square run, the cotton candy. And here's John of You Betcha Stan off the start line. Has learned from the first one, is taking a very nice, calm approach from the beginning, getting as much speed as possible. Ooh, looks like the flags are getting tighter. Ooh, hits, goes for a tumble, but stays up. Again, the, the gates are merely a suggestion. All it does is slow you down. Ooh, but managing to get through most of them and keep a nice top speed, still over 100 kph. Excellent job cutting back and forth again. Hits a gate but does not go down. Oop, misses that gate. Little pizza. Oh, bounces off the tree. Avoids the jerry. Through that real tight gate right there. Oh, but hits the gate and again manages to stay up. Excellent. Excellent recoveries here by John. Run is going well, looking at the bar up top. 30 seconds should be enough time to finish. Oh, but goes down. Commentator's curse. Oh, and hits another Jerry, but stays up. Bounces off that skier. Staying in the middle, I think those trees are just there to deter the people hanging onto the sides. And crosses the line with just three seconds left but still manages to clear our blue square run, Cotton Candy. And with a stage time of 1 minute, 46.72 seconds, John moves into provisional first place after two stages. On to our next competitor, Dave. Dave takes his place and gets started with that wonderful sprite. Keeping it really calm, only turning when he absolutely had to. Oh. Clipping the insides of the gates, but managing to go through most, and commentator's curse, but he stays up. Goes through the gates cleanly, bounces off that jerry, hits the pole, but stays up. Doing some bunny hops. Oh, manages to get through. Moguls lining the course. Tight right gate, tight left gate. Tight right gate again on this sweeping right hand corner. Dave doing an excellent job getting back and forth across the course. Oh, but clips that skier from behind and goes down. Dodges the trees. Mogul signifying we're in the bottom third of this run. Oh, hits the tree trying to get through the gates and ends up on his face. Narrowly avoids that tree. 
skims around the skier, jumps over the tree. Oh, almost brilliant. This is a rough time to take a crash. The finish line is in sight. Oh, and crossing the line with eight tenths of a second remaining, Dave manages to clear the blue square of cotton candy. And with a stage time of 1 minute 49.2 seconds, Dave manages to sneak into first place. Provisional first, that is. Let's move on to our next run, Sarah. And Sarah's off. All of our competitors seem to be doing much better about staying nice and tight and straight, and Sarah with erratic movements. I really need to stop saying nice things about people. They seem to do poorly right afterwards. So far, Sarah has cleared all of the gates. Oh, but clips the skier and doesn't make it through the gate. Oh, bouncing around. Nice the dodge on that skier. And we clip the gate. Oh, staying inside. This is excellent, excellent work. A little bounce to the outside, a jump off a mogul. And now we're into the much tighter middle section of this course. Clips the gate, dodges the trees. Oh, misses that gate. Hits a tree and clips in that gate, but stays up. And finishes navigating through these tight gates and now we're into this bottom section. This section has much more unpredictable trees, but the gates are a little bit wider. And the skiers are more reckless. Accelerating again right at the end, but oh, unfortunately runs out of time. Pizza's to a stop. And finishing a little bit past the one minute, the minutes marker on our leaderboard. So we'll see how that comes into play. So Sarah does not finish our blue square cotton candy and is currently in third place. Let's see how far Felice can make it. And Felice on the starting line, and off. They too are also keeping a wonderfully straight path on the beginning. Accelerating speed, but manages to clip the gate. Okay, here we go. The gates going back and forth across. Oh, clips another one. Clips another one. This series of tumbles, but not falling. Oh, again. Another one. All right, slows down, recenter themselves. Almost went off the course there. Trying to pass this very inconsiderate skier. Know the rules of the mountain. Bouncing off gates, but managing to make it. And now we're into the tight gates. This middle section is very technical. Misses that one. The misses really slow you down. Bounces off, makes those next two gates. On this one, clips it, but stays up. They're through another gate, 25 seconds remaining. Oh, clips a gate, almost hits a tree. Is moving very slowly. Needs to build up speed. All right, we're clear of the tight gate section and we're into the bottom. Slows down after missing that gate. Desperately trying to make it, but time runs out. And finishing a little bit past the Y of Cotton Candy, Felice is does not finish our second stage. And with that DNF, and not making it quite as far as Sarah, uh, Felice is unfortunately in fourth place. Now then, our two final competitors. Let's see how far they can make it down our third stage, Skid Row. Up first is John of Ubechistan. The Ubechistanian athlete is off. Dodges the skiers, stays through the gates. This run looks a little denser. Oh, we have the snowmen and the... Wow, this game really ramps up the difficulty for this third and final run. Okay. John is getting bounced around like a pinball. Just dodging for his life. Oh, thought he was gonna stay up there. Oh, 
It's another sled and a ski. Two skiers fly past, taunting John. All right, there's some really sharp corners here. Bouncing off of a skier's head, I believe. Unfortunately, this is not Mario, and that does not make them go away. Tight to the left, tight to the right, back to the left. Oh, hitting every snowman and taking a tumble. It's another snowman, manages to stay up. It's another snowman, goes down this time. Oh, bounces off the last snowman, bouncing twice, trying to recenter himself. About five seconds left, let's see how far he can make it. And that'll do it for John, making it about halfway between the W and the one minute marker. So with John's DNF on Skid Row, currently has him in second. As long as Dave can finish or makes it further, Dave will win the gold. And here we go, this top section seems innocuous enough. Managing to slow down after missing that gate. Oh boy, here they come. Sledders irresponsibly crossing left and right across the track. People built snowmans all over the place. Is this a slalom run or a death trap? It's made it into the tight left and right section. Jumping the snowman expertly. Oh, clips a skier, goes down on his face. Commentator's curse once again. It's like I have a superpower. Jumps the snowman, jumps another snowman, is rapidly approaching the position where John timed out with about 30 seconds left on the clock. I think Dave has passed John at this point, but let's see how far he can make it. A skier seems things have calmed down a little bit, hugs a tree but stays on the skis. Last set of gates and across the finish line, Dave manages to finish the Black Diamond Skid Row Run, dodging the skiers and the sledders and the snowmen, and puts in a time of 1 minute 29.52 seconds for a combined total of 4 minutes 12.76 seconds and the gold medal. And the final standings for Slalom. Dave gets the gold for Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with a final time of 4 minutes 12.76 seconds. The silver goes to John of Ubechistan, who ended up making it most of the way down stage 3. The bronze to Sarah of Imperium Ludum, making it a little more than two thirds of the way down stage 2. And in fourth place of Daisy Baby Bitch territory, Felice also making it only partway through stage two. Moving on to our overall medal count, Thierry de los Hermanos Hook picks up another gold and has a commanding lead out in front with four gold, no silver, and one bronze. Imperium Ludum in second place with two gold, two silver, and two bronze. You betcha Stan in third place with three silver and one bronze. In Daisy Baby Bitch territory with one silver and two bronze bringing up fourth place. The individual medal count, Rick still has a first place lead with two gold and one silver to Dave's two gold and one bronze. Peter and Jeff are tied for third with a gold each. John in fifth place with three silver and one bronze. Lindsay and Sarah tied for sixth with one silver and two bronze. And Felice in eighth place with no medals yet. Thank you very, very much for joining us for Slalom, a presentation of The Games. Please join us for our next event, Skeleton. I have been Teddy, aka The Evil Hippie. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others. Thank you for watching, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh event of The Games, the second games. I'm Max. I'm Lindsay. And we're from Game Face. Hello. Today, we'll be providing commentary for today's run, The Skeleton. And The Skeleton, because it has nothing to do with skeletons, <gasps> uh, runners will be competing against each other in a race down the slide in Super Mario 64's Cool Cool Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, like, the slip slide away one with the penguin. Yep. You, you know it. I know it. Yeah. So I guess they will be uh, racing down the slide, trying to do the fastest time that they can. But there are some catches to it. There are some catches. As it's a skeleton competition, when you start the race, you have to be on your tum. On your tum. That's important. Eventually, there's like a jump that will make you go to your bum. But before you finish the race, you got to make sure you're on your tum again. So bum start to tum. And yeah, make sure it goes tum 
bum tum. Tum bum tum. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. Yeah. And uh, so they have four extra lives, and if they either do not start or end the race on said tum, or if they fall off or take any shortcuts, uh, they lose a life. That run is void. And if they run out of lives, they're completely disqualified. So they must complete four runs in total to get a qualifying time at the end. And the racer with the lowest combined times across four completed runs will get the gold medal. Yay. Today's participants are Rick of Imperial Ludum. John of Ubechistan. CJ of the Baby Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. And Jose of the Terra de los Hermanos Hook. I'm sorry if I... I, I think that was pretty good. Okay, thank you. Well, without further ado, let's start the racing. Rick's run? Let's start Rick's run. Rick, Rick is, is up first, first from Imperium Ludum. There he is. He run. He run. He's he on tum. He start on tum. That's He's important. He's on tumby. He is on tumby. He's sliding. And Taking some good this turns. is where okay. he will hit. Yeah, so he, he now has to go bum. on bum, but, he, but he as long return. as he's returned to Tum, he's good. At any time, he can return to Tum. But he has to do it before the end of the race. Right. And if he falls so, off, he will lose so a life. So it's going to happen. Oh, okay, he's he's on his Tum. He's going for the Tum. He's on the Tum. That's going to make for a very cold Coins tum. mean nothing, but uh, they're they're a nice little, a nice little treat. Yeah, you can ha you can have and yourself a nice cream cone done. at the end. So that was... 30 seconds and 30 37. Nice, nice. Very good. What is that? 30 point thir oh, God. Oh. oh, God. It's moving oh, too fast. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So that was the end of Rick's run. Nice run by Rick. He got a 30 37. I mean, that's pretty respectable that first time. Seems good to me. I mean, I always fall off that, <laughs> even just doing it regularly. So. Yeah, I, I would have likely died and got disqualified, but he didn't. So we're moving that's on great. to John. John's run. first run. Let's okay. see what John has. Let's see. We got John. I would fall off so many times. So here we go. Start on the tum. That's good. Gonna get the blue coin. Oh, that's good. I think that's worth. You know, $5? I kind of wish I would have counted him. Oh, slowing down a little. Oh, rom bomb. He's taking it slow and steady. I respect that. First yeah. run, kind of getting his uh, bearings on things. Yes, yeah, it's true. Some of those, some of those turns. It can be if you're not used to doing the the. Oh, the oh cool. no! Oh, that was that was a little <laughs> no, scary. That was scary. A little bit scary. Are we gonna return there. to Tom? Not yet. Mm -mm. I respect getting he's getting scared. his bearings there, making sure that he doesn't get disqualified and lose a life. Losing a life is and painful. It's coming up. You know, oh, oh okay. he goes we're for the tum. We're moving, we're moving back to tum. That's a successful so run right there. 34, 40. So not quite, but yeah, a little I mean, bit of a slower time. But you know, for a first run, you want to <laughs> kind of make sure that you're used to things. And mm -hmm. a good run by John. Yeah. Up next, we have CJ from the Daisy a Baby a Bitch Territory, the DBB. You know. DBB, you and know, here classic. he goes. On Tom. On the Tom. Getting the blue coin. Getting the Gotta blue get coin. that money. I yeah, I should be counting like, how many dollars. coins I get. I'll just judge that with my own. Having your extra money at the end does not in any way affect your gold medal performance. You can buy yourself a nice Ooh. soda pop. You sure can. A okay, delicious fat. soda oh. to quench your thirst Early before your next Tom. run. I think that's earlier than everyone else's Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's saying something. Oh, it's definitely saying something for sure. It's saying that sure. tomorrow's going to have a sore tummy in the morning. A very cold tummy. A very cold tummy. Might want to put some heat on that oh, when you're done. Oh, 29, Oh, 13. 29. That is the, the quickest run that's we've seen so beat. far. Very nicely done by CJ. Up next, we have Jose from The, the Hook. The Hook. The Hook. <laughs> Let's see what Jose has. We're not has. good at remembering long names. I, I, can, I can just say Another that. good tum. Very nice tum. Got the blue coin. One of the best tums I've seen all day. Oh, but we return to bum. We return to bum, but when will we return to tum? And nobody's cheated yet. We've, no, we've nobody's seen nobody cheated. trying nobody's to get away with cheating. There's some yeah, close that's true. fall. That's true. I'm actually impressed with the no, uh, no falls yet. That oh, that's a, very a big long dive. long jump. That might have lo lost some time there, I feel like. It also might have lost some. some ow. That hurt. How out my time. Oh, oh my god, no! no! Oh no! The first life lost. Woo! That is a so. But oh, he okay, still has three of those to work with. Yep, you okay. can disqualify up yep. to four oh, so times. So close. I, I mean, I've had that happen to me so many times. So many times. You're like, oh, here's the end. And then you panic and you swerve and you fall to your doom. You know, it's a death defying run, the skeleton going down on an icy slide with no edges. If <laughs> this happened to you, would you scream? Luck, I would absolutely scream. Would you scream like Mario? Probably. Yeah. I think maybe like, probably be more high pitch. Might be more like Wario. Like, <laughs> okay, there we go. 2992. Not a so bad like, run. Close. The first, uh, the first foul. The first here. foul, but also the second best. Very true, very true. Very true. All right. 
And on next, we have Rick's second run. Let's uh, see how it goes. Rick, how you doing? What you got? Go- what you got for us? I don't think he's got Here an answer. Here goes Rick. Oh yeah, oh, I guess that was you're a right. scary there. It was like right on the, the right on the start line. I feel like with the tum. Yeah, we haven't seen anyone mess up uh, the the first dive yet. Nope. Because there are several ways that you can initiate. Like really, we've only seen the one the one mess up, and that was at the end for the fall. But... An, on, an untrained Ooh, skeleton or could you just really run off. That line. And you could do that weird slide, like the side bum thing that you can do, where he goes hoo hoo. Oh, the side bum. Yeah, the hoo hoo. Is there any use to that in this game? No. Okay. <laughs> what was that? Twenty-eight total. So, ooh, yeah, twenty-eight ninety-two. Pretty that respectable. Is the, that is another the time to beat. Time to beat. Oh yeah, so it is. Yeah. Very nice second run. I was getting getting their bearings a little yeah, bit here. Yeah, they're like, okay, I'm getting used. I'm getting used to it. Let's see how John's second run goes. It's coming right up. Here it comes. Right here on the games, the second game. And yep. Slide. Nobody's on. missing that tum. Everybody's practiced their tums. What about Tumby? <laughs> What's <laughs> about Tumby indeed? <laughs> what about Bumby? Left go left. Don't take that little oh. shortcut. It's a, it's Do you a think problem. Mario greases his pants before he does this? He has to. Move him up. Oh, that oh. was a close <laughs> one there. That was a little scary. I was a little frightened. Oh, we're not going back to the tummy just yet. It's a good oh, thing. Oh, now we're going to the tummy. It's a good thing that Mario has four lives. Otherwise, the skeleton would be a much more death-defying... Uh, oh, and we're good. 32.70. Not a bad not, one at all. Oh, no, that is a better time. My bad. Decent time. Yep. And who's up next? We got CJ up next for his second, second run, run here. Let's see what CJ can do. All right. The run. And oh, oh, that's no! a disqualify. That is, that is a death. You cannot yet. That is our first. That's the Yahoo of shame right that there. That was. I mean, it's pretty exciting. You kind of want to go Yahoo when you start the race, but you just can't. Very tempting to start uh, the run with a Yahoo. Okay, but now we're good. We're back to we're back to it. That's not skeletoning. That's just sliding down a slide. Maybe that was just like. A celebratory wahoo. Maybe. I, I mean, yeah, if you think that you can just take those You're like, you know what? I can take this. I'll show you that I'm good. Yeah. Get that yahoo out of your system That's and down you say. go. <laughs> oh, we're already back on Tommy. Already back on Tommy. You got to make sure that you do it so that... Because I think from this position, you can't accidentally get back out of the Tommy position. No? You're, I think you're in it. Is it more slippery? Oh, maybe I'm wrong. 29.62. 29.62. That's a much better time. A lovely time. In comparison... Wait. No. Why did I think it was 26? <laughs> I, I don't my know My brain, mid, like, flipped the up nine times. upside down. I mean, nines can but, do that. No. Anyway, Jose's second run's up next. All right. Here goes Jose. Got a Yahoo? No. No <laughs> Yahoo. We're good. That is the correct way to start yeah. the run right there. As I was right saying, is, does it make it more slippery to be on the tummy? Or do you have more control they, on the bum? I think bum does have more control left and right. I think it is a little it's harder. It's a little tighter, a little less slippery, maybe? Yeah. Um, That's what I always thought, but I thought maybe I was wrong. It's definitely different. Mm. Yeah, I think all the positions have like a different control style, which is interesting. Oh, oh, he oh no! Can you uh -oh. still get out of it? There okay, we no, go. We're good. I mean, that lost some time, but lost some time, still but got it. Thirty-two eighty. Thirty-two eighty. Not as good as the first one, but no foul this time. Right. You... So well, let's look at the standing. So CJ, we have in first. First place. Uh, Rick's in second. Jose in third, and John in fourth. So, I mean, you could still make it up. CJ and Rick are pretty close there. Between also, depending the 58 on if and the there's 59. Any, uh, any losses there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Rick's up next again for the <laughs> third run. This is the first third run. And we also have two people that have lost a life. So they, life had, they have each. three lives left, and then two have four. So, and Rick is one of them that has the four lives. Rick goes into bum position, goes as is bum. customary. Very, very good. Very Where, good. Will he choose? When will to he go choose to go to, to the tum? tum? Well, he has to. I mean, he might oh, want. that's that's a good spot to do it. That I feel is, like. I think that I feel is like a that dive just, spot. It's not as um, you don't like stay in the air too long. Ooh, this part always scares me. Bonk. <laughs> Twenty-eight thirty-eight. That is an even better time. Oh, I punched the microphone. I'm really sorry. <laughs> just so excited. I was excited for the better time. Yeah, that's a good run there. That is a very good run. Very it just nice keeps getting run. better and better there. Yeah, they're getting into their groove. Yeah. <laughs> Next up is John's third run. I forgot what the other times were. I'll be I curious hope. to see if they keep beating their times. Will this be a fun run? Oh, okay, we're good. Give that, that money. That blue, that blue coin's way too tempting. You gotta grab He's like, the blue I coin. just want it. I mean, it's in the path, but... 
you know. Make sure you don't get 100 coins and get the star. That'll lose your time. Yeah, you're not going to get 100 (laughs) coins on just the slide. What if they brought their wallet and it was full of money? Oh, no. Mario, no! no! And that's a life loss, a disqualified run. Is that their first? I don't remember. I'm sure we'll see. I think we'll it is if, if the lives in the corner are anything oh, yeah, to go by. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. The lives in the corner indicate yeah. that that was indeed the first so run So his loss. first loss. First loss. Three more. That's still a... Like, that... When you get down to, like, that one... Oh, oh no! and another one. That's... Is that the same spot? I think it was. My brain is always just... So now this it's is a little dumb. more dangerous. I was just kind of saying, yeah, like when two. you when you have four or three, like you're not thinking too much about the disqualifications. Mm-hmm. But now that you're down to the two territory, that's a little bit dangerous. You could lose the whole damn thing. It's true. And you don't want that. But I think maybe it's taking a little safer now. Maybe that'll push him though. He's like the, the the you know like an oh. anime when the characters are stressed out and they they really pull out the big guns and win the day. It's true, but you also might like feel like you have to pay, play a little safer because you don't want to hit that disqualified. That's true. And the Tommy. On the Tom. Tom go. And we're good. And bomb. 3163. So let's compare that. Let's so that up. is still a better time. Still a better time. So there's two fouls. Are you raising your... Do you have a question? I have a question. What's the question? <laughs> it's not for recording. I was, just, I was just curious. Up next, we have CJ's third run. Okay. Let's get right into it. Let's see what he can do. CJ still has three lives left. Okay. That's a respectable so amount of one. lives. I don't think you can get any extra lives on the course either. There's not like no, one-ups waiting. No, I, I mean, you have to get 100 coins, don't you? I mean, the only there, there's one in the secret hidden. That's a cheat. <laughs> but I think that would be considered you could, cheating. You could, you could play that to your advantage. Just well, like, I, I'll got load up on lives, but I guess that would cancel out. I think it? that the penguin that kind of watches the races and makes sure everyone's following the rules wouldn't allow that. The, peng- the penguin's not here today. But he, the penguin's he the took the day off. He's the one that tells you when you're cheating, though. 2878. That is a be- and again, a better time. 2878, the lowest yet for CJ. Nice. Very nicely done. One Very foul, good. and Jose is up next with All below 30. the third run. Very good. Jose, let's see what you got. <gasps> oh, this is scary. The, the big dive. We got some money. And there's the the bomb the bomb transition. I feel is like it? he's going very fast. He <laughs> is. He, me. He's in a I feel like he's Oh, and he's taking oh. some chances. This is scary. There are a few ways that you could oh. technically cheat at this, and you, you gotta, gotta make go sure the, you no, don't oh. do it. Well, that I mean, he took it where I thought he would, but I think he took it a little too late. So yeah, he had a little kinda, more air time you than can needed. You can kind of see there when you're turning on the belly. That it, it, oh it's no! not as t- that, oh, that's not a that's a disqualifier. That's a bum. <laughs> and the death of shame. Like, I cannot take the shame. <laughs> All right, so oh, two lives. Two lives. Oh, to that go. was too bad because that one seemed pretty good. And this at least is the, the first part seemed really fast. And this is the third run, right? Oh my god, it went right back to tummy. Like yeah, immediately. Not, not taking any chances. No, we're, we're in tummy. This mode. could be really fast. And around the corner. Get that and corner. That corner has uh, killed corner. a couple people. That's a that's a killer corner. It really is. It, it'll stab you in a back alley Ooh. with an icicle because Be it's cold in here. Ooh, what are we going in? And that's a complete tummy run right 85. there. Oh, that's, is that the that's, best yet? I d- 2885 is pretty respectable. I don't know. I'd have to look at the other ones again. I'm not good at remembering numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's that a very good time. Run for... We are on to the final run. Rick is final, up first. Final Rick run. Final Rick run. Let's see what it's like. All right. Can he <laughs> beat his is. time? That, oh, a, that, that was, was a nice slide. That was a really nice time Not slide. messing around, just going right into the action. Yep. And the transition and to the bump. And I find he usually does the tum at the at the bump up here. Yeah, because you can make some tight turns when you're bum touching. It's true. And turning. I feel like if you get it right here, you get right down to it. So feel it. Yeah, see, like you hit the slope, and I feel like that just gets you going faster than all that air time. At the very least, it oh looks my God, really satisfying. Oh, my God. real good. 27, 28, 28 42. 42. I don't know if that beat the last one. So. Oh, no. Just a little bit off. Just a little bit. All right. That's very so good, though. That puts Rick at 116.08. The time to beat total time, 116.08. <laughs> Those are all pretty good runs. Late. You got a 30, 28, almost... <laughs> Three of them below 30. Very yeah. good. Pretty decent showing. Let's see if John can... Uh, Very consistent on the last three. Abs- yeah, that's true. It's like only a couple milliseconds get, off. Got a good mojo yeah. going. All right. The bum! I mean, the so, tum, sorry. Two lives left. Two Let's left. see how he handles it. And we come to the... So, the staying on the bum? You're on the bum. 
around the corner. That was a nice corner. I like that. Was a that. Good I like those tight corners. Yeah. Not too tight that you fall off the edge and die, but tight. Oh, oh and that's no! what you want to not happen. <sighs> that is that corner. I swear. One life to live, right? There's so, no zero. Do we life. have a one and a zero? Oh, that's a that's oh, a disqualify. That's a th no, is he disqualified? Do you get? I think you get a zero oh, life, don't you? Don't. Oh, <laughs> even insult more dis to two disqualifications. That is insult <laughs> and one. injury. So. Does he have any lives left? Yeah, he has one. Okay, the zeroth life counts. The zero life counts, I right. think. This is so it. So technically, they kind of have like five lives, right? The pressure's on right now. Maybe I'm not counting. Uh, we might not be counting. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's four total. Okay, yeah. It's four, zero is a lot. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's a lot of stress right now. No lives left to live. You do not yeah. want to get disqualified here. You would <laughs> no. probably be taking it a little slower, I think. <laughs> That's tight. No. So we want to we want to get back to get into back that on that tummy, tummy or maybe he's I hope he remembers he might be oh a little stressed. That, okay, yeah. no, he, he got it. He got it. All right, we're still in the game. Just have to make still it across the ice cube thingy and 3202. 3202. That's that's not going to be the 11608. That's that is a uh 13075. Right. So we got So right now that's The time to beat is still 11608. Still 116. And CJ is up next with CJ, his final run. I think CJ was in first. At one point, let's so see how Spinal Run could, goes. Man, that was, a, that was a good one. Very nice. I feel like that was a very entry. tight tummy entry. You gotta you not gotta entering the tummy, but entering oh, into the tummy position. Oh, Okay. Going right We're for tummy. We're doing tum. this again. There's no bum. No tum. Like no, I'm I'm going because I feel. Do you move faster on the tummy? Maybe you do. I don't. I'm not sure about that one. You might have to fact check it with the with the penguin man. So he's I'll an ask the penguin man upstairs. <laughs> All right, you do that. <laughs> what do we got? Where does we oh, put us in? That's a twenty-nine sixty-eight. Twenty-nine sixty-eight for a total Not, of oh, so close. One seventeen twenty-two. Rick so close. still has the lead with so Jose for the final Jose's run here Jose's gonna today. beat it, or Rick's gonna take the gold. Let's see how things end up. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Exciting times. How many lives does he have left? Let's see. Two. Two, okay. which is technically so three, right? Yeah. That's well, a lot of lives to live. <laughs> no, it's actually two. Okay. You go to one, you go to zero. All right, I can count. I swear you. <laughs> We're not good at counting. Counting is hard, but... Uh, We're good at watching Mario slide on his bum and tum. Skeletoning is How are we going to take this corner? It's going to take our a, life. That's a tight. Oh, he bumped over it. I wonder, if you get to the end and knew that you didn't have a good enough time, you could just kill yourself. That is true, but do they, strategy. are they comparing each other's times, or do they not know? I'm not 100% on that one. That was a very we good time, are, though. We're that was, done. That was his best time. That's so 2942. So that puts Rick at the top with 116.08. CJ for 117.22 for the close. silver. Mm -hmm. Jose with 120.98 for the bronze. And John, unfortunately, coming in last with 130. 75. Still all good efforts. Good showing Yay. by everyone today. Clap, clap, Very clap. Very good. Ah. Very good. I enjoyed those runs. Nice skeletoning by all. Mm -hmm. The penguin upstairs was very happy as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> nice skeletons by all. Good skeletons. Good skeletons, everybody. Yep. And then uh, here are the metal counts. Yeah, so we, got we got the so far uh, Tiras or, or Hook. <laughs> showing with four gold medals. Ludum, second place there with, with three gold medals. You betcha Stan showing three silvers. And Daisy, Daisy Baby Bitch, unfortunately, no gold, two silvers, and two bronze. Well, and there's also some bronzes and silvers in there. There is. <laughs> there certainly is. <laughs> and you're like, I don't care and vote to those. I can only say so many things. <laughs> But so far, we do have Rick with the most gold medals at three, representing Imperium Ludum. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Tiras de, de, de Hook won. <laughs> <laughs> Tira de los Hermanos Hook. Thank you. Uh, Dave has got two so far. Peter won. Oh, there. Jeff with one as well. Looking good, I everybody. like that it's color coded for me. I don't think they can see that one. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was today's event. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. The events of today, tomorrow we have ski jumping. Ooh, I always could enjoy a good I ski jump. A good ski jump. So I hope you enjoy that one. This has hit been the second games. I'm Max. I'm Lindsay. We will see you next time. Well, they will. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Somebody, Somebody will see you next time. I'll see you in the comment section. <laughs> bye bye. 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 <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another event for the games. 
My name is Ian from Born Losers Gaming, and I will be bringing you the game Ski Jump, where runners will be competing against one another in the balance-based minigame Ski Jump for the Wii Fit Plus. In case you did not already know, the Wii Fit series of games uses a peripheral called the Wii Balance Board, which essentially has four interconnected scales which are able to not just detect the user's weight, but triangulate the center of gravity as well as measure force exerted on it. This is important as skiers will have to squat and lean forward to keep their center of gravity in a specific place in order to gain the most speed while descending down the slope. Once they reach the end of the slope, the skiers will need to push out their squat into a standing position with as much force as they can to trigger the jump. All this science humbo jumbo side, our players will need to keep their center of gravity in the same place as before, as this will give the skier the most distance as they sail through the air to the landing area down below. Each skier will have two jumps, and whoever travels the furthest combined between both jumps will win today's gold medal. Today's participants are Jose of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, Felice of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, Nick of Imperium Ludum, and John of Ubechistan. Without further ado, let us begin the games. Our first jump of the day will be Jose, and there is anxiety in the air, and I assure you, it is not just me. Dang, moving fast down the hill. How much of a jump will you have? Good balance, a little off to the right. A solid 82 meters to start out. Not a smile on his face. Not gonna accept that. That was a good run. However, Jose is looking for more. Jose's run will have to wait as next up, we have Felice doing their first run. On your mark, get set, go. Felice is going down the hill again with a phenomenal speed. And the jump. How was the balance? Pretty good, nice and centered. A fantastic 125 meters. That is a grin. That is somebody who is excited. <laughs> about the score that they just got. I need to calm down. We still have so many competitors left to run today. Next up, Nick will be having their first run. All right, Nick, two performances so far. Will you best them both? Let's see. How much speed will you find? A solid start going in and out of this fast speed. Everyone's so far a little forward on the balance board. However, bringing it back at the very end to get a thrilling 143 meters. Nick, knocking it out of the park. I am not sure if these scores are going to be able to be bested. However, there's one final competitor. John, with his first run, how will you do? Got the glasses on, you gotta hope that they're wind resistant. Staying at the front of the balance board, you look at the speed, pretty good. That's a jump, pretty solid. A very nice 123 meters. Again, no smile. We're okay. That was a good jump. However, John's definitely looking for more. All right, let us tally up the scores and see where we are now. In first place so far, we have Nick at 143 meters. Felice at 125 meters. And right behind them is John at 123. And then in fourth place is Jose with 82 meters. Now, of course, Jose did go first, and everyone else got to watch and study. So we'll see if that has any impact on the rest of this run, as now Jose is going to move on to his final jump. Here we are. Letting go of the poles. How much speed will you be able to find? Getting good speed right at the very end. A jump, you're a little ahead on it. 105 meters will find you with more distance than you started with. However, will it be enough to keep up with everyone else's tremendous scores? Jose, of course, now in the lead with 187 meters. However, everyone else has much less of a distance they need to cross in order to pass Jose's scores. Remember that this is a combination of the two runs, so each run matters. Next up, Felice will be bringing us their final run. I come back to this anxiety in the air. This was our second best performer in the first jump. Let's see what they've learned. We are finding speed as much as possible, leaning a bit forward. Though center will land you a fantastic 151 meters. You've got to feel great about that one. 
Felice representing the Daisy Baby Bitch territory very, very well. I do believe that that was our best jump of the day thus far. Landing Felice at 276 meters. That's impressive even me and I have been commentating the ski jump for longer than I will talk about on this video. <laughs> Next up, the first place of the first jump. Nick, let's see what he is able to bring to the table. Needing around 130 points in order to best and get the gold medal. How will you do staying centered, but are you enough? 129 meters. Was I correct? Was 130 the number that we needed to see? Let's find out as we tally up the scores. No, that is so close. We needed to see 100. And 33 meters in order for Nick to take home the gold. So far, Felice sitting very, very comfortable in first place. As if John wants to win the gold today. He is going to not only need to beat Felice, but he is going to need to defeat Felice's massive score of 151. And will need at least 154 points. Let's see what happens. Our final jump of the day. John, what do you have to impress of? There is so much speed going into this jump. Love to see it perfectly balanced in the middle. How far are you going? 115 meters. We know that that is a good jump. However, we also know that that is not enough to walk away with today's gold. It is time to look at our final standings. What a fantastic showing tonight. We had a tremendous first and second place with their scores so close to each other. A huge congratulations to Felice for taking home today's gold. Nick taking home today's silver four meters behind with 272 meters. John in third with 238 meters and Jose with 187. Now let's look at the medal counts of the games thus far. In first place is Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with four golds and two bronze. In second is Imperium Ludum with three golds, three silvers, and two bronze. Third is the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with one gold, two silvers, and two bronze. And in fourth is Ubechistan with zero golds thus far, three silvers, and two bronze. Congratulations to all of our participants today, and thank you for watching us in another day of the games. We would all very much love if you would come back tomorrow as we have another event, Speed Skating. I absolutely love all of these winter sports, and I hope that you do too. Thank you all so much for watching. Once again, my name is Ian from Born Losers Gaming. I'm not usually this loud, but something about these games really gets me going, dude. <laughs> I love this idea. I hope you all do too. And if you do, please show the series love. Thank you all so much, and I hope that I will see you all next time. Bye, everyone. Hello, sports fans. My name is Cedar, and welcome back to the second games. In today's event, Speed Skating, our competitors will be racing through Freeze Flame Galaxy to see who can collect all 100 purple coins on the summit and get the star the fastest in Super Mario Galaxy. The goal of today's race is simple in concept but far, far trickier in execution. The purple coins have been scattered throughout the mountain and require good use of both the ice and fire flowers in order to collect them all. If they want to be the fastest, the runners will have to strategize the best path to take while also avoiding the untimely fate of falling off the mountain entirely. Fortunately for them, they have been given four extra lives to try again, if such a fall does befate them. Wait, strike that. Reverse it. Your participants for today's event are Nick of Imperium Ludum in the top left of the screen, CJ of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory in the bottom left, Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook in the bottom right, and finally your mystery competitor, Diego de la Vega, representing Ubechistan in the top right. Time will start once Mario's feet hit the ground, and time will be called once the star has been grabbed. Our athletes are ready to go, so let's head down to the track. Alright, our competitors are off as they go down the starting slide. Three of our competitors going back for the hidden coins while Nick goes ahead and gets the starting coins first. Maybe a bit, a bit, a little bit, I can words, a little bit of backtracking. Not necessarily what you want to do in a speed game, but uh, we'll have to see how our strategies pay off in the end. 
CJ being the first to unlock the Ice Flower, which will be necessary to traverse a lot of the water throughout the stage, as this does let you ski over, ski over, skate over, skate over the water for a short period of time. Uh, now, who's going to be our first one to actually? Diego is the first one to actually grab the Ice Flower, but he still has some purple coins to grab by the Ice Flower. It seems to be ignoring them in favor of going straight for the stairs. An interesting strategy. Uh, Nick. Jeff and CJ all appear to have grabbed the first coins. Jeff and CJ both having... Ooh, CJ is apparently ahead by one coin upon reaching the second slide, so perhaps the others have some backtracking to do. Uh, we'll have to see. Jeff getting the second Ice Flower and going... Uh, getting the same Ice Flower and going back to the, uh, the star. I think he has done the backtrack to get the remaining coins. Uh, who is in the lead right now? It looks like CJ is in the lead with 26 coins. Uh, trying to get the purple coin up the top there, but not quite able to get the correct backflip into 12. Uh, can he get it before this ice flower runs out? No, he does not. But can he get back on there to actually acquire the coin? Jeff has now overtaken with 27 purple coins. I did not keep track to see which one he'd gotten. He appears to be checking around the start here to see... Ah, he's re-grabbing the Ice Flower to try and get the rest. Uh, looks like he's now going to where CJ just was. Is he missing one of the purple coins? Ah, the same purple coin that CJ was having trouble to get earlier. Not quite able to get the uh, potentially slightly easier to reach coin there. Uh, CJ making his way back over to that first Ice Flower yet again. Uh, Jeff had to backtrack to that same Ice Flower. This seems to be an issue for everyone to get, but Diego has just managed to get it. And Nick seems like he is on his way to get these same coins, and has also taken two damage. I didn't pay attention to see how that happened, but that is a hazard, a hazard that they will have to watch out for. CJ going straight ahead uh, towards the blocky stairs, opposed oh, instead of going for the uh, the fountain coins there. Uh, I don't know what version of Thwomp these guys are, but I believe they are a version of Thwomp. There are many versions of Thwomp. There's a whole Thwomp lineage uh, that can be looked at, but this is not the time for such discussions as CJ is at 36 coins far ahead of the rest of the pack here. Now, there are regular coins around the track for the purpose of regaining health, which Nick is not going to be able to use as he has just taken uh, extra damage. And you cannot regenerate back up to six if you have dropped to three or lower. So Nick is now at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, I suppose I should mention that the uh, cold water has been what's dealing this damage to Nick. Uh, if you are caught in that water without the ice flower, you will start taking damage. And Jeff has uh, handily demonstrated that for me in the bottom right of the screen. Uh, now, everyone does seem to be having quite a bit of trouble with this one purple coin at the starting fountain. Uh, CJ is miles ahead of the competition with 60 coins now using these fountains to platform his way up to this uh, next plateau, another ice flower available. Uh, and it's some regular coins for replenishing health that he does not need, but there are some purple coins hidden behind there. Jeff going back for another attempt at this uh, one particularly tricky purple coin. It requires a uh, a crouch backflip into a twirl to actually be able to reach. Uh, CJ is now three quarters of the way through the course, uh, unlocking another ice flower to restart that timer. Uh, it looks like he's making his way up to uh, a green toad, who are uh, potentially there to hand out refreshments. Uh, nice, nice cold bit of water. Uh, got, got a bit frozen, but. That's fine. Uh, Jeff making his way up some uh, platforming challenges there. Another set of platforming that does require you to be rather quick to actually make your way up, but he manages to get the purple coin there and uh, is making his way up to the thwomps. Uh, Jeff and Nick both seem to be at about the same position, while CJ is at 82 out of 100 coins. Uh, now, he does need to be worried about falling off, because that can cause you to have to restart the whole thing. But he has picked up the Fire Flower, first use of the Fire Flower in this event, used to destroy these snowmen. 
so that you can actually continue to progress up the mountain. Uh, gotta watch out for these swamps pushing you off the edge though. Seems to be doing a masterful job of avoiding them and using the Fire Flower to clear that next Warp Star. 85 coins left up to the final climb. Uh, needs to acquire another Fire Flower to deal with the snowman in the way. Nick seemed to have a bit of trouble with the cold water. Uh, ooh, falling back in. Not what you want to see. Are you going to see our first death? He's down to one health. It's not looking good. He's back in the water. Can he survive it? No, Nick has taken his first death. That does not restart the timer. You have to start back from the beginning. And menuing is a part of this, so Nick is going to have to uh, watch out here. Uh, Jeff making his way to almost the 50% mark as Diego hits the three quarters mark. Uh, as Nick restarts his run, going back once again for the two hidden coins. Getting a nice actual view of them this time, just to show what's going on there. CJ has hit 90 out of 100. Now, has he gotten every coin? That is the important part, because this is the end of the track. If he's missing one, then he will have to go back through the whole thing to try and find the coins that he has missed. So this is the uh, the final proving round to see whether you have done everything necessary. Ooh, he manages to just make it past the thwomps. He's at 98 coins at the top of the summit, which is all the coins. Now he just needs to get this jump. Does he make it? It's looking good. One jump left, and that is all 100 coins. He just needs to get to the star, and his time is done. Now our second place competitor is Diego at 81. He takes that warp star all the way, or CJ takes the warp star all the way back, and that is time for CJ with an excellent time of 7 minutes and 19 seconds. Very well done, CJ, your first place winner from the Daisy Baby Bitch territory. Now, uh, it looks like Diego is our second place runner with 81 coins, but Jeff is not too far behind with 72. Uh, looks like, well, now he has also hit the 75% mark heading up to uh, the Fire Flower segment. Diego looks like he's having a bit of trouble trying to uh, backflip past these fountains for some reason. I believe he may have missed a purple coin, or is he trying to make a shortcut happen? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Jeff looks like might be waiting for the ice flower to run out. And is making a long jump? I do not know what is happening here. Uh, ah, making his way to a missing purple coin. Ah, that is where Diego is trying to get to. It seems like he did not quite make the jump. Ooh, almost making it up there. Very, very nicely done. It, I don't know if he's actually going to be able to make it there, but Jeff is now in the Fire Flower segment. Uh, can he make it all the way? Diego, ooh, so close, almost able to make that jump. I, I don't know if he's going to be able to make it the whole way. Jeff waiting for the reappearance of the Fire Flower to restart that time. And Diego did actually manage to make it up that jump, so congratulations, Diego. Uh, in essentially the same position as Jeff, we are neck and neck as both players get their Fire Flower. Diego does need to clear out that snowman, but no hesitation, not waiting for the reappearance of the Fire Flower. So these two are now neck and neck. We have a serious fight for second place as Nick, uh, after that unfortunate death, is still trying to get that one very tricky purple coin with this backflip twirl. Can he manage to do it? Uh, looks like Jeff has managed to make it further ahead than Diego. Diego's Fire Flower did run out, so he has to make the trek back. Uh, Jeff, one purple coin ahead. Let's see whether this lead was all that he needed to secure that second place. Diego making his way up, needs to break that snowman in order to open up that warp star. Manages to get there, so he is moving on to the final summit climb. Uh, Jeff making his way past the thwomps. Diego getting the fire flower. Using that thwomp to make his way up, gets to the next fire flower segment. Let's see how he do. Ooh, Nick taking another death. That is unfortunate timing there. Is he going to keep going? Let's, uh, let's find out. He does continue on the race. Uh, Jeff making his way 
Can he keep that Fire Flower for long enough to get the next Warp Star? He does. Well done. Ten coins remaining. Has he got everything that he needs? I believe that was the same count that CJ was at before. Nick has continued on with his next run, so good on you for the perseverance. Two lives remaining. Jeff is at 94, I think. Yes, that will be enough as long as he manages to make the jumps. Uh, Nick is now um, re-unlocking his first Ice Flower. Gotta love the perseverance. The, uh, the, the true showmanship of these competitors is not, is not to be understated. Alright, Jeff. Ooh, not quite getting the wall jump. Having to wait. Di giving Diego a lot of time to catch up here. They're almost neck and neck again. Yes, I believe we are actually neck and neck now, as both competitors are waiting for the same jump. Ooh, Jeff actually manages to get the wall jump this time ahead by a fraction of time. Like, barely, barely a couple of seconds. Diego, hot on his tails. Alright, Jeff makes the long jump for the first purple coin. Lands it. Diego, the same jump. Can he get there? Lands it. Jeff has unlocked the final star. It is going to be a race as the cutscene is playing at the same time for both competitors. Oh, Diego quicker into the warp star. It's going to be a case of aiming. Can Jeff get it on the first jump? Jeff manages to get second place as Diego is barely a second behind. Very impressive. Close second and third place as Nick uh, goes for the goes for the fourth place. You gotta you gotta admire the competitive spirit from these players. That that back jump into twirl, not an easy thing to do, but he does manage to get it, so well done to Nick as he tries to aim towards the ice flower once more. Let's see how he does. Ooh, tries to go for a long jump, goes for a uh, a butt stomp instead. Not what you want to see happen here in this speed skating tournament. Alright, Nick manages to get the ice flower but only on one health. Thankfully, at the end of this uh, ice flower segment, there is the extra life mushroom, or the extra health mushroom, I should say, which will take you up to six life, unless that has already been grabbed, and I was not paying attention because the race for second and third place was quite in quite competitive. But he's making his way towards the thwomps now. Let's see how he does. Now he will have to back jump off of these thwomps to actually acquire the purple coins on top of them. Uh, let's see if that practice from that one very annoying purple coin that all of our competitors had trouble with today. Uh, seems like it is going well. Yes, excellently done there, Nick. Well done. Alright, gets that golden coin to replenish some health. And looks like he's going for this wall jump coin right here. Backflip into wall jump to get that extra height, just to make sure. Well done, well done. Alright. Walking along the walls here, doesn't uh, doesn't want to go on the ice. Interesting call. Right, on this plateau, getting the uh, the three cheekily hidden coins, just to make sure. Walking past the sleeping toad, getting these four other coins. Very nice, very nice. A, a much more uh, leisurely trek through, so that I can actually pay attention. It, it's it's appreciated, Nick. I, I thank you for giving everyone a proper view of the track here. Alright, these these coins are trickier than they would seem with the uh, the balancing act of getting the getting the ice tilted down low enough for the other coins to be reachable. Now granted you can reach all of them with the backflip, but that is not necessarily the easiest thing to do, as it does change your momentum slightly. It does risk you going into the water, which is uh, not not really what you want if you're trying to actually acquire the coins and not lose life, but Nick manages to get all of them. Very nice, very nice. Tilting the ice back up to make the jump easier to get over to the next set of coins. And the ice flower. Oh no! Oh, Nick's in the same patch of water that he died the first time. Can he make it out? He makes it out, but he's straight back in. Ah, there we go. Making the jump this time. Making sure not to let that fall into the water, and he's acquired the ice flower. He's still alive. Don't even worry about it, he had it the whole time. Alright, making his way past this swamp. Back into the water. Going back to the ice flower yet again. While trying to make sure not to have the uh, the platform sink too low. Alright. 
makes it back through. The platforms have realigned. He's reacquired the Ice Flower and it is back over to the sliding thwomps. Alright. Making his way on top of the thwomp. Excellently done. Alright, up and over. Excellent work, Nick. Well done. Alright, making his way up the fountains. Gotta make sure to get there before that Ice Flower runs out. Oh, just, just in the nick of time. Well done, Nick. That pun was not intentional, but I'll take it. Alright. Getting the next Ice Flower. This being on one health is very stressful. Thankfully, we do have a bunch of regular coins around the place, which should heal that up quite nicely. Excellent. Ah, that, that must be a, a real breath of fresh air for Nick. Not having to worry about one accidental slip into the water, meaning the end of yet another run. But Nick making his way over to the other set of purple coins. They're making pretty quick work of this... Uh, Oh no, this one isn't purple coins, that's just an ice flower. I see. Well, uh... I suppose it's time to move on to the next section then, isn't it? Now, it feels like Nick might be missing some purple coins here. Which is not ideal. Because other competitors have been at 75 before going up there, so I'm wondering where some might have been missed. Or, yet again, I could just be missing uh, something. It has been a while since I have uh, attempted this course myself, but right, making the long jump down to this long slide. Ooh, not quite making it back down in the water, not where you want to be. Thankfully getting back up there is possible, as we saw Diego do earlier, but it can be quite tricky to do. The question is, are we going to see Nick try and make the full climb again, or is he just going to go... Ah! There's one of the coins that was missed before, so perhaps that was a blessing in disguise for Nick. As he makes his way up. Oh, he never took this path before. I see. I was right when he didn't have that extra health mushroom. Ah. Oh, back in the water, but with six health, that is a much better buffer. I'm sure I'll be very happy with that. Well, the case of the uh, missing coins has been solved. Now Nick just needs to make it to the rest of the course. Ah, and getting the coin on top of there. Wow. He was uh, he was missing quite a few coins from the early parts here. Now, granted, this could all have been grabbed after he made it up to the top, got everything, and then come back down. But getting everything before you get to the summit is uh, definitely a load off of the competitors' minds. All right, Nick has got his ice flower. He's moving on to try and make his way up to that warp star. We saw Diego struggle before. Now, it should theoretically be easier to do with the ice flower jumping off of the uh, the fountains there. You can get a triple jump if you time it well, but Nick appears to be waiting for the uh, backflip jump, or backflip twirl. Backflip wall jump twirl, I should say. Ooh, almost manages to make it on the first try, but just didn't manage to get the twirl. Can we see it on the second try? Yes, we can. Excellent play by Nick there. Well done indeed. As we move on to the fire flower segment. Very, very nicely done. Round of applause for that. That was that was honestly quite impressive on the second try. Well done. All right, Nick, acquiring the fire flower. Can he make it up quick enough on the first try, or will he have to back up? Having missed that uh, first fire flower, I'm going to assume that we will need to see a second fire flower. And Nick appears to have the same conclusion as he is waiting for the fire flower to respawn. It seems to be a uh, a good choice. As you can slightly hear that uh, timer ticking down. All right, Nick making his way up the uh, sliding thwomps here. All right. We're going to need to see some quick play if we want to get through. Thankfully, you can climb on top of them. Ooh, but they do push you off if you're uh, if you're holding on for too long. Nick going back for the uh, fire flower again, uh, yet again, as you hear that music speeding up, signifying that the power up is running out. All right, attempt number two at the sliding thwomps. Alright, making quicker work of it this time. Can he make it up? There's only one jump left, and he just needs to land the fire flowers. Alright, making good use of the sliding thwomps there. Oh. And manages to open up the warp star before getting the purple coin. Appears to be the correct call. As he makes his way, 15 coins remaining. He does have every coin now. He just needs to make his way through this final fire flower segment. 
Alright, picking up the coin before getting the fire flower, one less thing to worry about. Good call, good call. Picks up the fire flower and moving on towards the snowman. Excellent early fire flowers just to make sure the course is clear. Well done, gotta watch out for these sliding thwomps though. You can stand on those green checker patterned platforms but they do not last very long. They can provide just enough of a respite to make your way over to the next platform. But that is still something to be worried about. Waiting for the sliding thwomp to pick up. Excellent. Well done. Excellent choice by our competitor here. Making his way to the second fire flower. Again, picking up the purple coin before picking up the fire flower. A good choice. Alright. As we break the 21 minute mark, Nick makes his way towards the final climb of the summit. Just uh, playing, playing it safe. Excellent. You want to get a successful complete... Ooh, falls down. Back to the first fire flower. Now, he doesn't actually need to grab that first fire flower to make it through anymore. All the obstacles have been removed. Alright, Nick. Making his way past the sliding thwomps. Manages to make it through without, without any hassle. Excellent job. All right, 11 coins remain. Let's see. Making it past the sliding thwomps yet again. Lovely little wall climb there. Alright. Remembering to grab the fire flower. Excellent, excellent. Had a bit of a trouble with the Luma not quite wanting to spin and break that crystal. Alright, makes his way up the summit yet again. Slow and steady finishes the race, as they say. Alright, has the fire flower. Needs to aim at the snowman. Lovely, excellent work. Uses that warp star to get back up to the top. Ten coins remain. Everything has successfully been grabbed. Ooh, almost slips off there. Manages to recover. Well done, well done. Now this is a bit of a tricky jump. Excellent, excellent. Nicely done. Alright, the final hurdle. Well, almost the final hurdle. 95. 95? Yeah, 95. That That is the number necessary. There are three more coins up the top, and then the two from the long jump. Just needs to get the wall jumps on the correct walls. Make his way up to the top of the summit. Oh, careful there. Oh no! Oh, he's fallen off. And it's back down to the second fire flower second. Not that much of a recovery needed. Thankfully he didn't fall back to the first fly fire flower segment. Just needs to make the uh, slightly tricky jump again. Making sure not to fall off. After you've come this far, you don't want to uh, don't want to succumb to the falling. It is, uh, it is not ideal. This wall jump is pretty tricky. It does require some rather quick timing. Manages to make it that time. Excellent done. Excellent, excellent, excellently done, Nick. Well done. Have I said that enough? All right. Final hurdle. The long jumps to the last two coins. This is this is very tricky. You can maneuver a little bit in midair. Gets the long jump. Aim looks good. Perfect landing. You'll love to see it. You'll love to see it. Alright, last jump. Can he get there? Excellent. Star has spawned in. Pretty much a foregone conclusion now. We just need to see Nick make it all the way to the end. Using that warp star. Lovely. The final little victory. Victory slide here. A little bit of a twirl. Love to see it. Victory lap around the star. Why not? You made it this far. Why not just have a little bit of fun with it? Alright, and the final time for Nick. 24 minutes and 8 seconds. Excellent job from all of our competitors. Round of applause. Very nicely done. A well-executed race by all of our competitors today. Truly something to behold. CJ displayed some extremely good course awareness and high-level platforming skill, actually managing to bring the Ice Flower power up from the top plateau all the way down to the fountain triple jump. A truly impressive display. The mystery competitor from Ubechistan, Diego, almost managed a similar feat, grabbing the ice flower from the bottom of the track and landing the triple jump on the first set of fountains, but not quite able to land it on the second. Nick showed us the correct way to recover from that situation, however, as he managed the warp star skip in a mere two attempts. Jeff, for his part, completely ignored those fountains after picking up the purple coin on his ascent, as he made an excellent long jump from the top plateau all the way to the warp star platform. But now it's time for the medals. 
with CJ from the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory taking a commanding gold medal with a time of only 7 minutes and 19 seconds. Our fourth place finalist was Nick from Imperium Ludum with those two unfortunate deaths and a time of 24 minutes and 8 seconds, but the real battle today was the battle for second place. It was very neck and neck for a large portion of today's race, with Jeff's more calculated playstyle not netting him many mistakes, but Diego's aggressive playstyle allowing him to catch up all the faster when he had to recover from a mistimed power-up or an unfortunate drop. When it all shook out, Jeff from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook was victorious with the silver medal and a time of 11 minutes and 45 seconds, with the mysterious Diego de la Vega with only two seconds behind, landing the bronze for Ubetristan. As we look at the medal tallies, we can see that Tierra de los Hermanos Hook is still in first place, but with a much less commanding lead than earlier in the games, landing their first silver medal today. The Imperium Ludum is in a much more precarious second place after their first event without a medal. The Daisy Baby Bitch territory is making some serious headway towards winning the whole competition after landing their second gold medal in a row, and Ubetristan has a lot of catching up to do, as they're yet to get a single gold medal. That's all the time I have for you today. My name is, has been, and will continue to be Seedude, and remember to check back tomorrow for the bobsled event. Can the Daisy Baby Bitch territory keep their momentum to win the whole event? Will Diego de la Vega, the mystery medalist, return to help you betcha stand in their time of need? Are the commentators going to band together to make Tierra de los Romanos hook easier to say? Will Editor Rick use his powers for evil to help Imperium Ludum rise to the top? None of this and more as the games continue. Hello everybody and welcome back to another day of the games. My name is Ian from Born Losers Gaming and today we are bringing you an event that is very near and dear to my heart. An event that I believe many of you know, but in case you don't, then congratulations, you are one of today's lucky 10,000. Please everybody buckle in as today's event is the bobsled run from Mario Party 2. This game is a 2v2 minigame where sledders will be paired off in a round robin style format, teaming up to attempt a run for the fastest time to reach the end goal. However, this track is dangerous and it is very possible that sledders may fall off of this difficult racetrack. Be warned, there is math incoming, so should a bobsled fall off the track, the official time for that pair of sledders will be the time at the moment and place of the fall, plus the time it would take to reach the finish line from that point forward at the rate of two minutes across the entire track. An example, just in case that doesn't click like it did for me, if a sled falls off at the halfway point in 35 seconds, then that is 35 seconds for the first half, plus one minute for the second half for an official time of one minute and 35 seconds. As I mentioned, this is a dangerous game with a not so dangerous prize as all of our participants are looking for the gold. Today's players will be Rick of Imperium Ludum as Wario, John of Ubechistan as Yoshi, Felice of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory as Peach, and Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook as Donkey Kong. With all of this information in mind, let us begin the first race. Our first pair in this round robin will be Rick and John going against Felice and Jeff. Let's see how everybody performs. You can already see that there is a best time of 1 minute and 21 seconds on the clock. Felice and Jeff storm their way into the lead. One of the parts about this game that makes it so difficult is that once you get a lead, it is very difficult to surpass. But Rick and John doing a fantastic job of making me eat my words until they fall off the ledge. That is going to be an official time with their penalty of 1 minute and 50 seconds. Felice and Jeff can now feel a bit better. As they move through this, they can take a little more time. They can move a little more slowly. They can play carefully. Let's see how these two do, because you still want to get the best time as possible. <laughs> We're seeing them play careful. We're like, oh, we almost fell off. Let's slow down. Missing one of the speed boosts. An essential part of getting a good time in this game are all of the speed boosts. Not hitting walls, because hitting walls are going to slow you down tenfold, or hitting other players, as we saw early on when Felice and Jeff ran into the backside of Rick and John. That is what allowed Rick and John to move forward. This is the scary part. You need to turn right, but if you turn right too much, you're going to be going right off that racetrack. Three lefts may make a right, but two rights make an airplane. That is your fun fact of the day as we're moving now. <laughs> as we move on through this race. The single player race with Felice and Jeff. Almost to the end. There's no way to fall off now. Hold straight. Thy heroes, you have ended with a time of 1 minute and 33 seconds. 
as this is around ramen we will be pairing up with new teams but before then let's look at the scores felice and jeff having a good time of one minute and 33 seconds while rick and john though they had a very speedy start unfortunately falling off leading them to have a one minute and 50 second time Moving into this next race, we once again have Rick on top, this time with Felice. And on bottom, we have John and Jeff. Let's see how this swap in team fares again. The bottom team getting that early start. Rick and Felice are going to have to play catch up. John and Jeff, very good on that mash. You do have to mash in order to get that speed. Missing the speed boost, very, very big. But Rick and Felice have to get ahead again, as I mentioned in the last one. It is difficult to get around because if you run into the backside of the leading player, unfortunately, you s slow down heavily. Everyone on the track at this point, which means that everyone's moving just a little bit faster. It's going to be interesting to see if we could see a new high score today, a new record. Will you take a left? No, Rick and Felice missing out on the speed booth. John and Jeff missing out as well. John and Jeff sitting very pretty until running into a wall. Both teams run into the wall and off the cliff. John and Jeff will be ending with an official time of 1 minute and 37 seconds. However, Rick and Felice cannot sit pretty just yet. They understand that they do need to move a little bit faster if they want to beat that time, but not so fast that you fly off the course. This match will end with a draw. However, Rick and Felice getting ever so farther in this race We'll leave them with a time of 1 minute and 33 seconds. And then John and Jeff with a time of 1 minute and 37 seconds. Let's see where all the competitors stand now. A reminder that all of these times are cumulative. So our current standings have Felice in first with 3 minutes and 7 seconds. Jeff in second with 3 minutes and 11 seconds. Rick in third with 3 minutes and 23 seconds. And then John in fourth with 3 minutes and 27 seconds. With all of these standings understood, let us move into our final race. Rick's final partner will be Jeff, while John's final partner will be Felice. Let's see how these two do at mashing at the beginning. Who will get the early lead? It is dead even. This is the perfect start. I love seeing this, but Rick and Jeff do get the slight boost, and they are in the lead. We've only seen one team finish so far, so I'm curious if we are going to see another in this final race. It will be a huge lead to whichever team does, if that's a possibility. John and Felice already off the ledge with a time of 151. Rick and Jeff have to be sitting very pretty now understanding that so long as they finish so long as they keep steady they're likely taking home either the gold or the silver going down the hidden path rick and jeff do still miss the speed boost as i mentioned earlier this is one of my favorite games you gotta be careful you cannot go too far to any ledge you want to stay in this middle however you do want to hug the sides to get the best speed possible, so it's all risk and reward. And that's what makes a game like this so fun and so challenging. Opting out of the boost here in order to ensure safe passage through the less of the level. I do believe you're sitting pretty. That's it. We're going to end this with a new high score of 1 minute and 15 seconds. That is a new record going to Rick and Jeff. A fantastic score, especially sitting next to John and Felice's 1 minute and 51 seconds. I said I wasn't going to get loud. Here I am. God damn it. We now need to take the time to look at our final scores. With Rick and Jeff taking 1 minute and 15 seconds and John and Felice taking 1 minute and 51, our final standings are as such. Jeff walking home with the gold with 4 minutes and 27 seconds. A fantastic cumulative time. In second place is Rick coming off hot of that 115, having 4 minutes and 39 seconds. Felice having done so well in the first two runs, they're going to be walking away with 4 minutes and 59 seconds. And then finally, John unfortunately plummeting too much will be walking away with the fourth place 5 minutes and 19 seconds. 
with everything calculated, let's look over the current medal standings. In first is Tierra De Los Hermanos Hook with five golds, one silver, and two bronze medals. In second is Imperium Ludum with three golds, four silvers, and two bronze medals. In third place is the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with two golds, two silvers, and three bronze medals. And in fourth place is Ubechistan with zero gold medals so far, three silvers, and three bronze. I would also like to give a quick shout out to our top three competitors so far, Rick walking away with three gold medals, and then Jeff and Dave walking away with two. Congratulations to everyone who played today, and thank you so much for watching today's event here at the games. We would love to have you back here for tomorrow's event, as tomorrow is another special event, snowboarding. Thank you all so much once again for watching, and thank you Rick and the Deep for having me. My name once again is Ian of Born Losers Gaming. If you enjoy my voice, we play plenty of Metroidvanias and other Nintendo titles, and we would love to have you over on our channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that I will see you all next time. Bye everyone. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Max and this is Lindsay. We Hello. are from Game Face and we will be bringing you the 11th event of the games. It's snowboarding. It's snowboarding. It's snowboarding. <laughs> <laughs> In this event, runners will be racing against each other and then 10 64 snowboarding game made by Atlas called Snowboard Kids. I like that game. And this, it's not so much about the tricks. We're not just doing it for kicks. It's a race to the race. end and you got to get the best time. So they'll be competing in the first three courses of the game, which would be Rookie Mountain, Big Snowman, and Sunset Rock. And they can choose any character they like, as well as any of the snowboards available at the start of the game by default. So none of those are unlockables. And so the racers will be ranked according to combined times across all three races. The event participants this time are Rick of Imperium Ludum. Oh, that's me. <laughs> John of uh, You Betcha Stan. Lindsay of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. And Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. So without further ado, we're going to get this first race started. Everyone goes at the same time, and I assume it's Rookie Mountain. So let's, let's, head, <gasps> let's head over to the mountain, shall we? Rookie Mountain. Over to the mountain. Here we are. That looks like a mountain, right? Ready? Yep. And so here we are. Rick on the top no! left, John top right, Lindsay bottom left, and Jeff bottom right. Okay, so we've got spiky black hair. Uh, Do you know their names? I don't remember their names. Brown hair. <laughs> Nancy? <laughs> yeah, that might be Nancy. <laughs> Is that Nancy? Nancy. And girl with pigtails. I played this game casually when I was but child. It was, I rented uh, it, it was a, a couple good time. times. It is. I never competed in it uh, competitively in any sort of games. But, you know, casually just oh. hanging out. That pan. All oh, the pan. So this game has some like Mario Kart esque shenanigans that go on in it. It's got like you a can. pan, a snowman. I think is a is a weapon. It's been a while. It has been a while. Oh, but parachute! You, you, I remember you the pick parachute. Up pickups and you can throw them at I each other. I think the parachute slows somebody down. I'm not sure if tricks do anything. When you get to the end here, this is important. You gotta hit that. You gotta hit the lift. Yeah, you gotta hit like you gotta go that little small area. Otherwise, if you miss it, you bonk and you lose time. And yep. you gotta do it single file too. If y'all kind of come at the same time, yeah, you gotta it's you important. gotta single file it, guys. It looks like there's five laps. So Rick's in first. But Rick is in first. He's first place. Like not not by much, I don't think. I'm trying to look at the middle thing. It's like, oh, he's got a bit of a lead. Oh, yeah, it's got, like, the, the classic straight line situation going on. Yeah, it, as like, opposed all the to, emblems like, the, and the then full map. The little characters, if they're too close together, you're like, it's just a ball of character. Oh! Rick's got the, the power-up that makes him go fast that has a propeller in the back of it. The snowman. Oh, is that what that is? No, 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 no. Well... I don't think it's a snowman. No, I was looking at the bottom <laughs> ones. Uh -huh. Lindsay and Jeff have... Uh, Snowmen. Has some snowmen, and it looks like Lindsay also has a possibly a pan saved up. Yeah, I think the oh, pan. Oh, there goes the pan. Oh, yeah, does the pan Jeff hit everyone in front of you? I think is what that does. No, it just hit Jeff. No, I hit two people, dude. It hit, it hit Jeff and John. I'm pretty sure. Oh, did it? Yeah. Next time we oh, see no. a pan, we'll have to pay closer attention. All right, we're on the last. Oh, yeah. There's five laps. There's a lot in of this. laps, man. So many laps. I forgot <laughs> that this isn't this isn't that Mario game I know. <laughs> 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 it's not one one slide down and Rick's you're done. Rick's got quite the lead. Rick is definitely knows his way around a snowboard, doesn't he? And a kid. He, uh, a snowboard kid. Carrying on. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. He's definitely got a bit of a lead on. But then everybody else is pretty close in the back. Do you know if the tricks do anything? Does it like get you more speed or anything I like that? I think it gets that? you money, so you and you use the money so you can actually get items to screw people over. Oh, that I'm makes sense. I'm pretty sure. Because as we as we stated, it's not like an SSX tricky situation where we're competing for points. We want to just go oh. fast. Go fast. What was and that move? I missed it. Lindsay got. I was watching Lindsay got John. Hit by something. The old something. What is it? Love, it's so brutal when they get hit too, because they do like the, the like, multiple flip forward. <laughs> it's like with a snowboard attached to your feet. They should it's cartoonishly brutal. turn into a snowball and run everybody over. That'd be pretty comical. Love to do that in snowboard. This isn't free. Looney Tunes. Ah, it's close. Pretty close to Looney Tunes, oh, right? Man. Yeah, Rick's Does, really I going. The, I think I don't, the ghost I... slows people down, if I recall correctly. Ghost? Oh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a, Lindsay has the fan. Yeah, the fan. The, okay, the power that fan. Okay, that makes you go fast. Makes you go real fast. It's oh, fast catching going. up to Jeff. Oh, passing Jeff. Oh. Rick still got first place, though. John's John's behind, but Trailing doesn't look like behind. by much, because they're, they're all pretty close in the back, and then Rick's got a bit of a lead. I mean, that's an interesting thing about a game like Snowboard Kids, is even if you are trailing behind, the game will probably be giving you some better weapons to make up for it. So. I don't know. It's been a long time since I played this game, and I don't really know the mechanics of it. Well, I forgot to do my homework, Final so lap. I'm not 100%. Oh, oh, John eating a little bit of dookie there at the oh, end. Uh, I, 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 know I know that pain. I know that pain. Oh, it's brutal. You're just like, yep, here I go, and then wall. So everybody's on the final lap now. Yes. Here the final go. lap. So power-ups come out of clowns, I think. Clowns? Is that what those are? What are those? I don't know. I can't tell. They're quite low, uh, low there's resolution. There's a box, <laughs> and then there's something on top of the box. Some sort of thing that holds Rick's the item. Rick's showing off with those tricks. Oh, John John as well with the John tricks. John landed in 100G. Yeah, so it's money. You get money. There's a lot to watch. Because oh, it costs yeah, Rick, money so Rick's to got the, the goal. Item. He's going to be... Oh, and, and jo Jeff second. Very close. Very so, cl Lindsay, very close with the third. Interesting to note. It's not so much about your positioning. It's about your final time at the and end. John's coming up coming up soon here so you, you even if like they were all there pretty we close together so not too bad john john a little behind but i mean yeah. it's the first race exactly the first one down rick taking the first place best time also award the stats on all these characters so we have rick with the best time there of 4 1435 mm -hmm. by a decent margin yeah i would say jeff with a 421 60 not far behind and Lindsay just after that with 424 three seconds off john a little behind the rest at 435 63 but that puts us into race two electric boog, goo, it's like doo, big, doo. big snowman is yep. that what it was called little penguin lost i don't remember we're gonna go Something there. Something snowman. I think it was big, big sno snowman. Big snowman. I was right. The biggest snowman snowman My memory down. is real good. We remember things. There's a balloon. Jesus. Whoa, you can do a zippy zip in this what game? What is that? How did you, how did, uh, well, I was gonna, how did you do that? <laughs> Answer me. Rick's showing off some tricks that we don't even know exist. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? I didn't know you could do the zippy zip in this game. But He's straight zipping. Yeah. How do you do that? So this is Snowboard Kids 1. There's a Snowboard Kids 2 as well on the Nintendo 64. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the one I played, but I don't remember. They're both, oh. they're both cool oh. games. Lindsay oh, Lindsay almost like, was in first and then got screwed by an icicle oh. thing. Oh, and Rick runs into oh. a jeffed up icicle ball. Did you thing. say a jeffed up icicle ball? A jeffed ball? up icicle ball, you know. <laughs> you know. You know, it happens. A classic jeffed up icicle ball. <laughs> oh, so this one only has, this has two laps, so it must be quite a bit longer. And it also has a big jump. Oh boy! Oh, oh! I was hoping for more flips. So John's got an early lead right now, which is uh, that's good for him since yeah. he came up. Uh, See if we can last, catch up on time. that uh, that extra time that was lost in the last one. Dodging and weaving through some greenery oh, here. But no, Rick's pulling ahead. Oh, what was that? A bomb? Is Lindsay in fourth. Oh wait, Jeff's in first. Oh, well, the tree stopped that. Everyone's pretty tight right now. Yeah, They're all like looking at the, the there. map there, everyone's very very close. Uh, Rick is now invisible. Oh my goodness. But now he's visible again. Oh, good flips. Very oh. nice flips. I love seeing them flips. Flips get you money, which gets you things to hit others with. And money oh, also no. does that. Oh, no. oh, oh, three of them fell down that little little ridge, oh, except for Rick. Really? Well, yeah. that gives him a lead. Yeah, although Back in it's still, one's place. still very, very close. I would assume the, the tracks probably get harder as they go as well, starting with the easiest moving towards the most challenging. Probably. I mean, this one seems a bit more tricky than the last one. Yeah, the first one kind of had that, like, this, this is a hill. This one's more like, this is a hill, but with attitude. This one's with got attitude. some hills that you could fall down. It's got some bumpy bumps and some other... I wonder if there are alternative, alternative route, routes. 
Probably. That's <laughs> Oh, that's all. Depends on if you're Good Canadian or American oh. or wherever you're from. Oh, oh the big bash. <laughs> Rick got a big bash right when he was doing the flip. Flat note. John taking the lead. I love seeing the flips. You gotta love a good flip. Everyone very smushed together. Y'all kind of. So nobody's getting a real good lead on. We're falling like terribly behind either. Yeah. Good to see. Good to see. I like a close race. Oh, John's in first, but here comes Rick. Oh, oh big wipe up by Lindsay. Oh, so, oh, no. oh, the double. Fanned into a tree. Doesn't that always happen Fanned in these kind of games? Fanned into a tree. You wipe out once and then it just starts oh, to God. snowball on you like that. You That's know what just, I mean? Oh, it's awful. It is awful. It's like I know in Mario Kart, sometimes that happens. No pun and you're just intended. like, why? <laughs> Okay, everybody's oh, kind of oh ending no. it. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, so it's off in the corner oh, this time. Oh, they're fighting! Oh, Lindsay just, like, did you Zipped see that? Zipped by everybody. Zipped yeah, right in. Yeah, very nice. Taking, uh, taking advantage of the oh, situation. Oh, John, no! That's one of the things I really like about this uh, event really... is just when everybody's all together at the end there and you're racing to get into that. You're just cramming in. Like, everyone was falling all over themselves or hitting the wall. Because it does make a and decent then Lindsay difference was like, nope. of, like, positioning whoever gets in that first, second, third, and fourth. Because yeah. you've got to wait your turn. Mm -hmm. You're not, like, crowding in there all at once. So no, sorry, kinda, Bob. like, a slight lead, but still, like, it could be anybody's game here. It's true. Where he came in first last time, it would be nice for him to kind of secure that lead a little more with mm -hmm. another first place. But, I mean, realistically... If you were in first both races and then lost horribly in the next one, mm -hmm. it's still anybody's game. That's true. Not mine. It's not mine. But Here comes I'm the not, jump. I'm not participating. And then Lindsay's right behind him. Right behind Rick. What do we got for items? Everybody except for John is holding. Well, Jeff's Rick's coming got on some the jump. bombs yep. there. Lindsay's got the ghost. Jeff and, and John uh, are also like very, very close to each other. What's Jeff got there? Is that the ice power up that oh. turns them into oh, ice? Oh, Lindsay got into first. Oh, very nice. Oh, can she keep it? Oh, something came, but it seems like it. Oh, oh no, the big the snowman. snowman on the big oh, snowman. Oh, no, I've heard all about the big snowman, but not the little one. All right, this should be interesting. Jeff has that okay. pan. I want to see if it hits everyone in front of him or not. Uh, okay, let's see. If he, if he used it. Oh. Yeah, see? Was it hit, it hit all three of them, actually. Hmm. That's interesting. Is that like a really good one? I think the pan is one oh, of the better items. Oh, and Rick. down the mountain. And down the mountain for Lindsay and Triple for down John. the mountain. That puts Rick in a good position. Oh, and then Jeff's just pulling up the second. John's got a hand, and oh, that's what the parachute oh, parasol is. Yeah, this situation. is the last, the last uh, go around, too, so. There was a decent amount of devastation that just went down there. Luckily, there's no, like, they don't have to get on the lift anymore. Oh yeah, there'll be no laps. fighting over that. That's true. Yeah, it's a bigger it's a bigger course, so it's got the less less laps. But all very close. Brick is still like still ahead, but Jeff's right behind him. You can see him. Yep. And then Lindsay can see Jeff. <laughs> they're all kind of <laughs> like they're all kind of all think John ducks can see in a row. Lindsay. They got the, all oh, wait, the ducks no, in a row. Oh wait, no, no, the changing positions. Oh no! Lindsay, Ooh, out. double wipe out. John also went down. Ooh. That might change things up a little bit here. Going off the jump. Oh, the oh. ice hit for Jeff. He's fallen down. He's very cold. So that's what ice oh, will do to you. But he's got the fan. You. That won't warm you up. No. Oh, oh, Lindsay pulling ahead again. Like it? Rick uh, got the like ice it? cubed. Getting close to the end of this one. Oh, gosh. This, oh, Everyone's this all tight. pretty tight. This I don't think tight. the times oh. are going to be too different on this one. This is, I think Lindsay might take oh, it. Jeff oh, ice. oh, my but gosh. she bonked off the ice. Oh, an upset for oh, Rick there. I missed Lindsay what happened, takes it. actually. And then, oh my goodness. Oh, there's a lot of change of positions there. Oh, yeah. what, is, what did you see when he did that? That was pretty intense. Did you see John just did a flip right before the finish line? Oh, did he? The wiped wipe out, out at the over end? The, yeah. Oh, that's the oh, way to so do it. Good. Love it. So Love what, it. What was the final positions there? Hold, hold your horses. Hold, hold your horses. horses. So Lindsay comes in on top on that one. 547. Um, 547, 82. Mm -hmm. John in second place with a 553, 90. Rick on third. Oh, they both finished with 554. Rick with 554.67. Jeff with 554.97. Very close for the third place there. Uh, that puts Rick in the lead. 10.09.02. lead, yeah. Lindsay second, 10.12.17. Jeff 10.16.57. And John 10.29.53. Pretty close. Mm -hmm. I would say it's hard yeah, to say where it's going to go. There's some positions there. Let's go to the finals. Let's see how big the last one is. Yeah, that's true. What's a sunset, sunset. rock? Is that penguins? There were penguins there. There were penguins. There's three laps. So this, so this one. is the best course so far. I had penguins. Um, oh, I like that snowman. I think um, Lindsay and Rick both got the boost there at the start. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. 
I'm that. sorry, I was thinking about penguins. You were thinking about penguins. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Hey, we oh, got man. we got we got to commentate two penguin uh races. Oh my goodness. I, like I do it. enjoy penguins, so oh. it's very appropriate. So Jeff's taking the lead here. That's interesting. If you don't have enough money for the, the clown box or whatever it is, you, you don't just bonk get, into it. Yeah, you don't get Oh you you bonk yeah, off you, it? Yeah, you bonk. Ooh, that's, that's uh that's a that's risky tricky. situation. You say you gotta keep an eye on your coins. You do, there's You're more like, penguins. Do I have enough? Uh, I don't oh. want this game. Lindsay hit the, the edge there. <laughs> I kind of want to go look oh, for this no, game. Oh no, Lindsay, no! Oh, and oh, I thought Rick was about to oh, eat. Oh, the edge is giving her a tough time there. Yeah, this one definitely seems like it's uh, so Jeff's keeping the lead for the a difficulty. while here. We got some Choco Mountain rocks oh going on here. Oh my god, I was here. just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's Choco Mountain up yeah, in here. We're, we're up on Choco Mountain. Oh, Rick's Rick's now taking the lead. How much is this game? I want to like go buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's very much money. I don't oh, think. We should, we should I could be wrong. To eBay. To eBay, in to a way. eBay. I think we did a video on this we game once on our channel, but yes. it, neither of us owned it. I think our, our friend Mac and brought it over, us. and he whooped us because he thoroughly because he was like you know Olympic level and we were yes. but casual. So it's still, still, still anybody's game in here. Close, yeah. Yeah, especially if somebody gets a good item off on someone. I feel like Rick would have to take a decent beating to not come out on top here. Because his overall score was pretty solid. That is true. They will have to kind of target him, which is not really possible in this type of game, I think. I mean, you could, but it would take some doing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. We've got the ghost around Ooh, him. I don't like this area. Rick's going through with the, the rocks. Those are stalagmites, not Because they are mighty. But they are tight to the ceiling. No, they're not tight. Yes. <laughs> oh, we're going through a cave. Very uh, dark and... Cavernous in there. Yep, yep, yep. yep, yep. Oh. oh. So this is a three lap race, and we're this is a three lap. We're yeah. almost at the end of lap one. Like the lighting makes it look like you're going on really dirty snow. Yeah, it does kind of have that like it just snowed. It snowed a couple and then days it, ago. It got a little <laughs> rainy, and the plow went by a few times. And it's just it's no longer pleasant to look at. No, it's just, it's it's just a mess. But I think it's supposed to be just the the fact that it's like sunset. P probably. Or dawn, maybe, but it's probably got that sunset. Lushy look to it. Nah, it's, it's a time of day. <laughs> There's the good snow. That's the pattern. <laughs> oh! Why did Wipe he do the flip? Rick Ready? did a flip randomly. Rick, he wanted him. more money. Fair. <laughs> oh. oh! Oh no! They both missed the lift. Get yeah, the gets, lift. Jeff goes in first. Lindsay second. And, and John's John coming up behind there, but he's getting it. Coming up. Is he going to get it? Oh, oh no. the bonk. Almost It's hard to it. tell, too, because like, if you're not familiar with the course and you're coming up to it really fast, you're like, is it on the left? Is it on the right? Is it in the center? Is it, Can it be in the center? I don't know. I, I think the first race, it wasn't on the left or the right. Right, yeah. not the rice. Yeah. So you're like, I just got to be quick. <laughs> and sometimes turning quick is hard. <laughs> on a snowboard? I would say so. On a, on a kid's snowboard? Yeah. A snowboard with a kid on top. Yeah. Oh, what, what was John? Oh, has John decided ju that he just doesn't anymore? I think... What is he I, doing? I'm not sure what's going on with John. Okay, oh, he's, he's I think back. he just got stuck. I think I he got he just, lost. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. We all get lost sometimes. Everything's cool. <laughs> I was a little worried. It seemed like he lost his way. So how are the positions looking here? We still have Rick in front. John Rick in front, but I think uh, Lindsay's just behind him. Not far off, no. And then Jeff a little Jeff behind a there. Little bit back there. And then John just got panned. Rick has got some money in his possession. He's carrying. Yeah, that makes me a little nervous. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to. Well, let maybe it know weighs him that. down. Maybe it makes him slow. I don't think it does actually. I, don't think, I, don't I think money makes you go faster. Know. You know, like in real. Life. I don't know if it does it in this game. I don't know either. I'm just <laughs> oh, okay, I thought you were being serious. <laughs> I'm in just in You're like, in you general. know, like in Mario Kart, it probably works the same. No, like in real life, you got money, you go faster. Through life. Nice. Right? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a lovely course. Oh, look at that snowman. A horse. Course. Oh, a course. Okay. okay, so yeah, yeah, Rick and Lindsay are pretty close because they. Oh, and yeah, yeah, so Jeff's pretty close too because they all pa just passed the snowman like right. one after the other. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, look at those penguins. And it's still got two more, or one and a half more laps. Big jump into the cavern. Oh, but oh, the bonky pan, pan thingy. What is it for like? Why is Rick invisible? Oh, was so, he smushed? It might have been the invincibility frames after the smushing. Yeah, a couple uh, people got panned. Gotcha. Jeff takes an untimely oh, no! drop Lindsay, off. No! The, and Lindsay also takes into an untimely drop off the cliff. That's uh, 
It's not ideal. You don't want that. You know that. what? That seeing Ooh, seeing that kind of brings back flashbacks of me <laughs> falling into that chasm way too many times. Yes. I keep wanting to say eat shit. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> we'll find out. I don't know. It's one airs. of our favorite phrases. <laughs> That's what you do when you snowboard. You, you can, Rick? yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought it was over. Oh, I, I, oh, I uh, thought Rick was going to hit that, but kind of just slid in I there. I forgot there's another lap left. I was ready to call it oh, there. Don't call it. It's <laughs> not... Final no. lap, everybody. Oh, well, Rick's got, got a pretty substantial lead. He's feeling pretty confident right now. People are going to have to hit him quite a bit. He might have to break a bone or something. Okay, to... Jeff, got the, Jeff got the lift pretty good not this time. Not that I'm encouraging that. Oh, and John, John got the lift? Everybody, I think everybody got the lift pretty good First on that one. First try on the lifts. That'll lift Unless the spirits. I missed one. It's a lot to watch. Three, it's like four different screens. <laughs> You're right. It is four. It's exactly four different screens. Remember four player split screen? I'm seeing it right now and I'm a little nostalgic for oh. it. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I was immediately like, we need to go buy this game. <laughs> He's going to run over I do have this. a soft, soft spot for those <laughs> old coach party games like this where you'd play with your friends. And Either like four players split screen or just like you could be on the same screen. It's like the frame rate was bad, draw distance was terrible, we didn't care, we were having a Ooh. good time. Snowboarding so down so a mountain places ghosts. right now? We got Rick still in first. I think John, John and Jeff are kind of like back and forth in it a bit here. John's got lots of money now. And, oh no, Lindsay pulled Ooh, ahead to second. What was the double bonk there? There was a lot going on there. I, just, I couldn't keep track of it all. Yeah, there's so I was a lot like looking pain. down, I was like, oh, hey, Lindsay's in second. Then I look up and some people are down. <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite catch up. Uh, and then Rick's just like, down, later. But, yeah, Rick's got that safety lead. Uh, he's got a bit of a, yeah, he's got a bit of a safety He's lead, in a yeah. good spot. You, in these kind of games, the last place you want to be is in the middle. That's yeah. the worst place to be. It's like you get screwed by somebody in the front and in the back. If you get a healthy healthy lead, then you don't get bothered as much. If you're in fourth, you get all the good items. But the people in the middle are the ones that get the, the crap into the stick. Any other items in this, I wonder, that you can leave behind that are bad? I think there is. I'm wondering if Maybe you can, like... Maybe it's that ice cube. I've I think it might be things. that ice cube. I thought that shot forward. I wonder if it's like a Mario Kart Not where you can shoot one. forward or backwards. There was a different one. Different ice. Got yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's one that you hit maybe and then you turn into like a little crystal. Yeah, okay. Whereas oh, that one I, I think is saying. a shooting one that Lindsay has. It's like a trap. I think. It looks like a shooting one. But supposedly maybe they oh. both do the same thing. John Snow got snowman. Man. But he's on a straightaway. He's so it's going, pretty good. It didn't even phase <laughs> no, him. No, he's like, nope, this is cool. This is, this is my <laughs> Let default. The pan. So I like being a snowman. Oof. Oh, we got a good shot of what it was ever on top of that. It looks like a dog. It wasn't a clown a at dog? all. I think it might have been a dog. It is like a lucky cat or something. A lucky dog. A lucky oh, dog. that's oh! a... Ooh, that's great. And, uh, John up yeah, there. Yeah. I... Jeff uh, almost hit the wall there, but kind of just made it work, I guess. I think the same thing happened to John. Oh. They were like veering off to the left or the right? <laughs> yeah, John went left. Did Jeff go right? Jeff went left. Rick went win. And Rick is the winner. The goal. I believe that puts him in gold medal position. So everybody else is fairly close together. So I mean, if anybody gets a good item, but it doesn't look like there's any items on this on this it's area the last here. Bit of the course. Yeah, Everybody's it looks like there's not much we can do. Doing their thing. No. Um, so Lindsay's oh, gonna Lindsay take second. Items, yes, Lindsay in second. Oh, oh. And somebody's mad. And then Jeff they hit and the then John people. right after. Oh, like, very, very close, close together at the end there. I believe those are the games. Three races, uh, a happy looking Rick at the end there, dancing it up. I want to see the final standings. Well, let's look at the final standings then because we're going to look at them right now. Uh, the final standings, Rick with a final time of 1834.58. Should we look at the current ones though? Sure. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, Rick had uh, 825.57, a pretty, pretty good lead on everyone else. Uh, Lindsay with an 844.12, also good. And then we have Jeff with 847.50, and then John with an 848.90. The, the last two are very, very close together. Very close at the end there, which puts the final standings. Rick with the gold at 1834.58. Lindsay not too far behind with 1856.28. Mm -hmm. Jeff in the third with the bronze for 1904.07. And John, unfortunately, trailing in the end there with the 1918.43. That's, uh, that's the final standings for this round. Very good racing all around. And that puts us at the end of this event it's been a been a good time 
Thank you all for having us on the games again. Thank you. And uh, some final standings there. We have Tier de los Hermanos Hook with five gold medals. One silver medal. And three bronze. Mm-hmm. Imperium Ludum with four gold medals. Four, four silver, silver medals. And two bronze. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with two gold medals. Three silver. And three bronze. You betcha stand, unfortunately, with zero gold medals so far. But three silver. And three bronze. Another one. And that puts Rick with the most gold medals at four. And Jeff and Dave both of Hook with two. And a bunch of other stats probably as well. We've been Game Face. Yes, and tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be cross-country skiing. Oh, that sounds cool. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to come back and watch that. I like skiing. Thanks for watching, everybody. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Good afternoon, evening, morning, whenever you happen to be watching this, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Retro Roulette's very own Anthony, and today I am joined by Photogenic Justin. How are you doing today, Justin? I am happy to be here, Anthony, and I'm also happy to be a commentator for The Games. All right. We represent a YouTube channel called Retro Roulette. It's highly popular, extremely well-reviewed. Uh, we've got uh, sub numbers and comments like you wouldn't believe. And Justin here represents a couple other things. Why don't you tell us about that, Justin? Thank you, Anthony. I am Photogenic Justin, also known as the co-host for Xenochat, your podcast for anything Xeno Gears, Xeno Saga, and Xenoblade related. You can find us on Spotify. And if you, for whatever reason, don't like hearing my voice and would rather listen to content written by me, you can check me out on Operation Rainfall, which is a great site for anything niche gaming related we write about niche game news and also about anime as well fantastic yes i'm going to actually be joining uh, xeno chat very shortly myself and i'm very excited to be doing that do check out uh, retro roulette and xeno chat as well as operation rainfall now that out of the way uh, for the 12th event of the games, cross-country skiing. Runners will be competing against one another in Blizzard Man Stage from the NES game Mega Man 6. And as soon as each runner's feet hit the ground, time begins as they take as long as they require in order to traverse the tundra of Blizzard Man's home, the Frozen Island, and defeat the Master of Snow himself. Runners will have their default set of three lives to start with, and may use as many continues as are necessary to clear the stage. And to make things a bit more difficult, they must go in without any special weapons, including Blizzard Man's weakness, Flame Blast. And everyone loves ice physics, so for those asking how this is a cross-country skiing event, well, Mega Man sure is traveling far in the snow, and his opponent is a snowball-shaped robot who happens to be a gold medal skier himself. Indeed. This event's participants are CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, Dave of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, John of Ubechistan, and Rick of Imperium Ludum. Our contestants will be facing off against Blizzard Man as you heard from Anthony. His stage is a fairly simple one. It is definitely one that you can take on first if you so desire. And Blizzard Man himself has won three gold medals in the Winter Robot Olympics. Despite the fact that he likes skiing, he actually hates snowboarding. Bit of a fun piece of trivia. And we're off with CJ. All right. And CJ starts by taking out a big walrus bot. Mm -hmm. And then waiting for a couple other weaknesses to get exposed. Ooh, but he takes a hit. Indeed, he takes a hit. Yes. The little seals here, they uh, like to keep you on your toes. But once you face off against them, you'll be you'll be coming across one of the little time bombs. We're going to be seeing a couple more of these throughout the stage. These are very tricky. He's going to take the top path. An interesting choice to take the top path, considering that there will be some time bombs up ahead. So he is going to face a little bit of a penalty, and he takes a health pickup. In Mega Man, it's a bit weird to pick, take a health pickup because the, the action will pause for a couple seconds, so that will cost him some time. But he can still make it up, and he's dropping down and fighting the curling robots. As I have to say, some... I am very happy that you're here because you have played <laughs> these games uh, upwards of countless times, and indeed, I don't think I have ever played this one. I've played uh, several Mega Man games, but I think I stopped. It was either at four or five, but uh, mm-hmm. this one I know for a fact I have not seen before. 
Now, All right, so CJ got, got through what was probably the hardest room of this level. He's inching forward because there is a shield robot and there will be another curling robot that's going to come up right now. There it is. And he gets it with a charge shot. Now, once he gets down the ladder, he's about to get to the first of two squids in this level. You actually don't have to fight the squids. In fact, he's doing just that. He's using the damage boost to get past him and go down the ladder and over to the submarine. The, the health is not looking too segments. sharp there, so... He'll have to be careful to avoid uh, mm -hmm. dying and uh, getting sent back a, a ways. All right, he took down the um, the ca the sniper. Oh, not the sniper Joe, but the cannon Joe uh, with East right there. He's got another one. He's gonna take that hit. That hit is really hard to dodge. It gets you right on your feet. Yeah, Oof. he's taking a lot of hits. Oh, and he bites and the that's dust. A death. All right. Well, hopefully right, that doesn't but send he him back. A checkpoint. So. Yes, luckily right he did hit that checkpoint, and he has not been sent to back. He is at the submarine. Mm -hmm. So one thing that's interesting about Mega Man, as I mentioned before, you can damage boost to save some time. However, if you pick up a health up, that will actually cost you some time as well because the action will pause as your health is being restored. So you really have to pick and choose where you want to do your damage boost where you Ooh. don't. And he hits the spikes again. Oh, that's rough. That he does not indeed. have the power adapter, so he wouldn't really be able to get past that ice block right there. When you're just playing as normal Mega Man without any um, of the special weapons, you kind of just want to run through the segment. You don't want to spend too much time uh, trying to fight these guys, or uh, also you don't want to be in a wrong place at the wrong time as a submarine goes up and down like we're seeing right here. It really kind of controls the pace. In fact, this area is probably going to make or break a lot of the runs we're going to see today. I, I would take it that those spikes up top are also uh, going to result in an instant death there. Is that correct? Indeed, they are. All right. Well, so they didn't call it in 10 hard for nothing. Mm -hmm. And once he gets above the ladder here, he will face the second of the two squids. He has a lot of health, so he can just run past it if he wants to save some time. But that is going to cost him. In fact, as he's doing just that. And now he's at the final part of the stage where he's got a couple time bombs. This looks a lot more difficult than it actually is, but you still need to be careful. Yep, you want to jump off that last time bomb so you can miss the explosion and then get through the boss gate. And we're about to get to the Blizzard Man battle. All right, and here is the man of the hour, Blizzard Man. His he starts by doing simple. a Sonic the Hedgehog spin yes. dash at Mega Man. But the, the tricky part about Blizzard Man is that you don't want to get caught in that corner. You mean like how he's okay. caught, currently caught in that corner? Exactly. You want to jump over him when he does that rolling attack. The little um, snowflakes he throws at you is the Blizzard attack. Uh, they're pretty easy to dodge, but oh, this Ooh, is a little bit too good. Oh, he man, bites the he dust bites the again. Dust. That's got to be rough. Mm-hmm. And he game overs. <laughs> All right, CJ, you can try that again. CJ is going to give it the start another the run. Level. Currently, CJ's time is at four minutes and forty-five seconds for those at home keeping score. And uh, he's got a better understanding, I think, now of how the stage is going to work, and uh, mm -hmm. he'll probably do a bit better this run, or at least I'm hoping he does. Indeed. I mean, these games are not easy. If if you know, you're at home thinking to yourself, oh, wow, he, I can't believe he wiped like that. You have to understand, these games are, are known for their brutal difficulty and uh, just in general being very unforgiving. So, yeah. uh, you know, cut the guy some slack. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the thing with this level is, casually, it's really not that bad. However, in a race or a speedrun environment, this level's complex. Because there's a lot of things that will control the pace at which you're moving in. Yes, right? I can see that. And if you're not ready for that, then you can really get screwed. Another thing about Mega Man 6 compared to the other NES games is that you cannot jump out of a slide. Which makes this particular room a little bit trickier than it otherwise would have been. As you're going to see, we got some more curling robots. There's another one that's going to show up right now. And he takes it out with a charge shot, gets the extra life. He's waiting for that shield robot so that he can get it behind with a charge shot. And yeah, he's, he's taking his time. Sometimes going, uh, you know the old expression, slow and steady wins the race. Mm-hmm. 
Yep, he does not have any of the power adapters, so he cannot get so they cannot get past that ice block, right? And right now, uh, they got rid of the curling bot and they're going down the stairs over to the first squid. It's looking like he's opting to once again damage boost past the squid. Mm -hmm. And is now re-entering the checkpoint zone where he will be contending with the dreaded submarine. Yeah. It's very risky to damage pass against both squids because you have to deal with all of this and you could potentially take a lot of damage right before you face Blizzard Man. So you really gotta pick and choose where and when you're going to damage boost. Yep, Cannon Joe taking him down a peg again. Dodging that bullet nicely, all right. So if he really wants to play it risky, he can slide through this. Yep, there he is. And then right over the time bombs and up into the ladder to the next screen. This screen's fairly simple. Just jump over the time bombs and you'll get to the next squid. Alright, and it looks like he is going to damage boost past the squid. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wanted to, but he took a hit and figured since he was so close, he might as well. Yep. Now, he yep. is Otherwise, approaching Iceman. He has not died once yet, so it certainly seems that taking his time this time around has paid off. <laughs> Indeed. All right, All right and so here we have Iceman again doing his dramatic well, entrance. Well, Blizzard Man this time. Blizzard Ice Man, Man, I'm would sorry. Be another Ice Man is from what? <laughs> Mega Man One, right? That would be Mega Man One. Yes. I See, I was actually getting confused because I was like, I saw him and I was like, well, well, where's his is like, you know, fuzzy coat and everything like that. And then I came to realize that uh, Doctor Wily is running out of ideas and decided to just call this one. <laughs> Ooh. And he takes a hit. That corner, I'm telling you, you can't get stuck in that corner. Otherwise, you're in for a real bad time. Da 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 da. <laughs> All and right. also, another and thing with Mega Man 6. New, he, uh, he seems Indeed. to be opting for the corner. Mm -hmm. And as I was about to say with Mega Man 6. Um, you are spending some extra time waiting for the bosses to come in because they have to do the little flashy entrance with the little lightning flashes. It's cute, but it does take up time. Come on, CJ. Mm-hmm. He's almost got yeah. it. I think this is the run. This could be it. All right, good. And he takes Blizzard it out. Time at nine, nine minutes and eight roll. seconds. Perfect. Yep, Blizzard Man decided to not roll right there. I think CJ was hoping that he would just sit there and use the ice attack, and he was able to take him out. Currently, we have uh, CJ in at 908. Up next, we're going to be seeing Dave. All right, Dave, show us what you got. All right, and the so clock is Dave's, ticking. Dave comes out of the gate swinging, immediately starts rushing towards the right and making. I'm taking a small hit. Those walrus things seem to be tricky to get around. Yeah, he's missing a couple of those shots, but it's okay. He can still do good. So, I'm really curious to see... Okay, so it looks like people are opting for the top route. Which is interesting to me, because you do have to face the time bombs, and that just adds extra time. That really does seem to add extra time. However, I think because of the the, the way that you have to ration so much damage in this, uh, in this level, it might more or less be necessary. Mm-hmm. If I were doing this, I know I'd go for the top route. But that's just me. Ah, oh, nice he just slide. decides to slide past a lot of the enemies. Very good. All right. All yep. Right. Oh he man, he got he got hit with the respawn, but that could work in your favor, as you saw right there. That shield enemy just disappeared, and he takes damage from the other one. This room is just cruel in a speed run. It is cruel, but I will say he is making excellent time. If he can keep up this pace, then he's gonna be. Uh, coming in first. So he's opting to actually take out the squid. Okay, not bad. I think it's because he had to but he has to budget that damage. And again, he's still making incredible time. The Mega Man right. Charge Buster was first introduced in Mega Man 4 or 5? It was Mega Man 4. It was 4, okay. Yep.
All right. All right. Getting on top of the submarine. Taking their sweet time to avoid those spikes. Not bad. All right. Now just get over to time bombs and then we get into the next room, which is kind of like a safe room, really. There's not a whole lot there that can really mess you up. No, there doesn't really seem to be. It uh, just seems to be some very <laughs> simple, basic parkour. Oh, so he's waiting for the charge shot to come up so that he can use it on the squid. Well, he doesn't have a whole lot of health left, so if he were to damage, mm -hmm. try to damage boost past the squid, it could oh, cost him. Oh, alright, he takes two hits against the squid. Alright, so... He could still beat Blizzard Man. It's it's not too hard to do him without taking damage, but he does. It's, they do need to be down on their A game in order for that to happen. All right. Oh, all right. Just barely missing the explosion right there. And all right, Dave is about to face Blizzard Man. Yeah, we have no idea. He might do a no hit mm -hmm. run on Blizzard Man. We we're about to find out. If they can do a no-hit run, he's on track to be in first place. And, and it is not a no-hit run. Yep. Unfortunately. But that said, he is right outside the better. boss chamber. Yes. And he is still clocking in at three minutes. If he beats Blizzard Man this run, that will put Dave in first place. Yeah, you gotta pay real close attention to what Blizzard Man's doing. Blizzardman does telegraph a lot of the moves that they're doing, and uh, you want to be ready because sometimes Blizzardman can start off by just rolling at you, and then you're just going to immediately take damage if you're not ready for it. Like right here, Blizzardman keeps keeps up with the rolling, and Dave is uh, taking some hits. Mm. Wow, those rolls are vicious. They are vicious. If you're not ready to jump, you're going to take damage. Oof, those uh, snowflakes keeping them down. All right, and that is a death. That is a death, and look at that! Look at that Blizzard man's health, though. So close. If you didn't see it, Justin, he only had two bars left. Mm-hmm. One more Buster charged Buster shot, and that would have been the run. All right, let's give this one more shot. I think he's. I think Dave has one life remaining before he would have to start the stage over, and yep. uh, we'll see how this goes. And you do not want to get a game over and have to continue because that is just a lot of extra time. It's not looking good for Dave. Mm -mm. Yeah, everyone's trying to get that corner. There are some Mega Man bosses that are very susceptible to the corner where you can kind of cheese them into doing the same move multiple times. People who speedrun Mega Man X3 know exactly what I'm talking about. And, ooh, that was oh, close! Oh, so close! Just a split second away. If, if Dave could have just landed a slide, he would have dodged it. That stinks. Alright, well. He's gonna give it another shot. His time is currently sitting at five minutes. Mm-hmm. And 14 seconds. Yeah, take advantage of the slide in these levels. You move a lot faster when you do that. And again, I can't stress this enough, folks. It's easy <laughs> for Justin and I to just kind of sit here and commentate. Especially for Justin, since he's, you know, played these games a million times. But these games are tricky. Yeah. So, uh, they are, they do, are. They're not easy. Do cut our, uh, our runners here some slack. Mm-hmm. They're playing very well. All right, so, so Dave's going to take the bottom path. And get rid of all the ceiling walkers. All right. See, I think I, that, I think him having to dodge those shots, it worked out to be about the same. Take out the curl, the curling robots down here, and then we get into the best room of the entire stage. <laughs> all right, take one of those out. Another one's coming. Good. Yeah, you gotta be careful with the way the screen scrolls, because sometimes enemies can respawn, or sometimes they can even despawn. We saw an instance of both of those just now. Alright, down like the ladder, damage into the boosting first squid. past everything. You do gotta be careful with the squid there, because that ice will just move you closer and closer to the squid, and it's very easy for you to run into them. So if you do opt to um, take the squid down with your Mega Buster, 
remember that. Just try not to slide towards the squid too much, because otherwise you will take damage. Right, the other cannon. Oof. Yeah, that was looking really rough. Yeah, I, I, that's I, I, a very I, tricky jump to make. The only other option they would have had was to go down and kind of hop up and shoot them, and that would have just costed them some time as well. They really weren't in a good spot there. No, I agree. The one big uh, little concession on the submarine is that at least there isn't a whole lot of ice platforms here. Otherwise, this part would be. A lot more brutal. Ooh, that was a nice Good save Lord Almighty. by day. I could see the moment where he froze like a deer in the headlights <laughs> and then snapped out of it just at the right <laughs> second. That or Dave just played us all and flexed like no one has ever flexed before in the games. You also got to be careful when you're you're going to this fight with a charge shot because you don't want that charge shot to hit one of the ice cubes, otherwise you're just going to waste it, and then you're going to be pissed. <laughs> nice. I love how they're all just completely flexing by standing just outside the explosion radius. Narrowly avoiding them by mere pixels. Mm-hmm. Alright, and here we are once again with Blizzard Man. I don't know what it is about Blizzard Man's design that makes me chuckle, but there's just something kind of cute about him. Yeah, just a giant snowball. Wearing a Santa hat. <laughs> and some skis. Oh. Alright. Doing a good job with those charge shots. You also gotta be careful, because every time you take damage, your charge resets. Dave is breaking the nine minute mark, and he, Dave is officially in second place now. That's correct. Oof. Very nice. Ooh, he, they've slid in the wrong direction right there. Right idea, just... <laughs> you're looking uh, the wrong way. Just wrong execution. Yep. Alright, and... We have another roll attack, followed by immediately another roll attack. Opting to take some damage, give him some damage over nothing at all. I mm. think this is the run, Justin. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, there is it is over. Time at 9 minutes and 57 seconds, officially dropping Dave into second place. Alright, up next is John. Good luck, John. Blow us away, John. Well, I've got a good feeling about John, Justin. Yep. I can tell right. that this competitor Not is out on. here to play. Oh, they they just barely missed those shots on those little copter robots. It's gonna cost a couple seconds, but John can still make it make it work. Taking down the curler bots, really really good. Another one's about to show up in a second. Yep, jump over the shields. Nice slide. Do another Very good. Bot. Ops to take the damage. Another reason why this, this room is hell, because it slows down sometimes. Yeah, that's, the, the, uh, that's the NES's processing power for you. Mm hmm. Alright. John opting to kill the squid. And very nice. He does nice. so very efficiently. I think he took that out faster than most runners could damage boost past him. Alright. And now he's already only a minute and 11 seconds into his run, and he is already on the submarine. Oh, man. That, that cannon Joe is really rough. It's got that perfect placement of just mm -hmm. between okay. and you. <laughs> Boy, if I really he had Blizzard Man's uh, weakness, then that wouldn't be so bad, because it arcs downwards and you'd be able to hit it no problem. But 
with just the buster, you gotta be a little bit more creative. Boy, I really hope that we're allowed to say bad words, because if we're not, I may have just flarped up. <laughs> but Maybe it might have been worth it for the a joke. funny sound effect. Yeah, just, uh, you know, bleep it out. It's funnier when you bleep it out, right, right yeah. folks? <laughs> yeah, put a little dolphin sound over it. There you go. <laughs> You know, uh, back on Retro Roulette, when we when we were going to try and start censoring ourselves, uh, Sam was going to put a Kremlings uh, UGG over um, <laughs> all of our bad words, which I thought was absolutely hysterical. All right, and here we are at all Blizzard right. Man, uh, and John currently is sitting comfortably at four bars, but let's see... Oh! Okay. So knowing that he's probably not going to be able to do a no-hit run, he opts to not waste any time yeah. on the attempt, take the life hit, and then reset his life bar. And now here's the actual attempt yep. on the boss. Honestly, that's fu that's fair. That is fair. That, that, In my opinion, that's a legitimate strategy. I see he just damage boosted past the boss by sliding through him after getting nice. hit by the icicle attack. Oh, this is absolutely going to be his run. Very good. All yeah. right. <laughs> the yep. irony in John it will be if he actually <laughs> takes less than four <laughs> bars of damage. Yep. Once well, you understand well, Blizzard Man's pattern, it's not so bad. And there it's we down. Go. That's time. Three minutes and nine seconds, blowing the other two competitors completely out of the water, and that's putting John in first place with CJ in second at nine minutes and eight seconds, and Dave at nine minutes and what was it, fifty-seven? Mm-hmm. All right, Rick. Let's see how Rick can measure up to that. That was a wonderful performance by John. All right, and Rick is also coming out of the gate quite strongly. He makes the mm -hmm. timed jumps, goes and opts for the top route, takes the damage, oh. restores the damage, takes yeah, the damage that's... again. Oof, that's rough. Comes up to the first curling bot, takes out the second one. Jump, slide, right, slide. Underneath slide. Both shield robots. Nice. Oh, it's gonna Very be. Very nice. I'm All getting right. the feeling it's gonna be close between Rick and John. Mmm. Took a lot of hits over there. Alright, we got the first squid. Oh. Okay, nice. Boy, the enemies in this game don't drop uh, health restorations like they used to, huh? Oh, they do. Just the RNG. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all these runs, and I don't think I've seen a single life pellet. Oh, Ooh, that was very you see how clever. He dispatched that enemy. Oh, that's how you do it. There you go, Rick. Now yeah, you're he's thinking. showing us a thing or two. All right, a minute and 38 seconds, and he is already almost at the boss. Here comes the second squid. He opts to take it out with oh, violence. Oh, man. All right, took took a hit there, but it, that's fine. And All we right, are so now at the room do? right outside the boss chamber. All right. What is Rick going to do on this boss? Rick has about a minute to, to beat this boss. He's got four. Wow, he's in the same exact position John was first time. Let's see if he does the same thing. Yes, he does. He yes. opts to take the loss on the one life so he could go in, damage boost. It's all going to come down to how quickly he can dispatch this boss. Mm hmm. Oh, man, this is crazy. This is. It's, it's right down to the money. I'm very excited. I'm on the edge of my seat. All right, let's see what Rick can do. Lands that first shard shot. Got the second one coming. There it is. Nice. Dodge the little snowflakes. Get it. Oh, just barely missed a charge shot. All right, we got another charge shot coming. Lands it. Perfect. Jumps over to roll. Lands another one. Awesome. Dodge the snowflakes. Lands another shot. Good. Dodge the snowflakes. Lands another shot. Good. Lands another shot. Jumps over. And oh! there it is. Two minutes of beautiful. Rick takes the win. All right. Okay, so, our final standings, Rick, 
First place, 2 minutes and 55 seconds. John, second place, 3 minutes and 9 seconds. And then CJ, 9 minutes and 8 seconds. And then finally, Dave, 9 minutes and 57 seconds. Excellent job to everyone involved. I uh, would take my hat off and tip it at you if I was wearing a hat right now. Um, I have to be totally honest with you. All four <laughs> of you did spectacular. Infinitely better than I could have done after several hours of practice. So yes. all of you, pat yourselves on the back. You did great. And uh, sleep well at night knowing that you put on an amazing show for many people, many viewers at home. Justin, any final words? That was an amazing show. Congratulations to Rick. Congratulations to all of our runners today. They all performed excellently here. The Mega Man games are never easy, and yeah, they, they killed it. All right. Yeah, quite literally, they, ki <laughs> they killed uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the boss, uh, Blizzard Man. That's it. Uh, I believe we need to go over some metal counts. Uh, we're going to go with Imperium Ludrum, currently in first place. Five gold medals, four silver medals, and two bronze medals. And then, uh, Justin, why don't you take this next one? We've got Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with five gold medals, one silver, and three bronze. And then in third, we got Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with two gold, three silver, and four bronze. And finally, in fourth place, we have You Betcha Stand with no gold, four silver, and three bronze. All right, and then I'm just going to run down the, uh, the list of players and their medals real quick. We have in first place Rick with five gold, two silver, zero bronze. Uh, Jeff with two gold, one silver, and one bronze. Dave with two gold, zero silver, one bronze. CJ with one of each medal. Felice with one gold, zero silver, and one bronze. Peter with one gold and then no silver and no bronze medals. John with no gold, but four silver and two bronze. Lindsay with no gold, two silver, two bronze. Sarah with zero gold, one silver, two bronze. Nick with zero gold, one silver, zero bronze. And Jose and Diego tied with each holding one bronze medal. Uh, we'd like to uh, take this moment to thank you for watching and as always uh, make sure you return for tomorrow's event ice hockey and uh, it says here in our instructions we're allowed to sign off however we like and uh, they thank us for commentating so the pleasure is all ours we Indeed. thoroughly enjoy doing this and we would be very excited to come back and do this for the next games event uh, and uh, I guess I'll sign off by saying this is Retro Roulette's very own Anthony, signing off. See you next time, gamers. Hello, friends, and welcome back to The Games. I'm Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie, and I'm bringing you hockey. And what we have laid out for our contestants is a wonderful round-robin tournament of the Sega Genesis Classic, NHL 94. In this event, each player will face off against one another in a full round-robin tournament, so everybody plays everybody else, and wins and losses will determine the seeding. After the round-robin has concluded, the third and fourth-ranked teams will compete in a bronze medal match, and the first and second place will go at it for the gold. If necessary, we will do any playoffs to separate any of the teams out, um, and in today's event, our participants are John of Ubechistan, representing by the Tampa Bay Lightning, CJ and Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, as the New Jersey Devils, Rick of Imperium Ludum piloting the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, and Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, represented by the Chicago Blackhawks. Settle in, friends, as this is going to be a long one, and let's get to our first match. And getting ready for puck drop in our first match here, Daisy Baby Bitch territory going from the top of your screen to the bottom, with You Betcha Stan going from bottom to top. Quickly in the corner, but Daisy Baby Bitch Territory navigates down the ice, is stopped by You Betcha Stan, and is moving up the ice. John lofts a lazy shot in, picked up in the back by CJ. Ooh, steal by John, good shot in him, but the goalie's got it. Bouncing around out of the neutral zone, but it seems CJ is picked up on defense and moving in on attack. 
tic-tac-toe play. Passed out by the goalie and sent down the ice. So we've got a lot of games to play here, so we'll go over some of the settings that we're using. The controls are... Well, there's a lot. But needless to say, in this game, you are given the option for passes, shots, one-timers were added. You can completely control the goalie, but I believe they have it set on auto. We've turned off penalties, injuries, and line changes. All were wonderful functions at the time, but would just slow us down. It's been a good back and forth game so far. This is our first go, and the attack has been rebuffed. It's a failed clear by John. Picked up by CJ, sent back around to the defense. Regrouping for the attack. And CJ fires the puck in, picks it up behind the net. Oh, but it's stolen by John. Given up again. Oh, probably a trip, but we don't have penalties. John still manages to get the puck out. A steal by CJ. Circling around, but there are four defenders in between you and the net. Not going to happen. Tough back and forth in the neutral zone. Manages to get the puck away from the goalie, but I think the goalie's got it covered up. Sends it back out. Oh, but a steal at the top of the crease. Oh, couldn't clear it to that. Oh, almost a breakaway situation there. CJ manages to regroup. Shoots the puck in. Nothing doing there. And John ices the puck. Actually, no, that was not icing. It was probably went out of the arena. So the faceoff is going to be in the attacking zone for CJ. Wins the puck off the faceoff. Goes in on the goalie. Gets the rebound, but nothing doing. Find the puck. There you go, John. John coming out. Takes a shot on net. Making sure the goalie's awake. CJ tries to pass it ahead. Stolen by John. Is sent right back. And that was icing. It was shot from the wrong side of the halfway point. Icing, if the puck crosses two red lines. You've iced the puck. This does not apply if you are on the penalty kill, but again, no penalties. Goalie sends it out. John tries to pass it across, but passes it directly to CJ. CJ, back and forth, trying to come up. Stalling in the neutral zone, waiting for more bodies. Goes in on the attack. Fires a shot just right in the middle, hoping someone can clear out the trash. But John sends it down the ice and ices the puck. Face off again. No one wins that one cleanly. John ices the puck again, assuming though. But the goalie touched it. No icing if the goalie touches the puck. Takes a shot. Goalie's awake. Sends it right out. CJ on the attack. Back in the middle. Bounces off. That sound signals we have about one minute left in the period. Typical hockey game. Three periods. I believe they have it set at ten minute periods, but they are not ten actual minutes. Thank God, or this video would be quite long. Passing back and forth. My CJ, nothing doing. Six seconds on the clock. And that's the end of period one. And we've clicked through right into period two. The teams have switched sides, so John is now coming down your screen. And CJ goes in right on the goalie. Quick out by the goalie. Gets leveled. Picked up again by CJ. John clears it out. John seems to be clearing much faster in this game. Able to stay out of the attacking zone. No one touches the puck. Oh, but John gets it behind the net, clears the icing. CJ getting a handle on going up the screen. And John sends it back down. Assuming the goalie doesn't touch it, and John icing the puck. Attacking zone face off for CJ. Waiting for puck drop. There it is. And sends it in on the goalie this time. No icing. Not sure why we have a face-off there, but we do. CJ clears the puck to nobody. But gets their own rebound. 
John sends a puck around the back dangerously as no one of his team is there. We have an injury. Lemieux is out for a period. This game was quite a bit injury happy. Um, so this is the third game in the NHL series by EA. Which was the second sport game that they opted to make after John Madden football. Ooh, good stop by the goalie from Uvechistan. Regrouping on defense, trying to get an attack going. Gets cleaned from behind. No penalty. And CJ trying to get some more attackers. Moves up the ice. Takes a good shot and then gets leveled by the goalie. John with a quick turnaround. Tries the slap shot. Nothing doing. John flicks it back. Icing was on the wrong side of the halfway point. So this is the third game in the series. The first was NHL Hockey. The second, uh, NHL PA or NHL Players Association Hockey. And then this, NHL 94. Oh, CD with a great attack, but completely rejected by the goalie. John picks it up, takes a swipe, misses. Oh, but gets it from the goalie. Sends it around behind. Picks it up again. There's a scrum in front of the net. Oh, CJ has the puck. Had a potential for a three-on-none breakaway. John tries some messy attacks. The goalie tries to clear it. Get back in net, buddy. And CJ on the attack. Tries to take it in all himself. So another shot right in the goalie's face. Come on, open net. Oh, just over the crossbar. John on the return. Not sure what that ding was. Way over the crossbar. A lot of mustard on that shot. What the hell was that? Watching this game with no penalties is a little barbaric, but it's also kind of fun. Oh, shot. Goalie couldn't get to it, but it wasn't going in anyway. Oh, his own player got in the way. John on the comeback. CJ moving it back up the ice. Sends it into the corner. His player runs into the goalie? Anyway, it's icing. Attacking zone faceoff for John. CJ manages to win the faceoff cleanly. Goes in. Nice tic-tac-toe play, but misses the net wide right. Brings the puck back on side. Oh. Goalie has it. Passes it ahead. John has a great attacking shot here. Ah, yes. That bong was the charging up of a slap shot. That bong was the one minute left in the period. Still scrumming for it in front of the net. John, 30 seconds left on this attack. The goalie has it, clears it up the ice. CJ going in for the shot. Pestering the goalie, nothing doing. And that's the end of the second period. After two periods, we're still tied nil-nil. And we're back with the third period. We've switched sides again. So once again, CJ will be coming down the screen. John with a nice passing play. Doesn't do anything. Goalie is a stone wall. Goalie skates up for a face-off. A little bit of stick jockeying before the face-off. CJ wins it clean. Comes in. Oh, excellent attempt. Good stop by the goalie. John on the turnaround. Sends it right in on net. CJ is looking for these face-offs. Oh, one by John this time. Great. Temp flies it over the crossbar. Oh, that one didn't make it through the traffic. CJ on the outplay. Pass it back up to the top of the crease. No. Oh, but gives it right back to CJ. John coming up on the left side. 
A shot from way out there, but the goalie turns it away with ease. CJ is one on one, beat the man, but not the goalie. Heading up, shot. Ah, we're getting some excellent organ music. Organists in hockey stadiums are a commonplace thing, and um, for this game, they wanted to make sure that they got a good, authentic experience, so they actually hired the organist for the LA Kings and the LA Dodgers, um, who performed a lot of this music. And another thing they did, they wanted to make sure that they got regional stadiums music correctly, so they used the same goal songs and songs they contemplate. Hold, oh, sorry about that. We almost missed some action there. John clears it. No. CJ's got it. No. CJ coming up the ice, takes the shot. Goes around the back of the net. Passes down in front. Gets knocked over by the goalie. Get out of my house. John at the top of the crease, nothing. Tries for the second attempt. And CJ, ooh, it would have been icing, but manages to pot a goal there in the confusion. Oh my, would have been icing if the goalie hadn't touched it, and CJ scores the first goal of the tournament for Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Up 1-0. John immediately on the counteroffensive. Shot from way outside. CJ manages to clear it to a down player who immediately gets up. Takes another shot. Not going to let in another cheap one. John skated ahead of the puck there. Had to come back to collect it. And CJ turns around. Sends it right back in on net. John trying to break out again. But once again, CJ steals it in the neutral zone and puts it in on the goalie. Trying to get again. John gets the pass forward. Takes the shot. Excellent stop by the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory goalie. Again, dangerous head pass. CJ picks it up. Goes in on the goalie, but the goalie just takes it away. You gotta take that shot. You're not gonna be able to dribble it past the goalie. Oh, levels. The Ubecha standing in front of the net. Oh, tries to get it past, but the goalie is and continues to be a stone wall. Goalie picks it up behind the net. Two minutes left in the period. Goalie laid out. Covered the buck. We got a face-off. John wins the face-off. CJ steals it on the immediate pass. Hands up the ice. John breaks it up. Turns it around. For the breakaway. One on two. Manages to get the shot away. Goalie turns it away. Oh, the goalie's way out of position. Manages to get back. Lays out. Excellent goaltending by the Daisy Baby Bitch Territorian. Is it offensive to call that? A daisy baby bitch. And there's icing. Anyway, CJ gets the puck. Shoots it in again. Gets his own rebound. Tries to shoot. And John sends it clear out of the arena. Would be a penalty for delay of game, but once again, no penalties. John wins the faceoff. Gets it out. Goalie tries to clear it. The defenseman skates away from the puck. You gotta bring the puck with you. Tries to clear it again, turned in on Ned. John sends the puck up the ice. Six seconds, and it's icing. Attacking zone faceoff for CJ here. Five seconds left in the game. John no wins the faceoff, but there isn't enough time left. Game over. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory and CJ win the match. One to nothing. Three stars of the game, all NHL players from the 1993 season. And here we have our current standings. We've played one game. CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory is up 1-0. Jeff and Rick have yet to play and will play next. And John of Ubechistan taking the first loss. Let's see how the next game goes. And we're back for game number two. Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook piloting the Chicago Blackhawks, moving from the top of your screen to the bottom with a quick shot on net against Rick of Imperium Ludum, piloting the Anaheim Mighty Ducks and working from the bottom of the screen to the top. Selling into this game, we've had a good back and forth. Jeff ices the puck. Attacking zone face off for Rick, wins it clean. Takes a shot, but Jeff manages to stop it. 
Passes it forward to the attacking man. Excellent stop by the goalie. Steals it in the neutral zone. Quick turnaround. Oh, but Rick manages to take it away and passes it to no one. Jeff flips it back. Stolen by Rick. And a shot clean over the crossbar. Rick passes it across, but Jeff manages to run down the puck, but immediately runs into the goalie. Rick, beautiful breakaway. Nice shot. Stopped by the goalie. Jeff picks up the rebound. Trying to clear the zone. Manages to. Dumps it in. Picks up his own rebound. Passes it to the man in front. Couple of shots, but good stops. Tagging pass for Rick. Lobs a shot in on goal. Looks like it went in, but it did not. And this will be icing from Rick. Yeah, that shot looked like it went in, but it did not. Uh, the camera angle in this game is fixed, just panning up and down. Uh, it was something they stressed about for a while in the development of this game. Um, but they wanted to make the game feel good uh, over necessarily looking good. Another icing here from Rick. And it truly does. This game feels great to play. The one-timer functionality, which was added to the NHL series of games this year, um, works great. Skating feels good. The speed feels great. A couple of hits back and forth. Gets tripped, but manages to pick up the puck on the other side. Through the neutral zone, dumps it in. Jeff is really good about this crossing the red line and dump in approach to avoid the icing. Good save by the Tierra de los Hermanos goalie. That name is too long to use. Rick picks it up. Skates through the neutral zone. Off angle shot on net. Good stop. Goalie way out of position there, but Jeff gets it ahead. And Rick clears the trash in the middle. Oh, but Jeff steals. Gets it to the guy in the middle. Gets it to the outside. Lobs it in on the goalie. Rick on the clearing. Skates through two, passes it across. Good stop by the goalie. Another shot. How'd that come in? Jeff has the puck, moves in, takes a nice slap shot, but good stop. Manages to clear it out in the neutral zone, but Rick on the attack. Gets tripped from behind. No penalties again. Nice pass across, but the man just can't skate to it. Good pass ahead. Three on two happening. Nope, it wasn't three on two. There was a defender hiding back there. But, didn't need it. Good stop by the goalie. Great lead pass and an excellent shot on goal. Jeff scores with 2.49 remaining in the first period. Neutral zone faceoff. Rick wins it. Not necessarily clean. Oh, good steal by Jeff. Oh, but Rick steals it back. Going for the breakaway. Scramble for the puck. Jeff skates it through the neutral zone. Another shot that makes it through the goalie. A second goal by Tierra de los Hermanos. Hook. Two minutes and 12 seconds remaining in the first period. Hermanos hook up two. Gets dumped in behind the net. Rick picks it up. Gets it stolen. Jeff, great leading pass. Passes it back. Oh, Cross-check from behind. Oh, but an excellent stop by the goalie. Oh. Manages to clear the puck through the neutral zone. Great attacking pass. Excellent layout stop. Jeff on the return. One minute left in the period. Rick dumps it in. This is icing if he can't get to it. And it is. Attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. Clean, wins the faceoff clean. Brings it back to the neutral zone to regroup. Cycling through. Shot right in front of the goalie. Let's make it up. There's a lot of trash. Goalie picks it up again. Passes it ahead. Trying to get something back before the end of the period. To have some momentum going into the second. But doesn't. Period ends. Tierra de los Hermanos hook up 2-0. Ducks win the faceoff. Rick is now coming from the top of your screen to the bottom and manages to ice the puck. Attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. Perium Ludum gets the pass, but stolen by Jeff. Jeff moving up the ice, gets his pocket picked. Rick coming in on the attack, charges up the slap shot, but gets it stolen away. Three on one breakaway. Oh, clears out the trash from behind with a nice cross check. 
Jeff picks it up. Jeff keeps checking up for offsides, but I haven't seen an offsides yet. So um, I'm guessing that is covered under the no penalties clause. A couple of little shots on that. Excellent attack pass from the goalie all alone, but shoots it right at the goalie's pads. Comeback attack from Rick. The shot bounces off the goalie's chest protector. Another breakaway for Jeff. Two on one. Takes the shot. Goalie manages to stop it and the rebound. Excellent goaltending from Imperium Ludum. By that I mean excellent goaltending by the computer because I believe we have auto goalies turned on. Oh, another breakaway. Tries to beat the goalie. Gets his own rebound and gets his pocket picked from behind. Rings it around the back of the net. Recovers. Sets up the shot. One-timer. Right off the goalie's chest protector. Trying to clear the trash out in front of the net. Another good stop by the goalie. Passes across. The breakaway. Shoots it right into the goalie's pads. Rick on the attack. Oh, gets his pocket picked by Jeff in the neutral zone. Takes a shot. Doesn't happen. Wipes out on the goalie. Breakaway for Rick. Still has it in front of the net. Excellent goaltending by the Tierra de los Hermanos Hook goalkeeper. A.K.A. the NHL 94 engine. Something again during the development of this game that they really wanted to pay attention to was making the goalies good enough that they could operate on their own, but not impossible. A really long shot. Excellent stop by the goalie. Got to pad those save numbers. A little bit of a scramble. Aired out puck. Comes right in on Jeff's goalie. Gets tripped up. Rick picks up the puck. Lining up a shot, passes it back, and lobs it to the goalie. Anyway, breakaway pass for Jeff. Takes the shot from downtown. Easy stop by the goaltender. Oh, goaltender has to lay out to take it from his own guy. Attacking his own face off for Jeff. A little less than four minutes left in the period. Tierra de los Romanos hook still up 2-0. Dumps it in the corner. Goalie way out of position. Rick manages to take it back, gets it into the neutral zone. Takes a shot. Scooped up by the goalie. Get back in the net. And we're getting an attacking zone faceoff for Rick. Not a clean win. Go ends up in the goalie's feet. Passes it ahead. You gotta grab the puck, Jeff, before you skate away from it. A little bit of fighting in the neutral zone. Gets in the way of the shot. Takes another shot, but the goalie scoops it up. Great breakout pass. Can he fake out the goalie? Well, he faked himself out and missed the net completely. Oh, shot from downtown. The one-timer on the rebound. And Rick clears the puck. Not sure if this is icing. Didn't see where it was shot from. Doesn't matter. Rick gets his own rebound. But Jeff manages to steal it with a timely cross-check. Skates through about three defenders. Clears out the middle. Tries the one-timer on the rebound, but once again denied. Rick brings it in the attacking zone. Great pass, but no finish. Bounces around behind the net. Jeff gets it. Gets laid out on the boards. One minute left in the second. Stops right in front of the net. Uh, we have an injury. Yake is out for the game. I'm not even sure which side Yake is on. Uh, can't remember many hockey players from the 90s. So I can, some of the Bruins for sure. Uh, Andy Moog of the Bruins. The Bruins goalkeeper is actually on the cover for this game for the uh, SNES and Sega Genesis versions. Oh, and Jeff manages to skate past everybody and takes a beautiful shot. Buries in the back of the net. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook scores another goal late in the second, up 3-0. And that's the end of the second period. Late goal from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook brings them score to three, and they're up 3-0. Jeff's now attacking from top to bottom. Picks up the puck and clears it back to his own goalie. Excellent pass. I get he's playing keep away at this point. Oh, squares up right in front. Beautiful shot. Easy stop by the goalie. Some scramble for it behind the net. Passes it. They keep passing it to each other. Rick's got it on uh, excellent attack, but ends up right back behind his net. But icing. Tagging zone face off for Rick. Jeff manages to steal the face off and puts a shot in on net. Excellent save by the goalie. 
Skates around a couple of defenders, but manages to get his pocket picked. Jeff on the attack. Bounces off the wall. Ringed around. Picked up by Rick and cleared to the attacking man. Tries to skate in. Goalie manages to stop two or three shots. Skates the goalie way out. Probably looking for a face-off. Ends up with a great breakaway. Gets leveled in the middle. And pocket picked. Rick on the attack. Skates around a couple of defenders. Passes it right to Jeff. Jeff tries to shoot it ahead. Ends up shooting it right to Rick. Oh, but steals in the neutral zone. Cleared out in front of the middle. Excellent stop by the goalie. Flick it off the boards to his own man. Jeff grabs it. Shoots ahead. Takes the shot. Wide right. Rick on the attack with four defenders. Skates around everybody, but manages to get taken out by the goalie. Great attacking zone pass for Jeff. But it's going to end up going all the way back down. He's got to regroup. Don't know why the goalie skated out for that. Gets leveled in the corner. Thankfully, the goalie's back in line. A little bit of generic fight music. I believe we were playing in the Anaheim Mighty Ducks Stadium. Once again, played by an actual NHL organist. Attacking zone pass for Jeff. Oh, gets stolen against the boards. Jeff with a quick turnaround. Tries to put the shot through. Great stop by the goalie, but steals it from the goalie and buries it in the back of the net. Four minutes left in the third period. Thierry de los Hermanos hook up 4-0. This is quite the hill to climb for Imperium Ludum. Rick steals the pass. Manages to get out in front. Sets up for a nice shot. But the goalie is a brick wall. Jeff with the off-angle shot. Stopped by the goalie. Tagging zone pass. Jeff picks it up at the red line. Oh! Gets his own rebound and scores again! That's a hat trick for Goulet and Tierra de los Hermanos Hook is up 5 0 with 3.20 left in the third period. Steals it off the faceoff. Takes the shot. Jeff really piling on the pressure now. Exerting some dominance early in this round robin tournament. Levels him in the corner, passes it ahead. Jeff manages to pick this up. There's no icing. Clears the icing. Attacks the goalie and buries it. Chelios with his first of the game. Tierra de los Hermanos hook up 6-0 with two and a half minutes left in the third. Rick wins the faceoff. He needs to start scoring goals and scoring them in bunches now. Jeff takes a shot. Stopped by the goalie, but manages to pick it up in the corner. They're scrambling for it. I think Jeff's just trying to keep it deep in Rick's end at this point. Phrasing, boom. Oh, excellent steal by Jeff. But Rick is keeping piling on the pressure. Another shot that almost looks like it could have gone in. Great stop. Jeff lobbed one a little wide left. We're coming up on one minute left in the period. There are the dings. Great steal by Jeff. Got to clear this trash in front of the net. Send it deep. 40 seconds left. Imperium Ludum has set at this point in Everest to climb. 30 seconds. Tierra del Smart Hook playing keep away at this point and just playing dump and run. Got it deep in the end. Five seconds left. And that's the buzzer. Tierra del Hermano Hook takes a commanding 6-0 victory in their opening game of this tournament. The stars of the game feature, something that is typical of actual NHL games, and uh, was added to this game for realism's sake. Anyway, after two games, our current standing, CJ and Jeff both have one victory each. Rick and John have been the losers in those games. There's still plenty more action to come here from hockey, so let's get into our next match. All right, and we're back for game number three. Rick of Imperium Ludum versus John of Ubechistan. Rick will be attacking from the top of the screen to the bottom. John gets the puck, takes a shot on Rick. Rick's coming out. Skates through the neutral zone, around a couple defenders, takes a pop. Puck rattles around, picked up by Rick. It's a shot on goal, and there's a face-off. He chipped it over the glass. Neutral zone face-off. One by Rick. Comes in, tries to take the shot. Stopped by John. Great out pass. Goes in, but shoots it right at the goalie. 
Rick skating through the neutral zone, skates through a third defender, shoots it right into the goalie's pads, skates forward for the faceoff. There's the drop, one by Rick. Takes a shot in, but John steals it and moves through the neutral zone. Three on two breakaway, broken up by Rick. Goes back in, scramble in front of the net, but John skates it out. Three on one breakaway, manages to get the shot away. Deflected by the goalie, picks up the rebound, ends up behind the net with Rick coming out. Puck rattles all the way back behind the net, and Rick picks it up for the icing. Face off one by John, rattles around, the goalie takes it, pass it to his defense. Chips it all the way ahead, great shot on net. Rebound taken by Rick the other end. Charging up the slap shot, gets it stolen away. Oh, trips him with the stick, but another trip right back. Goalie is way out of position here. But Rick manages to skate it through the neutral zone. Brings it into John's end. Picks it up again, but John ices the puck. Assuming Rick can get to it. There it is, icing. Gonna be an attacking zone faceoff for Rick. Now these two teams are 0-1 after the first round of the round robin. So let's see who's gonna get their first win. Rick bringing it out. Coming up on the halfway point of the period, another stop by the Ludham goalie. Rick skates to the neutral zone, flips the puck right to John, who sends it all the way down the ice and gets picked up for the icing. Excellent fight song. Face off one by Rick. Immediately taken away by John and shot over the goalie and behind the net. Gets two shots, another juicy rebound. Finally picked up by Rick and cle no, not cleared, now cleared. But, you know, it was icing. Attacking zone face off for John. Rick skates it across the halfway point, gets tripped up, sends it in on the Ubecha Stanian goalie. Two of John's players in the end with nothing from Rick. But Rick manages to get the steal and brings it all the way down the other end of the ice. John once again sends it in from way downtown, but picks up the rebound. Covered by the goalie. He'll take the face off. Face off won by John, stolen by Rick, but then picked up again by John. The goalie's flopping around like a fish. Rick skates to the neutral zone, no defenders in sight, but doesn't pull the trigger early enough and the goalie just simply takes it from him. Imperial goalie sends it up. Here it's level, oh, and he's probably out for the game after that vicious cross check. It's not a penalty though, it's just a face off. One by John, sent all the way back to the goalie. Picked up by Rick, who dumps in the backhand for a goal with about two minutes left in the first. Imperium let him up 1-0. John wins the faceoff. Sends it all the way down to Rick's end of the ice, but it's picked up for icing. You gotta cross the halfway point, John, before you send in those passes. High suck sent to the goalie. Picked up by Rick and skated out. Passes it ahead, passes it to the middle, scoots around the defender, but gets the puck stolen. Lost it to the other end of the ice. Technically, the goalie touched it, therefore no icing. One minute left in the first. Absolutely leveled. With the puck cleared, if the Abetch standing athlete can get to it, there won't be any icing. Great shot, juicy rebound, but no one there to take the second shot. The Imperial goalie is letting out some vicious rebounds and the hitting is just picked up. And that's the end of the first. Imperium Ludum nets one. On to the second period. Teams have switched sides. John will be attacking from top to bottom. 
Here comes in with a nice passing play. Gets it behind the net. Gets the pocket pick. Tries for the backdoor pass, but nothing doing. John sends it all the way down the ice for icing. Drops the puck there. Ooh, beautiful quick fire on net. Another man to get it. Rick skates it through the neutral zone, gathering some strength. Brings it to the side, fakes out all the defenders, but an easy save for the goalie. John brings it back down, rips a shot wide. And Rick skates up, three on two, skates through both defenders, but again, waits a little too late to pull a trigger. Skating it that far out with the goalie will trigger a face off. John wins the puck, sends it on net. Really juicy rebound, but thankfully Rick can clear it. Skates all the way in and knocks the net off its moorings. Faceoff comes outside of the attacking zone for Rick. Seals the puck, John picks it up. Now bounced off the top of the net and out, I believe? Hard to tell. John manages to win that faceoff clean, sends it in on the goalie, and Rick is now on the counterattack, skating all the way down. Take the shot. Neither of these teams like to take shots from way out. Well, in the case of John, it's from behind the red line. Oh, that went in? Well, unlucky for you betcha, Stan, but lucky for Imperium Ludum. Scores their second goal before the halfway point of the second period. Takes it again, runs in. I think this goalie's a little tilted after that. Bodies just littering the ice. John coming back, skates through the neutral zone. Rick picks it up behind the net. Skates away, has a clean breakaway on net. Charges up the shot and manages to knock it out of the goalie stick and in. Imperium let him up 3-0. And we haven't even reached the halfway point of this game. John sends a quick shot on net. Imperium let him taking the puck. Skates through the neutral zone. There's three defenders in front of you. Does a spin move. That was another spin move, but John takes the puck away this time and shoots it wide right. Dump and run. Sends it all the way back to the defense. Has a nice shot out in front. Passes it into the corner. Rick steals on the counterattack. Three defenders. Skates by them. Does the spinorama. And gets pocket picked again. No icing. Was over the halfway point. Ludum skates all the way through and gets leveled by the goalie. Stolen at the top of the neutral zone. Sent around the boards. And I believe this was played off of a Ludum stick, so therefore no icing. The goalie gets way out of position to pass it forward. Three on two breakaway. Shot goes over the crossbar. Blocked by the goalie there. There's a body on the ground. Oh, and the backhand from in front. Imperium Ludum piling on the pressure here in this second period. And leading 4-0. And the drop. Rick wins it clean, sends it deep. Picks it up, juicy rebound right out in front. No one there to take the shot. Steals it in front. John manages to ice the puck clear. Somehow not icing? Someone must have gotten that great save by the goalie. John picks it up and regroups on the attack. Takes a shot from downtown. Lays out, steals it from the goalie and puts one in the back of the net. You bet your stand is on the board. This has been an exciting second period. Wins it. Takes a shot right off the faceoff. Not happening though. With some renewed vigor, you betcha Stan is coming hard at Imperium Ludum, trying to steal it straight from the goalie. Ludum wasting some time at the blue line, dribbles it out in front. Great save by the goalie. John sends it ahead, dumps the puck in, goes for the scramble in front of the net, which seems to be very effective in this game. Skates it through all the defenders. Goalie has it, can't seem to clear it, will take the face off. Probably the safer option with that many people piled in front of the net. The face-off won by Rick. Can't seem to get it away. 
<laughs> pokes John off the puck and then sends it clear out of the arena. Neutral zone face off. One by Rick. Skated ahead. Little spinorama. Sent back by John. Icing. This will be an attacking zone face off for Rick. Puck is down. About 20 seconds left in the period. John sends it in on the goalie. Kicks it out to the side. Rick, I think, just wasting time here. And that's the end of the second. Okay, here we go. Rick is now attacking from top to bottom. Has the puck. Skates it in right to the goalie. Goalie then hands it off for the attack. some excellent music. I don't want to interrupt it. Good save by the goalie. Rick has it in the neutral zone. Fires through a war and gets absolutely leveled. And Yake will be out for the rest of the period. Attacking zone face off for Rick right in the middle. John wins it, but Rick steals and shoots. Gets the goal. Imperium Ludum starts it early in the third and is up 5-1. to one. The drop, won by Rick, skated in, stolen by John, but given back to Rick. Dances in front of the net, gets leveled, and John clears the puck. Gets to it to clear the icing, takes the backhand shot, takes another shot, sends that one clear over the net, gets leveled by the goalie, and Rick skates it out. Poke check, very effective. John has the puck, sends it deep, but the goalie has to touch it. No icing there. It's going for the scramble. But Rick skates it to the corner. Sends it back. Beautiful shot from downtown. Easy save for the goalie. Picked up by John, skated through the neutral zone. Takes the shot, scooped up by the goalie. Rick skates through the middle, loads up the shot. I think, believe that was an own goal, technically. But they don't credit those in hockey, so that was credited to Loach with the hat trick. Unassisted, Imperium led him up 6-1. to one. Rick has it, charging through the middle, takes the shot, bounces off the crossbar, and sent all the way back to Rick's goalie. Regroups, skates through the neutral zone. Picked up again by Rick on the spot. John steals it, takes the shot. Easy stop for the Ludum goalie. John is just firing absolutely everything at the net, hoping to get some goals, and at this point, almost needs to. Another injury. Semenov will be out for the rest of the period. And the puck drop, one by John. A little scramble in the middle. Puck sent in on net, wide left. Oh, juicy rebound, because the goalie was out of position. Nothing doing, and Rick skates through the neutral zone. Gets absolutely leveled by John. The dump and run, beautiful shot. The goalie lays out and manages to deflect it right to Rick's own player. Tries to skate it all the way in. The goalie's having none of your bullshit. Attacking zone face off for Rick. One by John. Tried to be cleared. Stolen by Rick. But given back to John. Sends this one on net from way downtown. Misses the net entirely. Rick on the counterattack. Skates it in front. Tries to just jam it through the goalie, but John steals it. Sends it in deep. But ices the puck. Another attacking zone face-off. Any time spent and when John's stuck in his own zone, his time they're not going to score. Needs to put on some kind of an attack here. The goalie clears the icing. John's got it. If he can get it in front, net is wide open, but Rick steals it. Rick sends it up the middle. The goalie sends it all the way down the ice. And then John turns it around and sends it back to his own goalie? I'm not really sure what happened there, but Rick's got it right in front of the net, but conveniently gives it right back. John sends it in deep, gets leveled, and ices the puck. Attacking zone face off for Rick. 
Not one clean. John gets it. Sends it in on net. This will be icing. Oh. Guess not. Whenever I think it is icing, it isn't. This was icing. Yeah, see, I was going to say something there. Anyway, back to the action. Another attack is on face-off. Rick, I'm up. one minute, 26 left in the period. John needs to get on scoring goals and goals if they want to come back in this game. And smashes through. We have a neutral zone face-off. One of the fun little Easter eggs added into this game. Some of the realism. Another icing and a little bit of extracurriculars after the whistle there. Tagging zone race off. Won by Rick. Stolen by John. Puck dancing around. John sends it in on net. No icing here. Rick steals it. It's playing tight to the boards. About 30 seconds left. John steals it. Takes a really, really deep pass into the corner. Manages to get it. No one's pulled a goalie yet in this tournament. So who knows? Four seconds left on the clock. And that ends the game before a goal can be scored. But Imperium Ludum absolutely dominant in this game. Taking the easy victory. Six to one. And the wonderful game end screen here. Showing us our stars of the game. That game was fun and crazy. That second period. Scoring goals on both sides. We saw an own goal and a hat trick. Absolutely a blast. After three games. CJ is 1-0. Jeff is still 1-0. Rick is 1-1. And, and John is 0-2. Let's get into our fourth game between our two undefeated teams. Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook and subbing in for CJ is Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. And the tune and the drop. And Jeff will be attacking from top to bottom, wins the faceoff. Skates it all the way in, but gets leveled in front of the net. Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory working their way out. From the bottom of the screen to the top. Jeff takes the short shot picked up by the goalie. Lindsay grabs the puck, skates it through the neutral zone. Sends it in on net. Easy stop for the goalie. Jeff skating up the board. Skates through the neutral zone. Past the defender. Excellent shot on net. Gets the rebound. Gets the second shot. Picks it up. Going for the third and sends it clear over the net. Lindsay picks up the puck. Deep in her own end, but sends it all the way down the boards. And Jeff touches it for the icing. Attacking zone face off for Jeff. Wins a puck clean to the middle. Take the shot. Gets absolutely leveled by Lindsay, but manages to pick the puck up in the corner. Takes the shot. Recovered by Lindsay and sent the length of the ice. Touches it for no icing. Lindsay has it at the blue line. Takes the shot. Easy shoulder stop for the goalie. Jeff on the attack. Sends it right into the goalie. He'll skate forward for the faceoff. Attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. And Lindsay wins it. Tries to clear it. Jeff steals it. Gets upended. And Lindsay sends it all the way in on the goalie. No icing. Sends it forward. Jeff's attacker. It's big scrum in front of the net. The goalie manages to get away with it, sends it to the corner, and hurries back to the net. Jeff steals, goes for the behind-the-net shoot, levels a player, manages to sneak one past the goalie from the top of the crease. And early in the first period, Thierry de los Hermanos Hook takes a 1-0 lead. There's his own face-off, won by Jeff. Brings it in, skates it up the middle, and shoots it right to the goalie. Seemed to have trouble controlling it, but manages to clear it all the way. Jeff picks it up, swings back for another attack. Skates through the neutral zone, waits for help. And gets leveled by Lindsay, who comes back on the breakaway. Three on none. Shoots it right into the goalie's foot. Bounces right to Jeff. Jeff tries the across pass. No one getting it, but manages to steal it with brute force. Blocks his own shot. And Lindsay sends it the length of the ice. Manages to grab it for no icing, but given right back to Jeff behind the net. Skates through the neutral zone, sends it forward. Jeff has it behind the net, but can't seem to bury the puck. Gates forwards again, another shot. Lindsay trying to clear it. Sends it the length of the sheet, but this will be icing.
Lindsay wins the faceoff, tries to clear right into the back of her own player. Jeff skates around behind the net, trying to confuse the goalie. Lindsay manages to clear it, not sure who sent this one, doesn't matter. Lindsay's player picks it up, no icing. Jeff leaves it behind the net. They're more interested in knocking each other over than actually getting the puck. Lindsay crashing the net, but can't manage to score. Jeff, with a quick turnaround attack, gets in tight. Flips to the side and it bounces all the way back. Jeff's end for icing. Tagging zone face off. One by Jeff. Goes for the turnaround shot. Doesn't happen. Lindsay tries to clear it. Jeff steals it. Lindsay manages, Lindsay manages to send it all the way down the other end. But Jeff picks it up for icing. Back and forth, Jeff wins the faceoff, takes the quick shot. Lindsay clears it the length of the ice again. And can't manage to grab the puck, so it'll be iced again. Jeff wins the faceoff, goes for the shot, gets the rebound, goes for it again. This time, Lindsay sends it in once again from the neutral zone for icing. One minute, 12 left in the period. Another face-off, this time won by Lindsay to the goalie. Gives it to Jeff right in the middle, who gets absolutely leveled. That's one way to defend. Jeff manages to steal it at the red line. Sends it around, but Lindsay manages to pick the puck up off the board. Sends it in on the goalie for no icing, and Jeff pots it in his own net. Own goal by Jeff. The game is tied, 1-1. Lindsay wins the faceoff, brings it up. Jeff absolutely levels. Manages to turn it around. Sends it the length of the sheet, and that'll be the end of the period. The late goal from Lindsay in Daisy Baby Bitch territory is on the map. Teams have switched, and Lindsay will be attacking from top to bottom. Jeff manages to steal it, skates it all the way in. Layout stomped by the goalie. Passes it ahead for a good attack. Jeff tries to go behind the net, doesn't manage to pick it up. Lindsay grabs the puck. A couple of shots on the goalie. Whoa, that was dangerous. Easy shoulder stop from the goalie. Jeff sends it ahead. Beautiful breakaway attack. Easy stop by the goalie. Lindsay has it. Doesn't skate deep enough, but sends it right at the Goalie who flopped on it for the faceoff. Tacking zone faceoff for Lindsay. Jeff wins the faceoff, tries to clear it, gets caught up in the garbage, crosses the red line, lines up for the shot, can't get the rebound, and Lindsay tries to clear. Sends it clear over everybody, but also icing. Tacking zone faceoff for Jeff, won by Lindsay. Sends it deep, once again for icing. Jeff wins it, sends it in deep. Lindsay grabs it, sends it the length of the sheet. Once again for icing. Now this game actually had two releases. Uh, one for the SNES. Excuse me, Jeff's got a good attack here. Lindsay sends it the length of the sheet. Not icing on this one, was managed to be over the red line. Jeff tries to get the attack through the neutral zone. Gets leveled by Lindsay. Picks it up at center ice. Jeff crossing the red line, skates it right into a defender. And Lindsay sends it right back. Oh, the goalie has to touch it. No icing here. Beautiful attacking pass, though. All alone. And shoots it right at the goalie's leg. Take another face off. Yes, two versions of this game. One that was the SNES and Genesis version. And one that was the uh, Sega CD... Uh, excuse me. The second CD was the same as the SNES and the Genesis version. Uh, the CD-ROM and DOS versions actually had um, full video in them. Full motion video, which technically the NHL owned the rights to. And we have another attacking zone face-off. Goalie smothered it up. After flubbing some random facts, let's get back into this game, which just seems to be going back and forth with icings and face-offs. 
I don't like we have another one. These two teams are very aggressive, which is resulting in some very back and forth face off play. Sent down the length of the sheet again for icing. That's it. Organ music will change it up this time. Lindsay manages to win the face off again. Sends it all the way down. Jeff touches it up for icing. A little more than halfway through the second period. Game still tied 1 1. And sends it in on the goalie this time, therefore, no icing. And Jeff has to skate it out. Skates it over the red line. Passes it back all the way to Lindsay, who then flips it to the boards and picked up by Jeff. A little bit of a scrum. Two on two. Takes the long distance shot. Easy stop for the goalie. As he sends it deep. Gets the rebound, though. Stuffing at the short side of the goal. Tries to spin it around the back, and Jeff manages to skate it through the neutral zone. Takes the shot from downtown. Easy stop. Lindsay clears it. Jeff with the turnaround attack. Stolen by Lindsay. Flipped into the end. Grabbed by the goalie for no icing. Jeff flips it forward for the attack. Takes the short angle shot and it gets jammed all the way back down to his defense. Goalie picks it up. Rings it around behind the net. Takes the shot from the blue line. Sends it clear over the net. Lindsay with a good attack. Gets leveled by Jeff. Gets leveled by Jeff again. Picks up the puck. Takes the shot. Good save by the goalie. Lindsay turning around at her own blue line. Sends it in. But for icing. Minute and a half left in the period. Jeff wins the faceoff. Skates it back to the blue line. Tries to set up. Hits Lindsay's player. Clear in the face. Easy stop for the goalie and a quick out. Jeff looking for the breakaway. Would have had the three on two. Stolen by Lindsay and sent into the boards. Skated through the neutral zone. Sends it back for more help. Jeff manages to pick the pocket. Sends it in. About 30 seconds left in the period. Lindsay sends it in deep. Played by the goalie. Jeff has it at the blue line. Stolen by Lindsay. Skates through the neutral zone, going on the attack, and that's the end of the second period. Exciting back and forth period, but no additional score, still tied at one. Sides have flipped again, and Jeff is attacking from top to bottom. And rips a quick shot that goes clear over the glass. Neutral zone faceoff. One by Jeff. Skates in on the attack. Goes around behind the net. Jeff's waiting for it to be icing. And it is. Jostling for the puck. Won by Lindsay. Played by the goalie. Sent in from the red line. The goalie lays out for it. And smothers it up for a faceoff. Tagging zone faceoff for Lindsay. Wins the puck clean. Jeff steals it. Skates it in. Takes the long distance shot. Plays the rebound. And dumps it past the goalie. Thierry de los Hermanos Sook takes a lead in early in the third period, 2-1. to one. Nuge is on faceoff, a little bit of hacking. Lindsay steals it, skates it in. Stolen by Jeff. Skates to the neutral zone, gets pushed down from behind. Sent all the way in by Lindsay. Who manages to play it for no icing. Jeff turns around for the attack, though. Played by the goalie. Oh, laid out, and Lindsay manages to sneak one past the goalie. And we're back to a tie game, 2-2. This is an exciting game, folks. Run by Lindsay, stolen by Jeff. Takes the shot. Nothing doing. Lindsay tries to clear. Nothing doing. Clears it right into the back of Jeff's head. Then trips Jeff, but Jeff still manages to retain the puck. Lindsay's got it, trying to clear. Hopefully can skate onto this puck. Can. But Jeff takes it away and skates it across the red line. Goes for the shot. Pass through the middle. Couple of shots and it's icing. Tacking zone face off for Jeff. Pushes Lindsay down and a quick pass. One timer. Back of the net. Thierry de los Hermanos hook back up on top. Three to two. 
Excellent, excellent play off the faceoff. Beautiful one-timer. Lindsay sends the puck in deep, but too deep for icing. Attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. Little more than half of the third period left. Jeff takes another shot on goal. Lindsay clears it deep, played by the goalie. Shot forward, Jeff on the attack again. Skates through the neutral zone, waits for help. Pass it back to the defense, goes for the fancy shot. And ends up all the way back at the red line. Oh! Lindsay manages to steal it behind the net. Bounces around. Jeff sends it all the way in. Played by the goalie. Jeff steals it. Had a juicy shot. Didn't take it. Back and forth. And then from the top of the crease, another beautiful one-timer. Tierra de los Hermanos hook up 4-2. to two. Lindsay wins the faceoff. Jeff steals it. He's playing around right at the front of the net. But Lindsay steals it and sends it all the way down the ice. Manages to get it. Clears the icing. Jeff's goalie says, no way, no how. Playing around in front of the net. Taking a couple of uh, backhand shots. Lindsay stopping all of them. Sending it all the way down. Played by the goalie for no icing. Jeff takes it from the neutral zone, goes for the shot. Beautiful back and forth play. It ends up in the back of the net. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook really coming alive in this third period and is up 5-2. to two. Four minutes left in the game. Icing? Yes. Okay, it was just behind the red line. Attacking zone faceoff for Lindsay. Needs a goal here. This is where the comeback starts. Jeff has the neutral zone, gets absolutely leveled. Manages to pick up the puck behind the net. Sends it back to his own defense at the red line. Stolen back and forth a few times. Lindsay sends it all the way in over the net. Grabs the rebound. Jeff rings it around the boards. Tries to send it forward. Takes the shot. Bounces off the goalie. And Lindsay flips it over center ice. Just shoves it to the boards. Good stop by the goalie. Tries to send it forward, but Lindsay holds the blue line. Jeff skates across center ice, sends it right in the middle. Beautiful stop by the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory goalie. And Jeff's goalie just stands there while Lindsay's player grabs the puck. There's a little bit of pushing and shoving. And we have a face off in the neutral zone. Neutral zone face off won by Lindsay. Sent in deep into the corner. Wins it. Jeff plays it around behind the net and clears. Manages to pick it up again. Sends it across. He's just sort of playing. Keep it in this end, but can't. One minute left in the period. Daisy baby bitch territory. Trying to make the comeback here. Needs three goals to tie. Jeff bringing it into the attacking zone. Beautiful cross pass. Gives it to the goalie. Sends it deep. But it's icing. Jeff wasting as much time as possible before checking up that icing. 17 seconds left in the period. Jeff wins the faceoff. Lindsay steals it. Sends it the length of the sheet. Jeff once again wasting a bit of time. And that's the end of the game. Our three stars of the game all from Chicago. Not surprising. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook scores in bunches at the end of that third period and manages to pot a nice win 5-2 over Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. And after our second round of games, our scoreboard looks like this. Jeff with a commanding 2-0 lead. CJ slash Lindsay and Rick tied in for second at 1-1. One and, one, and John still looking for that first win. Moving on to our penultimate game of this round, Robin, we have John versus Jeff. With Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook tacking from top to bottom, and John of You Betcha Stand from bottom to top. Jeff moves in quick with a shot, steals it at the blue line, and sends it right into John's defense, who flings it the length of the ice, but manages to pick it up. No icing. Skates around in front, stolen by Jeff, skated through the neutral zone. Tries to sling it to the man on the boards, can't. Pass it across, quick one timer, but the goalie is on his game. Attacking zone face-off for Jeff. John wins it clean, gets taken out, but manages to clear the puck. Gets it behind the net, getting harried by Jeff. Jeff trying to clear it. John steals it at the blue line, rips a shot. 
Rips another shot. Well, the goalie's having none of it. Jeff clears his own. And John sends it clear out of the arena. Neutral zone face off. Jeff wins this one clean, sends it to the boards, but can't pick up the puck. John sends it the length of the ice for icing. Attacking zone face off for Jeff. Jeff coming off that win in the previous game, but has to immediately play another one. And John looking for that first win. Oh, and Jeff manages to get the dirty goal in front of the net. Thierry De Los Hermanos hook up 1-0. Dirty face off. John shoots it in deep, sends it to the goalie. Jeff takes it from his own goalie. Passes it across. Skates out in front, takes the shot. Denied by the goalie. A little bit of garbage collection happening in front of the net. Goalie picks it up. No icing. Sends it out to the blue line. Jeff skates it through the neutral zone. Takes the shot. Goalie skates forward for the faceoff. Puck drop. One by John. Sent the length of the ice. Can Jeff pick it up for icing this time? Yes. We'll have another faceoff. And then the puck drop. Jeff wins it clean. Skates to the side. John manages to pick it up right in front of the net. Sends it the length of the ice. Picks it up to clear the icing. But Jeff takes the puck. Skates through the neutral zone. The quick shot just misses. John sends it deep. Picks up the rebound. Skates around behind the net. Trying for the wraparound. Once again, beat up by Jeff. The quick turnaround shot, but easily turned away by the goalie. Jeff skating it out. Couple of quick passes. Good shot and crash in the net, but nothing doing. John manages to get the long send in pass again, but Jeff once again on the attack. Skates through the neutral zone, waiting for help. Skates it down low, sends it up top. Goalie stops it and skates it out for the face off. A little fight music. John wins the face off and clears it out of the arena. Another attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. John wins it. Jeff gets it. Bothers the goalie enough and scores in the back of the net. Thierry De Los Hermanos hook up 2-0 in the first. John wins the faceoff. Sends it deep, but it's icing. You gotta clear that red line before you send it in deep like that. John wins it. Jeff takes it. Sends it in on the goalie from behind the net. Hard to go in from that angle. Sent the length of the ice, but apparently that bounced off the goalie, so no icing. Goalie has it again. Hands it out to the defense. Skates through the neutral zone. Takes the shot. Stopped by the goalie, but it was wide anyway. Trying to send it around the boards. Jeff picked it up. John at the red line this time. Sends it in. Picks up. The deep rebound rings it around the boards. Jeff takes it away. Goalie way out of position, and Jeff pots it in his own net. You betcha, Stan. Gets one back. Tierra de los Hermanos Hooks still leads 2-1. to one. The puck drop. John wins. Tries to send it in deep. Jeff getting violent. Probably frustrated after that bonehead own goal maneuver. Skates it up, takes the shot. Goalie lays out for no good reason. And it comes all the way back down the other end of the ice for icing. A little bit of hacking. There it goes. John wins the faceoff. One minute left in the first. Sends it the length of the ice. Picked up by the goalie. A quick out pass. Jeff waiting for help at the blue line. Takes the shot. It dribbles through the goalie and into the back of the net. Late goal by Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, and they're up 3-1 to one in the first. Quick shot off the faceoff, but it clears the arena. Neutral zone faceoff. This time won by Jeff. 
Skates it in, stolen by John. Tries to pass it across, but intercepted by Jeff, who takes a really deep pass. Sends it board to board. John picks it up, but that's the end of the period. Sounds like we broke the glass right there at the end of the period. Teams have switched sides, so John will be attacking from top to bottom. Little scrum off the faceoff, but Jeff skates it in. Takes the shot. Not happening. Gets the rebound. Takes another shot. A little wide. Jeff has it behind the net. Skates it up. Does a weird pass off the boards to no one. But John has a breakaway here. But somehow that was icing. I'm not really sure I follow. But anyway, attacking zone face off for Jeff. Sends it deep. Takes the quick one-timer. And in the back of the net, Tierra de los Hermanos Hook continues their first period. Into the second period. Scoring up 4-1. Face off one by Jeff. Skates it around a little bit. Pops it down, but ices the puck. Attacking zone face off for John. Wins it. Jeff steals it. Skates through the neutral zone. Walks up, tries the slap shot, misses wide left. Takes another one, misses wide left. This one comes all the way back down on the goalie. And Jeff on the attack again. Skates through the neutral zone. Pulls up just past the blue line. Sends it for a player who's not even there. Tries the off-angle shot. Gets it back behind the net again. John can't seem to clear it. It's just hanging out back there. Jeff getting violent again. Absolutely leveling. A steal at the blue line. A quick shot in on the goalie. Jeff looking for that and manages to sneak it around the goalie. Tierra de los Hermanos hook up 5-1. Puck drop. One cleanly by Jeff. Stolen at the blue line by John. Jeff skates it through the neutral zone. Around behind the back of the net. Tries to send it out top. Stolen by John. Sent in on the goalie. No icing there. Jeff skates it through a couple of defenders. Pulls up tight. Takes the short shot. But goalie manages to stop it. And John clears it out of the arena again. They're spending a lot of money on pucks in this game. One by John. Skated to the blue line. Sent deep, but it's icing. Face off one by John. Stolen by Jeff. Skated around back. John manages to steal and clear. Jeff on the attack. Skates through the neutral zone. Sends it back to the blue line. Nice shot, but an excellent save. John skates it through the neutral zone. The goalie steers it to the corner. Jeff on the attack. Sends it back to the middle. Skates it to the circle. John steals it at the red line. And then leaves the puck for no one. Jeff on the attack again. Takes the quick shot. Nothing doing. Oh, but John has someone sleeping in the attacking zone. Beautiful position, but nothing could come from it. Jeff can't manage to clear this puck. John all over him like a cheap suit. Jeff skates through the neutral zone and then fires one really hard, but really wide left. Comes all the way in deep for icing. Puck drop, one by John. Stolen by Jeff. Quick shot. Picks up the rebound, sends it back to the blue line. Another quick shot, another quick shot. Goaltender is on their game. Oh, sent almost over the boards. But ends up with icing. Attacking zone face off for Jeff. Little pushing. One by John. Sent in deep. No icing. Jeff manages to pick it up behind the net. Skates through the neutral zone and over the red line. Jostling with the goalie, but the goalie is having none of your bullshit. Sends it out deep. Unfortunately, icing. Another attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. He's had many of these, but hasn't won too many. John sends it in deep, and we're going to have another one. Jeff. 
One again by John. Sent in deep. Jeff grabs this. We'll have another face off. This time one by Jeff. Tries the quick turnaround shot. Not happening. Goalie turns away a second one, but then puts it in his own net? At two, Brute? Tierra de los Hermanos took up 6-1, to one, paying Jeff back for that own goal earlier. A little more than one minute left of the period. Jeff wins the faceoff, dances through the neutral zone, sends it in on the goalie, who sends it right back to Jeff. Flying around in the air, and the goalie skates forward for a faceoff. Little stick jockeying, one by John, stolen by Jeff, who takes the quick shot. And again, late in the period, Tierra de los Hermanos hooks scores up 7-1. to one. Puck drop. Now the hitting's picking up. If you can't beat them with skill, just beat them. Dancing around a little bit. Five seconds left in this period. No one wants to take the puck, and that's the end of the second. You betcha Stan has got a mountain to climb. Once again, we've switched sides. Tierra de los Hermanos hook, piloted by Jeff, attacking from top to bottom. A little bit of face-off jockeying. Bounce around. Jeff doesn't seem to realize where the puck is. You're playing hockey right now. Stolen by John. Shot on the goalie. Skated forward. Skated through the neutral zone. Another off-angle shot from behind the net. And John sends it the length of the ice for icing. I was going to say, there's no penalties, but uh, there's definitely an injury. And it looks like John's player is sitting on top of Jeff. Stick jockeying. Sent the length of the sheet by John, but this time picked up before it hits the baseline. And therefore, no icing. Beautiful shot. Beautiful save. Once again, Jeff overskates the puck, but manages to pick it up. Skates through the neutral zone. Gets leveled by John. But picks it up anyway, takes the quick turnaround shot and the quick feed by the goalie. Once again sent in on, on the goalie from deep in the zone. Skated in by Jeff. Shot through into the middle. Stolen by John, stolen by Jeff, stolen by John. Jeff's leveled on the attack there. John can't seem to clear it. Sends it the length of the sheet. Depending on who touches this one first. Oh, but John gets it. Clears the icing. But Jeff turns around for the attack. Quick bat angle shot. And it's flipped the length of the ice. Jeff skates it forward. Through the neutral zone. Quick tic-tac-toe play. But the shot has nothing doing. Attacking zone face off for Jeff. John wins the face off. Sends it the length of the ice. Jeff manages for a rough boarding call there, but again, no penalties and manages to get the icing. Been so much icing in this game, might as well be making a wedding cake. Fed out to Jeff, skated through the blue line, leaves the puck behind, and John ices the puck again. Once again, I called that icing before it was called, and it wasn't. I'm magic. Halfway through the third, you betcha Stan needs to really pick up the scoring if they want a chance at winning this. Oh, laid out and stopped, but stayed down for a little too long. Goalie way out of position. Jeff skates it through the neutral zone. Loads up the shot. Shoots it right at the goalie. Goalie gets it again way out of position. And it's sent the length of the sheet. Four icing. Tagging zone face off for Jeff. Wins it clean. Tries to take the shot, but there's a lot of people in the way. Hits the post. Hits a body on the ice. John skates it forward and clears it out of the arena. Neutral zone face off. John sends it in deep, but it's icing. 
attacking zone face off for Jeff. John wins it, sends it the length of the sheet, has got to pick up this rebound. It manages to, sends it in on the goalie, but a good stop. Jeff skates it through the neutral zone, pushing a body of one of his own players. The goalie tries the quick feed, realizing that scoring right now quickly is imperative. Steals it from Jeff from behind the net. It trickles all the way down to Jeff's end. John manages to pick it up, no icing possible. But Jeff picks it up, tries to clear, bounces off the back of his own player. John takes the shot. Goalie feeds it out. Jeff, nice passing play. Gets stopped in the middle. Jeff steals it in the neutral zone, pass it to his own defense. Skating, skating, playing keep away. At this point, realizing just needs to run out the clock. Sent the length of sheet goalie way out of position. Jeff picks it up. Less than a minute left in the period. You betcha stand with a quick back turnaround shot. Jeff skates it through the neutral zone. Takes the shot. Nothing doing. Takes another shot. Nothing doing. John clears it for the attack quickly, but it's icing. 16 seconds left in the period. Need a goal every two seconds here by John. Sends it the length of ice for some more icing. Five seconds left in the period. Needs a goal every .8 seconds now. A little bit of jostling for the puck off the inning, and that's the end of the game. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with another dominant performance. Beating John of You Betcha Stand 7-1. We have our three stars of the game. A little bit of celebration by the players. And after five of six games of our round robin tournament, Jeff is locked in in first place with three wins and no losses. Unfortunately for John, the inverse is true with zero wins and three losses. John is a lock for fourth coming out of the round robin. We have left is CJ and Rick, both at one and one. The winner of this will play Jeff for the gold medal. The loser plays John for the bronze. Let's get into our final match this round robin. And Rick of Imperium Ludum will be skating from top to bottom, and CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory from bottom to top. A couple of quick shots from CJ. Goalie man to stop it. CJ steals it. Rick can't seem to clear this. Skates it through the neutral zone, passes at the blue line, goes in tight for the shot. Lots of bodies on the ground in front of the net. And CJ grabs and skates the puck out through the neutral zone, goes in tight on the goalie. Takes a couple of whacks at it. Nothing happening. Steals it at the blue line. Comes in for the shot again, but the goalie holds strong. Sent the length of the ice and picked up behind the net for icing. Lots of action to start this game. The puck drop, one by Rick. Skated through the neutral zone, crossed the red line. Skates it up in front, but gets the pocket picked by CJ and Daisy Baby Bitch territory on the attack. Brings it in, has a beautiful shot, sneaks it past the goalie in Daisy Baby Bitch territory. Opens up our game with CJ scoring the first goal and up one to nothing. Oh, a little bit of back and forth action. CJ skates through the neutral zone, taps it in, but Rick steals it behind the net, trying to break out. Flips the puck end over end. Manages to pick it up behind the net to clear the icing. Gets laid out. The puck is just sitting there in a juicy spot. Rick steals it on the counterattack. Skates in front. Tries the backhander. Not happening. Beautiful out pass by the goalie. CJ takes a beautiful shot. Stopped by the goalie. Skated through the neutral zone. Waiting for help. Sent down in front. Beautiful out pass from the goalie but it's icing. Attacking zone faceoff for Rick. One by CJ. Skated through the neutral zone, across the blue line. Sent out in front. Excellent save. And Rick on the counterattack. Into the attacking zone. Skates down in front. Gets laid out. Beautiful out pass. CJ takes the off angle shot. Easy stop. Skates it ahead, passes it ahead, passes it down low. Can't seem to get the shot away. Nice out pass. Beautiful save. And Rick picks up the rebound in the back of the net, flips it all the way down into the other end. 
steals it from CJ, skates across the front of the goal, and puts it in the back of the net. With four minutes and 20 seconds left in the first, Imperium Ludum ties it up, 1-1. CJ wins the opening draw. Rick skating the puck out through the neutral zone. Gets laid out, but manages to get the pass away. Takes the shot, stopped by the goalie. And the breakout. But it's icing. Tagging zone faceoff for Rick. Won by CJ. And sent out of the zone. Quick passes back and forth by Rick. Pocket pick by CJ. Intercepted by Rick. Skated in tight. Beautiful stop by the goalie. Skating it out. Nice ahead pass. Stolen by Rick. And skated back in. Charges up the shot. Nothing doing. CJ trying to clear the zone. Beautiful ahead pass. One on one with the goalie. Two quick stops. And sent back down the ice. Rick picks it up to clear the icing. Waiting for help. Skates in front of the net. A couple of jostling back and forth. Another shot. And a wonderful out pass. May or may not have bounced off the goalie. Oh, the goalie did get it, so definitely no icing now. Sent the length of the ice for icing the other way. Attacking zone faceoff for CJ. Draw one by Rick. Skated through the neutral zone. One minute left in the period. Back and forth in front of the net, but CJ manages to clear it. Beautiful out pass. Takes the shot. Wonderful stop. Trickles all the way back into the attacking zone for Rick. Stolen by CJ. Stolen by Rick. Skated in. Stopped by the goalie. Oh, but manages to steal it right in front of the net. And Imperium Ludum with a late goal in the first. Takes the lead 2-1. 13 seconds left in the period. One by Rick. Skated in. And that's the end of the first. Great action in this first period, back and forth the whole way, but Imperium Ludum's leading 2-1. to one. Our teams have switched sides. Lee's an attack in on the goalie. Couple of shots, nothing doing. Rick on the counter attack. Gets in tight, gets the shot away. Turned away. Skated out by CJ. Wonderful passing back and forth. No one there to pick it up. Rick manages to stop a shot. And skates in on the counterattack. Beautiful stop by the goalie, but can't stop the second shot. And Imperium Ludum takes a 3-1 lead early in the second. The drop, one by Rick. Skated in, skated in, takes the shot. Goalie, nice out pass. Sent in deep. CJ has it behind the net. But Rick takes it from the top of the crease. Rick skates it over the blue line. Stolen by CJ. Stolen back by Rick. Another turnaround shot. Jostling for it behind the net. CJ manages to clear it. Over the red line. Into the attacking zone. Wonderful stop by the goalie. Counter attack by Rick. Skates it through the neutral zone. Wonderful stop. Another turnaround. Rick has it behind the net. And CJ skates it out for the faceoff. Attacking zone faceoff for Rick. Rick has the shot, takes a short shot. Stopped by the goalie. Beautiful counter attack by CJ. Rick gets the rebound, skates it all the way into the attacking zone. Stopped by the goalie. A couple of dangerous passes back and forth. Stolen by Rick. Skated in tight. Goalie turns it away. CJ manages to clear the zone this time. Flips a shot over the net and runs in deep. Rick steals it, skates back, counterattack through the neutral zone, through a couple of defenders. Oh, the open goal, but misses wide left. CJ can't seem to get this puck out from behind the net. Rick tries to skate it in front. CJ steals it. Through the neutral zone, pass into the back of his own player. Rick across the red line. Gets laid out. 
Manages to pick up the rebound, though. And CJ clears it. Shot in on goal. Turned away by the goalie. Rick skates it through the neutral zone, but gives it right away to CJ. Wonderful stop. Beautiful ahead pass. Across the blue line for CJ. Back and forth, but picked up by Rick behind the net and sent the length of the sheet. Oh, manages to clear the ice and gets a shot away. And CJ clears. Over the red line, sent in deep. Picked up by the goalie who's way out of position. Another open net, but nothing happening. CJ steals it. Cues up for a shot. Rick on the counterattack through the neutral zone. Leaves it for another player. Picked up by CJ. Picked up by Rick. And sent wide left. Sends it out in front for a beautiful, easy shot on the open goal. Rick of Imperium Ludum leads 4-1. And the puck drop. One by CJ, given to Rick. Given back to CJ, given back to Rick. CJ has it. Now Rick has it. Deep in the attacking zone. But rings all the way out into the neutral zone. CJ on the counterattack. Skates across the goal mouth. Looking for that angle, but the goalie giving nothing. And then Rick on the counter. Through the neutral zone. Little off-angle shot. Easy stop for the goalie. CJ brings it back in for the two on just the goalie, but a wonderful stop. CJ again right out in front, stolen by Rick. Good stick checking. A quick one-timer. Open goal, but a misses wide right this time. Oh, that's two wide open nets that Rick has missed. This one goes clear over the crossbar. Rick has another shot at it. Skates forward, loses the puck. CJ playing some excellent defense here, and that's the end of the second period. A couple of goals by Imperium Ludum, and they lead 4-1 to one going into the third period of this, our final round-robin game. Skates in right off the faceoff. Good stop by the goalie. A second stop by the goalie, who sends it out the length of the sheet. Oof. Barely picked up by Rick for icing. Attacking zone faceoff for Rick. Puck drop, one by Rick. Sent right into CJ's players. Sent right back to, to Rick's players. They're passing it to each other now. This is this is awkward. Another shot. Two quick shots by Rick. Both turned away by the goalie. CJ on the attack. It's pocket picked by Rick at the blue line. Who gets his pocket picked by CJ? Who gets leveled at the red line by Rick? Sent into the corner. Picked up by CJ trying to clear. Nothing doing. Rick picks it up. Skates to the middle for a shot. CJ on the breakaway. Good stop by the goalie, but the goalie's laid out. And Rick manages to clear it. CJ on the quick counterattack. Sends it in deep. But it's icing. Gotta clear that red line. Another attacking zone faceoff for Rick. CJ wins it. Passes to the left. Comes in tight. The goalie was laid out. Good stops and good jamming away, and Rick skates it through the neutral zone. Tries to skate it all the way into the back of the net. Nothing doing. CJ on the breakaway. The shot turned away. Rick on the counterattack. Through the neutral zone. Brings it in tight. Goalie lays out. Manages to stop the shot. Some more jostling back and forth. CJ skating out through the neutral zone. Laid out by Rick. Who turns around and fires it deep. Picks it up to clear the icing. It gets laid out by CJ. And CJ manages to clear the zone. Puck has been iced. A little more than halfway through. A little less than halfway through the third period. And Rick still has a three-goal lead. Another icing. A little bit closer to halfway through the third now. One by CJ, stolen by Rick, a short shot, stopped by the goalie, skated across the red line by CJ, beautiful pass, but you gotta bring the puck with you. Ooh, deep shot, easily turned away by the goalie, skated through the neutral zone by Rick, who gets laid out over the boards into the opposing bench, sent in deep by CJ. 
Stolen by Rick, stolen by CJ, stolen by Rick. Skated through the neutral zone across the red line, gets laid out. And CJ gives a quick turnaround shot. Open goal, and CJ puts it in the back of the net. Daisy baby bitch territory, Klein some back. Still trails by two. A little less than four minutes left in the third. Goalie has it, pass it forward. CJ sends it in deep, going for the chase. Clears the icing, the goalie way out of position, sends it forward. Rick can't seem to punch through, CJ on the counterattack. But Rick clears the zone. Manages to touch it up to clear the icing. Gets absolutely laid out and CJ on the counterattack, one on one. More back on defense. Rick turns and fires, but ices the puck. A little bit of extracurriculars after the whistle there. One by CJ. But good defense by Rick. Skates it through the neutral zone. Across the blue line. The quick spin. Tries to bury it. Nothing doing. CJ on the counter. Through the neutral zone. Across the blue line. The quick shot. Easy stop for the goalie. Counterattack by Rick. Skates it in tight. Manages to knock the goal off its moorings and we'll have a faceoff. Tacking zone faceoff for Rick. CJ sends it forward through the neutral zone. Got to pick up the puck if you want to score with it. One minute left in the third. Rick on the counter across the red line, across the blue line. And CJ sends it the length of the sheet. And Rick gets it behind the net. CJ gets leveled behind the net. And Rick skates it out across the red line. Ten seconds left. Gets out in front. Gets laid out, but that's the end of the game. And Rick of Imperium Ludum wins 4-2 to two over CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. And with this concludes our round robin tournament. Good celebrations from the players. But now, with our playoffs and medal games set, Jeff will play Rick for the gold medal, and CJ will play John for the bronze. Let's get right back into the action and move on to our bronze medal match between John of You Betcha Stan and CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, with John attacking from top to bottom. And a quick injury early in the first period. And CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory attacking from bottom to top. And the puck drop. Neutral zone faceoff. Won by CJ, finally. Takes the shot, ricochets off the goalie. John on the attack. Sends it in on net, avoids the icing. Quick out pass. CJ passes it back to the defense. John makes the steal in the neutral zone. Picked up by CJ and skated out for the faceoff. Attacking zone faceoff for John. CJ wins it clean. Trying to break out. Skates over the red line. Takes the shot from the blue line. Easy stop by the goalie. Loose puck in the middle. Picked up by John. Skated forward. Hits CJ. Ricochets back to John. Oh, and manages to pick up the trash in front of the net and put it in the back. John of You Betcha Stan scores the first goal of our bronze medal match with eight minutes remaining in the first. John up, 1 0. Cheers for a save that didn't really need to happen. John with the puck behind the net. It squirts out to CJ, pops out loose puck in the middle, and CJ takes it through the neutral zone. Sends it around behind the net. John clears it through the neutral zone. Oh. Takes a shot from the blue line, sends it clear over the net. CJ with a very dangerous pass across the middle, but manages to get it to the attack. It bounces over the net and back out in front of the net, and John sends it the length of the rink. Picks it up behind the net, but CJ steals it and sends it back in on the goalie. Skates it forward and feeds it out. Blue line shot once again broken up. This time stopped by the goalie, but somehow ends up in the back of the net. John of You Betcha Stan scoring in bunches in this first period and is up two to nothing. Puck drop, one by CJ. Sent in on net. Easy save for the goalie, who then lays out a player. 
John sends it the length of the rink, picks it up on the other side behind the net, sends it out in front. Shot broken up by CJ, and it ricochets over the glass. Tagging zone faceoff for John. Trying to keep the pressure on here. CJ manages to win it. Skates through the neutral zone. Across the front of the goal mouth. Goalie stops it easy. Sends it through the neutral zone, but CJ turns it right back. Bounces over the top of the net. Picked up by CJ for no icing, but John clears it out from the front of the net. Skates through the neutral zone. One-on-one -on -one with the goalie. Nice save by the goalie. CJ on the comeback. Breaks the glass behind the net. And we'll have a face face-off in the neutral zone. CJ wins the face-off, skates through a couple of players, takes a shot, manages to get it back open net for a second there, wasn't able to take the shot. John, a shot from the red line. CJ feeds it out. Broken up by John, but picked up again by CJ. Skates through a couple of different defenders. No one wants the puck. John manages to take it and clears the zone. Takes a shot from behind the red line, therefore it's icing. Tag zone faceoff for CJ. Wins it. Can't get the shot off. The goalie feeds it out. John skates it over the red line. Hits one of CJ's players square in the face. A little back and forth, but CJ's got it on the way out. John steals it in the neutral and hits his own player in the face. And now CJ skates it out. Gets the puck stolen by John in the neutral zone. Skates over the blue line. Takes the shot. It's bouncing around, manages to go over the net, thankfully, and not in. And CJ skates it out. Nice pass, takes the shot, goes over the crossbar, and John tries to clear. Goalie comes way out of the net for no good reason. And CJ on the counterattack, skates through a couple of defenders, takes a good shot, tries to knock it off away from the goalie, but that's not happening. Back and forth we go. One minute left in the first. And that is icing? Yeah. Tag zone face off for John. 54 seconds remaining in the first. CJ gets the puck at their own blue line. Skates it up. Crosses the red line. Picked up by the goalie and sent out. Some nice passes by John. Tries to crash the goalie for another goal. Doesn't happen. Picks CJ's pocket. Makes another shot, but that's the end of the period. With two goals, John of Ubechistan is up 2 to nothing over Daisy Baby Bitch territory. And here we go, right into the second. Our teams have switched sides. So John is now attacking from bottom to top. And CJ from top to bottom. CJ having a couple of good shifts here right in front of the net. And the goalie skates it out for a faceoff. Tagging zone faceoff for CJ. Wins it clean. Tries to come in on net. Has no help. And John easily swarms and gets the puck clear. Back through the neutral zone. CJ, little shoulder block from the goalie. Slap shot from the top of the circles. One by CJ behind the net. Gets leveled. Going back and forth with John for the puck here. John has it along the boards. Gets pocket picked by CJ. And then John says it the length of the rink. John manages to touch it to avoid the icing, but CJ has it and is coming out. Oh, pocket picked by John. Again, skating around the puck instead of to it. Beautiful outlet pass by CJ. Loads up the shot, but denied by the goalie. Back into the neutral zone, picked up by CJ. Wonderful slap shot from downtown. Easy stop by the goalie, who feeds it out for the counterattack. Leveled at the blue line. And CJ sends it almost the length of the rink. Picked up by CJ in front of the net. Gets laid out. And John sends it in deep. Picked up behind the net. And then sent all the way back down. CJ picks it up. Coming around the other side of the net. Walks across the goal mouth and takes the shot. Bounces off the goalie and in. Daisy baby bitch territory on the board here in the second. Still trail by one. Face off one by John, sent in deep. I'm out to the top of the circles, goes for the shot. Nice stop by the goalie. CJ sends it in deep, chases after the puck, but John gets there first, and it's icing. 
Tag zone face off for John. One cleanly by John. Takes the shot over the net. Gets the rebound. Takes another shot. Gets another rebound and gets leveled. CJ on the attack. Crosses the red line. Crosses the blue line. Looking for help. Skates across the goal mouth and can't get the shot away. CJ regroups in the neutral zone. Comes back. Gives it right to the goalie who has a great outlet pass. One on one but gets leveled. And CJ sends it clear over the glass. Neutral zone face off. CJ wins it, skates in, takes the shot, hits somebody in traffic, and John sends it the length of the rink. Goalie comes way out of position. D to D passing. More D to D passing. CJ through the neutral zone, takes the shot, immediately rejected and turned away by John. John at the blue line, can't seem to break in cleanly. Good save by the goalie. John lays out to try to stop CJ, who comes marching in, takes the shot. Puck loose at the top of the crease. John comes in and sends it wide to the left. Excuse me, to the right. CJ with a nice shot. Easily stopped by the goalie. CJ on the counterattack. John picks pocket. Goalie makes the stop. CJ on the attack. Comes in. Runs into a brick wall of a goalie. How the hell did that go in? Doesn't really matter. It did. John gets another goal. And you betcha Stan leads 3-1. With 1 minute 32 seconds left in the second. CJ wins the faceoffs. Coming in quick for an attack. And we'll have a faceoff. Tagging his own face off for CJ. Would love to get another one back here. John sends it the length of the rink. Picks it up behind the net. And a beautiful five-hole goal. Another goal by John. And you betcha Stan leads 4-1. to one. CJ has it off the face off. Comes in. Nice shot. Nice save. And John sends it the length of the rink. CJ picks it up for icing. 35 seconds left in the period. John wins the faceoff. Pocket picked by CJ. Pocket picked by John. And sent in behind the net. John picks it up. CJ's got it now. But that's the end of the second. And with two more goals, you betcha Stan increases their lead. Now 4-1. to one. And the puck drop. CJ now attacking from bottom to top. Has the puck through the neutral zone. Takes the shot. Great save by the goalie. And John clears it out. Behind the net. Gets laid out by CJ. Attacking up through the neutral zone. Skates around a couple of defenders. Fires a couple of quick shots. But nothing doing. Bounces all the way back into CJ's end. Behind the net. CJ manages to get the puck, clear it through the neutral zone. Top of the crease takes a shot, turned away by the goalie, and John's on the quick counterattack. And ices, nope, clears the glass. Neutral zone faceoff. CJ wins it. Stolen by John. Sent in behind the net. There's some traffic. And CJ skates it out for the faceoff. John wins it, gets a little shot away, but nothing doing. CJ trying to regroup, gets it in the neutral zone, comes in on a breakaway, but shoots it right at the goalie's pads. CJ has it behind the net now, skates it out top, looking for the shot. John's got it at the red line. But stolen back by CJ, regrouping for an attack. Two on one breakaway, gets around the one, but the shot goes wide to the right. John sends it the length of the rink and picked up by CJ for icing. A little more than half the period left. CJ needs to score some points. John sends it the length of the arena for icing. 
Tagging zone face off again for CJ. John wins it, but CJ has it. Looking for the shot. Ooh, just wide right. John on the attack. Crosses the red line. Crosses the blue line. Goalie comes way out of position to play it. But CJ on the counter attack. Has the one defender beat. Tries to beat the goalie, but can't to the short side. John on the quick counter attack. Misses wide to the right. Oh, but gets leveled along the board. CJ needs to pick the puck back up. Got it. Hands it right over to John. No one wants the puck. And CJ over the red line. John steals it. Comes right back in on the attack. Takes the shot. Goalie does a quick serve right back to John. Good hit by CJ. Crosses the red line. Beats the one defender. But the goalie is a brick wall. Can't can't shove it in the short side either and John on the quick counter attack gets absolutely decimated by a stick and CJ on the counter attack come in two bodies on the ground and John will say thank you very much and takes the puck out loose puck picked up by CJ skated through got two defenders to beat here dishes it to the man on the boards sends it up high around the glass and John sends it the length of the arena. Picked up by CJ for icing. 2.47 remaining in the third. CJ needs to get on that goal scoring. Gets it across, misses wide right. John clears the puck, gets over the red line, over the blue line, dumps it in, goes really tight to the goal, can't manage to put it in. And it trickles all the way back into John's own end. Skates it forward, passes it through the neutral zone. Loose puck again, picked up by CJ on the counterattack. Beats the one defender, but can't beat the goalie. CJ sends it in deep behind the net, but it's picked up for icing. Little more than a minute remaining here. John wins the faceoff. CJ steals it back. Comes in on the attack, skates in close, gets laid out by the goalie. And John ices the puck again. Bo, but has a breakaway runner, therefore clears the icing. CJ on the turnaround. Skates in tight. Goalie holds firm. John takes another shot. CJ with the quick passing, seven seconds left. Takes a quick shot, and that's the end of the game. John of you betcha stand winless through the round robin manages to come out on top winning four to one over CJ of Daisy baby bitch territory what an exciting game that was unexpected results absolutely wonderful this is why we play the games and after all that excitement we still have one match left it is our gold medal match between Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook and Rick of Imperium Ludum let's see what happens for the gold. And the puck drop, and we're off. Rick will be attacking from the top of the screen to the bottom, and Jeff from bottom to top in this first period. With some quick action, Jeff with a quick shot away. Rick on the counterattack, stolen by Jeff. Skated through the neutral zone, passes it ahead. Beautiful pass across and a wonderful goal by Jeff. In the first minute of the first period, Tierra de los Hermanos Hook takes a one nothing lead. Rick wins the faceoff, jams it up the boards, skates in tight, takes a shot. Nice stop by the goalie. Couple of bodies on the floor. Jeff tries to pass it ahead, but Rick rejects that. Bounces off the goalie and over the glass. Neutral zone faceoff. Excuse me, attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. Jeff wins it clean, brings it back, loads up the shot. Turned away by the goalie. Jeff rings it around the boards and all the way back behind his own net. Goalie steps out to play it. Sends it way back in. Bodies left, right, and center. But Jeff comes away with the puck. Takes the shot. And Rick on the counterattack. At the blue line. Checks up. Waits for help. Tries to jam it through the goalie, but not having any of that. Gets sent in deep. Picked up by Jeff behind the net. Picked up by the goalie and fed out. Jeff manages to steal it at the blue line. Has it behind the net. 
Passes it around, takes the shot at the open goal, but misses completely clear over the crossbar. Oh, you're not going to get too many chances like that one. And Rick on the counterattack. Over the red line, over the blue line. Waits up. Gets stopped by the goalie. Gets the rebound. Takes another shot. Almost gets a third shot. Steals it again. But Jeff manages to clear the zone. Skates in. Played by the goalie. Oh, Jeff tried to intercept that. Lays out Rick. Picks up the puck. Rick has it over the red line. Takes the shot almost just over the blue line. Not happening. Jeff thought he had the puck. Didn't. But he does now. Sends it diagonally across. Just the goalie to beat, but can't beat the goalie. And Rick on the counterattack. Back and forth play. Ends up the length of the ice. I didn't see off whose stick it came. Doesn't matter. Played by the goalie. No icing. Jeff has it. Passes it to the middle. Beautiful stop. And Rick on the counterattack. Flips it back to the blue line. Jeff cross-checks him. Rick still has it. Takes the short shot. Nothing doing. Goalie way out of position. But Jeff lays out to block the shot. And Rick regroups. Jeff steals it. Sends it across to the middle. Tries the backhand shot. Runs it to his own player. And Rick on the counterattack. Coming the length of the ice. Jeff steals it. Across the red line. Passes it at the blue line. Stolen by Rick. Rick regroups for an attack. Passes it across. The one-timer ends up over the glass. Neutral zone face-off. Jeff has it. Playing around a little bit in the neutral zone over the blue line. Takes a weak shot. Rick on the counterattack. Skates through just about everybody, but doesn't really have the distance to take a shot. Jeff on the counterattack. Stolen by Rick. Picked up again by Jeff. Over the blue line. Takes a shot that touches absolutely nothing. And ends up in the stands. Two minutes left in the first. Neutral zone faceoff. One by Rick. Skated in. Skates in very close and has a pocket pick by Jeff. Laid out at the blue line by Rick. And sends the shot in. Oh, gets tripped up along the boards. And once again, stopped by the goalie. Jeff has it. Gets stolen right in front of the net and put into the back of the net. With 118 left in the first, Rick manages to tie it up. We're all square at one. Jeff takes a wide shot. One minute left in the period. Gets laid out. And Yake will be out for the period. Is that out for a period for the rest of this period? To be honest, I can't remember how the injuries work in this game. About 50 seconds left in this period. Jeff has it over the blue line. Takes the shot. Lays out another one of Rick's players. Will also be out for a period. Does that mean, again, only out for the next 37 seconds or all of the second period? Who cares? Jeff has it, takes the shot. Oh, and manages on the second effort to put it in the back of the net. Tierra de los Hermanos hook takes the lead back 2-1 to one, with 24 seconds remaining in the first. Jeff has it, goes in for another attack. Wonderful stop by the goalie. Rick with the quick counter, and that's the end of the first period. All right, the teams have switched sides. Jeff will now be attacking from top to bottom, and Rick from bottom to top. Rick with a quick turnaround. Jeff has it, across the red line, crosses the blue line, skates through everybody, tries to flick it back, but ends up giving it right to Rick. On the quick counter, has the breakaway, can't beat the goalie and gets laid out in front of the net. Jeff with a quick out attacking pass, the goalie still has it and holds it for the faceoff. Attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. Rick wins the draw and sends it the length of the ice for icing. I'm going to take a drink of water here, and you should too. It's probably been a while. Jeff wins the faceoff, but Rick steals it on the attack, gets it out in front, takes the shot. Two beautiful stops by the goalie. Sends it all the way down to the opposing goalie. But Jeff, oh, just misses the puck. And Rick clears the zone. 
Frick can get to this. There'll be no icing. He does get to it, but then gets cross-checked square into the boards, and Jeff takes the puck back. Tries to do the stop and turn around. Gets pocket-picked by Rick. Gets broken up by Jeff, who's still on the attack. Takes the shot. Takes the second shot, but the goalie still has it. Rick gets laid out from behind, but the goalie's back in position. Jeff goes back to the D. Ends up with a two-on-one. Goalie can stop it way out of position. Jeff on the counterattack. Takes the shot with a wonderful stop by the goalie. Rick tries to settle things. Gets slammed by Jeff. Rick with a great breakout pass. Behind the net. Jeff manages to steal at the blue line. Loses the puck. Comes in for another close shot. Almost gets tripped by the goalie. Rick sends it back to the middle. Turned around again by Jeff. Rick regrouping for an attack here. But Jeff's back on defense. Skates it over the red line to the blue line. Passes it into the middle. Rejected by the goalie. Rick on the attack now. Over the red line. One defender to beat. Beautiful stop by the goalie. Jeff almost pots another own goal, but manages to clear the zone. Jeff has it behind Rick's net. The goalie has it. It's kind of trash going back and forth. Quick out by Rick. Oh, beautiful shot sails just over the crossbar. Jeff has it behind the net. Rick stole it behind the net. Loose puck. Not sure what Jeff's trying to do with this, but he needs to clear the zone. Zone cleared. Beautiful shot. Beautiful save. Another shot. Another save. And Rick on the counterattack. All by himself with the goalie. Good stop. About three minutes left in the period. Jeff looking for some help. Beautiful stop. And another counterattack. We're just going back and forth. This is some really good north-south hockey, as they would say. Once again, Rick on the counterattack. It skirts all the way around the boards, but Rick still has it. Just behind the blue line, rips a shot just over the net. Gets his own rebound. Almost got another rebound, but Jeff has it. Trying to clear the zone. There's a body on the ice. Has it. Over the red line. Takes a shot. Stopped by Rick. Gets laid out by Jeff. Crosses the blue line. Dumps a nice easy shot. Jeff has it behind the net. Less than a minute left in the period. Jeff out in front, jamming away. But will be denied by Rick. Holtender has it again. Loose puck in a dangerous spot. Jeff tries the off-axis shot. Tries to get in on the goal. He gets laid out, but Jeff still has the puck. Rick finally manages to clear the zone. Sends it in deep, but that's the end of the second period. And after two, Sierra de los Hermanos Hook has a 2-1 to one lead. Over a little bit faster. We've switched for the last time. Imperium Ludum attacking from top to bottom with Tierra de los Hermanos Hook from bottom to top. They have the puck at the blue line. Tries the turnaround shot. Picks up the loose puck. Goalie gives it right back to Jeff, who gets laid out. And Rick clears the zone. Coming in out in front. Stopped by the goalie. Stolen by Rick. Loose puck. Picked up again by Rick, who I think tries to pass it to his own defense. I don't know. Picks it up behind his own net. Passes out to the neutral zone. Gets laid out at the blue line. Jeff trying to clear the zone. Does. Into the attacking zone. Takes a shot from the right circle. Stopped by the goalie. Held for a faceoff. Attacking zone faceoff for Jeff. Rick wins the draw. Skates through the neutral zone. Passes it off. Shot blocked by Jeff. Sent up the boards. Across the ice. Around behind the net. Fighting for the puck at the blue line. Jeff comes away with it. Passes his own player from behind the net. But the goalie manages to pick his pocket. Rick skates it through center ice. Sends a shot right in on the goalie. So when it's come the length of the ice, if Jeff can pick this up, he can't. It's icing. Tacking zone face off for Rick. One by Jeff. Skated out. 
through center ice into the attacking zone. But now Rick has it on the counter. Right through the middle, takes the shot. Goalie stacks the pads, makes the block. But Rick has it again at center ice. Takes the shot, Jeff with a quick feed. Jeff over the red line, over the blue line. Looking for that shot, gets blocked by Rick. Loose puck and Rick is on the quick attack. About halfway through the third period here. And Rick finally manages to tie the game up. Rick with a beautiful goal with 5.04 remaining in the third. And we're all tied up at two. Rick wins the draw. Comes in for the quick attack. Jeff manages to get the puck into the corner. But can't seem to get it out of the zone. Skates it over the red line. Over the blue line. Throws it out in front. But Rick here on the comeback. Rick crosses the blue line. Gets absolutely leveled. But Jeff sends the puck straight in on the goalie. Rick with some back and forth passes. Sent out in the middle. Rick charges the goalie but gets nothing done. But still has the puck from behind the net. Jeff clears the zone. But Rick pinches to keep it in. Jeff skates over the blue line. Takes a deep shot. Misses wide left. Good hit by Jeff. Gets laid out by Rick. Oh, and this one goes clear over the crossbar. We're getting chippy out here. Neutral zone face off. One by Jeff, sent all the way back behind the net. Gets laid out by Rick. And Jeff pots an own goal to give Imperium Ludum the lead. Rick leads 3-2 on the own goal by Jeff with two minutes left in the period. And icing. If this is how this game ends, this is going to haunt the representative of Tierra de los Hermanos hook for years to come. He might not even be able to show his face again in his home country. Cross the red line, cross the blue line, trying desperately to equalize, but can't. About a minute 30 left in the third. Beautiful stop, and there we go. Imperium Ludum gets their fourth goal of the match. It's no longer that own goal's fault. Imperium Ludum leads 4-2 with 1 minute 20 left in the period. Tierra de los Hermanos hook representative Jeff needs to really absolutely desperately get his butt in gear if he wants to win this gold. And is trying. Crosses the red line. Gets sent back. Rick realizing he just needs to keep it down Jeff's end of the ice. Less than 30 seconds left. Imperium Ludum just playing keep away. Rick skates it out in front. Three seconds left. Two seconds. One. That's the buzzer. And with that final buzzer, Rick of Imperium Ludum takes down the number one overall seed, Jeff of Tierra de los Romanos. Hook four to two and wins gold. Excellent, excellent game. This tournament was crazy. We had everything. We had two upsets in our medal matches. We had six wonderful games of the round robin. And this is our final standings. Rick of Imperium Ludum takes the gold. Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with the silver. John of You Betcha Stan with the bronze. And CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with one sub game by Lindsay is unfortunately in fourth place. Moving on to our medal count. Imperium Ludum now has the lead with this gold medal with six gold, four silver, and two bronze. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook in second place with five gold, two silver, and three bronze. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory in third with two gold, three silver, and four bronze. And You Betcha Stan with zero gold, four silver, and four bronze bringing up the rear. Moving on to individual medals, Rick has a commanding lead of six gold and two silver. Jeff and has two gold, two silver, and one bronze. Dave following closely behind with two gold, zero silver, and one bronze. CJ, Felice, Peter all have a gold with some other pretty mixed in there. And then there's a lot of other players from a lot of other teams. 
Thank you very, very much for joining us for hockey. I knew this was a long video. I hope you stuck with us for this. Please get up, walk around, stretch, grab a drink of water. Please join us tomorrow for our next event, Curling. I have been Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I'll see you next time. And welcome back to the games. We are here today for our 14th event where our competitors will be going head to head in the monkeying around minigame Brass Monkeys, brought to you by Time Splitters Future Perfect. Each participant will be curling a monkey stone in an attempt to net some big points in the house, which is the large target we see on the icy field, isn't that right? Yes. The goal is to get as close in proximity to the center of the house as possible. We are your hosts, I'm Ween. I'm Squishy. Of Ape Arcade. And today we will be seeing performances by Felice of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, Diego de la Vega representing You Betcha Stan, Peter of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, and Rick of Imperium Ludum. Each of our competitors will participate in three ends, one at a time, to see who will walk away with the gold today. Let's get started with Felice's end. Okay, and here we go. Felice taking their time here, just kind of assessing the situation by it's the looks happen. of it. It's gonna happen soon. It's gonna happen. We're all waiting with bated breath. Oh, uh, when it's gonna happen, you're gonna know. <laughs> when it happens, it happens. Now. Uh, oh, yeah, see? Ooh. Ooh. And we're off, look at that monkey go. Look at, look at, the, look at those other monkeys, my god. They're, they're cleaning up the, the ice? These are some brass monkeys. Now what they're doing is they're actually sweeping the ice so that the, the curled monkey can travel as far as possible without being stopped by ice dust? The X button on the bottom told me it was brushing the ice. So I believe they're, they're brushing the ice. A solid 50 points to Felice's first curl of the monkey. Oh, got a little spin on this monkey. You know, I'm glad to see that monkeys are being given jobs. You know, it's it's not easy being a monkey out there. It's, it's just, it's good to see well, monkey a, representation. A labor shortage going on. They ran out of small children to use as stones. And what's the next best thing? Chips. There you go. Whoa. Ooh, very close to the house there. You know, if that monkey had stopped in the center, it would have been the center of the target. You're not wrong. Oh. Come on, Felice, you got this. You want to get a nice centered aim. Deep breath and... Oh, things are happening. Shoot. There it is. This third monkey, a little too far to the right. Oh, this monkey's going for a 360 no scope. He's definitely not going to get in the center, but... They can only get better from here. Ooh, monkey looks like through the legs and it's going to end on a 180 mid scope. You know what they say, good enough. Felice ends with 470 points, and up next we have Diego. All right, here we go, back at it. Ooh. Coming in hot with this monkey. There is no spin on this stone. Just a straight shot. This monkey's determined for that center. Great shot, Diego. These monkeys are brushing. Monkey's coming in fast. It takes a lot of talent to be that frozen solid. Nice finish. And here we go, Diego. That play makes me wanna hurl. This is curling. I thought this was hurling. No, 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 you're thinking of Hurley from the hit TV show Lost? Hurley, the great album from Weezer? Diego's second monkey going God knows where. Now, unfortunately, you're not able to curve your monkey after you throw them. That's an illegal move. Do you think that that monkey is not actually alive? I believe it is alive, but they feed it as one giant stone, and that's what weighs them down enough. See, I thought you were going to go with a different route. I thought you were going to say that the monkey is stone. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. That's a, sto <laughs> that's a stone monkey right there. That's a half-baked monkey. Is 
slight bit of a rotation on the monkey here, but he's still going strong. And that concludes Diego's first end. Coming in just shy of Felices with 450 points. Next up is Peter of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, and we will see how he does. All right, so far we haven't seen too much monkey business happening. Well, these monkeys are actually about business. They take their jobs very seriously. Do you think they show monkey incoming before they show the monkey? Yeah, no, I think they shout, oh! And they respond, oh, oh! oh, oh! Ah, <laughs> uh, it could have been a good thing. Could've its toe good. was touching. There was a toe in the red. Does I that count? Yes, actually. 200 points. It did, in fact, count. They've practiced this routine a thousand times. They always know which monkey to put in the front and which one to put in the back. This is part of their routine. They have trained for this. This monkey is making a beeline right for the center. We could be looking at a good shot here. Is Peter going to do it? We'll have to see. Coming to a crawl. Oh, if only a little bit more oomph. Oh. That monkey would have been right in dead center. Unfortunately, he stops just a little short, but plus 400 points. You can't go wrong with that. Let's go. Third monkey out the gate and into the field. Already we're seeing a lead here with Peter. Will we see monkeys collide? We haven't seen a monkey collide yet. That would be a first for this competition. We have paramedics standing on the sidelines. Are the paramedics also monkeys? Of course. God, I hope so. What do you call a flying monkey? I don't know. What do you call a flying monkey? A hot air baboon. Is it going to be a strong finish? 800? 1,000? Anything's possible. Oh my goodness. 1,000! All right. Peter with an even 1,000 points taking on both Felice and Diego's scores. Some would say that that is more than their scores combined. And others would say, what are you doing in my house? Please leave. Next up, we have Rick of Imperium Ludum. Let's see how well he does. Looks like a straight shot by Rick. That monkey is heading right for the center. You know, that's what they used to call him in high school. Straight shot Rick. I like to imagine these monkeys wish they were race car drivers and they're in their head they're steering wow just missed that monkey's ashamed we practice this come on rick coming in to snipe this monkey in rick not taking any time here with the aim he knows exactly what he wants monkey's coming in fast where is it gonna end no one knows this monkey knows you don't know until it's been done. That ice feeling nice and chilly on those monkey cheeks. Do you think the monkey with the most hair on its butt is chosen to be the rock? I think quite the opposite, actually. The I think it's the one that has the least amount of hair, so as to not prevent it from sliding across the ice. I was thinking of the safety of the monkey's behind, but you're correct. It's always about winning. It's about the top performance of the monkeys, and but sometimes sacrifices have to be made. The bottom performance. Look at the trust of this monkey. This monkey's like, I'm going to turn my back on it. You guys brushed me to victory. He did not make it. And that was Rick's performance, coming in with 700 points. Not quite there up against Peter, but moving on to Felice's second set. Let's go. A lot of concentration here. A moment ago, it was snowing. That seems for Felice's turn, that snow has stopped. There's a little snowfall on the camera lens you can see. Felice's shot a little too far to the left here. Not gonna quite make it to the center, but they might be able to net some points. The surprise in their faces. They are always surprised. It's a very surprising sport. Many say that about curling. Another slow rotation here with the monkey. I'm gonna go to the concession stand. Do you need anything? Yeah, um, if they got any shaved ice, could you get me a lemon? A lemon shaved ice? Yeah. Yeah, they have snow cones. And like boxes of popcorn. I don't see any like popcorn maker, so I think it's like imported. Do you think they use the popcorn maker to make the shaved ice? Could you ask? Yeah. They said no, that's not how that works. Fuck! Alright, just get me lemon flavored popcorn then. 
Hey, someone peed on your popcorn. Perfect, I'll take it. Hey, what you don't know can't hurt you, right? But you know. Fuck. Yeah. The cool 50 points. That's cool. That's not first place kind of cool. If Felice wants to get this, they're gonna have to shoot right for the center. Look at the speed on this monkey. Could this be it? Could this be the one? Is this all the marbles? Felice's third monkey couldn't possibly stop in the red and just barely missed, unfortunately, only with 200 points. Okay, so that was Felice's second end. Unfortunately, they did not match their 470 points from their first end, so they are still remaining in third place. Up next, we have Diego, and here we go. Batter up. Monkey batter. Like... I was trying to think of the uh like monkey bread a uh, monkey bread oh yeah. perfect i was thinking the what's the uh, chunky monkey chunky monkey but that doesn't have batter in it if it did would you bake it oh yeah, a herpy monkey get in the oven Woo. look at this monkey looks like he's driving <laughs> that's his horn <laughs> That monkey's butt is right on the red. It's got a red butt. Just like a chimpanzee. 400 points. <laughs> you know what would be funny? 420. 420. Because hey! uh, you made that. High five. That joke. Because you made that joke earlier. Yeah. Twice, yeah. Like, no, I was yeah. there. Monkeys coming in slow. You know, the monkeys that are playing the stones, they undergo a lot of training in order to maintain their physique. They're also petrified at all times. That gives them their stone-like structure. Uh, right before they are shot out into the field, we have a trained professional go up to them and go, boom! And it really scares them stiff. Not wasting any time with that shot. These monkeys, they're hard working. They're out there every day training in all kinds of weather. Oddly enough, these monkeys come from South Africa where there's like not much ice, but by golly, they try. These monkeys have actually trained in the simulation. You ever see a bunch of monkeys with Oculus Rifts attached to their heads? Kind of funny. Those monkeys are working overtime. And that was the end of Diego's second end, actually coming in on top with 650 points compared to his original 450 points from his first end. Let's see how Peter performs up next. And we're off! Monkey incoming! Peter's aim is right on the money here. Now, if he gave this monkey enough power, we might be seeing a centered monkey. That butt's gonna kiss center. Peter seems to be getting the hang of this monkey curling business. Slow and steady. It's gonna happen. My god! I think that's the closest we've ever seen on this game! A plus 500! Congratulations, Peter! That monkey bottom just went to the middle of the center. There was a chef's kiss. If you listen closely, you can hear it. The second monkey also coming in hot. He might actually- we might see our first monkey collision here today. Is there gonna be a monkey hat trick in the center? Oh. 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 That's right, we have resorted to monkey sounds ourselves. That's the kind of entertainment you get from Ape Arcade. That's bananas. Peter's prime material for gold. Seems like they really went out there and practice. Peter's primal material. Because it's monkeys. His primate material handler. He has a monkey that gathers his materials. Wow. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I heard that if you drift your monkeys, you can actually build up a little bit of a boost. Ultimate drift. Looks like we have a weak finish on this end. Unfortunately, you can't win them all, Peter. And well, you did get your first two monkeys in the center. Your third monkey is a little too far to the right. However, that was an excellent performance by Peter. Not only did he top his score from earlier by another 100 points, but he is still on top in first place. And up next is Rick, coming in at 700 points from his first end. Let's see if he can beat that this time. Rick coming out, showing everyone how to play this game. 
Rick made a dead center shot here. Let's see if his monkey stops on time. Those monkeys are brushing. It was a nice direct shot. I have a good feeling about this monkey. This monkey might actually make it right in the middle. This monkey's determined. This monkey knows what's good. Does it? Beeline in it straight to the middle. Very impressive shot! He might actually have a chance of beating Peter. I wouldn't go that far. We'll see. We'll see. There's a lot of spin on this monkey. I'm not liking the spin on it. This monkey is still headed for the center, however, a little bit too far to the left. Let's see if they'll actually stop in the center like the first monkey did. And if he does, then Rick might be looking at gold. Monkey's coming. It's landing. Where's it gonna land? Oh, is it, is it happening? Well, color me impressed. It's not quite 500, but it's very close to center. If Rick nails this last monkey, he could take on Peter. We get another bullseye. That's it. This monkey's coming a little too hot, though. I have a feeling that it might pass right through the center of the rings here. Not even, though. Just oh. barely made it. I am mistaken. This bullseye can hold so many monkeys. If anyone could challenge Peter's spot for gold, I think it might be Rick. Rick also ending at 1100 points, coming in neck and neck with Peter. Up next, we have Felice and their final set. And let's see if Felice can climb their way back up from fourth place. Unfortunately, these poor monkeys, they don't have anything to cover their little feet. Uh, do you think that it's possible that the monkeys could get frostbite on their toesies? I think it's a little weird that you're concerned about their little toesies, but not their bottoms that are scraping a good slice. A little too far off to the right. Don't keep making that face, it'll stay that way. Again, the surprise in the monkey's faces. Surprisingly, plus 100 points. Yeah, look, look at the monkeys trying to run into position. They're doing their best. God bless those monkeys. <laughs> Powerful Ooh. shot here on this monkey. Turning its back on the target, actually. This may have been too powerful of a shot. We'll see if this monkey stops in the red. Seems like it's coming in a little too hot. This monkey is, is leaving. This monkey is gone. Ah, oh, this is a lost cause. This could be the best end yet. 10 points. Could be the saddest performance we've seen all night. No, because why you were turned the other way, I switched the rules to golf. <gasps> that that means lowest points one. <gasps> <laughs> what song do you think the stone monkey's listening to as he gets shoved out there? Gorillas, for sure. I like to think it's a major Tom song by David Bowie. Do you believe that there's ice in space? Yes. Cool. I believe if there is any place for ice to exist, it would be in space. Felice's final performance unfortunately came a little short with only 160 points. It looks like Felice might be staying in fourth place. Up next we have Diego and we'll see how their final set goes. You know, at this point, anyone could go home with the gold. It's true. We could be seeing Diego get 1,200, 1,300. Th there's also 1,400. Dare I say, 1,500. Diego could walk away with the gold. I mean, anything's possible here. Do you think there's like a monkey test to decide whether or not you're going to be an astronaut monkey and get shot into space or curling? I think that, much like the human race, monkeys have the opportunity to pursue whichever career they want. There was definitely an attempt. This monkey is a little too far off. Not gonna make the center, but we'll see if we can get at least 100 points. You ever go to, like, gym class in elementary school, and they had, like, the board of wheels on it and you would sit on it and you would have to like kick your feet to push yourself around oh yeah dude like the the dolly yeah that's what i imagine that's what it's like for these monkeys to go on the ice oh my god i miss those things right and th that's why this monkey's having its time in its life look at the face of this monkey and tell me 
that it is not having the time of its life. I mean, they all seem like they are having the time of their lives. They are all very surprised. It is a very surprising event out here today. One day we're eating bananas, next we're in the games. Hurling everywhere. Curling, damn it! Monkey's doing a little jig at the end. An excellent performance by Diego, coming in at 700 points. This is actually going to put them at third place. It's still going to put them at third place. Let's see how well Peter does with his third set. It's neck and neck. Neck and neck. Peter and Rick. This could be anybody's game. Monkey Stone incoming! You really had to channel your inner ape here. You gotta be the monkey. You gotta be the monkey bottom on the ice. Too much power. Too much of an angle. Fast, but not quite in the dead center. Not satisfied with that first round. Peter shoots another monkey into the center. This one seems to be closer to the center and slowing down at a steady pace. Let's see if he gets anywhere in the house. Oh! That's a pretty good finish. That's a good finish. You know, this game is a lot like Goldilocks. You shoot a monkey, it's too much power. You shoot another monkey, it's not enough power. And you shoot that third monkey, and maybe it's just right. Hello, 911. Yes, I would like to report multiple shootings on monkeys. I'd like to report a fucking murder. <laughs> <laughs> it could be anyone's gold. Yeah, but it, it's gonna be Peter's gold. You don't know, Rick could take it. Scrub monkeys! Scrub! Scrub faster! Do it! Your monkeys slow down, you're not fast enough! Make it happen! Oh, come on, you monkeys! Boo! You're terrible! You're blowing the game! That was really good. Get yeah, that, monkeys. wow. And Peter's third set at 850 points. Not quite 1100 like he had gotten earlier, but he retains the first place. Let's see if Rick can take it away from him. Hey. Who let the monkeys out is what I want to know. Great question. Excellent question. And who taught these monkeys how to curl? Pearl. Burl. Burly monkeys. We got some burly monkeys out there. Monkey curling is not so much in the performance of the monkey. It's rather in the structure that the monkey decides to take as it is being kicked on the ice. I followed that crazy trick. I respect it. This is a real neck and neck situation between Peter and Rick. You ever been neck to neck with someone? You ever see how giraffes fight? Yeah, it's they, crazy. They, they actually go neck and neck. Neck and neck. Giraffes should not exist. I'm just saying it. I'm throwing it out there. It's it's a weird thing, dude. I feel like if you squeeze these monkeys, candy will pop out of their mouths. Oh yeah. Like they look like those toy monkeys. Like, boop. You squeeze them and they just squirt water. Is it gonna happen? This monkey's determined. No, no spin. I'm not going left, not going right, I'm going straight. Now is this monkey gonna join the other monkey in the center? It could happen. Uh, but my eight ball says very unlikely. Ooh. It was a close one. And Rick finishes with only 1,000 points, a nice even 1,000 points. Unfortunately, not enough to take first place with 1,100 by Peter. And Peter gets the gold. Congratulations, Peter. And that's all we have for our game today. Thank you for joining us. We've been Ape Arcade. Tomorrow, we will be having figure skating. So don't forget to join us for our 15th event. And thank you again for having us on the games. I've been your host, Ween. And I'm Squishy. And we are Ape Arcade. We'll see you tomorrow. 
Hello again, folks, and welcome back to the games! Today we are seeing the 15th event, Figure Skating, take place on beautiful Shiver Burn Galaxy, provided by Super Mario Galaxy 2. I'm your host, Ween. I'm Squishy. And we are joining you today from Ape Arcade. This event is called Chimp's Ultimate Skating Challenge, and the purpose here is for our skaters to navigate the frozen arena with the goal of striking as many gummits as they can before the timer runs out. Green gummits are worth 10 points, while gold gummits are worth 50, but spiked gummits will hurt the participant, causing them to stop skating and fall backwards and costing them valuable time. Today's event participants are Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, Dave of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, Nick of Imperium Ludum, and Diego de la Vega, representing Ubechistan. Alright, and here we go. We're gonna see Lindsay take us off. Alright, our contestants are on the ice, and they need absolute concentration. The moves these contestants are gonna be making, the twirls they're gonna be doing, the dance routines, they're gonna be incredible here. I am a huge fan of figure skating, and I love the moves they do. What right. is this? <laughs> <laughs> We're already seeing some excellent performance. So this is much like whack-a-mole. This is not figure skating. This is whack-a-mole. Those are two different things. This is like figure skate whack-a-mole. I don't like the way the spiked gummits stare at you as you skate by. How about all the gummits? Well, no, I like the way the green and gold look at me. They're yeah. kind. The it's spikes are threatening. It's all fun and games until a spiked gummit shows up. Coming in at the end. And that was the end of Lindsay's turn with 440 points. Up next, we have Dave. And here we go. Nice twirl at the beginning. A twirl for good luck. That's gonna net him some great points with the judges. Really going after those Shrek heads. They really do look like Shrek heads, they do. don't they? I don't really see the chimp in them, but I yeah, see but I, the Shrek. Yeah, now I can't unsee the Shrek. Oh! Ooh. But solid decision going straight for the gold gummit, knowing that it'll give you 50 points. I heard the technique you want to be doing is twirling all the time. Skating around at the speed of sound. Let's see how many points you can get at the end. Most points are scored in the last 10 seconds of any event. 480. Dave coming in with 480 points takes over Lindsay. If you take their score and subtract 60, uh -huh. that'd be 420. NICE! <laughs> Up next we have Nick, and we'll see how well he fares. And they're off. Score to beat is 480. This is still anyone's game. We'll just have to wait and see. Nick already got his first gold gummit. I remember when I first got my gold gummit. I knew it. I knew you were going to say something like that. <laughs> what flavor do you think the gummits are? So the green is easily lime. Yeah, you're thinking lime? I was thinking like sour apple. No, nah, because they look like doctor candy. Like, you want it, but then you get it, and you're like, well, this isn't good at all. Yeah, no, this was just for show. Yeah, and the gold's lemon. Yeah, of course. Yeah, naturally. Oof. Little sneak attack right there. Another great decision to go straight for the gold gummit, knowing that you are pressed for time. Nick's attempt putting him at 460. I'm seeing a bit of a pattern here. We are going up in 20 increments. If this is any indication, Diego, who is up next, will either get a 420 or 500. A lot of pressure is running on Diego. Diego could be the make or break of this competition. Can Diego see the pattern here? Can Diego see the code and know where the gummits are gonna be? Off to a bad start. Well, Diego sure can't see the hitboxes. Do you think the gummits are like hard lifesavers or the chewy kind? Oh, missed one, okay. I think they're more like jello-y. So they're like the gummy lifesavers? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Diego with a mouthful of spiked gummit. Oh, what oh, is this? Oh! 530 points! Well done! Give a round of applause to Diego, making it in the end, in those last final seconds, coming in first place. But you know what they say. What do they say? In the end, it doesn't really matter, yeah. does it? Well, I mean, it matters for Diego. He's taking the gold home. 
And that's all we have today with figure skating. Thank you so much for joining us. I've been Ween. I've been Squishy. And we are Ape Arcade. Tomorrow we will be having our final event with the game, so come and hang out. And thank you for having us. Hello everyone and welcome to the final event of the games, a mountaineering marathon. Runners will be competing against one another in a race to the peak of Celeste Mountain. For those unfamiliar with the game, Celeste is an indie platforming title which sees you take control of Madeline, a young woman determined to scale the immense Celeste Mountain, overcoming obstacles both physical and emotional as she comes to grips with her own anxiety and self-doubt. Runners will be completing an any percent run of the game, which means they'll be opening a brand new file, starting from the prologue and climbing as fast as they can until they reach the summit over 3,000 meters above. These runs will utilize the in-game timer, which is always running when in a level, even when the game is paused, but won't run when in the level select. Since starting each level relies on human input, this does mean the runs will be slightly desynced from one another, but will remain close enough for the race and the runner's position relative to each other to still make sense. And joining me for commentary on this final event, someone who knows a lot more about Celeste than I do, everyone, give a round for Steve. Hello everybody, my name is Steve, also known as Asavian. Uh, I have done a number of any percent runs of this game, uh, and I'm excited to see what our runners will be bringing to us today for tips and tricks uh, for getting all the way up Celeste Mountain. Excellent. Uh, now, in your in your experience, do you have an idea of like what a rough, you know, like a rough time for like an early or amateur speedrunner might get on this game versus like a blind speed run with no real experience? Yeah. So. Um, very typically, like if you have some experience with the game but no speedrunning experience, it can very easily get to about an hour and a half uh, for a first time speedrun. And then just with a few more runs after that, getting some practice under your belt, uh, getting to about an hour, uh, even just under an hour, which is where my, rec my personal best stands, uh, is very easy to achieve. Excellent. Cool. And any thoughts about like a blind speedrunner? Like I know that that would probably depend a lot on kind of your own, you know, platforming skills in general how quickly you can kind of get acclimated to a game but is there kind of like a range that you've that you've seen for like first timers with the game uh yeah definitely for first timers um like definitely a first run will be several hours you know maybe two to three hours uh to get through the uh any percent run of the game um and then you know just as subsequent runs they can get that to an hour and a half uh, maybe even an hour and 15 minutes excellent all right cool well, so for this event, let's introduce our participants for the marathon. In the top left corner, you'll be seeing me representing Imperium Ludum. I'm Rick. Uh, on the bottom left, you'll be seeing CJ representing the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. On the bottom right, you'll be seeing Jose of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. And there is no runner for this event from Ubechistan. We will have three participants in this race. And as we begin, we see our participants typing in their names to get their files started. In just a moment... Their adventure up Celeste Mountain will begin. And we're off. So my run, we're we're skipping right past the little opening mm -hmm. segment, though it would have been nice to just kind of take the just breathe. I think the anxiety of a uh, of a speedrun race. Especially one so Celeste has been uh, really fine tuned over the years, has it not? Definitely. Um so as, you know, people have been describing speedrun tricks, the actual developers of the game have been really encouraging that. Uh, and they're, they're speedrunners themselves, so they actually go through and uh, have optimized the game to be very well speedrunnable and replicatable. Excellent. I think, I feel like there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of um, acknowledgement of that even within the game itself with the Farewell DLC having its mm -hmm. own introduction of the wave dash technique, or at least Definitely. the version of wave dashing that they have in Celeste which up until that point was kind of more of a speed running trick than it was like an official, you know, maneuver, I guess, that was that was explicitly shown in the game. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of support from the developers on that. Some other uh, speed running tricks like wall bouncing, uh, which we may see later in this run, are actually taught later in some of the more difficult versions of these levels, which we may not be seeing in this run. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. No, that's 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 totally fine. So uh, a couple things right off the bat here. Uh, yes, I did definitely embarrass myself right off the bat by <laughs> taking a taking a quick death in literally the first real room of the game. 
<laughs> here I am trying to be fancy with my wave dashes, and I literally sail right over the first platform into the second pit. So that's a that's a really good start to the game for sure. Yeah, definitely. It takes a lot of practice to know exactly when to wave dash and when not to, and when to uh, sort of reverse and kind of go back. Absolutely, yeah. And I think so. Uh, there's there's a couple differences that I that I'd want to point out between uh, the runs that you'll be expecting from myself on the top left and Jose on the bottom right. Uh, for one, you can see in the middle here we have this little progress bar, uh, which I've added in there, which I think it's it's a nice way of being able to tell kind of where everyone is relative to one another. Uh, unless you have these, you know, courses memorized, which, you know, anyone that's watching who does do speedrunning for this game probably will at least to some extent have, like, these maps relatively well memorized. But anyone who's coming in without that knowledge, all of these rooms may as well be next to any other room in the level. There's not a ton to distinguish them from one another until the summit. Uh, so having that at least gives you a good idea of where everyone is relative to each other. Uh, but so notably, I think there were, there were two big differences, I think, or, or there was a big difference between the runs that uh, Jose and I are, are going to be putting up here. Um, I definitely came at this from from an angle of just I know how, at least vaguely how to do the, the wave dashes. I'm a pretty like quick platformer in general, uh, and you know I am a big fan of like just figuring out routes kind of on the fly. Uh, Jose also I think I think for both of us this was our first real. Uh, like attempt at doing a full speed run like both of us had some of segments um, you know through practice but neither of us had really done a full sized speed run of this before so Jose had also taken taken some time to look at a few tips and tricks from Definitely. you know the best from speed runners uh, I don't know the names of some of these techniques but you can see Jose doing what I wound up I wound up internalizing as uh, stone skipping that kind of like wave dash diagonally into the ground to then definitely skip back it's up. The, one of the basic um, ways to like start your hyper dash mm. uh, to actually go through and then uh, I'm not sure if you saw toward the end of the first level Jose actually um, employed a trick uh, with some spike jumps uh, that in this game you can actually see uh, spikes don't actually hurt you unless you are moving toward them so you can actually mm. get some wall jumps off of spikes as long as you're moving in the same direction that they're pointing uh, so there's actually a way to skip a portion of the uh, end of the first level to uh, get through that a, bit, a little bit faster. Interesting. See, I, I, I had definitely encountered uh, in... So I had, I had streamed this game before, I think maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I definitely once or twice encountered a couple instances where I would land what would seem to be directly into spikes or, or kind of mm -hmm. grab onto the wall right on the corner of spikes and not actually die. I think that's kind of a related... You yeah, know, there's, a little, there's a little that, bit. Right? There's a little bit of a grace there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the game gives you. There's definitely. I've I've, cert, I've definitely seen a couple folks pull off uh, some speedrun techniques that uh, exploit that pretty thoroughly. A lot mm -hmm. of jumping uh, off of corners and things to, to avoid the spikes. And there's a good amount of like hitbox manipulation as well. We'll see that uh, particularly in level three, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll be getting into shortly. There's. Uh, some very there's a very difficult trick called the demo dash, which I can walk through when we get there. I'm not sure we'll, if we'll be seeing that from our runners today, okay. um, but it's a very interesting trick to to skip a good portion of that level, actually. All right, so we've got Jose currently running from Badalin, or mm -hmm. I guess I guess technically technically she doesn't really have Her a name canonical is, name. It's part uh, of me, right? Part of you, yeah. Yeah, and then Badalin is kind of the nickname that she got unofficially, and then it got used mm -hmm. in uh, Towerfall, I believe. Yes, what it is. Yes, I know. Yeah. There was some fighting game, or well, not fighting game, but competitive. Kind of game. like an arena. Yeah, like an arena, yeah. like archery battle. I don't know what that would be, right? Like it's a tiny arena yeah. fighting game, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in my run, also now on the run from part of you, part of me, we've got and CJ is on the second to last room of level one, so he's yes. still making his way through. Definitely, uh, if you're going for the uh, the winged golden strawberry, this room is torture. The one that CJ is mm, in definitely. right now. Uh, I, I, my final stream with, uh, with Celeste was spent, uh, among other things, going for the golden, the flying golden strawberry, and I think I spent a good 20, 30 minutes just in this room. <laughs> it's so very, very specific, tricky, very the jumps tricky. you need there. Uh, let's see, so it looks so, like Jose is also on his way, so has, just about done. Has escaped the, the trail of Badalins, uh, yes. following him, following them. And uh, is just making their way to the end of the dream sequence. There we go. Over to the phone booth to wake up and get our little junior version of the stage. All right. As CJ is coming out of the Forsaken City and into the old site. 
All right. It's interesting to see Jose in the waking version of the old site while I'm in mm-hmm. the same screens of the of the dream. Definitely, definitely, like dream parallels there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, it it was a little bit more obvious earlier. Uh, so right now, Jose has got a couple room lead on me right now. Uh, the flags are kind of you'll notice anytime we get close together that uh, the Tierra de los Hermanos hook flag is kind of layered on top of the Imperium Ludum flag. Whoever's in the lead is just layered on top. Just makes it a little clearer who's who's in the lead when when anyone's like close together. Mm-hmm. All right, as we right, head now we're to on this level three, resort, the old oh. mansion. This one, this one seems to be just everyone's. I wouldn't say nightmare exactly, but. Mm-hmm. It seems like nobody really likes the resort. <laughs> yeah, this level is all about all about cycles and timing, and it's difficult to get the timing right if you're trying to go through as fast as possible. Yeah. Especially since, like, like you're saying with the cycles, so many of the enemies in this level, I guess all of the enemies really, are, are on this uh, these little cycles where if you fall off of your timing even a little bit, it just completely messes just with it. the pace of the rest of the room. Mm-hmm. And one interesting thing is that, so a lot of speedrunners have a route to go through one of these rooms with these cycles, um, but they have to actually come up with a alternate route if they die, because sometimes the cycles will be different if they yeah. start in this room versus walking into the room. Yeah, I def- um, So a death will typically uh, cause them to actually have to employ different strategies. Yep, I, d- I definitely noticed that, like, I, I died in a couple rooms, Jose died in a couple rooms. I noticed that, that it would seem like, all right, first time through room, you got this thing. You kind of make it maybe halfway through. Take a take a death that you weren't expecting. It's like, all right, fine. You try to take the same pace, and you're dying immediately just because you're so used mm-hmm. to what you just did a moment ago. Exactly. All right. Also, uh, I'll admit, during my own run, I forgot that the uh, and I don't know the official names for any of these, but the fuzz that becomes the kind of dark mold that kills you doesn't mm-hmm. actually trigger until you leave the spot that exactly. it's on. Exactly. Um, this actually was an older version of that did actually activate on a timer. Oh, uh, really? They decided to change it to just activate when you leave. Ah. Uh, that fuzzy wall will become fuzzy again. Interesting. Was that a Celeste Classic thing, or was that like a version 1.1? 1. 1? I believe that was a version 1 thing. I don't sure if the fuzzies were actually in Celeste Classic. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, speaking of Celeste Classic, we do actually... Uh, we will probably will not see this in the speedrun, but there is a secret computer in this level where you can actually play a version of Celeste Classic baked into this game, which yes, is a, yeah. a pretty cool inclusion by the by the developers. Now, is it an actual Pico 8 version of the game, or is it just kind of a, a like pretend version of Pico 8 that's... Uh, I'm not sure in the actual development. I mean, I believe it's supposed to like fairly well emulate the Pico 8, but I'm not sure if it's actually having a Pico 8 engine inside of this code. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I think the room that it, that it takes to get there, we don't even see in anyone's runs here since it's kind of out of mm-hmm. the way from I, I guess you kind so, of return yeah. you return from one of the three paths mm-hmm. on like the left side of the room that leads to the computer but there's no reason to go to the right at all exactly um looks like now, Jose is currently in our big mess room yeah uh, going to talk to has there uh, been start any the, starting the three paths to clean up has there is there are you aware of like any meta as far as this room like which paths are the optimal ones to take and when uh, there are definitely optimal paths. Um, it's been a while since I've run. I believe Jose is kind of on the path that I would take, which is top, then bottle, bottom, then middle. Okay. Um, that may have changed since I've done done my runs, so uh, that may not be the actual optimal path, but it is a good path, okay, I will say. Cool. It's, definitely, uh, it's definitely one of those things that's interesting. So for anyone who's not familiar with the game, uh, the, the kind of point of this middle chunk of the Celestial Resort is you've got all this junk and clutter everywhere. You've got the purple kind of bedding clutter you've got green and blue which appears to be like books and then you've got brown which is just kind of crates and as you go through these three other paths you clean out all of one type of that clutter as jose just did he got rid of all the books so now as you go through the other two paths all of the green and blue book clutter is gone but the beddings and the and the crates are still there so each path gets progressively i wouldn't say easier but certainly cleaner there's there seem to be yes. some that are actually easier if you do them earlier yeah, definitely. It does change. It will change the pathing no matter what um, of each level. So if yeah. you do them in a different order, you might actually have to have a different strategy to get through. Gotcha. And CJ is uh, is now getting further into the the battle in section with three battle mm-hmm. behind. Ooh. Ooh, unfortunate, unfortunate little death right there. 
One very good thing about uh, about this game is that if you ever die, you're always sent back, not too far back, to just to the beginning of the room, and the rooms are never too long. It really encourages you to kind of just keep trying and keep uh, getting that one part perfect. Absolutely, yeah. It's actually that was that was one of the the concerns for for CJ going in was like how like how many lives do I get? What's like the worst? Mm -hmm. Like. Am I gonna have to like do whole levels again? It's like no, you're never gonna have to do whole levels again. You're 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 gonna get sent back to the beginning of whatever room you're in. You're never gonna get penalized that hard because the game is tough, uh, mm -hmm. especially for first time experience. There's a, they throw a lot of stuff at you, none of which is impossible by any means, but it's definitely like the difficulty does scale pretty well. Definitely, um, and part of, partly to address that, the developers have actually added in an assist mode, uh, which oh, I nice. don't believe any of the runners are running on for this run, uh, but it does add different tricks like uh, invincibility or infinite stamina that just make it easier to kind of get through the game so you can oh, actually experience nice. the whole story and all of the levels. Nice. There's definitely a couple spots, especially uh, ne near the summit, where stamina starts to really come into play, even if you're pretty experienced with the game. Definitely. I think, uh, oh god, I'm going to get the number wrong, but like flag 14 maybe is one where you are more or less required with it, like unless you do some serious... Um, some serious like strats on it that you're pretty well going to run out of stamina or or mm -hmm. just at least start blinking on your way to uh, the next flag. Definitely, managing okay. a stamina is always very important. Now, Jose getting the key, moving on to the next portion of the stage. As it looks like I'm about to get into the third path of the 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 messy room. Mm -hmm. So you'd be having a little bit of trouble finding the entrance to that last path. Or finding the Oshiro, oh, yeah. the keeper of the of the, of the mansion. Yep, I think both Jose and I wound up uh, confusing where he was for for one of the two for for one of the uh, the points we have to find him. And the first time he's in the center, I think the second time he's in the bottom left, and the third time he's in the top right. Mm -hmm. I want to say uh, Jose went for the the top second, and I went for the bottom third, which wound up losing us both a little bit of time there. Definitely. Uh, so this might be a good time to tar start talking about um, hitboxes and some of the uh, the technique I talked about before called the demo dash. Absolutely. Uh, if you see right after this cutscene in Jose's screen, there's a big wall of these fuzzy creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that the hitboxes for them are individual circles that are about four pixels apart. Uh, it also turns out that when you uh, duck and dash in midair, your hitbox is also four pixels tall. So if you're ah. very, very precise, you can actually dash through uh, a wall of fuzzies and actually avoid this whole section about getting the key and coming back up and wow. save a good like 30 seconds but that's incredibly precise uh looks like jose did not opt to do that so as went for the safer route as kind of a uh you know middle ground strategy i'm trying to remember whether or not this is the case so you can certainly clarify but uh if you collect a key i'm relatively sure if you die you go back to the start of the room but still retain but the you still key. have the key so yeah, you could so arguably that's, a, that's also a trick uh once you get the key you hit start over you go back to the start of the room yeah and you just have the um, key at the entrance it didn't occur mm. to me till after my run or i was like wait a second hang on yeah. It might have been an opportunity. Just make sure you don't do that when you're going for the golden strawberry. Uh, oh. I've seen some runners do that by accident just oh, by habit. Oh, no. And then, yeah, and then you get back to the start of the whole level. Oh, God. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, whenever you're going for the golden strawberry, uh, checkpoints do no, not, uh, no longer count when you've got the golden strawberry in hand. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got Oshiro's ghost on Jose's side of things. A sort of uh, one of the closest things this game will call to a boss. Uh, this chase sequence. Yeah, there's uh, this. To get to the end of the mansion. There's this here, and then there's the encounter with uh, with Battle and in, in uh, Reflection that are about mm -hmm. the the closest you really get to boss encounters in this game. Uh, it can be pretty tricky too, because like uh, even more so than the rhythm of the little fuzzies, uh, Oshiro's ghost definitely like throws you off if you die in the level, since the timing changes for him too. Mm -hmm. Some of these jumps yeah, you always become... dash where you are um, at a certain point, and you just have to move out of the way. Yeah. Uh, but if you're falling through the air, you might not be able to move. As Jose right just kind of showed right. there, yeah. Sometimes you just have to dash straight down and kind of plant yourself for another for another attempt. Exactly. Oh, nice. Actually, most of that did most of that horizontally, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I feel like it's definitely one that's more geared to be done diagonally, but. You can mm -hmm. just get it right. It's definitely a little bit faster going straight across. Yeah, if you start off with the hyper dash, you can actually get a good amount of momentum to keep going. Absolutely, yeah. I 
think. On the bottom left looks like CJ has, he has escaped all the battle and Absolutely. is making his way to the end of the dream sequence. Excellent. And those blocks that you can pass through have a lot of like interesting properties to them that I don't think anything else in the game really does. So you get your mm -hmm. dash back once you pass through them. Uh, you can also kind of jump out of the block. Definitely. In order to get like uh, a ton of extra momentum. Yeah, jumping, you can even do a sort of dash jump out of that block as well to kind of get even more momentum. Oh, interesting. Um, so okay. there are definitely some parts later uh, in level seven when we kind of come back to some of these mechanics uh, where you can get a lot of speed out of those dream blocks. Gotcha. CJ waking up as Jose exits the Celestial Resort and starts making his way over to the Golden Ridge. So I'm making my way over past the messy room on my way to meet up with Oshiro and trigger the ghost event. Mm-hmm. Oh, and actually, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Golden Ridge is one that's kind of interesting. I, I, so I didn't spend uh, like any real time watching speedruns myself going into this, uh, and I'd be very curious to see how the top speedrunners deal with the windy sections of this, because obviously, you know, when you're dashing, you're mostly negating the effects of the wind, but if you're standing still at all, and there's a couple spots where you kind of still need to. The wind is really just kind of this, just force you can't avoid otherwise. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious yeah, it's, to see. it's kind of considered one of the more annoying mechanics to deal with uh, in this game. Yeah, uh, just having to fight the wind and trying to get to where you want to go. Your dash, uh, while it may negate the wind, is still shorter than you would expect. So yeah. you still have to manage that as well. Interesting. I assume are is it common to do, I guess you know wave dashes or hyper dashes, and then using that replenish dash to like go into the ground to start it again like can those be chained together in like a meaningful way uh they usually can be uh sometimes the wind will actually hurt uh, your ability to kind of get back up in the air to do that again though yeah um, so it's kind of okay. difficult to maintain and we also have the introduction of the uh blue bubbles um oh yeah that's right that will actually launch you in a short distance in a certain direction We'll be seeing in, uh, in was it the Mirror Temple, I think, the red bubbles? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which go until you hit something or you dash out of them. All right. We got our... And we have our, these directional blocks as well. Yeah, uh, these ones are... Some of them are able to be manipulated and steered in certain directions that let you reach uh, new heights. It's definitely a lot of interesting... Interesting kind of... Uh, I feel like the, the Golden Ridge is probably the most precisely laid out stage in the game especially mm -hmm. due to like just how the wind functions it seems like it's it's very carefully laid out where there's kind of there's obviously you know skips and things you can do but it seems like there's fewer ways to exploit it generally in this level than most of the others definitely there are some tricks that you can do with some of these blocks um to kind of get some reverse dashes off of them before they actually hit their destination so you can kind of build up some momentum um so that's always interesting and then uh, Jose actually just ran into a crumbling block, uh, which will crumble as soon as you're on top of it, though if you hit the side of it, it doesn't start to crumble immediately, so yeah. it gives you a little bit of extra time if you want to just uh, hit the side of one of those crumbling platforms. Grab that and then either strategize or wait out the wind changes, give mm -hmm. yourself an extra boost up to somewhere else. While I'm over in the Celestial Resort, I had a lot Toy of trouble with this room. Uh, mm. I don't know what it was. This is probably the worst room for me in my entire run. Uh, <laughs> something about just because there's oh jeez, and right at the oh, end there too. Right at the end, yeah. Because there's about a dozen or so separate cycling enemies, in addition to Oshiro's ghost, mm -hmm. and just if you fall off of that rhythm, it really does punish you in this in this Definitely. room in particular. And it is one of the uh, longest rooms that any player has encountered so far in the game. So it's just. Yeah. It ends up being a bit of a, of a grueling task to get through to the end. Oh, boy. Right there. Barely keeping nice. it together for that. <laughs> We're out of the Celestial Resort at long last. Yeah, I think that I think that was the that, that is the worst the worst room that I put up in my run at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely a rough one as I'm kind of taking a quick breath before going into the next level. <laughs> and uh, and like I mentioned in the intro as well, uh, when you're in the level select, the in-game timer is not running, so it is a good opportunity mm -hmm. to take a breath, take a bathroom break, whatever you need to do, but it does also mean that as we're doing this, as you can see, the, the timers on the three screens are all off by a bit here and there. Um, so 
if two people are in the same room at the same time, it's not necessarily that they're at the same point, like at the same time, but it's, you know, a pretty good approximation. Pretty close. Yeah, definitely. As we can see, too, Jose has built up a pretty decent lead about mm, 60% of, a, of an entire stage ahead. And there's not a huge number of opportunities to gain back uh, to gain back ground in this level, at least, since the wind definitely. is such a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. uh, some, of the some of the later levels definitely do have some large skips, uh, if our runners know about them, to actually save a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what will happen with, uh, what happened with those. There we have the flying snowballs on Jose's side of things. Mm -hmm. A nice little reminder of uh, bullet bills from old Mario games. That's true. Um, it's similar mechanics to Oshira, where they will always target where you are when they launch. You just have to move out of the way. Yep. And they, I believe they, they come at regular intervals until you get you know, to that last 20% of the screen or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can definitely time, time your jumps in anticipation of them so that you can avoid having to deal with them much at all. But, oof, as you can see there, Ooh. sometimes it doesn't quite time out the way we're looking, the way we're looking for. And the snowballs are definitely, because of their timing mechanics, one of those things you have to watch out for when you die in, the, in that same room because they'll be on a slightly different timing than you uh, oh, would have point. expected when you first come in. Yeah. It's interesting, too. So similar to Oshiro, they also work as um, kind of platforming uh, tools mm -hmm. if you can time it correctly. So I, I okay. could certainly imagine some some folks in the in the more like intense speedrunning side are able to like pull off some really impressive chains utilizing those as as uh, platforms. Definitely, it's very helpful. They also gave you your dash back. Um, any any sort of like you know platform benefit you still get from those snowballs too. Nice, nice. CJ currently in the uh, the what is there a name for those for for those uh, kind of triggers? I've always thought of them as like shields, I guess. Um, I've I've always referred to them as coins or buttons. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm not yeah I'm not sure if there's an actual like official term for them. Nice, because there's there's definitely a few a few specific rooms in the game that feature generally like four or five of those that tend to be some of the trickier ones. I think that's the first like legitimately kind of tricky one, just because the moving the moving bumper platforms are are you know constantly swaying back and forth. You get four of them. You have your limited. You have just the single jump at the time. Yeah, it's rather difficult. Um, and toward the end of Golden Ridge, uh, Jose is moving into Mirror Temple right now. Uh, there was actually a slight uh, mishap where Jose went to skip the cutscene, but the menu had not yet changed. They accidentally retried that last room. Oh, yes. Um, so you have to be careful. You have to have your timing right if you want to get the cutscene skip yep. uh, on the right timing. Thankfully, that's among the shortest screens in the game, like mm -hmm. uh, of, of the ending. Uh, so like, you take a couple steps and you're done. Exactly, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, technically, I guess a couple seconds lost there, but nothing too tragic. Mm-hmm. Certainly, certainly not as bad as some of the uh, some of the screens in this game can be in terms of how far you have to get before it qualifies as as you know in the closing cutscene. Yeah. And so we, we also have Jose using one of our red bubbles, which take you as far as they possibly can mm -hmm. until you either hit a wall or dash out of them. Yep. And this room being kind of the tutorial for the fact that you will have to dash out of some of them. Going up and hitting that button, which I think unlocks this wall down here to the right. Yeah, that, that button definitely unlocks uh, an extra collectible, I believe a strawberry, uh, yeah. which is actually not quite necessary uh, for the enemy percent run, but yeah, a I was button a hit is a button earned. I was a little confused when I saw that, because I was like, wait, but nothing in this in, nothing in this room actually <laughs> moved, so I wound up looking it up after the fact, like, oh, okay, so that wasn't like that wasn't like a skip or anything, it was just, you know, a ha just a thing that happened to be there. Yeah. Alright. Mirror Temple was definitely one that uh, that I had to take some time in practice to actually figure out where I was going because it's just mm -hmm. so sprawling. Uh, the darkness really makes it tough to to see where you're headed unless you you know you know ahead of time where where things are laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, as we're seeing here, Jose entering this long vertical chamber, but opting instead to head off to whoops, head off to this little zone over here. Here we go. He's sneaking back to kind of uh, chain some hyper dashes together to actually skip a key, yes. uh, an intended skip that you don't actually need the key to get through that part of the room. Yeah, and I want to say that saves about six rooms. I don't know how much time it would save, but it would have to be mm -hmm. like around a minute or so, or at least mm -hmm. close to a minute. 
because uh, the normal path involves you, I want to say, going up, and then you have to go in kind of a loop, uh, a little tight loop of rooms to collect your key, and then back down and around, and that can be pretty time-consuming. Definitely. All right, so we got one of the longer rooms in the game, at least outside of the uh, the B and C sides that Jose is mm -hmm. in right now. Uh, and also, speaking of B sides, there's actually an interesting uh, sort of strategy that some other speedrunners might take. Is that so? In order to get to the B side of a level, you need to find a cassette in the what's the normal version or the A side uh, to access the B side. However, if you complete the B side of a level, say level five, it will actually unlock the next level in the normal run. Uh, so, ah. uh, so some of the more professional speedrunners have actually found that it is faster to complete five B, find the cassette, and then complete all of five B than actually it is to just complete all of five A, uh, and then that will actually unlock level six for them. So. You may not be seeing that on this run, but that's a very interesting thing that uh, some of the you know, more high-end speedrunners will do. Interesting. I didn't even consider that as a possibility. Just because the so I mean the B run the, the B sides are generally a lot tougher than the than the A sides, and the C sides are brutal. Uh, we had mentioned mm -hmm. before that like oh it's you know if you die it's not that big a deal. You go back to the start of the room, but the C sides I want to say are three rooms all, all of the three C rooms, sides are three very difficult rooms yeah <laughs> so if you die then you could be sent back i mean if it's your first time you could be sent back like 20 minutes <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's it's so devastating uh but and fortunately to pull off that uh b-side trick you need to know some of the tricks in the b-side as well to skip a lot of that yeah um so it's very you know kind of professionals only or it takes a lot of practice to get there yeah it definitely seems like uh something that you'd want to practice a couple times before trying to take it out for like a you know one and done kind of speed run where you don't really have mm -hmm. the opportunity to go back and like restart the runs because yeah high risk but high reward so definitely all right so got cj still in the celestial resort i believe he's on his second path here we've got jose now dealing with our in the dark temple, the yeah. dark, dark version of the mirror temple. Mm -hmm. As I get myself over to our first key block in the mirror temple. We have uh, sort of these, I'm not sure that they actually have a name, these sort of like octopus Cthulhu monsters yeah. that will constantly chase you throughout a room. We already got past uh, the transition into the dark temple where you briefly control one in this mm -hmm. weird kind of abstract void moment. No other moments like it's, it in the game, but... Yeah, sort of a reversal where you actually have to control one to uh, attack Madeline uh, that's sort of sitting in space. And yeah. then you re-control Madeline afterwards. It's a very it's a very interesting little moment there, because, I, 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 again, like there's no other moment like it in the entire game. And so it's just kind of this jarring little abstract thing where suddenly you're controlling an enemy, and you see mm -hmm. Madeline, and you're like, well, I, I guess I'll go do that. Yeah. I don't know if this was intentional, but Jose actually discovered that these monsters can actually activate the coins for you. Yeah. Uh, so you can actually lead one to activate a coin while you go get a second coin and kind of get them both at the same time. Yeah, if, you're, if, you've, if you've got things lined up just right, then yeah, it can be a huge uh, time save as you kind of multitask. Uh, there's at least, I believe there's at least one room where you do need to use little demon guys to get a coin, as I think it's a, a coin that's surrounded by the like red brambles. Believe so. Uh, we'll we'll be seeing that shortly. Yeah, it's a little um, bit further in, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, as we're now getting to this I mean, giant to complex room. area. Looks like Jose is. Oh, maybe not. Uh, I was going to say there is a way to actually skip this. You actually need to find two keys to progress to the next room. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a method to skip finding those two keys, uh, which involves a very precise sort of wave dash to get over a pit of these sort of wiggly spikes. Yeah, I was I was um, reading up about that after I like after my own run, but I I had I was curious if there was something there cuz it's such even if you even if you pull off an alternate, you know, route here, there's still so many bits and pieces to this that it would seem like there would have to be something that mm -hmm. would cut down time here and and yeah, I guess there's a really intricate little hyper dash chain thing you can do that that saves you a lot of time there. Yeah, but it seems like Jose has a route to get both of those keys. And we actually saw that uh, he was running out of stamina a little bit, but wall jumping actually consumes no stamina, so you can kind of wall jump forever. Yeah. And gain a little bit of height each time. And so Jose opting to head off to the side with the demon breaking down the door. Because mm -hmm. this area, so this is something that I was not even aware of until, so I did my run first because I needed to, you know, physically record this with the other runners, so 
rather than seeing any of their strats. I did mine before they did theirs. Um, I didn't even know this area was was here. I'm sure that because so during my own streams, I, I hundred percented it with strawberries. So I'm sure that it came over here at some point. But uh, but yeah, this area has actually got three keys available. There's two that are next mm -hmm. to each other or that are placed next to each other. You have to go to opposite sides of the complex room for it. Um, but you can instead opt to have that red door get broken down and go for a third key that can save you a bit of time there. Definitely. All right, past the two key doors for Jose. Mm -hmm. Looks like I'm about to get myself over into that area. We're now dodging the little demon guys. Taking shelter in some of those uh, glittery streams of light that the demons can actually get through. Yes, uh, those are little protective areas. It's a nice little. It's a nice little bit of help if you're if you're trying to just dodge one at the last second. Duck behind one of mm -hmm. those. Give yourself a breather. And continue on. Uh, one other thing about those demons is that so you saw Rick just jumped off of uh, one of them, just kind of like Oshir. You can get your dash back, same as a platform. Uh, but then when they reform a couple seconds later, they actually uh, send that little shockwave that will give you some momentum if you can take advantage of that. Oh, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. They also don't stay stunned for very long. You can see on Jose's no. side, they really only stay stunned for about a second and a half, maybe two seconds. Mm -hmm. So in a pinch, it's good to get yourself out of you know having to dodge them a ton, but you're not necessarily going to like get much of a breather there. Definitely. Um, you also see Jose is carrying your mountain climbing compatriot, Theo, uh, who's currently trapped in a crystal. Uh, so you actually have to complete the rest of this level with Theo, uh, providing some color commentary himself uh, Oh yes, as yeah. far as how Madeline is doing. There's some interesting uh, mechanics that go along with, that are kind of unique to this level, where throwing Theo can actually trigger buttons. Uh, mm -hmm. It can also knock back enemies. I don't think it can actually stun them fully. Um... But I don't, don't know. Believe, if, I believe if you have Theo land on top of an enemy, on the it top. might stun them. Okay, nice. Uh, and, I, and obviously, he can collect our, our blue coins here as well to trigger the doors, along with the demon oh. itself. Yep. Oh, and yeah, as you can see on the left, that's where the uh, little bramble protected. You have to go through the bramble was there. Yeah. Um, there's also a couple things that I noticed that I didn't know my first time through this game, where you can kind of do some tricky maneuvers involving. Throwing Theo, doing and wave dashing to catch him, and you can kind of yeah. get a lot of extra momentum uh, by kind of pulling a bunch of those together in sequence. It actually can be really useful in the final room of this level, where you're kind of dealing with a constant barrage of this uh, concussive energy that keeps blowing you back. Because mm -hmm. you can kind of, uh, you almost it almost feels like iframes a little bit for uh, at least from that that blast sending you backwards. If you like catch him at the right moment as that's as that's happening, right, it kind of negates the moment, the backwards momentum. Yeah, the momentum of the crystal, I guess, going forward. It's like it's the, I think it's the the the, f the few uh, frames of animation of you picking up the crystal uh, negate any motion that that you're getting mm -hmm. pushed back. All right, so on my side, I just got the second key. So I, had, for mine, I had gone through the right path for the key, which brings you back into the room that you would need to walk through to get to the to the key on the left side anyway, so that was my my path for that to keep to keep those loops tight. Uh, and as we can see too, we've got a lot of uh, this we've seen these before at this point, but the the platforms that uh, respond to dashes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing them on my side right now. We'll see them on Jose's in a second on the other side of this room. But uh, the last kind of quarter of this level relies on a number of these where you have to kind of carefully place Theo in order to get yeah. the, the platforms to respond. Mm -hmm. Oh, and now uh, we're in if that. If you're able to room, carefully place a demon under one of them, you can actually crush a demon, uh, killing it permanently uh, ah. under one of those platforms as well. Nice. All right. So we have our concussive waves uh, that Jose is currently fighting through. Yep. A little difficult to get through. It's a little bit of a pain to deal with it. Oop, almost. There we go. The eyeball. There we go. <laughs> there it is. And we are done with the mirror temple. I believe moving on to reflection. Mm hmm. All righty. I don't know if we'll. We probably will not be seeing it, but the setup for reflection is that uh, Madeline has actually uh, fallen down uh, a good chunk of the mountain and it kind of needs to work her way back up along with uh, Badalyn. Yes, yeah. I think... Uh, I guess we'll see, be seeing this first part where we introduced the feather mechanic. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, just kind of a free-flying... You actually are able to move 
I forget the actual thing, but you are able to move in more than eight directions, uh, which is more than what you're typically doing in on the ground. Uh, so it's actually very useful to use the joystick rather than the D-pad for using the feather. Yeah, so I, I, do, I can't speak for either CJ or Jose, but for me, when I play this game, I tend to just use the joystick anyway, which I know is <laughs> far from optimal when you're trying to set up like specific <laughs> tricks. Uh, something about using the D-pad for a game that's this... For some reason, for me, when there, when there's games that are this smooth and this technical, for whatever reason, using a D-pad feels too restrictive to me, even though it's the same kind of inputs and it's much looser. Nice little quick skit for Jose there. Yep. Uh, for whatever reason, the joystick just feels more natural, and especially if you're then going to be using these feathers, which have, it seems to be a full a full 360 of, of controllable motion, uh, using the joystick yeah, is... Preferable there, there, there's sure. some percent, there's some degrees that it's, I, I want to say it's like 17 or 13 degrees of uh, increments. Nice. Uh, but I don't exactly remember. All right, we got Jose coming into the very large room here with the feather. Mm -hmm. We've got myself with Theo and the crystal. Skip. CJ making his way to go meet up with Oshiro and encounter his ghost. Oof, rough death on that one. Mm -hmm. And we're going through, uh, Jose is actually hitting a number of these uh, grumbly blocks. Every time you hit one, they kind of grumble and kind of send you to a new place. Uh, I believe in the code that is named after one of the developers named Kevin. Uh, nice. So the community frequently refers to these as Kevin blocks. Kevin blocks, nice. All right. And yeah, the trick with those, as you can see, is the side that you hit it from is the side that it then moves towards. I would say the room that Rick just went through, which has a sideways uh, dash block, uh, is also called the yeet room because there's actually a way to manipulate the momentum of Theo to actually just carry you through that room and honestly partly through the next room. Oh, uh, nice. If you go fast enough, you can actually go through a wall of spikes that way. Oh, interesting. Um, oh, yeah. okay. So that's uh, kind of a... If you ever watch an AG ADDQ, AGDQ run, uh, you'll see the audience yell yeet nice. as they go through that room. Nice. So that's... I, I assume that that's the result of a similar, um, at least the passing through the wall is a similar thing that gets used in um, even as far back as uh, Super Mario Brothers speedruns where mm -hmm. um, there's like I, I was going to say sub-pixels, that's not right it's not sub-pixels, it's more essentially each frame the game is checking for collision based off of a couple different points on both yourself and the right. like object in front of you but if you manage to not be touching a wall and then the next frame be completely past the wall, still not touching it, then the game, unless you specifically are very carefully like watching for that, a lot of times you'll be able to just pass through the wall entirely. Exactly. It's very uh, common. I don't want to say common, but it happens frequently in a number of games where you can kind of skip through walls based on how fast you're going. Yeah. Usually, usually it's not something most games have to worry about per se, since most games don't have you moving like particularly fast, where that would be a problem. But every once in a while, it does come up, and it's kind of a huge pain to code, like to fix too. Yeah, you have to check every single kind of a continuous checkpoint along, like a array or something like that. Yeah, which can be kind of a hassle for a lot of for uh, for a lot of games. For one like this, it wouldn't be impossible. There's, there's not. I don't think there's, there's enough going on that it would like choke the game to be able to make those calculations. But it's such a rare occurrence that it's probably not really something that would matter. And like you were saying at the start of this, the the devs are really fond of like speed running and speed runners. So I'm sure they, that upon seeing that, they're like, oh, that's cool. All right, let's leave yeah, that. Just kind of left it in. Yeah. Mm. All right. So both Jose and myself in reflection. Jose coming up on the halfway point of the level and myself very early into it. Ooh, running into those bumpers is always a little always a little rough, uh, but Jose seemed to have recovered from that. Yeah, there's definitely a couple spots where cause because the you you bounce off directionally based off of where you strike the outside of the bumper. So if mm -hmm. if you're off by just a little bit, it'll throw you in a way where you're not quite expecting it. And it does deactivate the bumper for a short moment, so you can't always even rely on coming back to it. Uh, as well, so you might just fall through it and, and into spikes. Yes, in this level, there's an awful lot so of that. Might be, yeah, skipping a portion go. of this level uh, or the, of the screen to actually skip a, several rounds of spikes. Yes, um, through some very small openings. Yeah, very large S curve of of uh, navigation through the spikes. Otherwise, uh, I had definitely I. I Definitely knew that that was an option, but I hadn't practiced that one before, and I was like, I don't know mm -hmm. if I want to 
risk it on a level on a stage, uh, rather a room this large, because if I yeah. if I mess it up, then it means a lot of wasted time. CJ aiming to get that key on the other side of the room. We've got taking the time. Jose on the big block. These platforms. Oh, and he overshoots one of the platforms. Whoop. Unfortunately. But this is the I believe Jose's on the final Kevin block uh, before we hit to the sort of climax of uh, reflection. Yes. Which carries a pretty substantial uh, gameplay shift from from a lot of the rest of the game where. You know, our second boss battle, and not just that, but also one where you're actively participating in it instead of just passively trying to escape. Mm -hmm. As you can see, we've got yeah. battle and now shooting, you know, little energy balls. She'll be, she'll be doing lasers eventually as well. And the only way to get through is to actively make contact with battle and. Mm -hmm. And every time it changes the level just a little bit, you see the rocks falling. Uh, they will crush you uh, if you're caught under them in the wrong oh, time. Yes. Uh, but it does change how you actually have to manipulate yourself through the level um, so you can dodge those. Important, uh, it doesn't come up just yet. I mean, it can, but it definitely comes up later. You don't actually have to be dashing in order to damage uh, battle in. Mm -hmm. You just need to make contact. It'll consider any contact damaging, which is useful because there's a couple spots where it's very difficult to actually make a full dash over to her. Definitely, and also touching her, uh, which will you know signify the next part of the chase, will give you your dash back, yes. so you can actually kind of sort of recover by that way as well. Which is very useful in, in some spots where you're kind of being dumped, like there, kind of directly mm -hmm. over spikes. Yeah. Can be a bit of a, 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 a double-edged sword, though. If you are a little too hasty on dashing forward, the game definitely sets up a couple trap blocks to crush you if you just you know, mindlessly dash forward. The one that Jose's on right now, in fact, being a pretty a pretty straightforward one. Definitely. Alright. Rick going through that last feather section uh, for the second half of reflection as well. Okay. About to meet up with Granny. Continue on forward. Uh... Big shout out too. So the music that you're hearing is always going to be whoever's in front. Uh, the soundtrack to this game is incredible. Um, mm -hmm. The the standard soundtrack is the farewell DLC soundtrack is like out of this world. It's it's one of the few video game soundtracks that I've ever like had on my you know music devices or whatever. I've had farewell on there since I played this game the first time. Mm -hmm. It's so good. There's Fantastic like a, shout outs to uh, Lana Rain, who is the composer. It's like a nine, eight or nine minute suite done for farewell. Mm -hmm. That's that's really really good. There's a very high probability that that, that, that got used for the intro to this video <laughs> as we were explaining things. It's that or or one of the other ones from the DLC, just because the, the, it's oh it's so good, so good. Yeah, this this battle and boss music is also very very catchy. Yes. Uh, hearing the hey yeah kind of going through it, mm -hmm. through it all. all the chanting in there yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely brings up a lot of the a lot of that energy, but it keeps those themes and motifs from earlier in the game too. The mm -hmm. the like main theme of the game is present in I think all of the all of the level tracks. Sometimes it's buried a little bit more than others, but it's a little buried. Uh, and we'll also see in the next level we actually get um, good remixes of the main theme with the themes of each of the levels as uh, oh, our right, Thomas yeah. is going through uh, the summit. Because you get the uh, that kind of. Uh, is it reprise or reprise? I've said reprise for so long, I but I've heard reprise I so many have no idea. Oh, no. It's kind of like a gif-gif situation, just kind of switch every so often. Right. I was so confident for the longest time that it was reprise, and then for some over the last, like, two years, I've never heard reprise again. Mm -hmm. I've heard reprise infinitely more, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> All right, so, so yeah, both we have three boss battles on the screen right now. Yeah. Actually, we have two battlings and one Oshiro. All pretty tough moments uh, in the game here, as we're mm -hmm. a little over 42, 43. There's actually a pretty big difference between uh, the time on the clock for Jose and I and the time for CJ. Though I guess that's because we've had a couple more um, mid or intra, I guess intra or inter level transitions where the timer is mm -hmm. not running. Uh, that makes more sense, yeah. Um, and particularly if uh, I'm not sure if CJ's been skipping cutscenes. Uh, uh, he has. He hasn't been as quick on the draw, if only because. So be I, I had to kind of give him a little guidance on like you can skip this, you can skip this, skip this. Right. 
because uh, a couple of them are a little bit less obvious than others. Most of them, it's you. Ooh, You're almost getting crushed, out there. but I got it. <laughs> Very close on that. He has a couple scenes. In fact, earlier in this in this stage, I believe we didn't even really mention it, but uh, there's a spot where you have four sequential. Uh, Dialogue-based cutscenes with battle in, in a mm -hmm. row in the same room, which is kind of frustrating because all four of them have a single jump between them. So you have to <laughs> skip the cutscene, make your jump, skip the cutscene. A little and bit Jose frustrating. Going through the final room, uh, one big long room to get to go. the end of uh, battle in, but seems to have made it on the first try. All right, and skipping that cutscene, Jose has unlocked the double dash. Mm-hmm. Uh, Madeline and Madeline, sort of a, a story situation, is have uh, reconciled some of their differences, and now they are working together to climb up the mountain. Yes, I'm trying to remember. Madeline essentially is a represent is sort of a personification, I guess, of Madeline's kind of d self doubt and and kind of d like defeatism, I guess. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like the entire time, Madeline mm -hmm. has been telling Madeline that you know you can't do this, you can't make it up, and. Um, Kind of, kind of being a bit more selfish mm -hmm. uh, about about herself, but and end up learning of, more about each other to become whole. Yeah, through part of their discussion that they have in this level and the next, as Jose is getting to the summit, uh, is kind of that we're learning that the the sort of villainous, you know, vibe that Battlein has been giving off has been slightly misconstrued, and that it's more of a self, it's more of a defensive, uh, sorry, a defense mechanism. Than Definitely. it is, you know, out, uh, like overt antagonism. It's sort of a an attempt to protect Madeline by by virtue of just like don't do this thing, you might get hurt. Mm -hmm. And with now with two dashes, there's a number of uh, more moving opportunities that we can actually see. Absolutely, you know, double dashing twice in the air, uh, being able to chain some uh, wave dashes on the ground as well, mm -hmm. a bit more easily and a bit more quickly. So uh, it's always going to be an interesting play. We'll also see for uh, for the summit, like you were saying before, we're going to get um, kind of musical uh, reimaginings that kind of mix together the main theme of the game along with the themes of those levels, but also the uh, backgrounds that we're seeing here and the just environments and the and the level mechanics themselves are going to be reminiscent of each of those levels as well. Right now we're getting mm -hmm. kind of a remix of Reflection before we move up to get a um, before we get a sort of remix of the Forsaken City. At 500 meters. Yes. Uh, it's always going to be interesting. I had to do like a nice uh, tour of Mount Celeste uh, yeah. to kind of wrap up uh, this game. I think I made a joke during during my stream that we're not even playing a Mega Man game, but we got surprised by a boss rush in the form <laughs> exactly. of a level rush at the end. Mm -hmm. Nice little skip. And there's a number of other paths that lead to you know other collectibles, other strawberries, crystal hearts, mm -hmm. uh, like a cassette. Uh, that you will not be seeing, uh, but this is a very sprawling, very large level. You can spend a long time. Here. Absolutely, if you if you get through the whole level and you miss something too, it can take quite a while to actually locate what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I I want to say this level only. So so uh, most of the levels, or I guess all of the levels, have um, kind of chapters to them that you can then select from on the level select mm -hmm. if you want to like go looking for strawberries you missed or a cassette where you know where vaguely it is. Uh, I want to say for the summit, it just divides them by 500 meter markers. Yes. So uh, and then, I believe the summit is also divided up. Um, oh, into its but we'll see that when we get there. We have a couple of uh, number markers. Yeah. Because yeah, because because when you get to the top, there's 30 flag markers that are there. But I want to say there's six distinct rooms to the actual place. They're just very long mm -hmm. rooms. Yeah. Um, but if you die, you start from the most recent flag marker, not the actual room start, which is a nice, nice. Uh, yeah, it makes it easier help. to uh, sort of retry and make sure you have all your strategies correct. Yep. All right, so I am now beginning the summit as Jose is reaching the end of 500 meters on his way to 1,000 meters. CJ in the long corridor with Oshiro's ghost, mm -hmm. giving me terrible flashbacks as we <laughs> as we get uh, into the 45, 50 minute range here. Always, well, yeah, it was still like one of like the biggest tests of this game right early on is this all oh, this year over. So it really is. Yeah. The paces. It's interesting. It kind of forms a really good like mid, sort of mid boss midpoint for the game as as far as challenges go. I would I would argue that this room is maybe harder than uh, than most of uh, the Golden Ridge, kind of put together. Like Golden Ridge yeah, is more about that. patience than anything. 
Mm -hmm. Whereas this one, you have to be like really careful and kind of twitchy with your controls to get out of the way. Make sure you have all your timing correct. Yeah. It's nice. Uh, Jose it. is now in the bolt site, uh, yes. dashing through the dream blocks. Uh, and we actually saw earlier that if you dash through a deep dream block into a wall, it does automatically kill you, so you have to be careful about your yes, you know. directional inputs on that one. Yeah, there's an interesting, uh, right near the start of it, there's a very tall dream block that uh, you have to, like, do a series of diagonal kind of jumps through if you want to get through there correctly. As you can see, mm -hmm. you can kind of dash back and forth if you need a second to think, but you do need to kind of eventually figure out, like, all right, what am I actually doing here? Yeah. Thankfully, with the double dash, you can also correct your. You can also give yourself a second by you know using one of your dashes straight up to like reposition yourself along the dream block. So you have a lot of a lot of maneuverability there. All right. So Jose, moving on to the Celestial Resort at 1500 meters. Moving on to Golden Ridge. All right. I believe I am in the Forsaken City portion, 500 meters of the summit. Ah, this room, yeah. The, and of course, the Celestial Resort immediately starts punishing Jose. It will punish yeah. me as well. These Those, timings are always just difficult to, to figure out and get through. This one in particular, th this one blob early into the into the <laughs> Celestial Resort portion of the summit uh, had Jose's number and mine. We both spent a weird amount of time just struggling with this one I think part of it is you don't have... And there we go. He actually he got past there it, it there. Using the second dash to kind of make the timing work. That's the thing is like if you get the diagonal dash, if you time it just right and get the diagonal there, then you can buy yourself a little time. But if you don't and you kind of go up and then diagonal with it, you don't really have a way to correct yourself in midair. Whoops. So... And you have the coin protected by these these blobs. Yep. Uh, it's always difficult to figure out the timing to get in and then also back out. Yeah, Jose actually resetting the room nice. to give himself uh, that transition timing instead of uh, the death mm -hmm. timing. All right. On to the final, Rick is on the final room of the Forsaken Site section of the summit. Uh, you have to follow uh, battling along for the ride to get up to the top. Uh, indicating that you need to help each other to actually reach the top of the summit. Yeah. It's a nice little quick visual signifier that you're coming to the end of a given 500 meter section too. Because mm -hmm. uh, Battleland only shows up in that final room. And when you meet her at the top, that transitions you up to the next portion of the climb. As I reach 1,000 meters, Jose continues through the 1,500 meter Celestial Resort. This is another, another long room to get through. Uh, Full of fuzzy floors and fuzzy walls. That means you can't stay there for too long, or else uh, you'll start getting hit with some of those uh, anxiety bubbles. Now, is there a is there a path underneath the uh, the the button that's there? I there was curious about is. it, but didn't try it myself. There is a path. I believe it leads to an extra collectible. I'm not sure which. Um, there's another underground path that's a little bit hidden that Jose skipped over. That does actually lead to a skip into this room, so you don't actually have to go up and then back down. Oh, interesting. Okay. Ah, the spike room that I'm in was definitely one that I think all three of us had to, like, take a second to... Cause there's just so many spikes there. Yeah, and just maneuvering around. You can't touch the floor at all. It's all its all about man managing your dashes. Yep, yep. And as Jose reaches 2,000 meters, getting up to Golden Ridge at the summit, while CJ is working through Golden Ridge the first time around. Mm -hmm. Making my way. You get the, the similar side. aesthetics both on the screen. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot more, uh, a lot more of the, uh, the kind of brambly spikes going on further up at the summit than there are uh, mm -hmm. the first time around. They do a really good job of. Uh, I, I feel like part of the inspiration for the way that the summit works overall is, at some point they came up with a bunch of rooms that they were like, this is just too difficult for that portion <laughs> of the game. We have to like, not destroy them that early. Okay, let's put these all into a thing in the later. end then. Mm -hmm. Put all of our most challenging stuff at the end and we'll kind of lace those together instead. Yeah. Uh, you could definitely say the same for some of the B and C side levels. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Some of those were definitely developed earlier for you know normal levels and it's like, mm, we need to tone this down a little bit. Yeah, it needs to be, it needs to be beatable uh, for <laughs> someone who does not spend an entire day on this one level. Exactly. All right, as I'm making my way into the Celestial Resort, prepare for this awful room that I'm about to spend a good minute or so in. Ooh, on the backswing. Yeah. Getting caught by the, by the little bubble. Yeah, it's a it's it's a real trick trying to get past that one. 
Jose is fighting the wind uh, in that portion of the of this part, part of the summit. Uh, it seems to be going on to this other longer room uh, where you have to guide this block all the way through. Yeah, uh, It's kind of precise, but it looks like you got, uh, you got through uh, just fine. Yeah, It's definitely one of the more technical rooms, I think, out of, out of the A-sides, where you have to really chain together a handful of things pretty precisely if you want to get through. Yeah. Another block escort room as well, where you can't even move this one block, so you kind of just have to mm -hmm. follow it all the way up. Particularly difficult if you want to get the strawberry as well. You have to kind of go out of your way, but still yeah. follow it. One takes a, a particularly difficult path through there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with the backdraft wind, it's actually one of the... I find this one of the more fun rooms just because you're able to like go super fast. Oh, have yeah. Have the wind kind of carry you through some of the obstacles. It's generally a lot less dangerous uh, when you've got the backdraft instead of like a headwind coming oh, at I would you. I say using a hyper dash to skip some of those skip some of those blocks, but did not end up working in the end. Oh, there we go. Trying again, and making it this time. It's interesting seeing CJ doing uh, the the, um, the little pilotable blocks at the same time as, as Jose yeah. right next to him. <laughs> All right, as Jose gets to the last room of, was this 2,000 meters, I believe? I believe so. I don't actually remember the uh, the numbers. I just know them. And the worst part names. The worst part yeah. too is it's like okay, so what are the actually? I guess it does it does line up with the actual level numbers because reflection mm -hmm. is at zero meters technically. So That's true. level one then goes to five hundred and so yeah, twenty five hundred meters as Jose is taking a back road through oh, the beginning. To grab this bubble that will actually take you further into the temple. Yes. So. And go through a secret path up top. And there we go. Drops it back down here. Continuing on, as I'm getting to the end of the Celestial Resort. Yeah, there's another timing uh, challenge at the end of Celestial Resort. Yeah. Oh. I think you actually were able to uh, just barely miss a bubble due to some hitbox weirdness. If you, it, it, it seemed like very closely you actually hit one of the fuzzies, but the hitbox it, yeah, didn't there's, overlap just enough. So there's definitely a couple some, spots where it's there. like, it's like, did that did that make sense? Was that supposed to? Okay, I'm not going to ask questions. <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. As I go up to the, the 2,000 meters, the Golden Ridge, while Jose is making his way. Like, guess this key. This is also a key where you can hit start over and get to the start of the room, so most of climbing down. Oh, yeah. Uh, I also guess a very difficult down, right? one if you accidentally do that with the Golden Strawberry, because that's you know, oh, all no. the way through. You have to do a Golden Strawberry the entirety of Summit. Oh, my God. So it sends you all the way back down to zero meters. <laughs> Jeez, that would be a pretty devastating one. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, so the Golden Strawberries don't appear on your first playthrough, correct? That's correct. You have to beat all A and B sides uh, before they pop up, appear. along with the C sides will also pop up then as well. Gotcha. Yeah, that would definitely good that that does not that that uh, that, that does not appear on your first playthrough because that would be a pretty <laughs> awful even by accident. At that point, it's like you see a you if you collect a golden strawberry, just immediately take it like start over. Just don't even. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even useful. Um, I would say all the golden strawberries except for one are at the beginning of the level, so you have to like, make that choice. Yes. Um, level one's golden strawberry is actually at the end, and it is a winged strawberry, which we've seen a couple of those. Those strawberries will go away if you dash. Yeah. Uh, which requires the level one golden to not only be deathless, but also dashless. Yes. Huge challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I spent several hours doing that for a stream once. I did get it. I was very happy that we mm -hmm. actually managed to get there. I was very good. on the brink of giving up literally on the last the last <laughs> room of it, but uh, but we, we pulled through. Alright, we got Jose reaching the end of the Mirror Temple at 2,500 meters mm -hmm. on his way. Ooh. Uh. Oh, oh no, that's not, not so good. Quite. All the way to the bottom of this very tall room. Um, now this would take some time to get through in the first place, even even just on your first try. All right. As I'm making my way, continuing through the Golden Ridge. I think I'm getting close-ish to the last room of this one as well. Yeah, there we go. Last room yep, of there's Golden the last Ridge. Room. There we go. So As Jose... Up. Moves on to the final challenge of the summit, 3,000 meters. So this, as we were talking about before, the, the mechanics of this change a little bit. Uh, so the summit, excuse me, the peak at 3,000 meters, 
only really has, I think, six distinct rooms, but as you're seeing, Jose grab the, tw the 29 flag. Uh, those count down from 30 to 1, and each of those serves as your checkpoint instead. So if you die somewhere rather than going to the start of the room, which are massive at the summit, uh, you just go to the most recent flag that you would hit. So it's very important divided into trigger. three sort of sections. Um, I believe it's three. So this section is what's called the downdraft section. So you see the wind on the screen is actually oh, blasting yeah. Jose down, which will mess up with your jumps and your up dashes. So you have to be careful about that. Uh, later on, we'll be running into an updraft section where it's almost as if gravity has been turned down a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to be jumping a lot higher. And then the final section is just normal. Alright, up to flag 24. There we go. And then Rick is going through the mirror temple, uh, hopping down to get into the bubble to get that last key. Ooh, a little bit of misfire in the red bubble there. CJ still yeah. fighting some wind. Uh, toward the end of Golden Ridge. Yeah. A lot of, lot of wind mechanics as the game goes on. Mm -hmm. Always uh, difficult to kind of manage yourself through. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of runners consider the wind mechanic to be one of the more annoying mechanics of the game yeah. uh, to fight against. It's just such a limiting factor, and if, you, if you're off by even a little bit, then it really does mess up your, uh, your, your movement you know, mechanics. Definitely. Uh, this overhang at the twenty flag is kind of a is sort of a little tricky, a little tricky one because you need to essentially get into each of these overhangs with one dash apiece if you want to make it to the there we go the little recharge crystals there and just a straight shot up to All right. flag nineteen and the updraft section. Alrighty, I am slowly gaining on Jose over time here, but. Mm -hmm. The question is if it's going to be enough before. Oh, in yeah, in this room with uh, that Rick just got through, there's actually a way to skip the skip activating those doors. Really? Uh, commonly known as door skip. Uh, oh, it's nice. one of those things that you must do in order for your run to be quote unquote not actually valid, but um, it, it's a skip that doesn't save a lot of time, but uh, <laughs> it's always just fun to do and always fun to fun to see. And people, nice. Uh, it's a de facto requirement if you ever make it through that. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Jose now halfway through the flags of the peak at 3,000 meters into the 14 flag. Rick making it right to the summit to flag 30. Uh, and this is that stamina section I was talking about earlier where it's it seems to be ooh, barely yeah, getting barely through those enough. spikes. Uh, it seems like it's virtually impossible not to be winding down your stamina as you get to that flag. Mm -hmm. It seems to be like the only real section of the game where that comes into play to that degree. Um, yeah, um, just being able to manage that stamina um, and knowing what you can do while you're still flashing uh, yeah. is very important. Like Again, wall jumps will not take up your stamina. Uh, there's actually a way to do a single wall wall jump without using your stamina called a neutral wall jump uh, uh -huh. that you can actually still gain height with. Uh, it is very difficult. Uh, it requires some you know deft joystick maneuvering. So you can keep gaining height while also going back to the wall that you came from. Interesting. Uh, but it is possible. All right. We're now crossing just past the one hour mark. Uh, Jose getting to the nine flag. Myself getting to the 24 flag. CJ in the Golden Ridge. Making his way closer to the end of that stage. Mm -hmm. Let's see after the 22 and the seven, seven. on the flags. So currently... The seven is one of the last sections before the final climb to the peak. Yes. I want to say what the seven or the six flag is the last portion, portion of the updraft section, too. Yeah. Right, we got six with the feather. Nice little jump up to that cloud from there. As Jose gets to five, five, skipping the oh, five wait, flag. A, yeah. Uh, there are a couple Ooh. flags you can skip that actually technically take a little bit... Uh, more time to kind of get through. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's the risk of if you die, you have to go back further. Right, yeah. And I, I suppose skipping the five flag is not the end of the world. It's not exactly difficult to get from six to five in the first place, <laughs> but it is a little bit time consuming. And with the race tightening up as much as it is, you definitely don't want to be sent back more than one flag if you can avoid it. Exactly. Uh, so Rick is now hitting flag 16. 16. 15. Yeah, those were really pretty close together. 14, yeah. Some of them are like extremely, extremely tight together. 
As Jose gets to the number two flag. Final clap. Oh, and takes a short dive. But is it will start pretty quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think he's about to the section with the little uh, one one block brambles that are kind of there that need to be kind of jumped diagonally around. Oh, I guess he's actually passed that already. Here we go to the one flag. The final ascent. Here we go. You hear that music kind of drop out. There's the cold mountain air. It's always... Oh, let this happen. Here we go. All right, here we go. And the final time the final for Jose it was one hour, 228. Very nice. 18 minutes on that one chapter, but that is a very good time uh, to kind of get through. As I was saying, like one of my best times is around 55 minutes. So, you know, around an hour is about uh, what you're looking for. I'm trying to remember. Jose had mentioned what his best, like some of segments was building up to this. And I want to say he was at 10. Oh God, I'm trying to remember. I think he was saying like 110 somewhere around there okay. was his previous oh, summer that's segments. A, that's a good savings. So yeah, a pretty bad. solid PB for him. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think my own my own sum of segments before this was about 108, uh, mm -hmm. and as we're coming down to flag four. Every time I hit Final flag four, I, I start moving right. And I'm like. Psh Right, binoculars, <laughs> stay away. Yeah, the binoculars are helpful if you don't know the level. Yeah. Uh, they kind of give you a good overview of what you're about to do. But mm -hmm. if you know what you're doing, you just kind of go right ahead. Yeah, you're just going to skip past it and go. Uh, and unfortunately, with the speed run we see on Jose's screen, uh, since you're not getting any or any strawberries, you have a, kind of a sad pie at the end yeah. of it. Um, but <laughs> it's a very pretty pie. time to kind of make up for it. Yeah, I, I believe uh, when you have all of the strawberries, you have a much more much more incredible looking pie at the end of it oh. yeah it's very it looks very delicious uh if you see the cutscene, also the people do actually comment on how many strawberries you've collected so nice. it's a little bit a little bit sad at the end when people <laughs> are like that's only got zero strawberries but <laughs> oh my goodness here we go myself getting up to the one flag our final ascent here final as well <laughs> getting that music drop time again. Was. There we go. Them. Final time of once it comes up, one hundred four oh seven, a little under one hundred four oh eight. Only a, a minute and a half difference yeah. right there. So at this point, I'm going to let Steve take a little break uh, for what's left of the run, since we're shifting over now from uh, you know my and Jose's kind of very you know like novice speed runs through the game. Uh, over back to focusing on CJ, who uh, is doing this entirely blind. This is not something that uh, he had uh, played before. Uh, the day of for practice, he kind of took a quick swing at a little chunk of the summit, but otherwise, this is his first go here. So, a little bit of context as to as to like the differences in those runs. Um, uh, even even after getting to the end here, uh, CJ talking about possibly picking the game up himself probably uh, uh trying to do a little bit better of his time here uh this is this is actually one of the more interesting kind of uh rooms here in golden ridge that cj is kind of struggling with because it's it's one of the earlier examples of some like really tight required uh you know platforming to get this done where you have to kind of land on this platform and then immediately dash to the side to be able to get the button down below but then you have to land this red cloud launch back up and then you kind of have a few different options here you can either dash into the blue bubble uh, which will then shoot you you know either right or at an angle but either way you can shoot out of that onto the actual arrow block to go over to the side uh, or if you lined up just right you can actually just grab the block without the blue bubble it's not really like a time save since you're going to be waiting for the block to make it to the side anyway but as you can see, it's a little bit tricky between just getting the, you know, timing of the red cloud down and... Ah, here we go. Let's see, is the one? Oh, no! Oh, no. But as you can see, he's just about got it here. This is this is kind of one of those doubly tricky challenges because the wind is really strong again. So you can actually see at the start of each, you know, return to the, to the beginning of the room here that uh, it's a struggle just to even get 
any movement to the side at all without dashing. So you have to like really pace how you're moving around, how you're how you're getting through there. If you want to do it quickly, then that's that's great. You can use your dashes, but if you wind up kind of using it too early, going off the side, you could find yourself in trouble here. And there we go. So we're now over to the next room where CJ is fending himself off from the snowballs. As you can see there, they're a little bit tricky. Uh, if you're not quite ready for them, then they can be kind of a pain. Uh, as mentioned earlier, they're very similar to uh, the bullet bills from classic Super Mario Brothers on the NES, which, ooh, oh, almost. Uh, which in a few levels, uh, I think usually third stages of a given world, uh, would fire uh, at, in some cases, in, at random heights. In some cases, it would wind up being uh, the height that Mario's at. Either way, a pretty big challenge. Uh, I want to say either for the Lost Levels or... Yeah, I think it was Lost Levels. Uh, there is actually a stage full of bullet bills where rather than having one bullet bill fire... Actually, you know what? No, I'm sorry. I think I'm thinking Super Mario World. Uh, rather than having bullet bills fire like one at a time at a given height, it instead had like five or six that would all fire at various heights and, and uh, along different... Uh, horizontal placements going up too and like it's a huge mess and it's it's kind of scarier looking than it actually is because for the most part you're going to be in the middle of the screen and not having to worry about it but it's still an interesting look it's a very dynamic kind of thing there uh all right so we're navigating the four springboards up and on top fantastic siege getting it done excellent excellent the, the bounces off the snowballs are very interesting because the timing can feel a little bit off. You have a little bit... The hitbox for where you can land and then jump off of it is actually a little bit lower than you might expect. Uh, it's not quite on the very top. Like, you don't have to drop down onto it necessarily. If you hit that front corner, then you can come at it with some uh, some horizontal velocity and not have to worry about, about dying to it. Uh, I'd be very curious to see how many speedruns have a uh, you know pathing strategy that involves um, that involves like landing on the snowballs at a certain point because there's definitely uh, there's definitely so because it's all timing based right so it's all it, it's coming at recurring intervals it's gonna change a little bit if you die in the room like the point at which a snowball is gonna show up is gonna be different based off of that versus if you you know come into the room successfully and immediately start dashing across, so I'd be I'd be very interested to see how like an official speed run uh, generally deals with these snowballs, or do they usually just ignore them? I suppose that's that's a possibility too that that they just kind of try to you know dodge around and not bother with them since they might be you know if you're if you're not working off of optimal optimal strats like if you're not if you're not optimally timing stuff or you're not or rather you just like you have you're off by a frame or two from what you're used to then you might find yourself smashing into a snowball where you weren't otherwise if you were relying on them for uh for speed so yeah so this is so this is celeste as you can see our final event of the second games uh welcome at this point to the uh full length uncut version of the event uh, for the sake of the original event, we decided to go with uh, a kind of abbreviated version that showed off the the two runs that were that were very close together, and then with Siege having a blind run, we decided, all right, let's let's kind of fade that out. We'll show off uh, his summit run at some point in a video as well, and then we'll have a version that has all of it together as one big thing. So that's where we are now, checking out the full run. Still quite a bit of challenge left to go. Uh, as we're here in Golden Ridge, and we still have uh, Mirror Temple, we still have Reflection, and then, of course, the Summit, uh, which, if you've been following our uh, bonus videos for the second games, the snow must go on, uh, then you'll know more or less how the Summit goes. Uh, but for those just joining us, we will be following all the action right here. Uh, another part of the reason we did the abbreviated version, aside from being, you know, a little bit more interesting and being able to kind of commentate or have Steve rather to commentate on you know some of the speed run strats or attempted speed run strats between the two runs uh we also felt a little bit a little bit cruel to have him sit down and be like hey we're gonna do like uh, basically a day-long commentary I hope you're ready for that so 
Uh, I hope I hope he doesn't mind terribly that we're that uh, this part is going uh, so low, but uh, I think this is going to be a little bit more. I, I think it'll be kind of you know an interesting. Oh, almost had that one. Had to flip around and grab the left side of the wall there. Uh, be able to commentate a little bit on. CJ's run, so obviously for, for all three of these runs, I was present as the person who had to record these. Um, I did my run first to make sure that I wasn't taking any strats off of anyone else's runs. Ooh, the wind really messed him there. Ugh, close one. Uh, and so, yeah, obviously I was here for CJ's run as well as Jose's. Jose obviously knew exactly like what he was doing, where he was going. CJ at times needed a little bit of, of kind of a just general like, oh, yeah, that's, that's generally where you want to go. In in some areas, you'll see with uh, with the Mirror Temple in particular, that can be kind of a maze. Uh, and rather than having a lot of guesswork in addition to that, uh, we decided to like, all right, let it let it be, you know, the fastest version of a blind speed run. As CJ gets to the end of Golden Ridge, and as we are now at one hour, 14 minutes and change into his run even picking up a strawberry at the very end there. I forget if that's the same strawberry that I grabbed on mine. Uh, both CJ and myself inadvertently grabbed one strawberry on our way through uh, and then, you know, carried that through to the finish. And Jose managed to dodge all of these strawberries. Uh, regardless, one strawberry does not improve the quality of said uh, bready pie. Uh, so hashtag bready runs. So here we are in the mirror temple. CJ navigating around, doing a little Spelunky action here. Getting a little squat, a little uh, squat dash. I think, I think that might be the, no, there's another one later. I think there's only two required squat dashes in the entire game, and I believe they're both in the mirror temple. Um, where is the other one? As, I'm, as I say that, I'm now just like, wait a minute. Uh, there's a pretty useful optional one in uh, the old site that you can use to get past uh, one of the segments that's got three battle-ins. Um, and I believe that was in Jose's run, and I don't believe that I used that one. Um, oh, and yes, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, both squat, both both required squat dashes are going to be in here. Um, the other one coming, uh, I think, shortly after the second the key door? I'll have to remember as we, as we get through here. Uh... I definitely had, like, a vague idea of the ordering of, of, you know, all the rooms and things, but as you can see, I don't have the overall layout memorized, whereas uh, anyone that's doing, like, pro-level, you know, sub, especially sub-30, but probably anybody that's doing, like, sub-50 uh, runs of this game are going to have essentially every stage completely laid out, uh, you know, in, in their heads and, and being able to recall how every single area connects to one another. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting. So when uh, when I started working on some of the uh, um, uh, post production, I guess you could say, for this event, uh, for the original version of it, uh, I wound up looking up uh, maps essentially because I was like, all right, I want to, I want to, for as you can see that little middle line there that's showing progress. You can see the Tierra de las Hermanas Hook uh, flag. On the far right, uh, Imperium Ludum's is there, though it's kind of buried underneath the uh, the Tierra flag. Since uh, you know, at at end of game, uh, you know the the Tierra flag was you know representing first place. But as you can see, so like every time you know we cross into another room, that flag is going to move. And so I was like, all right, I should take a look at some maps and like see if I can get an idea of how many rooms are in each stage. Uh, follow the... Oh, there's the second one right there. It actually didn't look like he did a dash there. That was very interesting. Um, but yeah, I wanted to see, like, okay, so is there, um, you know, an easy reference on, on rooms, essentially? Uh, and the answer wound up surprisingly being no. Like, I was, ve I was very much expecting, like, oh, okay, it'll be... Uh, There'll be some map that's got like a like a white line or something or a dotted, you know, perforation looking thing that indicates where one room starts and another one ends. Uh, and there was none of that. It looked like uh, you, maps you might see for like Sonic the Hedgehog, where it's just the complete level, uh, pixel perfect stitched together. 
and with no indication of where one room ends and another one begins. And like, I probably could have walked through and gone, oh, this is that room that does that. Oh, this is that room that does that. But like, it really wasn't, uh, it really wasn't working out when I tried doing that. I was like, I'm just gonna actually walk through this. And so essentially, I, essentially what I wound up doing was I used, so I, I started with my own because I wanted to get post-production going as soon as possible. We didn't we didn't even have a second run in yet. And I was already like, all right, I got to figure some of these things out because this is going to take probably the longest time to pull together. Um, strictly speaking, I mean, if we're looking at a full event, when we did Sonic Mania, the first games, uh, the we did the whole thing as one big video. Granted, I was also the solo commentator for that. And that does make it a little bit easier. And we didn't really have like a a middle line style um, progress bar. Uh, also, if I had thought about it, I would have made the progress bar look... Uh, so the, the design of this progress bar is meant to look something like... Um, something like... So when you pause the game, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little set of dotted lines and pipes that indicate uh, chapter, uh, chapter breakdowns within a given level, as well as how many strawberries are in a given spot. And so I was like, all right, that seems like a fun little, I'll, I'll use that. So I used that as kind of the, the model for uh, the, uh, the progress bar. And I think that kind of ties it in together. A lot of folks were saying they didn't actually realize uh, I forget what prompted some people to notice, but I think it might have been during the Celeste event itself uh, that people in the comments hadn't noticed that uh, that the overlays we've been using for like time and score and all of those things uh, and like names and, and show details was actually literally uh, the uh, good recovery by CJ, but he couldn't quite get that one in there. Uh, was I going to say? Uh, but the yeah, the overlays that show time and points and names and all that uh, are literally the overlay here in, in Celeste. You can see that kind of... It's it's a little dark right now, so it's not super clear. Uh, but you will be able to see... Oh, that shortcut, by the way, that we just passed a moment ago. Uh, all three runners uh, wound up using it. That was one where... Uh, CJ, rather than, you know, pushing him to try to figure out a maze blind where there's a million different ways to run his strawberries, uh, pretty much was like, there is a shortcut in here. I won't tell you how to get to it, but there is a shortcut in here somewhere. And he did figure that out entirely on his own. So, uh, so kudos to Mr. CJ. Um, but yeah, the, the current, uh, timer that's going on up there. Uh, you can see not very well. You'll see it in a brighter room later, but uh, it's basically just kind of like a neat little slanted uh, block. Very simple, straightforward, uh, you know, font. Uh, Renegare, I believe, is is the font. I don't know if that was the font before the game came out, but that's certainly the font now. Um, and I really like it. It's a very sharp, classy-looking font. I like it uh, quite a bit, and I think I even used it in one or two things in the lead-up to the second games. Uh partly because I liked it and partly because I was like, I wonder if anyone's going to notice. And it's interesting. There are so many times where people, especially in our discord, have been able to predict stuff with almost no information at all. Um, like for example, we did the, um, Oh boy. Was it the super Nintendo classic? I think it was the super NES classic edition, maybe the NES classic edition. Uh, and we had a plan for something we wanted to do at the very end of it. And literally, uh, we put up the unboxing video and someone called straight up the entire plan. Like, and I was just like, how, how, how is that possible? We've given no information and, and, and they just figured that out. And yet for this one, we were using a, an overlay that not only was it inspired by Celeste, it's literally in the same, when it's on the left side, unless there's some element of the game UI that's, that's sitting there normally, it's literally in the same position as that timer using the same font sizes the same colors the same kerning a lot of the time uh we literally exactly mimic the timer when we're using uh it as a timer uh and nobody guessed it i was very surprised by that i thought that was for sure going to be like the dead giveaway now, granted there are people who were looking at the the little circular icons the little event icons uh from the from the like trailer for it 
And there were a few people who were like, that kind of looks like Celeste, right? Like, that looks like the mountain from Celeste. And it was. It's literally the logo for Celeste uh, in silhouette. Um, but nobody really mentioned it again after that. Including, uh, so using using the font and literally the overlays from this game in all 16 events. I guess technically... Oh, no, I, guess, I, I suppose I was going to say technically we don't use... Um, we don't use uh, any overlays for it here, but uh, I think we I think we do, right? We have the I think we have the names in the corners ultimately. Um, but there was all of that, and uh, I think a day before the original upload, the original like hour twenty ish upload, uh, the abbreviated version uh, had. And I guess still technically in this video as well, but like we had announced ahead of time that that Steve was going to be co-commentating uh, on that. I guess technically we announced that he was commentating. I don't think we I don't think we actually announced that I was going to be in there as well, because realistically Steve was the important commentator of the event during during the more intense speedrunning portion of it. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. I do not. <laughs> uh, if I did, I would have probably had a slightly better time. Uh, but uh, I don't think anybody like people noticed that Steve was going to commentate and were like, Hey, Steve's commentating. But I don't think anyone actually was like, Oh, if Steve's commentating, that's probably Celeste. It was, it's so strange. The stuff that, that wound up being the stuff that winds up being dead giveaways, uh, on our channel and things that don't you know, are wild. Uh, anyway, we're now in kind of the trickier section here, uh, where we've got these little demon things that hound Madeline on her way through the Dark Temple. Uh, it's a tricky, it's a tricky little mechanic. I think I think all three of us had varying levels of difficulty with it, where uh, we just like couldn't get one of them to behave, or like just one of them just happened to just keep barely nailing us as we're trying to get by. Uh, and it wound up being like a whole thing there, but. That's okay. I love a good game with some challenge. I'm sure that there's uh, optimal strats on how to, like, frame perfect navigate through rooms where the little demon guys are kind of baited into, you know, useful positions where you can, you know, uh, you know, bounce off of them to set up a new like combo or whatever. Oof! Oh, oh no! Rough one there for Siege. This is kind of interesting too. This little section that he's in strikes me as kind of odd in its own way because it's the only section of the game I can think of that really feels like kind of the same. This one's a little different, but the few that come before it feel like the same room like three or four times in a row. And it's just very kind of surprising. Like it's, it's a little bit different each time and arguably a little bit harder each time, but it's kind of the same task over and over again. Which is which always struck me as a little bit odd, because so much of the rest of the game, every room feels like unique and distinct from one another. Uh, but that section feels like, all right, we're gonna like really test your ability to do this a couple times. So that that was always kind of surprising to me. Trying to trying to uh, take care of my voice a little bit better. Uh, so, I've talked about this since the original video came out, but uh, earlier in the week from the day that, uh, I guess the night, evening, that Steve and I recorded our commentary for the first hour and a quarter of this, uh, like that Monday or Tuesday, I was suffering from the early stages of a sinus infection, uh, and at the time, it was mostly just like, oh, man, the left side of my head feels like it's on Jupiter right now. Like, it's killing me. It's sore. I was so congested and, like, so much pressure, and I couldn't do anything about it, and I was miserable. And then Tuesday comes around, same thing. Uh, and I think on Wednesday or Thursday of that week, uh, I think it might have been Wednesday, uh, or Friday, actually, another thing about it, because Thursday I probably would have been streaming, but 
regardless, uh, Steve and I sit down and we do our commentary for a, a little under an hour and a half. Uh, and you can actually hear a few folks were commenting on the fact that they can actively hear me start to lose my voice doing the commentary. As it turns out, if you're suffering from any kind of throat-based or throat-adjacent uh, ailment, don't go pushing your voice by speaking for an hour and a half at a time. Uh, or you could devastatingly lose your voice. Uh, the follow-ups to that wound up being uh, some... Uh, oh god, what was it? Kirby Star Allies, episodes 26 to 28, uh, in which you can hear me dramatically losing my voice. Actually, I'm sorry, that came second. First up was uh, three episodes of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, where my voice sounded super deep and super cool, and I was doing like the, the shock jock radio voice thing. And, uh, and... It was great, and I apparently pushed it too far because by the time we did three episodes of Star Allies, I could barely speak at all. Uh, and this was followed by about a week of me not being able to speak basically even a little bit. Uh, and I'm only just coming out of it by the time of the last couple episodes of, I think, Kirby Battle Royale. So you get that in kind of three backwards progressions there. So CJ's in this mean little section here where the game kind of points you in the wrong direction. Like, you hop up and over, and then you can go to the right here, and that can lead you to the strawberry. But if you're not looking for the strawberry, just kind of, like, come on, jump, you can do it. There we go. It just kind of points you away from... So this is interesting. We mentioned before that, so you see, CJ still has the key here. Uh, it's not useful in this room because you still have to climb and get out of there. But if you do that in... The uh, if you do that in the Celestial Resort uh, during that long horizontal segment, the really narrow jumps where there's a key on the far left side, and then you got to go up into the ceiling and the rafters to go back around. Uh, if you just take a dive or even just pause and, and uh, retry the room, you'll just be back at the beginning of the room with your key. So it's a nice little time skip there, um, which is which is pretty nice. It's CJ going for. His second key, passing by the optional alternative key that Jose used in his run. CJ getting sniped by the little demon man as he crosses one hour and 30 minutes, 90 minutes into this run. As we continue on forward. So the marathons are always an interesting kind of thing when we when we bring them up. Usually we do them as marathon streams, but for stuff like the games, we decided, you know, we did Sonic Mania once, which was variably between, oh God, an hour and a half to three hours, I think. Uh, and this one's got a little bit more variance in its, in its times overall. CJ now swinging back around to the left the underside of where he got the first key as this is where the second key re is going to reside or rather the path to the second key the second key lives right next to the first one all right using this no I'm not using the springboard just going forward up the wall scaling the wall instead of using the springboard to get up there and as uh as i had mentioned earlier with steve here's like the one spot in the game at least in a sides where you do have to use if you come this way like, you could optionally do the path that Jose used and not encounter this at all. But, as you can see, the little demon will target or will uh, activate the button. So this is the one spot where once you come down this path anyway, you have to use a demon guy to activate the button. You do not have the option of doing it yourself. There's all those brambles there. I suppose it's hypothetically possible if the hitboxes have a gap similar to the ones in the Celestial Resort uh, during the... the um, fuzz wall. I don't remember what it was called, but there is hypothetically the possibility that uh, that there's a crouch dashable thing there. As you can see, the wall comes down and covers up our little demon friend, so once you get that, you're, you're in the clear. It does also mean that you're going to need to do that one second. I'm pretty sure there's bramble, there's spikes that are in the way from the left side of the room, so you can't just then jump up to get to the one on the right, so you would have to do that one second if you wanted to be able to uh, oof if you wanted to be able to uh, get through that room alright those the like little tendril things here 
weird me out because they almost look like giant versions of the little fuzz tendrils from the Celestial Resort. But they're kind of like... I don't know. It's almost like demon seaweed. It's so it's kind of hard to describe what it looks like to me. But it's like little flagella, just wobbling around, dying on the same patch here, from the opposite side. CJ getting around now has the other key, so he'll be able to go and get the red bubble to careen off to the left. Uh, so far, I have not actually tried. Apparently, there is a hyper jump means of uh, skipping all of this, which sounds pretty great to me. Uh, I am told that it is a, I, I mean, see, uh, I, I'm told, Steve, I think mentioned it earlier in the run that, uh, that, yeah, it's an extremely difficult, like, uh, hyper jump situation. I guess you would have to, yeah, th that seems like an extremely difficult one to pull off. I'm not even entirely sure what you'd be bouncing off of to get that one done right, but I don't know, maybe... I don't know. You might have to do like a, uh, you might have to do a uh, a corner jump or something, like the the jump off of like a corner where there's spikes. But ang if you, I guess maybe if you angle it the right way, you can you can make it work. I don't know. Oof. This one's a kind of a fun room. You do have to kind of carefully navigate down and then back up. And this one, this one has a pretty solid use of the uh, of the dash blocks here. Oof, and it is tricky because if this demon guy gets up top here, it can be very tough to. Oh no, it can be very tough to not have him dash at you as you're setting up uh, the launch off of that dash block. All right, setting it up, setting it up. Oop. Alrighty. Just need to down dash and be in the clear. There we go. All right, up we go. Another vertical climb with another demon. This one, if you don't move fast, can be a little bit of a pain. Like, you have enough leeway that you can get up there quickly without the demon being in your face. But if you take too much time, like, he's just kind of all up in your business. And it can be sort of difficult to actually navigate. Because you have to dive sort of back and forth there to make that work. And uh, if he's on top of you at the same time, it can be kind of a problem. All right, so this hallowed room... This one is the big pain where if you just kind of fall off your rhythm, you can spend a weirdly long time here. So you don't have to break this lower one, though if you break the lower one, there's a springboard underneath that can be useful to getting yourself in position. The biggest trouble that I tend to have here is that uh, it's sort of just a big square room. So there's not a that, like it's weird. It's big, but it's a little congested. There's not a lot of like good active zones here. So our little demon friend has a lot of places he can go where you would think, oh, he'll be able to charge at this, but he doesn't. And if he hovers right here, that makes it also difficult. Where like now you have to kind of like line it up in just the right way and like make sure the demon doesn't like dive out of the way. Make sure you don't jump on the demon like that. Hits you. That's not great, though. The block does stay. Uh, the bottom block stays gone. I don't think the top one does. I think the top block will come back if you die. And I'm really not sure why that is. Uh, I'm not positive why one stays and one goes, and it's not a consistent behavior between the two. Because uh, there were definitely times where either Jose or myself, or maybe both actually, uh, got the block, the the block on the top left, taken care of. And then still died, and so we had to reopen it again after that. But, ooh, bad beat on that. All right, CJ looking to get this red block out of his face. And that's worse, too, if you're hugging onto it. So that's like the worst case scenario here is you wind up being on the wall, knocking out the demon, and there's the block, and now it's back, yep. You knock out the demon, he, while you're on the wall, he drops straight down, so then when he comes back, he just kinda hovers up in your direction, and then tries to dive at you, just missing the block. So you have to like, peel yourself off the block, but then kinda lead him back to it. It's, it's, a, it's a much more difficult kind of set of maneuvers than it looks like, and I think that's kind of what gets a lot of folks kind of stuck there. All right. I 
think for mine I tried to like stay up near the top as best I can and then drop down. Um, but there's a lot of different techniques. I'm sure there's better techniques than the ones that I was than the ones that I was using. Ah, uh, that one sucked because it looked like it bounced off of Madeline and then into the red block, which makes that a little bit, a little bit of a of a extra little dagger twist. Here we go. This might be it. All right, sweet. All we got to do is get up top there. Oof. Just got to climb. Use those those shimmer barriers to your advantage. Go, 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 go. Don't let up. Don't let up. Yes. There we go. All right. Okay. So, got to grab Theo. There we go. And we're off to the final leg of this very long level. This level, it's like... It can be done very quickly, but it's got a lot of, like, decently segmented out bits that all have kind of their own vibe to them. Um, this one and... I, I guess... I guess they all do to an extent, but I feel like it's much more noticeable in this level than in others. Uh, like, the reflection... Reflection also has some, like, very distinct stuff, especially once you're fighting uh, Battlin. Uh... Golden Ridge kind of has slightly different areas with the wind uh, blowing at different intensities. Obviously, the summit is, like, entirely made up of just a ton of segments. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I think this one, it's its the first point where it's, like, really striking that there's, that there's a big difference between some of these segments. Oh, remember, my chair has suddenly come very loose, and that makes, uh, loose, and that makes me very sad. Entirely sure what's going on there. I'm, I, I have a GT racing chair, and I'm looking forward to getting rid of it. I actually really don't like this chair. It might be a better chair for someone, uh, you know, 80 pounds lighter than me. Like I'm not horrendously overweight, but like, there's not a whole lot of seat to this seat. If you catch my drift, I don't know. Anyone out there who's like 150 pounds or less, though, you're probably all for it. This is probably a great chair. It was like the top-rated chair, and I was so excited for it. And then I used it, and I was like, hmm, I don't know. But I digress. We have some interesting... So this jump right here is kind of strange to me, because, like, you can make it while just carrying Theo, but, like, it's such a near-pixel-perfect jump to make. It's easier to throw him. Even still, like, that feels kind of awkward, too, and, and I don't know. Also, you might be noticing that for CJ's run, he's spending most of his time... So, this may be something that most people do, and I'm, like, the weird one for, for not doing it, but... Uh, so, CJ uh, tends to do his run... Or tends. It's, it's only one run that he's done. Um, for his run... Oh, so close. For his run, he opted to basically not be holding grab until the moment where he wanted to start grabbing uh, onto walls, uh, or I guess Theo as well. Whereas for me, I usually I'm spending most of the game holding one of the trigger buttons uh, just to grab in case of like a missed jump or something. Uh, there's obviously segments where you want to not be doing that, but ooh, wow, almost threw the demon right into him. Oh no! Ah. Uh, but yeah, I, I spend most of my time. I, I never, I don't think I actually, you know, pulled Jose to see how how he does it. But uh, this door, this one's, this one's a little interesting because you have to like, <laughs> sweet little switcheroo with the devil there. But uh, you have to kind of throw Theo. You can either dash and then very quickly pick up Theo and dive through the door, or you can like throw Theo and then dash him as soon as you can afterwards. Uh, and just kind of, excuse me, just kind of get the, uh, get him through there as soon as the door is open. But I don't, uh, uh, you can also, so for, for mine, I didn't throw him through the little spikes. I, I put him onto the platform and then, you know, sent the platform up. Okay. So that's something little demon guys on the other side. Go, go, go. Ah, not quite. Almost. Almost snuck through there at the end. 
Yeah, so I, I usually just threw him onto the platform because it was going to launch him up, and it seems like they designed it as being you can kind of go either way with it. Um, it just felt easier than having to worry about, like, if I messed up the throw and then was up top and had to navigate back around and, like, pick it up to try again. It's just easier to throw it onto the onto the dash block and then, and then not worry about it, you know? All right. You really don't get much time with the little demon guy being dead before he's he's good and active again. Like it's just a short enough time you can't really plan out any like meaningful like okay, now that he's dead, I can blah. It's like no, you just be like, "All right, he's dead. Quick, let's do a thing." I'm curious if you can crush Theo on the top of that door. Like if you put him on the top and then dash, what would happen to Theo? I have to imagine it'd be the same as throwing Theo off a cliff, like that, actually. Uh, and that it would it would cost a a life. Not not a life, but it would it would reset the room. Uh, but I guess I, I don't really know for sure. Trying to fix this chair on the fly, but it's no it's a it's a no go. I'm gonna have to live with it. It's okay, at some point uh, at some point, you know, twenty minutes from now, I'm just gonna suddenly scream out in pain as the chair arm gives way and I just kind of lean mash my elbow into the side of this. Alright, so we are coming down to this might be the last this might be the last room before the giant eye. I think... I think this is the last one. Right. Oof. Ugh. Almost. Almost. Come on, CJ. You got this. Oh, That little jump there, because you got to make them... you got to make those two jumps pretty quickly. Uh, I believe you can go up and around, though it is a little bit slower. Oof. And I don't think any of us actually tried. It might have been a little bit easier since you actually have, like, the fallback of if something goes wrong, you just kind of, you know, bounce down to the lower path and then go from there. There we go. Go, go, go. All right. Yes, here we go. We have made it. We are here at the final segment of the Mirror Temple where these optic blasts, these concussive waves being sent out, are knocking Madeline and Theo backwards. Now, if you if you time it exactly right, you can actually... Oh, is he gonna... There we go. Nice. Hour 45 and 30 as we get through the Mirror Temple and head off to Reflection. Uh, you can throw and then... You can throw Theo and then kind of dash. Like, do a little, like, dash, jump, grab all at once. Uh, and the end result is that you get at least a couple extra frames. It seems, anyway. You get a couple frames where those optic concussive waves don't actually have an impact on Madeline. Um, I don't know how much the effect is. It, it seems like it's kind of tricky to get it just right. But I'd be intrigued if there was an actual pattern that can be used to uh, further minimize the uh, the you know blowback there. So CJ trying out the feather for the first time. All right, getting ready to yeah. There we go, heading upward. Now, if you time that one just right, if you make if you make extremely tight turns uh, going through the little S-curve zone, you can actually reach this upper feather without using the lower one, and that saves you a bit of time there. Because these ones you actually have to dash through in order to... There we go. In order to get the, the feather. If you don't, you just kind of bounce off the bubble. And these ones, as we can see, we do not need to do that. Let's grab the feather and go. Oop. Oh, no. You got this. There we go. Oh, might need to uh, grab that one again. 
up into the Aurora Borealis. Alright, and now we get to the level proper, now that we've gotten through our little prologue section. Into the water below. So I believe that is I believe that is the end result of us uh, falling from essentially the near summit of Celeste Mountain. Oof. Uh, which is based off of a, a real mountain uh, in Canada, I forget where, called uh, Mount Celeste, which is approximately, I think, a little under half the height of the fictional version in this game. I believe it's, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 1,500 meters. All right, you can do it. There we go. Yeah, not quite. Yeah, we're going to need to hit the block on the top in order to send it upwards and move on to the next area. I am surprised that it seems like momentum doesn't really carry through much in this next room. Because if you, like, jump off of that, I mean, it's probably for the best because if you had momentum, you would almost certainly go directly into the spikes. But uh, it's interesting that it doesn't really carry through there. Because it seems like you have at least a little bit of momentum carry from one room to another otherwise. Or I guess you at least have... Yeah, I don't know. It does seem like you do keep... Oof. It does seem like you do keep your speed as you go from one room to the next. So, so I'm not really... Oof. Almost made it back down on that too, actually. Not bad, not bad. Getting those spikes. There we go. Can we get around here? So there's, so the game wants you generally to take this block around to the right and then up and then left. Uh, and it gives you forgiving enough um, like collision here, right there. It gives you a decent window of time to hit it on the top to go up, etc. Uh, but as we saw, I believe, in Jose's run, you can actually, if you hit right and then almost immediately right there, I, I was already late even in just saying it there. Um, nice, there we go. If you hit it when it's directly under those purple spikes, you can actually hit it on the top and it'll go up through the spikes and you can ride it for, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a second or so and get a jump and dash from there to get into this room here, saving yourself... Probably a good, like, two, maybe three seconds. I'm sure there's documentation as to exactly how how uh, much of a time save each of the various little, you know, in-room skips are, are worth um, or are capable of, I suppose. One of the more difficult aspects, as CJ is seeing here, of using the feather is that it, it's interesting. The feather controls extremely well. Uh, it's it's uh, surprisingly tight controls... Not because Celeste itself doesn't have tight controls, but because the rest of the game doesn't really use... So you can dash in any direction to a certain degree. I think there's a, a certain um, number of, like, cardinal points that you can dash to. But it's, it's you know, pretty... Uh, it's pretty, you know, good at giving you lots and lots of options. When it comes to the feather... It seems like it's almost a full free range of motion there. Uh, and it'd be easy for a game to kind of mess that up a little bit in the transition between the two. Uh, because when you're not dashing and when you're not using the feather, you are basically just using, you could use the D-pad or the stick and see no difference in terms of what you're actually pulling off. Um, and so, oh, almost, almost, almost. Uh, but so the feather controls very well, but you do need to do some really tight turning radius moves in some spots here to to get through. As CJ takes the slightly faster path to get into the next room, he's looking up, seeing all these spikes. We got some work to do. And you can see the you can see the wheels turning on this one. All right, so we got to do a little bit faster in order to in order to get on top of that. There we go. Oof. Narrow little scrape on the spikes there. And a little bit too late, leaving the block a little further left than, uh, than CJ was looking for there. Almost. Just got to get that momentum from it slamming into the wall, which is a, a 
technique that this stage likes to utilize a lot. There's at least, I think, two more sections where you need to use the, moment the momentum of those blocks in order to progress. That's kind of your first mandatory one. So you go up and over to try and grab the feather that's here on the bottom left to go to the upper right. All right, so we got that. Up and away we go. This one's also interesting. You have to be you have to be almost dead on in order to get up to this platform. It's it's a surprisingly unforgiving little moment here. Like I suppose if you focus more on going to the right than you do going up, then you should be able to like climb the wall a decent amount to to make up that difference, but it still feels like a pretty tight little bit of navigation there. All right, got the first section down, but you're going to have to hit it on the right side again after that block has come down in order to continue moving to the right. All right, that's number two. Of course, you do have to hang on to the block at that point because that little bit of grass is going to scrape you right off the top. All right, so that's one. Barely hit on that one. That would have been last frame before the uh, the dash ran out. All right, here we go, here we go. Checking out the right side here. CJ seeing that he cannot quite get to the end of that. Not even can't quite, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on here that we're about to see as he plows through on this side. Ooh, just barely scrapes those purple spikes as we go for another attempt. All right, so again, this is our second point where you need to use that momentum in order to uh, to progress past this room. There we go. All right, cool. Pressing on forward into reflection. Not bad. All right. What do we got here? Siege kind of taking his moment to kind of assess the room, seeing, okay, I got to hit that. Gives you just a little bit of lift there. It's such a tiny amount of difference compared to where you could normally jump that I could see it being a confusing point for a lot of folks who are like, well, why can't I just dash up and over that normally? And in fact, I think if you do a hyper jump off of the... Um, off of that top section, you can just barely get enough clearance to then dash up and over rather than using the bottom section. Saving you, I don't know, maybe a, maybe like two-ish seconds, give or take. I'm curious if there's actually a... Um, well, one, I'm curious what the sum of rooms looks like for this game right now. Like some, some of best segments, some of best rooms... Uh, and if anyone's kind of been starting to work out like a hypothetical, uh, you know, best, you know, best time, essentially, best theoretical time. All right, giant pinball room. Got to get up to the right. There we go. And, you know, naturally, these little pinball things that have the electric little zappy things going on alongside them, their element is ice, naturally. If you don't believe me, uh, play Celeste and check out the core level. It's, uh, it's actually a level that you unlock upon clearing uh, the summit. But you do need to have, I believe, four hearts in order to uh, in order to actually get into the level. You need to collect four crystal hearts from among the a, B, and C sides, or rather the A and B sides. Uh, the C sides don't. I think the C sides were were added with the farewell DLC and don't really factor in. Uh, granted, if you can beat the C sides, then there's no reason you should be doing that instead of beating the A and B sides. Also, but yeah, I suppose you probably could do that to get hearts. And to be fair, the C sides are very short, technically. Uh, I've been practicing a little bit since. My own run, 
and I think the first three seasides. So I decided, like, okay, I'm kind of trying to get my own sum of segments down in various stuff, and I may as well do that with, you know, B and seasides also, because why the hell not? And for the seasides, I was like, well, technically, so all the seasides are three rooms, which means no matter how well I do, the last room is going to be returning me there. So if the only difference is those first two rooms for a given seaside, I may as well go for the golden strawberry, right? Like I can redo the first two rooms pretty quickly because they're going to be fairly short and then struggle against the third one. And so the result of that is I've got, you know, sub minute times for, for the first three seasides and like one in change for the fourth because I just got uh, annoyed with, with trying to golden strawberry it and just like had a particularly good third room like in terms of, you know, reattempts. Uh But I suppose seasides, like the first four seasides, I probably have in under 5 minutes between them. Uh actually maybe even under 4 minutes between them. So like I guess if you were to do a in any percent speed run that didn't stop at the summit like this one does, but rather included the core, or God help you, farewell. Uh, I guess a fast way of unlocking what you need to unlock. Well, so for farewell, I think you need 23 crystal hearts or something, right? Like you need basically all of the all of the available crystal hearts. So that's a different story. But if you were also doing core, I feel like the easiest way to do that would be to play through most levels normally. Uh. I guess, like Steve was saying, uh, the Mirror Temple is actually faster to unlock and complete the B-side rather than beating the A-side. And B-sides, I believe when you beat those, you're ge like, you get a crystal heart as, you're, like, as the thing that ends off the level. So then you just do 1, 2, and 3 C, and you've got your four crystal hearts. You don't have to really worry about it anymore, right? So, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. I'd be very curious to see how uh, how those tend to play out there. All right. Seeds are continuing on with the blocks, this little back and forth segment. I thought this one was kind of cute. Uh, and I, I'm curious if if you squat dash over it, if you have, if you do it right, if you can get your dash back in time to just hit the right one instead of having to hit it left and then right again. Not really sure. All right, getting lined up. Uh oh, oof! Pain, extreme pain. Not CJ's run, just you know, getting smashed into a giant rock wall. Oof! Again. All right. So it was interesting. I debated using my own timer overlay. For one, the in-game timer is everything I needed to be. So like, it it didn't make much sense for me to go and like re you know reinvent the wheel. But um, oh, and as we hit two hours, there we go. Uh, but as the screen does this little transition to black, it would have been cool to have the timer still be there just for consistency's sake. But it's so not a big deal. But what I find very interesting about that timer is, so if you're playing a 60 frame a second game, which Celeste is, uh, and you're counting milliseconds, strictly speaking, counting milliseconds is a tiny bit redundant because for any given frame, the centiseconds, the hundredths of a second, will always change by uh, one or two. Uh, if you are using basic rounding, then the hundredths of a second, so every six frames that you're going to have zero hundredths, two hundredths, three hundredths, five hundredths, seven hundredths, eight hundredths, and then you're back to zero again. So it's very easy to just count hundredths of a second, and in fact, we did that for a handful of our events because uh, it just kind of seemed a little redundant to have thousands of a second when they weren't actually being like a meaningful addition. There's some spots where we included where we included it in official times just for just for the hell of it, but 
So if you were counting sixtieths of a second in milliseconds the way that this game does, what you would expect to see is 0. 0.000, then 0. 0.016, 0. 0.033, 0. 0.050, 0. 0.06, uh, 0. 0.066, 0. 0.083, and then 0. 0.100 where those hundredth and thousandth place digits just repeat every six frames. Uh, but that doesn't happen in this game. There seems to be some kind of allocation for dropped frames. Uh, it's it's tough to it's tough to like really notice when you're playing it, and even when it's moving at full speed. But the next time we get to a screen transition, uh, take a look at the in-game timer, and take a look at there's actually just a tiny like few frame kind of buffer. As the next game, uh, as the next room presumably loads, I would have to imagine it's doing a quick load on that, or something like maybe it's enemy placements or or whatever. Because like the background is consistent, I believe. Like it's still a scrolling background, and the sprites are all loaded and stuff too. So like, I'm not entirely sure what would be loading, but that's the only thing that makes the, like any real sense. And and you can see right there it froze at 0.779 seconds for a handful of frames. It wasn't very long. It was like, you know, somewhere between four to six frames. But I think the idea is it's freezing the game in between frames. Like, it's got its own calculations, and maybe it's literally making decisions every thousandth of a second instead of every sixtieth of a second or, or something. Uh, and when it freezes the screen there, it will often show a non 60th of a second amount. So as we saw, 0 0.779, right? So that's not that's not an even 60th of a second count. So just looking at that, I would have to assume what's happening is it's making calculations and then it's like, oh, gotta load stuff. Finish, finish whatever this frame needs to do, but cut it off the moment you're done and show whatever time that applies to. And then take a couple frames, load a few things, and then when you're ready, unpause it on the next frame and continue. And then you've got these kind of inexact looking times. Because it's like, all right, your inputs are having thousandth of a second you know, impacts on what's going on, but we're only presenting it in sixtieths of a second. So you may not necessarily notice that that's going on. So basically that just makes, you know, and I assume when it reloads the room it has a similar effect, but we also don't see the timer for a little bit during that point in time, so it's hard to tell, is it at the beginning, is it at the end, is it throughout? Uh, so any kind of displayed timer was not going to be a great a great call here. Like an, an added one, the one that you're seeing is in-game. Alright, as CJ continues down to the depths, preparing for an encounter with a battle-in. Here we go. Oh, oh, that's right. We're not there yet. We're almost there. We're very, very nearly there. First, we have this little guy. We got our three hops, and then we ride it all the way to the right. But it's going to take a second to get that situated. I believe there is a way to hyper jump at just the right time to gain an immense amount of momentum here uh, and skip essentially the second half of this ride. Um, Jose was looking to set one up, but I think uh, miss inputted. How the hell would you say that? Wrong. Like he, his thumb, he was just like pointed down instead of diagonally, basically, and wound up just kind of diving straight down into the pit uh, rather than getting the hyper jump off and because the room was so long he opted just not to bother with it on the second try uh, in case it would in case it was going to wind up being like a big time sink essentially so here we are the confrontation with battle in the second of two real like boss battles in the game uh, and as mentioned before this one's a good deal more difficult since uh, you're not just dealing with an enemy that is showing up on the side Oh, it's hilarious. We have uh, Nintendo fangirl who commented uh, with Alex Roseberg on 
the uh, the biathlon earlier in the games showing up on the uh, the online notifications. Um, but so when fighting uh, uh, Mr. Oshiro's ghost, uh, he basically just dives at you, and you can jump on his head. You can kind of duck out of the way. It's not too big of a deal. It's a it's a kind of a passive sort of experience for you because you're mostly just trying to avoid him as you go on your way to the exit. Here, it's a much more active confrontation. You have to actually aggress on Badalin in order to allow yourself to continue through the stage. And Badalin is also attacking back pretty fiercely with lasers and bullets. And you essentially, you essentially wind up with this little chunk, this boss battle of an almost bullet hell segment mixed in with the kind of indie platformer vibe. Which is kind of neat. There's a lot of like indie bullet hell games that exist, uh, but the blending of that with traditional platforming is kind of a fun little thing that you don't see all that much of. Definitely kind of rough. There's there's more than a few times where, uh, where you can wind up going for your... Ooh! Unlucky squash there. There's uh, more than a few unlucky times where... Oh no! The same exact spot! That little block's got his number. Uh, there are definitely a few times you go for your dive against... Ooh, narrowly dodged one there, in fact. Where you can go for your attack on Badalin and wind up diving directly into one of her bullets or one of her lasers. Ooh! Uh, there is a good amount of forgiveness with this game, though. I have noticed that there are times where Badalin is preparing an energy blast and appears to release it at Madeline, but if you're close enough, you just get pulled into Badalin for like the event of getting that collision, and it doesn't actually count you as having hit the energy ball, which is which is great. It actually usually destroys... Oh, in fact, that might have been a good example of it right there. It destroys the energy ball also, uh, so pretty forgiving on that front, uh, but otherwise, Badalin is a lot. She's a, she's a bit of a handful. All right. There we go, progressing through, and yeah, one of the one of the bigger lessons that needs to be learned when doing when dealing with this section is knowing when you have to hold back for a quick sec. The blocks can do their thing, so you don't get squashed, so you don't get crushed in all the wreckage. All right, down to a little tiny room. Some of the more tight navigating platforming happening here. You got to be a little bit more careful and conscientious of, of your surroundings. All right, a lot of bullets, a lot of bullets. All right, that one's an easy spot to get crushed in. That one's one where you definitely have to go back because I don't think you can actually clear those spikes otherwise. You have to navigate back or pull off a really, probably extremely pixel perfect um, wall bounce off of the falling platforms and then dive to the right to get out of the way. Uh, probably not ultimately all that worth the, oh no, worth the effort unless you are extremely sure you can pull that off. go. Oh, no! Unlucky little spike. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, get up and up. Oh! Heartbreaking. Got, got stuck on the little stone step. One of being... Oof! One of being uh, CJ's downfall on that particular run. Alright. Here we go. Here we go. Ooh, unlucky little spike kick on that one, and then falling directly in because of the new spawn point. So yeah, there most rooms it's not a huge deal for placement. It's more an issue for time, especially in the Celestial Resort. But for the most part, when you recover in rooms, you're put in a, a relatively safe spot. You don't really have to worry about instantly dying again, but in some cases they do put you in slightly weird positions where it can be very easy to just 
fall right off immediately and be like, oh, well, that's okay. All right, I guess I just insta-died there. I really like this section of the of the battle and fight where you're kind of doing these, like, it's like a ballet of item collection and movement where you don't really have the opportunity to stop in place. You're kind of just going with it. It's a kind of a... Um, was it Rayman Origins or Legends that had the little... I'm, I think it's a thing that's from further back than that anyway, but these sort of musical platforming segments where you're sort of running and matching the music in order to optimally play those levels, and I think that's kind of a neat thing that they do. Uh, this one's got a similar sort of vibe to where you're like, I really can't stop. I just have to keep moving. Wow, extremely close call, but unfortunately was... Slightly squandered and slipped into the spikes. Sibilance, sibilance, sibilance. Oh, there we go. Continuing forward. This might be the last room of this oof of this segment before the kind of a uh, uh, midpoint of the battle in battle happens. Battle in battle. Huh. Battle in. Battle in. Battling. Battle in. Huh. Anyway. I can't remember if there are any more rooms after this before the spot where uh, where Battling calls you out and is like, I was only trying to help you, kind of thing. All right. So CJ is taking kind of a uh, careful... Oof. That's a little tough segment because you have to kind of da like neutral dash through there in order to not bump into any of the walls, the ceiling... Get through the little narrow passage there. Ooh, very close call. Oh my goodness, a lot of extremely close calls. Ah, with the with the lasers. Doesn't quite make it through there. Alright. Continuing. Continuing on. Really good music in this section, too. It kind of ramps up the intensity while still having a very, like, emotional sort of um, foundation for the track. The the chanting kind of adds a lot to it, gives it a lot of that kind of, like, very personal sort of feel as opposed to... And it's interesting because it does have... It has that same, like, lightly... Like, light electronic... I mean, I guess the whole, the, the whole soundtrack has an electronic feel to it, but... This is one where you really get that human side of the music pushing its way through. Which makes sense. It's a very emotional sort of personal uh, struggle going on here between uh, Madeline and part of herself. All right. Oof. Oh. Almost. Almost. All righty. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, boy. All right, can we get through? Ah, not quite. I believe during the during the run, during CJ's run, this was a moment where uh, where Sarah came up to watch for a little while. She picked a hell of a room to, to witness because this one is pretty unforgiving, especially on a blind run where you're not really used to, oh, where you're not especially used to uh, the various little teeny bits of movement tech or just like the timing of the lasers. And that bit right there, it's the trap, is you want to try to see, oh, I can dive through both of them, right? Not so much. You have to go through one and then the other. Oof. Catching Siege on the jump. Here we go, here we go. Looking clean. Oh, barely ducking underneath. All right, there's our one. There we go. As we hit two and a quarter hours... Oh, that's right. We have our vertical sections here. This one's a toughie. There's like a whole bunch of hits in a row, and then they drop you down into that zone where you have to kind of thread the needle. I believe you have to jump over a chunk of spikes. Oh, no. You go, you, you go through it. I'm mixing it up. There's another section that comes later on where there's a moving block that you get flung and you have to use that momentum, but then you also have to jump over a set of spikes while taking into account your increased horizontal uh, 
movement, and you can very easily just slam directly into it. I think both both Hoje, uh, uh, Jose and I wound up at least once smashing into those particular spikes. All right. Oh no! Missing the platform. Here. Oh! Dashed a little bit early there. Alright, keeping on moving, keeping on moving. There we go. Oh! Some narrow misses here. Uh, so, originally when coming up with the idea for the marathon event to do for this, not like there was a lot to come up with exactly, but um, at first I was considering whether or not we should have the core also be part of it. And then I gave, I gave core a quick, a quick like practice run through. And I'm like, no, no. Cause like the rest of the game, I, ah, here we go. Here's the, here's the kind of midpoint confrontation with battle. And it's actually, it's actually past the midway, but uh, it's it's kind of a middle point. Oof, smushed into the ceiling. Um, but I spent some time on core, and I was like, all right. Like, if this was just me doing a challenge thing for myself, like if I was just doing speedrun stuff, would I do core? Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, but I also had to take into account, like, all right, what are people going to want to do? And what are people going to want to put up with? And core was kind of pushing my buttons. And I'm pretty resilient as far as, like, I might complain out loud, but I will still just kind of, you know, rip my teeth and dig through it. But core was kind of causing, this, by the way, was the room I was talking about before, the block that flings you at those spikes that are kind of tricky. Because you have to do a diagonal dash, but if you have too much momentum or you hit the button too late, you just smash directly into the spikes. I like that. Uh... Yeah, core core even on just like a practice run was taking me like twenty some odd minutes, and I was like, this feels like it's gonna wind up being too frustrating. A lot of the actual rooms feel much more random than the rest of the game because you have uh, those bouncing, like the bouncing ice platforms. A lot of just or, or the bouncing ice enemy things. I don't know what they're called. A lot of moving platforms, a ton of mid-air double dash techs that you have to pull off to navigate and not die. And I'm just like, I want to make sure that, the, that these runs are still fun for the people that are doing it. And I feel like core is just a little over the line of fun, like between fun and just rough. Like, if you're playing it for yourself and you don't really care about your pace and you're just trying to be fast for the sake of being fast, then it's not that big of a deal. But for speedrun, that's just an extra layer of stress I don't think anybody needed. So, uh, plus, honestly, as, as like, you know, figurative marathons go, it felt like starting your game at the base of Celeste Mountain and ending it once you reach the summit made the most sense from a kind of a... Um, I almost want to say like a metaphorical sense, but that's not really right. It just, it felt, it felt right that the race was bottom to the top. None of the extra fluff. Um, just you wait. One of these days we'll just have like a, like a hard mode games and Jose and I will race each other through um, farewell or something. And then we'll both cry. Cause like you can learn strats and you can get good at that. Absolutely. No question about it. But man, if that level, because it really is one giant, it's essentially its own A, B, and C size smashed into one. You can literally even see where the transitions happen because all of a sudden you have rhythm blocks, which becomes your B section. And then suddenly you have a handful of very large rooms and then one absolutely massive room that even at optimal speed is going to take you like a couple minutes to get through with extremely careful tacks. Uh, and once that level gets under your skin, it is so easy to get thrown off your game and just start taking the worst deaths. Oh no! Oh, so close. Uh, 
and yeah, I don't know. It's one where it's interesting because like so strats will help, and having a plan for some of them, like the section where you have to get five keys, like having a having a real route and plan for that is gonna help out a lot. But at the end of the day, it all just comes down to execution. Uh, there's there's not a lot of places that I noticed where you could really make significant time saves by like, ah, if I do a very specific sort of hyper jump wall bounce, then I can land this thing. It's kind of like, uh, well, you have to do a hyper jump here and you have to do a wall bounce here. Uh, and you can maybe save yourself about two seconds if you do this extremely complicated maneuver. It's like, ah, I'm probably just gonna stick with the regular one and, uh, and just try to do it quickly, I guess. There we go, Siege. All right, coming down to the feather segments of the of the battle with Battlein, the Battlein battle. Down we go. Yeah, in there. I love this bit. It's a nice long chain of. Uh, oh no! Didn't get the didn't get the momentum. Otherwise, that would have been one and done from CJ on this. Uh, well, I guess once you get past here. But this room's fun. I, I really like this one. I think it's a nice little, uh, uh... Close enough. Oh, that's right. There's still more. And, oh, dodged the spikes, but did not manage to land the pinball bumper. Excuse me, the ice bumper. Because in the core, uh, those appear when the core is ice uh, engaged. I don't know. Uh, as compared to the fire one, where instead they look very spiky and on fire, and uh, you can't touch them or you die. Uh, so CJ, as you can see, has paused the game for a moment. He decided to take a quick bathroom break. Uh, he was hoping to get to the end of the level, but he had been holding it for like something like 15, 20 minutes, uh, and was just like, I can't wait for the end of the level. Unfortunately, because he's still in the level... The timer does still have to run. I did mention that, and he's like, "Yep, that's fine. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use the bathroom." Uh, but he is back in approximately 15 or so more seconds, uh, and I think he actually does. He does actually get through this pretty quickly upon return, which he was just like, "Oh, great. Okay, so maybe I, maybe I could have last another like you know little bit, but that's all right." Uh, but yeah, the battle in battle is a very interesting. It's such. It's such a long segment of the game. Like, it doesn't seem like it, but it does really stretch itself out, especially if you're just dealing with it for the first time. And there we go. We got we got CJ back on. Shout out to Snookum's gal as she's appearing in the in the uh, as they're appearing in the the uh, corner there. All right. Here we go. Ah, almost, almost. We're so close, CJ. You can do this. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, damn. A lot of, like, wild visuals going on. It's actually kind of impressive in, in some ways that, like, there's so many particle effects and things. I guess, I guess because they're so pixelated and the Unity engine, I'm sure, is doing a lot of the legwork to, like, you know, garbage collect and all of this stuff. And I'm sure that, like, not that they also didn't program it carefully to account for all of that, but there's tons of things going on, and there's no real slowdown outside of that couple frames in between rooms. Ah! And the trap of those spikes right at the end there. I believe there's one more hit before this room is over after that. But... There we go. Oof! Oh, that's right. The pinball hit is, is still down there. I was mixing up the uh, the momentum platform hit and the pinball oof hit. All right, all right. Here we go. And I'm down. Oh, I don't know how that one didn't count. There's there's a certain radius around Battlein that all counts as yes, you got her. Uh, and it'll kind of, like, you'll get sort of drawn in, and it'll force the attack to, to go through. Oh, no! Oh, right into the laser. Um, 
and it looked like it, he was he might have literally been a pixel away on that dash. So that was extremely close. I think the sprites actually overlapped for a second there. All right, down we go. Oh, jumped into it again. Oh, God. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, bang, bang, bang. All right, momentum block cleared. Down to the pinball. Oh, no. Oh, not a great bounce. Got unlucky on the... Uh, on the angle. So if you're not familiar, I think I think Steve might have mentioned this before uh, when Jose and I were in this level, but the pinball bumpers, the little ice bumper, will fire you off. Uh, there, uh, so so I was a very you know math focused person in school and in college and stuff. And there's a word for it. It's not tangent. Um, Essentially, whatever whatever direction, whatever vector you're on from the center of the bumper, that's the direction that you're going to go. You're going to move, I guess, perpendicular to the bumper at the at the point of contact. So you want to, for here, you want to kind of hit it right there. Perfect. Like right along the right side of it, not so much on the top right corner, but as close to the right face as you can get. Because that'll fling you to the right. You get a little bit of upwards momentum. You get your dash back, and you can use that to close that gap and get that final hit. All right, so now we have our long feather laser corridor. I'd be very curious how many rooms in this game have actual um, have like have like community nicknames. I feel like I, I bandy about like off the cuff uh, off the cuff uh, nicknames. Not just in this game, but in lots of games. We're like, oh, we're in the block. I wish I could think of literally any examples right now. Nope, not a single one is coming to mind. That's a that's a that's a real bummer. But think about how you know uh, the Sonic community, for example. There's the Barrel of Doom in Carnival Night Zone Act Two. I want to say uh, where many a child's uh, Sonic Three game completely ended when the the mechanic of pressing up and down rhythmically to move the barrel up and down uh, was totally lost on us. Funny part too is like everyone that I knew was just like, I don't know, man, I don't know how to do it. And then upon finding it out was like, oh, they never told us any of that. But I think someone has pointed out that in at least one manual for a version of the game, whether it was like North America, PAL or Japan, whether it was Sonic 3 or like uh, Sonic 3 for Genesis or for the PC version, something somewhere the barrel mechanic did get explained and somehow we just all missed it. I want to say it was in one of the instruction manuals, but I don't I don't recall. All right. Navigating once more through the feather laser corridor. This one's a tough one cuz it does seem like this, you know, outside of that little the split zone right there. Like, it does seem like this area has a path that uh, that, you know, it wants you to take, but we'll see. We'll see how this shapes up. Could go any direction. Let's see. Siege coming up on two and a half hours here. All right, making the dash to go grab the feather. And you can't scroll back to the left. That was something that I did not know uh, for this one. You cannot go back to the left. And so we kind of got screwed out of a, uh, a feather there. All right. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Oh, no. Wound up bonking himself down back into the spikes. Here we go. Here we go. All right, grab and go. Oh no! Ran out a little bit early there. Now I'm not 100% sure if CJ is pressing right or not. It seems like he is. He's moving pretty quickly now. Because uh, if memory serves, if you don't press a button, I forget if you automatically just go to the right. There we go. 
final room of the battle and battle. Uh, or if you just keep going in the same direction, you do go slower than if you were to hold the button. All right, level up achieved at two hours, 30 minutes. And now CJ has the double dash ability, the neon pink hair. And now we'll be able to ascend Celeste Mountain once more. We have our quiet kind of deep breath epilogue to reflection. Nice quiet segment. I'm not actually sure if it's possible to die. I don't think it is. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's no hazards in this closing segment for uh, for reflection. All right. Get up to the little bottleneck section here. And there's our orb. We're battling. I'm gonna hurl us up to this next segment and hash it out with us. But CJ is going to skip this cutscene. And so that brings us to the end of reflection and to the beginning of the end as CJ arrives at the level called the summit, but he's really back at the base. We're going to end up at the summit. The level's the summit, but as you can see, we got a ways to go. So let's do it. All right. And up we go. CJ, getting it started. We're into our act three of this video. All righty. So the summit is essentially, and I think we joked about this earlier, the summit is sort of a, uh, a boss rush of sorts for Celeste. Uh, it brings back basically all of the levels of the game make a return appearance. Uh, in order of elevation, essentially. Uh, and you have to deal with not only the hazards that those levels had been uh, providing before, but they're much harder versions of those of those hazards uh, and, you know, laid out in a way where you need to utilize your neon pink hair double dash in order to get by and get through there. So a much tougher platforming challenge than the rest of the game thus far. Uh, and it's interesting because like the, the double dash is sort of a red, uh, uh, a uh, double edged sword. I almost said a red herring. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about, but on the one hand, yes, you can in fact, uh, you can in fact use your double dash to like fix mistakes and correct things and even skip by stuff. Uh, but it also means that they're going to make these platforming challenges substantially more difficult since now you have the ability to move twice, so they're going to make you move twice. I want to say, by the way, so when, when the neon pink hair comes into the equation, you can see that uh, Madeline's hair moves and flows a lot more. Uh, when she uses one of her jumps... Uh, her hair kind of goes back to that normal, like, red color, but it also goes back to just acting like hair. Like, it doesn't hover the way that it does with the uh, the, the neon pink hair. Uh, but as it floats around, you can see that it's an extremely fluid bit of motion, and I want to say that's because I think... And I don't think this is the case for the rest of the Madeline sprite, but I believe uh, Madeline's hair in this game is actually a 3D model. It's being rendered as pixels, which is why you will have these very subtle little differences in uh, in how it like looks compared to the frame before. Where you know most of Madeline's stuff is like okay, so we've got a like four frame run cycle and a little bit of like squishing and stretching animation as you like jump and land and all of that. But the hair is like extremely fluid, and no, they did not like code in. Like, they didn't draw up, uh, like, dozens and dozens of hair sprites at varying angles because as you jump, it moves around a bit. I think, actually, yeah, when you're when you're jumping around, it may also be a... I, I think the hair is always a 3D model. It's less obvious when you're, like, hanging from stuff, but... Uh, but, yeah, I thought that was kind of a neat... A neat thing there. And I was... I, was, I only found that out recently 
when reading up about a different game that used a similar uh, style, but... All right, so now we are up to 500 meters, our first major checkpoint of the summit, uh, and we are essentially returning to the uh, was it the construction site from the very start of the game? Oh, not the construction site, the the Forsaken City. It's got a bunch of construction stuff. I'm thinking of old site, which comes afterwards, but you can see we have our tra our traffic blocks back. Those are the ones that are touch sensitive. You touch them, they green for go ship themselves off in their ordained direction along that along that little uh, chain there so yeah so the order of these segments for the summit you start with reflection which is the most recent level that you finished but it is technically the lowest elevation um, I think he, so it's funny I think because when I anytime I've played this game before, it's like okay, you get up to the the Forsaken City segment and it marks it as 500 meters, and the way that I've always read it is like oh you've reached 500 meters, so that is where we are at when we start the Forsaken City, and that's presumably where the Forsaken City itself also is. But thinking about it, I feel like it might actually be in the same way as the whole level is called the summit while that's the goal, not where you're starting from, I wouldn't be surprised if those segment names actually indicated where each segment ends instead of begins. Because if you think about it, the Forsaken City is the first chapter of the game, uh, and you start from... You essentially start from zero meters, right? You start from the base of Celeste Mountain, uh, and you start climbing, and when you're doing that, that's Forsaken City at the beginning. So it would be strange if you were already 500 meters up to do that. Not like there aren't actual cities that are, you know, a, a good deal above sea level. Denver famously, Denver, Colorado was famously was uh, uh, Mile High City for being that far above sea level. But I don't know. It's It, it wouldn't surprise me if the idea is the start of the summit level is the tail end of reflection where you're still technically below the base of the mountain, but you're just kind of climbing out, and now you're back to the base, and you're going to get to 500 meters, and then when you get to the old site again, you're going to get to 1,000 meters, and so on and so forth, meaning that when you get to the actual summit portion of the summit, after you've beaten the, the, the mirror temple portion of the summit, and you see that 3,000 meter marker, it's not we're at 3,000 meters and still climbing. It's rather, all right, here's the last segment where we reach 3,000 meters. This is all total speculation. I have absolutely no idea if there's any basis to believe that whatsoever. I don't know if anyone behind the game, if, if Maddie or, um, or anyone else that, that worked on this has ever been kind of asked about that. I'd be curious if... Frankly, it's an answer that that realistically doesn't matter. It's a question that does not. It literally is just flavor text at the end of the day in terms of, you know, meaning. But all right, as we get to the end of the Forsaken City Part Two, and we now reach the old site Part Two, we get our we get our starry blocks, our dream blocks. This is also very interesting too because so the dream blocks. If you couldn't tell by their names, uh, they only existed prior to now in Madeline's dream. Because when she wakes up, those blocks are gone. Those blocks don't exist outside of her dream. But now we're here and very much awake, and they are very real. Granted, a you know good portion of this game is is fairly figurative, also. Uh, like, you know, with all the metaphor flying around, one could assume that Madeline is not, in fact, uh, double jump dashing up a mountain. But I digress. You, 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 you want to try to avoid looking a little too hard into uh, real-world applications of video game logic, because you're going to wind up... I don't want to say disappointing yourself, because I feel like that implies that the... Uh, 
correct answer there is that it's supposed to make real world sense, which I don't think is true. Uh, I think if you if you try to over apply real world logic to video games, you're just kind of I don't know being. I almost want a hell of a grab there, by the way. Grabbing onto that tiny ass little section there and saving that saving that run. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it sucks some some of the fun out if you overanalyze like that. Like, think about it. Uh, at least back in the day, a big part of the intended humor behind uh, the angry video game nerd is the fact that his nerd character obsessed over, among other things, uh, video game logic not making sense in a real world context, which, like, of course it wouldn't. It's a video game, you know? But CJ picking up some real, picking up some real uh, good times here as he's moving forward. Picking up a decent amount of speed. Saving himself once again after a little slip. Moving through the old site with apparent relative ease, honestly. Uh, not nearly as much difficulty here as he's been having uh, in some of the other areas thus far. Now, granted, this is a portion that he did see before diving in, so it's a little bit familiar to him. But... You know, a single, a single, uh, a single bit of, of run there, no more. So it's it's certainly not a memorized bit. And then you got this section, which historically does mess with people a decent amount. So now, if you jump as you exit these dream blocks, you do get a little extra jump. Although he didn't seem to need it there. I'm gonna say, if you jump there, you can give yourself the extra height that you need in order to uh, to make that second diagonal there. But it looks like we got through just fine. Nice, CJ making some good time here as we reach the end of the old site. Let's see if he can seal the deal here. Nice, going the underway there. Whoop! All right, and that is the old site complete. Moving on to the Celestial Resort portion of the summit, a.k.a. everyone's worst nightmare. Starting it off strong by walking directly into an enemy. You love to see it. Love a little snap. Going on with the, with the track here. So yeah, all of the, as, as Steven mentioned earlier on, uh, the music for the summit is essentially its own main track that utilizes the main motif of the game. Also, can we point out that CJ managed to get past this fuzzy asshole on uh, on his first attempt, whereas it took both Jose and I, like, uh, a number that's greater than one. Let's just go with that. So, good on Siege for, uh, for making the clean maneuver there. But, anyway, the music for the summit is kind of its own track that utilizes the main motif of the game, Madeline's, like, theme, the theme of Celeste Mountain, uh, while also incorporating... Also, real super nice sneaky move there. That was good. Uh, while also incorporating elements of the stage themes that, like, the theme for the stage that we're currently revisiting. I don't know if they, if they reuse portions of the melody of those levels... Uh, but you do at least have some of the insp instrumentation and some of the actual um, kind of tone. And again, clean, one and done. CJ is in the zone here. All right. Oop. Oh, a little bit early. He had the right idea, though. So it's I, I'm realizing it's not finger snaps. It's a it's a wooden percussion kind of thing. It sounds almost like a uh, a rim hit and a snare drum, but not quite. Because it does have kind of a snap back to it. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like a it sounds like a wooden percussive thing. That's being kind of smacked against another percussive wooden thing, and it's got that kind of slight bit of like double hit to it, which makes it sound a little bit like a clap or a snap. That little extra, or rather, a chorus of of snaps or claps, kind of tightly bound together there. All right. 
right. Give him a sec so we can breathe here. So he is going for this kind of upper path that can be a little bit, a little bit of a pain to get through. So for, for me, I just kind of like, if you go for a forward dash, you can kind of thread that needle under the next, the, the, the fuzzy guy that's on the right side of the screen now. You can get into that little section there and in my opinion, a little bit easier to do that than it is to kind of navigate up and around because you're not really going to have much in the way of attach. There we go. CJ got it right there. Did bump into the fuzzy thing there, but he did ultimately, uh, did ultimately get there. go. There we go. All right. Moving forward. Waiting for that needle thread moment here. Oh, no. Ah, oh, didn't quite line it up. Is that a... What is that on the wall? Is that a ram? Like a ram head? Ram skull? It looks like... It looks like a... Um, I mean, it's got that kind of like vague, lightly, um, almost satanic kind of vibe to it. It's very cool, but I'd never noticed it before. It's very imposing and impressive, I must say. I love this little, like, chunk that's up here that's got a different kind of, um... I don't know how to describe it other than material biome, I guess. Like, it's this little stone passageway while everything else is visibly, like, wooden. Alright. Ah, almost, almost. So he's coming at it a little bit too far to the right, which isn't giving him a lot of breathing room as he makes that first dash and tries to line up the second. And I think that's causing him a bit of trouble. He doesn't have to, like, jump super far here. Like, he's, as you can see, he he's kind of coming at it a little bit too far to the right, so his dash is taking him basically directly into the little fuzzy spot. There we go. That's what you want to do. Yeah, a little bit of a jump is all you really need to get through there. You don't have to, like, overdo it. Oh, man, that was a tight one. All right, let's see what happens as we get this one lined up. All right, not bad. There we go. All right, here we go. We're going to drop down through this. And this one's tough because you have to, like, lead it by a little bit. Because it's going to take, yeah, around half a second or so to uh, to drop down past it. There we go. Use that ledge. Get your dash back. Can we get it? Can we clear this room? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, my heart. Oh. Oh, my goodness. All right. Here we go. Here we go. You can do it. You got this, Siege. I believe in you. Mm -hmm. Here we go, here we go. Can you drop past it here? Here we go. Getting through this little scaryish diagonal section. All right, yeah, that's that's kind of. I think that's how I did it, just like up and then to the side. That earlier diagonal one was like risky as hell. All right, dropping down, nice. Ah, almost, almost. Yeah, 
Yeah, that dash is like, that dash is giving CJ some trouble here. Nope, almost. Okay, okay. As we're coming up, or rather not, as we're getting through to two hours 50. As we're seeing here, the Celestial Resort takes no goddamn prisoners. The normal level and the summit level are both just cruel. Something, it's so bizarre that platformers, and we got through it, hooray. Uh, it's, it's so bizarre that, so platformers are so often about like really tight precision, especially for like speed running them. For like really tight precision, navigation, getting through there with like perfect timing and accuracy and all these things. And yet somehow enemies that move in a perfectly rhythmic, regular motion are like somehow the most frustrating things to deal with in the entire game. I don't know how that is. Also, I'm relatively sure that if you line this up right, especially with a hyper jump, you can just hit that lower... Uh, you know, energy crystal or whatever, and just double jump your way out of here without hitting this button and, and worrying about that. Like, you can drop below. You don't even have to, as, as you can see with CJ right there, you could also just go to it and not really worry about, you know, even hyper jumping it, and then, oof, and then uh, double jump your way back up. Yep, the fuzz came around. It was planted right where CJ had stood. Not so good. Oof. Nope, nope. All right. Celestial Resort. Why are you like this? Here we go. Here we go. Nice. Okay. I think this might be the last room before... Oh, no, no. There's some outside stuff. I was going to say, this might be the last room before... Uh, the orb and battle in and moving on to uh, the Golden Ridge portion. But yeah, we're, we're literally now going outside. I think there's two little outside segments that have uh, two rooms apiece. All right. Uh, this segment wasn't fun in the original Cel uh, Celestial Resort, and it's also not fun here. <laughs> it's just It's just such a pain. Oof, not so good. Something about just the exact height of the obstacles is... It's just like it makes it that much more difficult. Oh no! Oh my god. Difficult segment. It's like you have to line up some really rough diagonal jumps here to make this work. Ooh. Barely getting through there. Oh no! Oh, I was going to say barely getting through there without landing back onto the fuzz that he just planted down. Let's see if this one goes a little smoother. Gotta just gotta dive through this bit right here. And we're on our way. Oh, there we go. One and done. Look, it's easy. Alright. Okay. 
point. Last room, last room of the resort. You can do it, you can do it. Out of the Celestial Resort at last and on to Golden Ridge. Here we go. Getting through. Hopefully this will be a breath of fresh air for Siege. Rough time with Celestial Resort. Coming up on three hours into the run. Looking to pick up some time. Uh, so during his little practice session, he... I don't remember exactly where it was, but he had gotten a little bit into here uh, when he was like, all right, I'm good, to, I'm good to do my run. He'd only done this level for what it's worth. He actually just went straight to straight to the summit and did a handful of, uh, like, the first half of the summit uh, before, before diving in. So we're very quickly going to reach a point where he hasn't seen anything again. Go. The heavy wind picking up. And this one's tough because, like, you basically have to dash just to move. Like, you can, as you can see, CJ's like pushing hard. Oh, but, like, if you're in the air and you're not dashing forward, you're going to make no progress forward. So you have to be pretty much as precise as you can get with your move, with, with your movement here, if you want to be able to actually, like, get to the other side of this room. Oh. Oh, a dash up would have gotten you there. Alrighty. Ugh. Yeah, unfortunately, if you get to that spot without any dashes left, I'm not sure there's a way for you to get to the end. It sucks. There's a few spots in the game. I mean, not even a few. There's a decent number of spots in the game where you can get somewhere not have any dashes left and you're like well I guess I'm just dead <laughs> like I don't there's nothing else to be done here uh, and that was another one of those uh, another one of those moments alright Oh no! Got stuck in the bottom corner there. So, as you can see, we have more snowballs to be dodged, which is uh, is gonna make this room a little bit of a pain. Ooh, all, probably could have bounced off of that one if he didn't use up the dash, but not a huge problem. Oh no! Oh, he got kind of an extra dash there, right? Like he he landed and dashed in what appeared to be like the same frame. And I don't know if he was quite expecting that as he as he landed and smashed directly into the uh, oof into the snowball. All right, here we go, making his way. Much cleaner one this time. All right, there we go, and we are on. Not so good there, so this one needed a tiny bit of, uh, of prompting as far as, like, the rough idea of what you're doing here, because as you can see, you get over here and you're like, whoa, how the hell am I supposed to do that? And you might look and go, oh, if I can do a double dash through there, maybe there's a wall I can grab onto, but even if you can, there's nothing you can really do from there. Like, you could... 
you could make a very difficult argument that like you could maybe do like a wall bounce up but yeah but probably not because you need the whole block to make it through and it takes up the whole space so that's not really very likely so yeah you do need to do kind of the intended uh kind of tech i guess i don't even want to call it tech it's like just the intended uh you know movement through here because now you get to push this block up through the narrow passage Oh, no. There we go. There was... My braid is apparently on backwards. He got it through there just fine, and I said, no. <laughs> it did break shortly after, and as you can see... Okay, so now, we got the now we've actually got the block making its way through as we get past the three-hour mark. And now it is time for Siege... Ooh! Oh, that was a little unlucky. We need, uh, we need Siege to grab onto the left side of the block as it passes through this little narrow passage here. You gotta move it up. There we go. Now we got to get on top, push it down, and hit that up block to get it out of the way so that he can get up here. And you can see him kind of like sitting here for a second going like, huh, okay. It looks anyway. I'm very curious if there is a sneaky means of managing this without that block, but it seems like it's just barely set up in a way that makes that impossible. Actually, you know what? No, I think you probably could if you were very careful you use one of your dashes to get to that right wall and then, again, very carefully because you, you don't have a ton of time to do it, but uh, if you... So when you're hanging onto a wall, it is possible to get around a one unit like overhang bit of block if you get high enough, you could then set up a wall bounce that just might barely take you up through there. I wouldn't. I actually wouldn't even be all that surprised if that was like something that was something that is used as a, as a speed run tech. Oh, get up, get up! Ah, no such luck. But that is what he needs to do to get through this. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Can we set this? Oof! Almost. We're getting there. We're getting there. Alright. Oh, oh no! Up, 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 up! Oh boy! Okay, nope, that works. That's fine. We got there. We got through the room. Uh, now time for this one. Our vertical block that has no... Uh, you can't guide it at all. You can't maneuver it around. You just have to follow it all the way up through all this junk that's in the way. And there's quite a lot of it. All right. Oof. Oof, oof. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, nope. Can't quite get there. Yeah, this is this room is kind of tricky. There's a lot of like, strictly speaking, there's like three-ish different paths you can kind of take up through this, and all of them are kind of a pain in the ass. CJ almost pulling off the strawberry path by accident. Uh, and that one takes a very tight jump uh, precision. I think you can actually just hold on to the right side of the block and not worry about the wall. So it is a tight thing to set up, and it's probably easier to just... Oh, no! It's probably easier to just set up by uh, going to the wall and then jumping back after it's passed by those two overhangs that are coming up, the little two spike zones. Oh, there we go. I was going to say if... I Oh, oh, so close. I think CJ might be getting a little bit hung up on, on the kind of the, um, the reflex of using both dashes every time when they may not be necessary. It's not biting him too hard, but there are a couple times where it's, you know, giving him more risk than, than he might necessarily need to spend on a given uh, a given room. All right, now we have the uh, the backdraft. A favorable wind. 
I believe this was the room that Steve was referring to uh, during Jose and my uh, Jose's and my uh, runs as uh, as one of the more fun rooms, just because you kind of you kind of just wing it, and you just go for it. It's a fun little breezy room. It's not too too bad as far as, as far as what to do. Uh, the only real like technical thing that you need to do ultimately is you just have to use the blue bubble to go up to the right and then use your dashes up to the right and you got it. So not a terribly complicated room. Eh, yep, almost, but you do need to get that up right momentum if you want to be able to clear that all the way. All right, and there we go. Nicely done. No more wind. See, just kind of just like, all right, are we, are we good? Are we good here? All right. Nice. Good grab, CJ. All right, Springboard giving him back his, uh, oh, no, giving him back his uh, his dashes in midair. All right. There we go. Nope. No such luck. <laughs> These rooms all get a lot more difficult as you get close to the end, and, and he still is kind of struggling a little bit with some of the um, with some of uh, the jumps here to get to this crystal. There are better ways to go at it. Ah, see, yeah, using that second jump leaves him in kind of a vulnerable spot here. Um, a couple ways to do it that might be a little bit better. Uh, you can use one dash to get to the first one. Like, even without any advanced tech, you can use one dash to to get to this first one and then just jump directly to the second and then use your second dash to dash through the gem. Another one is to dash twice under the first two onto the third, another jump for the gem directly or jump, jump against the second one to kind of bounce off of it. Uh, I believe as we're sitting here right now, I believe this is CJ's second of two bathroom breaks. Uh, and I, I think he just opted not to bother pausing since it didn't really matter either way, whether it was paused or not for the sake of the timer. Uh, and he should be back in even just a couple seconds at this point. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a couple ways to go about this. It is possible to do it without any dashes with just the third platform, as you saw. I think CJ's first attempt at the room, he was able to, to pull that off. Uh, but it is certainly easier if you do have one, at least a dash by the time you get to the gem there. Um... Here we go. Uh, nope, still going for it without the without the second dash. Again, it is doable. Oh, see that was it was very close. He can definitely do that without. There we go. Much safer way to. Oh, geez. Well, you just have to not dash back to the left. You got to keep that momentum moving to the right, upward. Oof. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, and we are at the final room of the Summit's Golden Ridge. Which just leaves us with the Mirror Temple and then the Summit itself. We are coming down to the end. Let's go. Let's hear it for the boy. Right, just about. Oh boy, there we go. Golden Ridge Part Two complete, and we are off to the Mirror Temple. The last segment here at 2,500 meters, or are we going to two, to, uh, to 2,500 meters? Who can say? Probably the the creators of the game, Addy Thorson. If you're out there, by all means, please weigh in. I know that you totally have time to watch multiplayer speed run slash blind plays of your own video game. Surely, surely that is that is a thing that you spend your time on. Uh, all right, Siege taking stock of the room, looking around. Oof, a little bit, a little bit early on the on the forward motion there. Nice, dropping down, getting what needs to be done. Go. 
So this one's a little bit tricky. You can, oh, just a tiny bit early, but that was the right idea. Easiest way to get that is to just dash from the top of that wall. Uh, you could hype, like you can jump for it too. Honestly, it's probably just easier to do a dash like that. Okay, momentum time. Ooh, good save, good save. And just up and over. Oh no! Oh, so close as we hit three hours ten. CJ making his way through the summit's mirror temple at 2,500 meters. This one's a little tricky to get your head around until you've actually done it a couple times because there's a lot of like just stuff moving around everywhere. All right. But CJ gets it. One and done. Magic Man. All right, popping up top, but needs to head down below in order to grab the key from the right side. Oof, bumping onto our little shuriken thing here. They actually look almost like, uh, oh, I don't remember the name of them. There's there's little spiky obstacles in uh, from the original Legend of Zelda game on the NES, but they've appeared in a handful. Of, whoa, they've appeared in a handful of games since. Um, the last time I remember them appearing in a game is hmm. I know they appeared in um, I think they appeared in Majora's Mask weirdly enough oh no sorry not um, yeah I think in Majora's Mask actually in uh, in the uh, the water the water thing no, actually no that's the water temple in Ocarina of Time my mistake Let's CJ kind of taking a look around here Trying to figure out how to deal with this moving spike. Here we go. Moving spike uh, platform there. Ooh, didn't quite land the gem on the other side. That's all right. Here we go. Ooh, oh no. Oh, used up his dashes trying to get past the little lip there. Didn't quite, didn't quite make it. go. And we got the gem. Using the platform. Nice, nice. Gears are turning, figuring out the path through here. That's one. Nice. Very nicely done. All right, we're moving on to this little segment here, and I think it I think this might be the last room before uh before the final one here. And we'll have to see once uh once it gets through it, but I think this is the last room before before we move on to uh, 3,000 meters. Whoa! Nice. Oh, not quite. My bad. Uh, I don't currently have the middle line in front of me. Uh, that one's a bummer. You can't get the dash blocks to move if you don't have any dashes. I don't quite have the uh, the middle the middle line in front of me as I'm as I'm doing this, trying to minimize the uh, the complexity of the video as uh, as I commentate on it. So we got that disabled right now. Ah, this room, yes, with the buttons on the ceiling, the springboards, and the gems. This one's a very uh, aero gymnastic kind of kind of uh, thing that'll need to be. Ooh. Barely managed to avoid the first set of spikes, but then careened right into the second set. All right. Oop, oop, oop. Nope. Missed the button entirely. I think he saw it on his way down there. Let's see. All right, so switch number one. So switch number two is right there on the ceiling. Oof. Those diagonals, they really get you. All right, button one. Okay. Oh no. Oh, not quite. A little bit too low to be able to make that move. We're at pie hours. I guess not pie hours exactly. It's like pie o'clock more than pie hours. 
Because Pi Hours would have been more like, uh, I don't know, 3.11-ish, I think. No, it would have been it would have been more like uh, three oh eight three oh nine, based off of you know how percentages of hours work in terms of minutes. All right, we are in fact in the last room, the last room of the Mirror Temple before we reach three thousand meters. Which will be a breath of fresh air for Siege because at that point, uh, each of those height markers becomes its own checkpoint, which makes life. A lot easier in terms of being able to breathe. There are far fewer long stretches of really devious uh, challenges. Instead, they're very tightly packed and devious, but you can replay them very quickly. And once you get it, you get it also very quickly. So, like that, you know, makes life a little easier there. So, here we go, making his way up. Let's see how we do in this last vertical climb. We have our two motion blocks. You got to jump between them. Oof! Not so good there. You gotta jump between them in order to avoid a handful of spike walls the last moment. Alright. No, nope, not quite. So you need to move that dash block and then let it start going back to the left. Then you jump on it, use the momentum to fling yourself to the wall. So you gotta set it up. There we go. Oh no, we used both dashes. Ooh, oh no. Yeah, that's not so good. You don't want to do that. You want to keep one of your dashes so you can send the next dash block your way and also dash to it to grab it. Oh no! Oh, just barely missed that. All right. Here we go. Oop, oh no. Correctable. There we go. Oh, okay. All right, okay. I believe at this point, this was uh, around the time CJ was mentioning that uh, his his hands were decidedly starting to get a bit tired, which is understandable. This is definitely a long, intense session at this point. But he's putting up a damn good show for a fully blind speed run. Oh no, the same spot. Oh. Alrighty. There we go. I'm going to make the jump. All right. Grabbing, dropping. All right. All right. Here we go. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. If he had just gone for it, I mean, he obviously didn't know that that was right there, but if he had just jumped, stayed on it and jumped straight up, he actually would have probably made it to the final orb there. Ooh, jumped a little bit early. All right, let's see. There we go. Okay, line that up. Got this one. Dropping down. Very nice. Okay. All right, vertical climb time. So you can actually jump onto the right pillar there. Oh no, oh no, oh, oh, Siege, no. In that last vertical segment, you can launch yourself and just grab onto the right pillar without using up one of your dashes. Um, obviously you can get to the top with just one dash and still manage it, but it's definitely easier if you have both of them. All right. There we go. Nice. Oh man, he's really like making a point of landing on top of that platform, that that pillar, which is causing some trouble as he's getting to that last set of spikes at the very top. You definitely want to make sure you're hanging onto the inside of those two pillars uh, before before you get to the very, very top there. Ooh, that was an unlucky little moment there. I think he 
don't entirely know what happened there, but wound up just barely nicking the uh, the spikes at the bottom there. All right. Cool, setting that up. go. Okay, still using up one. Alright, there we go. Dropping down. That's helpful. Oh no! Dash, dash! Oh, CJ. Oh boy. Alright, coming up. We're at three hours, 20 minutes. Final room of the 2500 meter mirror temple segment of the summit. We are just about good with this room. CJ's rhythm is certainly coming together a lot at this point, is pretty regularly getting up to the top of it here. We just gotta seal the deal with that red bubble. Just gotta jump in there and then send it straight up and he's good to go. There we go, all right. Mirror Temple part two complete. And we are on our way to the summit at 3000 meters. Let's do it. Here we go, 30 flags, the final challenge. Oh, listen to that intense music. Now, I don't know if the music, if the theme here is the same or different as the theme you get at the start of the level when it's mixing, when it's, you know, otherwise, when you're doing the reflection at zero meters. All right. Here we go. We're up to 28. Already passed our two flags. We're into the second room of, I think, six. I want to say the entirety of 3,000 meters is broken up into six rooms, and uh, one of which literally has just one flag. I think the sixth flag is by itself in a room. Um, but thankfully, like I mentioned before, each of these flags is its own checkpoint. If you die, as CJ is showing you right here, you just go back to the last flag that you hit. So usually it is in your best interest to hit all of these flags just in case. Um, surely... You know, Steven mentioned there are some flags that actually cost you time to land on. Uh, so presumably most speedruns only hit a few of them. And even then it seems more like a just because you happen to land on its platform more than, you know, actively trying to get it. Of course, if there are more difficult techniques you're trying to do, it may behoove you to, you know, waste the one second it takes to grab it just in case because it'll cost you a lot more if you die and get sent back further. All right, five flags down. I guess technically six flags down. Now seven flags down. 23 more to go. Here we go. Climbing up the summit. Siege making, oof, making his last stand here. He's going all the way. Oh, yes. Here we go. All right. So, uh, as Steve had mentioned, there are three... This this tends to get broken down into three segments. You've got downwind, upwind, and no wind. We're currently in the downwind section, and it's... Functionally, it's increased gravity. It is basically the overall effect that, that is experienced here. Um, and I'd mentioned during during our co-commentary earlier that when, the, when you've got the updraft... Uh, it's, it's still like a fairly reasonable thing to experience and, and like play through because it's not all that different from like underwater physics uh, or space physics in a lot of other platforming games. Whereas the downdraft section uh, is pretty different from that. There's not many games where you experience heightened gravity uh, as a main mechanic. So it's definitely a little bit different from what, you know, you might be used to for gameplay. All right, we get to the 20 flag. We got 19 more to go. This is that mean section we referred to earlier where you need to be able to... See, you're going all the way back just for a second to think. Where you need to kind of get up here and keep... You essentially need to get to each of these two overhangs using no more than one dash each. Grab it on that, and then through this overhang, and yes, there we go. Whoop. There we go. I'm going to say that is salvageable. Looks like he got that figured out. Nice. There we go. On to room three, I think. All right. Now to the updraft section. 
the 19 flag. This one's great. This one's a nice, fun little section because for the most part, you can kind of breeze through a lot of this. There's a good, you know, the, the, the updraft makes for a lot more favorable control during the platforming segments. I mean, everything's a platforming segment, but during the more, like, careful positioning. Ooh, oh, no. Careful positioning sort of platforming stuff. Here we go. Now, for this section, you have to retain one of your dra uh, your uh, dashes going over this. You need to grab onto the wall, do a little... Basically like that, you, you probably want to do an upright diagonal dash. I'm not sure if it's possible to get to the, to, to the blue cloud or the white cloud uh, without diagonal dashes. All right. CJ doing the same thing I did my first time here, using all my dashes and then going, wait, how do I actually get up to that platform? All right, 17 flag, just 16 more to go. We're doing it, boys. All right. Oh, so close. I think he actually might have been able to make that if he if he stayed committed to the right input instead of like, there was a little brief little shake and I think that might have cost him the ability to to land that grab. All right, let's see. Oof, not quite. This is a little tricky one. Like, the, the navigation is a little bit tight. A lot of the dash stuff is, is a lot tighter in this, like, middle chunk here. And I think that's because the updraft makes the actual, like, fall physics so much more forgiving. And for it again, ah. No, no, no. Here we go. Do -do. Yeah, these uh, it's it's not just that it's like super tight navigation here, but it's also that it's like a lot of diagonal dashes, which for one reason or another are just a little bit harder to like mentally process. Ooh, almost. If he landed that wall grab, he'd be able to kick off and get that dash. Uh, I don't know if he would have had the stamina to get the rest of the way, but at the very least, ooh, damn it, it would have got him to the platform. Let's see if he can recover this. Oof! A dash up to the right might have saved that from there. I don't know. go. Here we go. There we go. See there, that's what I was referring Ooh, well, that was what I was referring to of like it is salvageable. You just have to like line up the shot. Alright. Ooh, that was close. But there we go. 16 flag. Half the flag's done. There's number 15. Just 14 more to go now. And 14 is literally right up around this bend to the right. Go. Oh no! Oof! Bit of an oof on that one. Getting a little bit stuck on this segment, but there are a lot of like damage zones to, to be careful about there. Oh! You knew it, you knew it! Yes! Alright! 14 flag get! This section is a little tricky because you have to really be confident in your... So, for one, I think you do have to grab the wall unless you have some extremely perfect precision on your dashes. Because uh, eh, you can you can get past the first one. The second one might also be doable, but I think the, like, the position you are at when you're then needing to turn around and grab the wall is like less than ideal unless you come at it here. Because then you give yourself a lot more time to turn around and make those climbs happen. All 
right, here we go. Okay, all right. Just gotta get up. Oh no! Oh, not gonna have enough stamina. This. So I, I mentioned this earlier with Steve. This is the one section where it seems like you have like just barely enough stamina to get there, even if you do it very well. Like if you line this up almost perfectly, you're still gonna wind up with, you know, extremely little wiggle room. And it can be a real bastard if if you're not like prepared for it. All right, first one there. All right, here we go. Uh, go go go! Uh, yep, nope. Just barely ran out of stamina at the end there. It's it's so tough to line that up. So so tough to get that one line. Oof! Oh no! All right, as we're coming up on three and a half hours. With just 13 flags left to go in the game. I guess 14 if you count the flag at the summit, right? Oh no. I wonder, I guess if you if you do a even with your stamina's, you know, bottoming out, if you do a jump and kind of kick off the wall, that probably gives you a little bit of a boost to get more easily over to the 13 flag, right? Alright. You got this, Siege. Come on, you got this. All right. Got that one. And that one, nice. Oh, this is looking clean. This is looking real clean. Yes, 13 flag. Ba-boom. And just got the 13 flag, so so we'll, we'll live with it. It's fine. All right. There we go. Another kind of snaky little segment there. All right, now we got the springboard section with the three buttons. I think this... Is this the last button segment of the game? It might be. There might be one more. I can't remember. I think this might be the last one. I think. All right. Oof, oh no! Uh, as we are crossing into one hour in the summit, making our way through with just 12 flags left to go. This one's kind of tricky though, like this section in particular is like, if you're not like on it then, then it can like really mess you up. And it like, it's weird because it takes a, this is probably the longest uh, individual flag in the summit. Because, like, you have this whole snaky sort of segment here, and then you have to do the three buttons, and then you have to thread that needle at the very end to get to the platform, to actually get to the 12 flags. So there's, like, a lot of pieces for this one. So it's not short, and it's difficult. So this might be the last, like, real significant kind of um, challenge in terms of both uh, difficulty and complexity. Oh, no! Oh, that one was looking pretty good, too. You got it, CJ. All right, all right. There we go. One, two. I get the one on the right. Oh, dangerous to do that without the dash, but he can. Oh no, he pulled it back in just a little too early. Ah, damn, 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 damn. Part is so rough. Here we go. We got. Oh, uh, almost. Okay, dropping down, getting our snaking through here. You would almost think that like the the updraft would be like really helpful for this, but it actually like for this one in particular, it just kind of I feel like it makes you free like panic more. There's more time to go, all right, and fuck, damn it, ugh. Mm -hmm. Here we 
go. Here we go. That's two. Let's get the third. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, yep. Go for it. If it's not looking good, there we go. Nice. You can always line up for a second one. That's 12 flag. Here we go. All right. 11 more to go. All right. Some very careful maneuvering of dashes at this point. Another section that is more or less uh, technique perfect. Like you basically... Uh, Sort of the, like all of the spikes and the negative space in them is laid out where it's like you just kind of have to do what they want you to do, essentially. There's not really a better way of, uh, of, of making it work than uh, than the way that they've laid out for you. All right. Hmm, okay. Through here, a couple diagonals. That one's a uh, that one's a little unfriendly of a of a grab there. Mm -hmm. Over around, get to the ten, get to the ten. Yeah, all right, we're at the ten. Here we go, nine more to go. Mm -hmm. That wall of spikes has got CJ's number. Got to get up there, and then another little snake section, and you have so little wiggle room. It's, like, ridiculous. And you have to have one of your dashes there, too. If you don't line up the shot, you got to drop back down, hit that springboard again, and then go for it from there. All right, here we go, here we go. Yep, and again, you might, eh, at that point, it's like, eh, drop down, take the, yeah, because there's, you need, you need a dash to get through that. All right, up, over. Oh, boy, that was a lucky little wall grab there. Holy cow. All right. Up and down. Ooh, a little snug, but we got there. All right. But over, not quite high enough. You do have to hit that first springboard a little higher up if you want to be able to reach. There we go. That should be a good one. Ooh, oh no. Got to do a diagonal. A diagonal dash off of that if we want to be able to. Oh, that one looks good. Okay. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, no. Uh, I don't think he I don't think he was quite expecting that he actually made the grab and was kind of going for a reflex, a reflex save there. Whoop. Whoop. Okay. So letting that one go. No big deal. Up, over. Here we go. Okay. Nice, clean grab. Boom. Nine flag. All right. Holy cow. All right. Eight more to go. You are right there, Siege. Let's do this. You're on the doorstep. Time to start knocking. Another one where you have, like, a pretty precise set of movements that you need to do in order to get that. It is doable if you uh, if you grab the wall, but boy oh boy, is it less than ideal, and you you certainly feel it while you're doing your uh, your uh, your your dashes if you're not doing like the exact way. All right. Ooh, almost saved that one, but. A little aggressive to the left, and that kind of there we go. Oh no! But he's there. He's got this. He's got the he's got the tech down. He's just gotta sink it all up, and he's ready to roll. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. There we go. Eight flag. Seven more to go. Holy cow! CJ, you're doing it. You are still doing it, even despite that. All right, here we go. Here we go. Line it up. Line it up. Yeah, seven flag. Oop, you do need a dash here, though. So, drop them back down. Get your dashes back. There we go. Now for my favorite little segment of the summit, which 
I, I feel like I always do it like twice as fast as I'm supposed to because I just kind of do like diagonal out, diagonal in, diagonal out, diagonal in. But I do it fast enough where I'm just like, I'm going to fuck this up and like bash into something and like completely waste all the speed that I was like building up there, but... Use that updraft. There we go. Oh, that's right. The overhang to get to the six flag. Uh, uh, you can do it. Yes. Oop. Or oh, sorry, to get to the five flag, not the six flag. We got the six flag already. Five flags. Burgers and fries. There we go. Oop, you do need one dash to get to the four. Taking it back one more time. Oof, oof. Okay, all right. Here we go. Uh, not quite. Got to get him on that wall. There we go. Nice. Boom, four flag. We're getting there. We're getting there. Coming up on three hours and 40 minutes, and we're down to just the last three flags. Oof, not quite. All right. Here we go. Jumping over onto the stone platform. Up on the wall. Lining up the shot. Bouncing it. Ooh, lands in the spikes underneath the feather that we needed to progress. That cloud looked like angry. I don't know if we'll go back and see it. If we do, take a look at this cloud on the right here. It looks like an angry face. It's like, Arr. All right, lining up our shot down to the springboard, bouncing up. Oof! Didn't quite have the down direction ready to go there. All right. Okay. Oh, good grab! And I oh, all right. Didn't quite manage the the dash there. The last moment. Still setting that up. All right. Off the stone platforms, off the wall, bouncing over, setting up the shot. Ah, oh, didn't have the down direction ready to go there either. All right. Around uh, the spike hinge, off the stone platform, to the wall, no dashes. He did get his dashes back, but I think he was kind of in his own head about getting to the gems to replenish them, even though just landing on the stone platform got the, the jumps back. But bouncing off of that, there we go. Oh. Oh, yes. Come on, to the three, to the three, to the three. Oh, my goodness. Three flag get. All that stands, all that stands in CJ's way are the two flag, the one flag, and the flag at the summit of Celeste Mountain. Let's go, boys. Oof, oh, no. At 342 now. At the three flag, closing in, zeroing in on the peak, on the summit. What's the difference between a summit and a peak? Is the summit the tallest peak? Is a summit like a kind of landing platform style zone at a peak? Or are they literally just the same thing? I don't really, I guess I don't really know. Let's see. What is the difference between a peak, a hill, a mountain, and yada yada? But it says summit versus peak. Summit is a point on a mountain surface that is higher in elevation than all points immediately adjacent to it, whereas a peak is the pointed top of a mountain. The distinction between the summit and the peak is unclear and largely subjective. Okie dokie. <laughs> I was like, those descriptions sound different, but actually the same. So that wasn't great. All right. So they're more or less the same. Sounds like peak is like literally if it's a pointy top, you're going to have a peak. If it's not necessarily a pointed top, it's more of a summit. And considering there's a flat zone with a flag in there, I could I feel like summit is the more appropriate word. All right. Oh, 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 ah, almost. 
Got to thread that needle with a double dash to get to the two flag. It's a little bit tricky because it seems deceptive. You almost want to take your feather and try to fly through it. But that's a mistake. You want to fly past it and then drop down and start your double dash. You want to just go straight up and then when you line up your shot, when you're horizontal, when you're lined up horizontally with that hole, that's where you want to dash left and then dash up to the left and grab onto that platform, climb, get yourself to that two flag, and then you are in business. All right. Here we go, here we go. Oh, yes, good enough. That'll do it. Two flag get, one more to go. Come on, Siege, you got this, let's rock. All three of us fell at that exact same, like, zone, and I think in between the same uh, gems, even. So I think we all missed this one once. Oh, no, it was the one, it was the one past that. Whoop, okay. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh, no! Okay, all right. That's all right, we got this. All right, up and over, nice, okay. Oh, not quite. All right, here we go, lining it up as we get to three hours and three quarters, 3.45 on the run, 3.45 on the clock. Just a single flag stands between CJ and the summit of Celeste Mountain. Here we go, boys. Here we go. Let's do this. Oh, no. Oof. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Ooh, that was tight. Oh, oh no. Okay. All right. That's fine. We can clean that up. He is super close, though. I feel it right here. Yes. All right. Yes, the one flag. Ladies and gents, we are on the precipice. Oop. Quick little refresh there. All right, 346. You hear that music fade out, and you know you're there. You just hear that cold breeze at the peak. Closing in on one hour, just under 115. Gotta hit that. We actually did it. You damn right you did. And there we go. Time for CJ. A total of three hours, 46 minutes, 23.68 seconds. And with that, there we have it. Our complete runs for Celeste in totality with Jose, myself, and CJ. Without further ado, you can get to our final standings for the race. Jose for Tierra de los Hermanos Hook taking the gold with one hour, two minutes, and 28 seconds. Myself grabbing the silver for Imperium Ludum with one hour, four minutes, and seven seconds. And CJ for Daisy Baby Bitch Territory taking the bronze at three hours, 46 minutes, 23 seconds. Not a bad time for a, bl for a completely mm -hmm. blind run of this game. I, I think I took longer when I was streaming mine, so I certainly I, I certainly can't, you know, knock him for for a time like that on his first go. Mm -hmm. For for a completely blind blind one, that's totally great. Uh, and then, you know, even like one or two more runs of practice will bring that down a lot. Absolutely, yeah. We were talking about it after his run and he was saying that like if I did it again I could probably do it in under three hours, even just mm -hmm. doing a second run now. It's like, yeah, oh absolutely. Like I could see him knocking a full hour off of this on a second attempt, for sure. Easily. Uh, and he was also, he had never played the game. Uh, he he was kind of unsure about, like, you know, whether whether he wanted to, like, try to practice or just go in totally blind just for kind of a fun run. And afterwards, mm -hmm. he was like, yeah, I might pick up this game. And I was like, sweet. Ah, yeah. awesome. That's that's what I want to hear. <laughs> Definitely way to that, get into it. Exactly. I'm glad that everyone, like, enjoyed themselves with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this was kind of a really important, important one for the overall standings here as Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with this final gold clinch the top position for the games with seven gold, three silver, and three bronze. 
Uh, Imperium Ludum taking second overall with six gold, six silver, and three bronze. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory in third with two gold, three silver, five bronze. And you betcha Stan in the back of the pack with one gold, four silver, five bronze. Everybody walking away with golds, which is always good. Uh, for the individual medal counts, we've got myself at the top with six golds and four silvers. Jeff with two gold, two silver, one bronze. Dave with two gold, one silver, one bronze. And Peter with two golds. Uh, we have a handful of folks with one gold as well. CJ with a gold, a silver, two bronze. Diego with one gold and two bronze. Felice with one gold, one bronze. Jose also with one gold earned here as well as one bronze. And below that, we've got uh, we've got John with four silver, three bronze. Lindsay with two silver, two bronze. Sarah with one silver, two bronze. And Nick with one silver and one bronze. Uh, special shout out to uh, myself, to Jeff, to Diego, and to Sarah as... Uh, the only folks who we actually managed to medal in every event that we participated in. So a perfect 100 uh, for those four competitors. Uh, I especially want to thank all of the competitors that we just listed off there. Uh, Sarah and Nick, John, Diego, CJ, Felice, Lindsay, Jeff, Peter, Dave, and Jose. As well as all of the commentators that we've had over the course of this series of the games. The second games, in fact. So a big shout out to Alksprit, to C Dude, to Nintendo Fangirl, Alex Rosenberg, that Andy guy, Teddy, aka Evil Hippie, uh, Max and Lynn from Game Face, uh, Ian from Born Losers Gaming, Anthony and Justin over at Retro Roulette, Ape Arcade, and Steve, you as well, uh, and Jeff, who who uh, commentated for our very first event for this. Uh, on top of that, it's been a hell of a ride. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap this thing up? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that you know it's been a great run from all of the competitors. Uh, it's been great to see you know all of the skills and all of the different uh, events and all of the you know how close all of these events were as we were talking about earlier. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to see. Uh, it's been great to uh, be a part of this. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining me for this. I was kind of for Sonic Mania. I kind of commentated that one out of necessity just because it was such a long event and it was sort of last minute and. You know, two or three people I was chatting up about it didn't really think that they'd be able to do it with the time that was available to them for, for Sonic Mania. So this time around, I was like, I need to figure out somebody for Celeste, like, way ahead of time on this. Uh, and I was, like, thinking about it for a while. I'm like, you know what? I, we, you know, Celeste comes up in the, in the D-pad Discord, you know, relatively frequently. Not, like, all the time, but it does come up from time to time. And I was like, do I even know anyone outside of our own circle who who talks about celeste like at all and the first one was like no actually wait a minute okay then we got to go in we got to go inward for this and you know as soon as i was thinking about that i was like okay steve is the obvious choice for, for a commentator on this he knows this game like the back of his hand and he's definitely going to have like solid knowledge of the game the the strats the routes and all of the things that like make this game really tick so i i really appreciate you joining me for this of course it's been a lot of fun Sweet. Well, with that, uh, that is going to be the end of the games. And I believe that means we're going to be needing to throw this over to our closing ceremony. So we'll get right to that. Yes.